Yeah, let's just get the show started. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey now, it's your boy PSA Sitch here with another Sunday Sunday stream with everyone's favorite spectral investigator, Adam Friend. <laughs> oh, what's up? How's it going? I like that intro. Yeah. Yes, I, I'm. I'm all for investigating the the spectral, whatever that is. <laughs> And and look, we're here with an an amazing guest on the show. I, I love this guy's videos. Uh, what if Alt Hist is his channel? It's amazing. Everyone should check it out. And your name is Rudyard, right? Am I yeah. pronouncing that correctly? That's, and that's, it's, you're one of the few people to pronounce it correctly. Okay, Rudyard. Nice. But Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling, I think, is who you're named after, right? That's yeah. like the famous Rudyard. So, but you're Rudyard Lynch, and Lynch is also, I mean, da who doesn't love David Lynch, right? You got like the perfect name here. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, um, we were just talking a bit before the stream. I mean, if you want to just go into like the conversation got started getting so interesting, so quick, yeah. we we're like, okay, was, we better just go live here. So before so, the show, we were talking about how the CIA and the Soviets had various experiments in the spirit world during the cold war. And they found some really interesting stuff. And what I was saying was that academia will take information that's not really valid and shove it into a pre-existing worldview and then there's stuff that has much more evidence behind that just won't make it in. And the reason I said for that is that we confused what priest classes do with what scientists do. And every society has to have a priest class. And you look over history, every society ever is religious. And so when you remove religion, you end up with it kind of seeping into a bunch of other places like fan culture. People treat Star Wars like a religion, um, into science, into politics, etc. And so... Um, an example of what's moral and what's factual, and they have to be kind of intertwined because if you have a worldview that's like, you can't have a moral code that's completely separated from what the real world is. But for example, I believe war has to always happen. War is an inbuilt part of the natural order where if societies don't have war, they grow weak and silly, but I don't think war is good. I'm not going to pretend that war is an amazing thing. And so there's that separation there of what's moral and what's true. And then we've removed that separation. And so you can't, when you're looking at the scientific truth, it gets conflated with what people want to believe. And then once th those two need to be separate, and if you don't make them separate, they mess with each other, where if the science isn't allowed to see the truth, it'll basically be corrupted. And what you end up with is people manipulating both for their own personal gain. And I think that's what we've done in our society, where we've basically created a religion around what gives people with college degrees the most power. And I think, I mean, this is- I use, I I use that thing. The left. I think Looking, the left is a religion based on giving people with college degrees more power. Yeah, I use that. You said that in a video, and it really just clicked for me. And I, I mean, I think I have it in my notes somewhere. I, I have mentioned it more than once. Yeah, uh, the that theory that leftist politics is really just about empowering college college graduates. I, I think it's this totally interesting it, idea. But just wait, just to go back to the war thing, just for a second. Like, is there is there another means to do it? I mean, people often say politics is is war by other means. Like, I would hope as the future goes on, we can find a way to maintain our strength as a culture without actually, you know, engaging in tribal warfare. It depends on what time frame you're looking at. And for me, because my speciality is history, I look at things over thousands of years. And over that perspective, we're, there's no way in hell we don't have a war. Um, however, you can look at periods of like 100 years or 200 years, and there's not a war. And uh, be, the, the only time in history where you don't have major wars is because one great power is strong enough that it's capable of making war uneconomical for everyone else involved. So the Romans, the British, et cetera. The Americans, let's be exactly. clear here. <laughs> and um, interestingly, over the 20th century, we've seen... Um, we've seen alternatives to war where the fall of the Soviet Union, decolonization, um, and 
The reason most people get scared of war is by how traumatic the world wars were. Because people, when people predict the future, they always go back to the last alternative and think it's the next thing. But because the end point of the world wars was that millions of people died, the European continent got fried, we nearly had a nuclear holocaust. But I don't think that has to be the future of war. And so what I've said in my videos is I think that if we have a major war, it'll be a decentralized um it'll be a decentralized um more limited war and that sort of thing it's not the horrible world wars that can wipe out a society in four years it's more something where like for example in the 1700s you could trade with or go on vacation to a country you were at war with and that's a completely different <laughs> yeah for real like people <laughs> that's crazy and back in the 1700s people would literally have dinner with the opposing army before the battle because they were all gentlemen and it wasn't personal <laughs> <laughs> wow okay that's kind of crazy and so when people think of war it doesn't there's only two eras of history that have these giant like empire breaking periods um and that's something that we don't really think about today because when we think war our first thought is nuclear armageddon mm -hmm. well let's uh so another thing that we talked about before the stream started which i think people will be interested in is i was saying that i think we have a lot of overlap in our book selections we, we mentioned the righteous mind you you had said quite <laughs> equivocally that the righteous mind had changed your life you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, I, I really love The Righteous Mind and it it really changed how I viewed the world. And the reason for those that haven't read it, and I really want to bring John Haidt in my podcast, what John Haidt does is he studies the psychology of politics, where he goes through that there are these six pillars that all societies have to differing degrees, and they're ingrained in our biology based off certain biological self-interests. And these include liberty harm fairness um equality not equality authority and purity and different parts of the political spectrum pull on them and human nature is 90 percent irrational and about 10 percent irrational and we choose different irrational points to start from and then we use rationality or rationalizations to justify where we end up and that really changed how I viewed the world, because beforehand you have this idea that the right and the left are these, you don't, you didn't really have a frame of reference to understand why they were different and what they were really about. And that was a big turning point for me because you could suddenly see the architecture behind these different beliefs. And also I could pair, compare it to other historic societies because you can go back and compare certain political views to pre-industrial religions. And that was really a big turning point for me because I was able to, um, I was able to kind of deconstruct the worldview of both the right and the left on a more, in, on, on a more clinical basis. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you, are I you familiar will, with? I actually want to ask you about this because I, I want to ask you, how do you define the right versus the left? And yeah. have you seen Heights kind of right-left moral foundations break down in history? Or is it like a recent thing? Interesting. Oh, great question. Um, sorry about the background noise. My neighbor's mowing his lawn. We uh, we can't hear any of it. Zoom actually oh, cuts a lot of that stuff out. That's incredible. So, yeah, yeah, it no, sounds Zoom great. I was worried yeah. about that. but um, that Sounds awesome. So these things, the right and the left today are they're broad coalitions that don't really have a shared they're not like back in stalinism or in stalin's russia everyone believed the exact same thing and if you didn't you were shot um where the right and the left are broad coalitions that don't really share that much um i see the left as a descendant of gnosticism and that's kind of a, this kind of schizo rabbit hole that i've seen a couple of other people fall down where gnosticism was this ancient religion from the middle east and it was kind of its own thing but it would latch on to judaism or christianity or islam or other religions and it's kind of like if you split christianity and buddhism where gnostics believe that the world is an evil conspiracy by the devil and mm -hmm. i 
for people listening in the audience, wait till the end. I know this is going to sound weird, <laughs> but suspend disbelief for about a minute. Um, where Gnostics believed that the earth is inherently evil and the world is an evil conspiracy by Satan to run to basically torture souls. And then there is this secret God that gives people this hidden knowledge and that the people with the hidden knowledge can realize that they can become gods and then break the evil conspiracy. And this was a very common belief, but it wasn't able to gain widespread um, adherence among the majority population. So it kind of bumped around secret associations. And it was big in the Middle Ages because this was a very religious society where every educated person knew religious philosophy. And then we, it was big in the early modern period. And then Hegel, people, these people would use um, certain terminology to make others aware that you were a Gnostic. And um, Hegel used a lot of this terminology and Marx based it off Hegel. But if you look at the left today, People study people's beliefs at two face value and not realize what is this belief getting and what is the underlying worldview. And for the left, their underlying worldview is everything is an evil conspiracy that we have to deconstruct. And we are the people with the hidden knowledge. And thus, anyone who disagrees with us is um, has to either be evil or stupid. And this is one of the things I see with the left. The right is capable of believing that its opponents are just misguided or are people who are intelligent with different upbringings that came to different conclusions. And so if you also look at the left, they believe the second that they win, the world will become a utopia. And that belief structure only makes sense from a Gnostic framework because the Gnostics believe the world's an evil conspiracy. And once you remove that, you'll be living in a utopia. And so the left... I don't think the people involved knew what they were doing. They were just, these were ideas that were kind of in, in circulation. And over time they evolved into it because these are ideas that are very psychologically palatable. Mm -hmm. uh, and so one of the things with John Haidt is that the left has two or three psychological foundations. They care a lot about harm. They care a lot about liberty. And then they've recently become obsessed with purity. And it's funny that the radical left is the most obsessed with purity of any population in America, or maybe even the world. I, it wouldn't surprise me if woke people are more puritanical than the Taliban, if I'm honest. <laughs> I don't one disagree. Buddies, one of my buddies was captured by the Taliban, and wow. he, he lived with them for six months. And it was ironic where, I, I, like, having spoken to him, I would legitimately say that the there are ways where woke people are more puritanical than the Taliban, mm -hmm. um, but the but the thing is that with the left they 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 come from this worldview where everything is an evil conspiracy and um and that's just not the reality. I'm sorry, it took, this is just taking a long for me to explain, but. The reality of the world is everyone is struggling for survival against a bunch of other groups, and people always try to find edges over other groups, where, for example, from the left's perspective, men oppress women because when men are brutal. However, if you look over the entire course of history, if men could have gotten a strategic edge by giving women like by by basically doing feminism a thousand years ago, you would have seen feminism a thousand years ago. And so the left doesn't see the world through any lens of practicality, which leads me back to them having having a worldview that stems from Gnosticism. The it seems like the the right has adopted in a lot of respects the uh, everything is a conspiracy now too because yeah, like definitely. everything's the deep state. Yeah, that's it's it's sad actually because I predicted the right going off the rails mm -hmm. a little bit ago, and we were talking at the tweet I released before where uh, I put out a tweet saying we're about a year away from someone on the right saying I'm unironically a fascist, and then having all the comments be based, mm -hmm. and then the tweet went viral. It got seven hundred and fifty thousand views, <laughs> and all the comments are based I am an unironically a fascist, and we're already there. It makes me sad because I'm a classical <laughs> liberal. And I built a lot of my identity around that. And I love mm -hmm. freedom and democracy and all that stuff. And it's, and I, I saw this coming. I talked about it and then it just kind of happened. And what happens be, because people feel so disempowered today because they're broke, they're depressed, they're lonely. They look for conspiracy theories to explain it. And it's, 
it's kind of I'm kind of scared to see where the right's going to go. And the right also does have like Nazism is also a descendant of Gnosticism. Um, and the reason that both the far right and the far left kind of get that conspiracy worldview is mm -hmm. because once you remove traditional religion, you remove any sense that the world has order. And so once you lose it, the sense of order, you kind of jumped like the, the next easy psychological jump is that everything's an evil conspiracy. Um, mm. And where I see the right going, the thing that scares you the most at the where the where, where the right is going is the lack of empathy, because for a lot of the right today, if you suggest like, hey, can we please be a little bit kinder about this? Can we please um, not go full barbarian? People will call you a cuck. Right. And it's 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 it, it the left boy who called called wolf the right where and I saw this for like 10 years. I was thinking about this where the left is is bait the left's top dominant strategy is baiting into hazard or basically annoying people so much they do something dumb <laughs> and um i think that that's probably the left strategy where they're trying to basically bait the right they're master baiters they're trying to bait the right <laughs> into doing something crazy but they don't seem to understand that the right's military power the right controls all force in America. The right has the military, it has the police, it has the gun owners, it has the resources, the internal transportation. Um, and so I think things are going to get ugly and I'm scared if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. yeah, it seems um, like the left kind of was crying, has been crying for a long time about racism, sexism, so that when the actual racists and sexists show up, it's kind of like, oh, they're probably lying. And it yeah. was the same thing with the right kind of cried wolf about socialism. And now that the actual socialists are here, it's like, oh, well, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. And it's funny. I think a lot of people, a lot of socialists are better served on the right than the left at this point. Because I, one of my friends said, really? there are loads of people on the MAGA right who would mm -hmm. have positions that are identical to that of a member of the American Communist Party. In the <laughs> Jackson Henkel. They, Big corporations are terrible. Example. The yeah. rich are grinding us into the dirt. Yep. Um, the um, giant multinational corporations are destroying our our culture. And um, something I've I've had this debate with my father for like five years, where we were talking about is the right or the left a um, basically a an unconscious vortex that acts on its own or is it run by a small cabal and the conclusion i've come to is it's both at the same time and that this the small cabal is in competition with the, the social justice vortex and i think over the last couple of years with like the left has become more corporate and so you're seeing a lot of these choices made by the top cabal and then because of that um the right has been able to become more populist and at this point, I don't really see the American right having any real identity. It's just people who aren't part of the left. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just give you. Oh, well, I, just, I just want to ask on the fascism conspiracy brain thing. You mentioned yeah. that you thought it was economically driven. I think a lot of people, you know, obviously they call it the culture war. They think it's philosophically driven. But I, I'm often torn. I think the philosophy and the the economic conditions are intertwined to some respect uh, to some respect obviously you know how you conceptualize your your economic conditions philosophy can help make better or worse but i do think a lot of it is ultimately has to be driven by economics what is your uh, what is your take i definitely agree i mean everything's everything it's why i make 40 minute video essays if the answers were easier my videos would just be people are poor and they're angry Done. <laughs> yes totally um, yeah. But I mean, it's history comes and goes like an ocean current. And when the storm smashes up against the beach, when the waters are ready, there's a lot of random flotsam and stuff from further out to get washed up. Mm -hmm. And we can actually predict when societies have revolutions through economic data. So the underlying driver is economic. Um and there's this really cool data scientist named Peter Turchin who has a computer model that can that his stuff's amazing. He's been able to predict the Russian Civil War, the French Revolution, um, the Roman, the fall of Rome, the fall of the Roman Republic, the Black Death, 
You're talking about elite overproduction, right? Exactly. Yeah. Where um, he controls for three variables, inequality, average wages, and elite overproduction, which is basically people trying to get into good jobs. And using those three variables, plugging it over history, he's able to predict when countries have revolutions and civil wars. And that, and so in 2010, he said that we would have that in 2020. And so I don't think most Americans realize how rough, I mean, the lives of Americans economically are rough, but I think it's compounded by a bunch of other stuff like the breakdown in community, religion, um, shared culture, et cetera, where people aren't starving, but because we've removed those shared things, people don't have to be starving to have a revolution. And I... I think the economics is push is pushing this to breaking point. And then there's a bunch of other variables that make it worse in different ways. Yeah, I know you're a James Lindsay fan. James Lindsay did a podcast on this elite overproduction thing. And it was before I had encountered Turchin's yeah. um, high, uh, I research. I didn't know that Lindsay talked about that. I just got it from Turchin. Look, I, I, I DM'd Lindsay and Lindsay d- does, hadn't read Turchin either. He just came up with it on his own. But Lindsay was in the the... PhD program and he could see the elite overproduction like firsthand. <laughs> yeah. So he did this podcast. It was just such a black pill. I was like, all these kids are getting all these PhD degrees and there's absolutely no place in society for them. They're yeah. going to be revolutionaries. It's, it's impossible yeah, for them not to be. I saw that at age 22. I mean, I'm, I'm age 22. And I went, when I went to high school, I could, I didn't know how to explain this stuff, but I could intuitively pick up on a lot of it just looking at people's lives. Um, And I grew up in Pennsylvania, which is part of the Rust Belt. And so that adds another degree of desperation of things. But I'd see people working really hard in high school. And I didn't really do that. I was kind of an edgelord in high school and I didn't try that hard. Based. uh, (laughs) Way to be. Smoking weed in the bushes. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But I saw these kids and I thought, you guys are working because for a lot of them, they were working like 12 hours a day, six days a week doing various stuff. It's like China level things. I remember seeing a girl break down in tears when she had an hour free in senior year. She didn't know what to do with that. And having an hour free was an existential crisis. So I was thinking to myself, and I heard all these stories of people out of college. You guys are working super hard and I know there's not a payoff at the end. So why are you guys doing this? And I worked hard on, I I remember I had a calculation my senior year of high school. I'm not going to be successful in the conventional route. And I developed five different things I could try to do as an entrepreneur because I knew I wouldn't make it on the conventional route. But I think there's this like awakening black pill among the population, especially people in my age, that they're just screwed on a bunch of different things, um, whether uh, economically, dating, socially, um oh yeah dating is a whole nother oh man i I think i actually think the dating i call it the dating and the marriage crisis is the number one revolution driver today i think it's more than economics actually Mm. yeah that's tough go ahead sitch was being on youtube one of your plans or did that i didn't expect it it kind of just happened um i I never planned on being on YouTube because it, being a YouTube public intellectual wasn't even a career. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember I was rewatching iCarly and I was looking at iCarly's live stream stats. And I thought that I saw that and I thought this girl in 2010 is supposed to be one of the top content creators. She would not be able to live off those stats today. <laughs> but, and mm-hmm. so that's just how fast the internet grew. Um, and what happened was that I was stuck at home during COVID during my gap year, and I was just bored out of my mind. And I had around 60,000 subscribers, and I was still doing alternate history back then, like what if the South won the Civil War, or what if the Nazis won World War II? Mm-hmm. And I just worked on my channel full time when I was stuck at home during COVID. Then I went to college, and my channel really took off when I my first semester of college. And I was making enough money that I didn't really have to. I look. I just looked at one of my checks in December of freshman year, and I thought I can't stay in school. And I was working myself to death, where I do my uh, classwork and then I do my full time YouTube job. And I, was, I wasn't an alcoholic, but I was drinking more than I liked to basically calm my nerves. And so, I 
And then I met one of my friends who was uh, a digital nomad living in Mexico. And then he basically said, hey, Rudyard, you want to drop out of school and move to Mexico with me? And so I did that. And it wasn't I didn't decide to be a YouTuber until it was just my job already. Right. Interesting. It, OK, so I mean, you said a lot of things that I think are very true. Uh, Conspiracy is bred out of a lack of order in people's lives. Uh, and let's see. And that the lack of religion has led to faith bleeding into science. And also, I'm assuming you mean like also when kind of wokeness has become its own yeah. uh, religion as well. Um, but I want to go back to in the beginning. You said that you were doing a bunch of reading on the CIA and Russia's uh, oh, yeah. experiments into the spirit world, which that so, interests me a lot. This is a rabbit hole that I've been stuck on yeah. for a long time. And I'm, I'm going to end up making like 10 videos about it. But I'm kind of obsessive with how I make videos where I don't feel I've done a good enough job unless I've read like 10 videos on 10 books on the topic. That's so yeah. I've been studying this topic a lot. And um, the CIA did these studies in the 60s and the 70s where they'd play sound frequencies and then have people lie in bed or lie down. And they were consistently able to find that people would astral project out of their body. And they were able to get evidence for... Wait, has it been documented? Yeah, this is the CIA was doing this for 15 years. And then their, the report on it was all the science is correct for this. We yeah, just but like this is an official CIA report. It says like we were able to yeah, get people to astral report. project on command. Yeah, this is, this is look at the gateway report. And then okay. the military... You had doubt that, Sitch? I'm, I'm just shocked. Yeah, it's called gateway. And okay. it's all public data. It was released in 2016. Nice. Um, and then the military's report was all the science in the Gateway Project was correct. Um, just they didn't have enough people in the field to validate it. Mm -hmm. Where um, they they ran through a couple different kinds of biometric. They 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 had like three or four different scientific ways of analyzing what was going on at the time. Where they could astral project out of their bodies, and they could go stuff like go to the neighbor's house, see what the neighbor is doing at a certain time, ask the neighbor about details of it, and they were able to get data that was correct enough that it, they weren't making it up or they could right. read numbers on the other side of the room or the other side of the country in a certain room but the problem was the further you get out the more your mind messes with this so they could mm -hmm. read a number like they'd have a, a room on the other side of the country and then people would use their minds to basically read the numbers and enough of the numbers were correct that they they knew they weren't making it up but at the same time um, it wasn't enough that it was perfect. And what they found is the further you get out into the spirit world, the more it doesn't relate to what's actually going on in the physical world. The more your ideas and mindset and your your own psychological state mixes with it. And oh, okay. the what the Soviets also did in the Czech Republic at the exact same time, and you got to love the Soviets for stuff like this, is they gave... 4,000 people, giant amounts of LSD over extended periods of time, and then interviewed them. And what they found was um, a, like, you know, for Dante's Inferno, the further you get out from Dante, the weirder hell gets. And this was mm -hmm. a concept in the pre-industrial mystic traditions that, because back in, back in pre-industrial societies, they didn't have a concept of splitting off the psychological world and the physical world. So if you do these weird spirit quests, they just thought that was outer space and you were going into physical outer space. Um, and so basically the further out, and for both the Gateway and the Soviet ones in Czechia, th it, there's this kind of map where the further you get out, the more abstract it is, where you'll talk to like a god, then beyond that is the incredible unknown um, and it's more degrees of abstraction and difficulty to understand. And, um, I don't fully buy all of this. I mean, whenever there's a new, whenever you find new stuff, a lot of it turns out to be wrong in retrospect. But the thing that mm -hmm. makes me kind of wink at it is that every other, literally every other society in history believed in this stuff. And we in the modern world are the weird ones out. And our reason for not believing it is just that we can't document it. And um, like we have records of a pre, like in, in ancient India, they'd have the priest classes would take psychedelics or they'd, um, or they would um, 
meditate. And then they also built a mental model that's exactly the same as what these two exper experience are talking about. And you also have a similar tradition in pre-modern Europe where the priest classes of all these ancient societies would go on, they, they would have these encounters with the spirit world. And this is something that we hide in modern Christianity, but like, like Isaac Newton was obsessed with this stuff. He would, he was, he studied the esoteric as nearly as much as he studied physics. The founding fathers were steeped in this stuff. And so a lot of the choices for like the currency are esoteric symbols to like, to uh, further the Republic because the Freemasons were talking about this stuff. And I think that there is a theory of the world here that we haven't really locked onto that needs serious study. And I don't know when I make videos of this, I'm assuming a lot of the stuff I'm going to say is bullshit, but I think someone should at least talk about it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's crazy. Like, so if the CAA was able to replicate with some um, consistency that people could project and they would get, I don't know, like 50, 60% accuracy on some of the stuff. I mean, it's just wild to me that that wasn't taken seriously and is not being yeah. researched outside of, you know, some top secret lab somewhere. I mean, unless it is all being researched just secretly. Just, I don't understand how that could just it's, fall into the cracks. The thing is, it doesn't fit with the modernist worldview well enough, where it makes me think of back in the Middle Ages, they would find fossilized sea animals in the middle of the land. Like in the middle of the continent, you'd find a fossilized seashell or a dinosaur. And mm -hmm. what the medieval Catholic church said was that these were aberrations designed by God to test our faith in him. Right. And in retrospect, you can see that's kind of a stretch. But <laughs> if you look over history, you find that people build paradigms of the world. And then you see enough cracks in it over time that the paradigm breaks and you build a new one. And yep. the universe is infinitely large. So there are infinite theories you can use to explain the world. And we just pick a handful that work for our society. And so what I think happened was just no one knew what to do with this, where imagine in the 60s if they had if the cia had released all this astral projection stuff and i don't want to go like this is stuff conspiracy theorists say but our entire society is built off a right to rule of the material world being everything that would challenge academia it would challenge the military it would challenge the government um and i mean what happened when they finally did release it in 2016 is that the guy who ran the experiment james monroe he had a page about how the teachings that the things he figured out were applicable to world religions. And then the CIA just removed that page because they didn't want people thinking about the ap applicability for religions and peace and stuff. And then Monroe, re Monroe released the version with the pages just to fuck with them. And so <laughs> it's just, I think it was too much to bear and they were scared of what the social implications would be. And the reason this stuff is coming out now and people like Joe Rogan like it so much is because our society is falling apart and people are desperate to find something else. But I don't, like, I think even 10 years ago, I might have written this off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny because, like, I know, you know, when I was younger, I kind of went into the astral projection rabbit hole too. And I wasn't looking at it from the C. I I didn't know anything about the CA studying it. Um, but I just, like, you know, reading a bunch of kind of, you know, uh, mystical hippie books about it. And it's funny because some of the ones I read would say the same thing about how like, oh, you know, you can project somewhere and you'll see things that are kind of real, but, you know, the closer you get to the spirit yeah. realm, everything becomes kind of like fucky and you're not really, you know, seeing what is real anymore. So that's, it's just that's funny true. to see the CAA basically replicate that or say the same thing. What I think is that in physics, everything has to have its counterpoint. You see this across mm -hmm. the universe where matter is antimatter. Um, we have the night and the day on earth. Humans replicate through man and woman. Um, war and peace. Du duality exists everywhere. And for something to exist, you have to have its opposite. Like life couldn't exist without death. And one of the things that I've gotten from ancient sources, but also um, the CIA stuff, is that the law of the spirit world is that anything you think is possible, it's limitless and it exists out of time. And mm -hmm. The nature of our reality is that everything's incredibly finite, where our every part of our lives is based off finiteness. We try to escape it. And so I think that kind of for the our world to exist, you need its opposite. 
And that's kind of what the spirit world is, where it's real, but it's not real at the same time, where it, like you could see a horrible demon and that means nothing to you and the rest of your life is fine, um, where it's balanced between where the, the realness of our world kind of needs its opposite. And I, I don't know if I'm making sense here. Yeah, no, like I, well, I don't know if I'd use the word real. I'd say like, you know, we have the, this world that we call real, it's physical yeah, and, and everything is very like static and solid. It require things require a lot of force to change yeah. or manipulate because everything's like heavy. And if there's some opposite to that, like a spirit world, everything would be kind of etherical and fluid and you know easy to move and that's why you could you know do whatever you want yeah so that's it's very fascinating um what, you want to go on to the super to, to the tweet you got I have, yeah um, i have a bunch look um we've well, kind I was of gonna ask on... him about the free time question if you want well okay i just before we move on i just like i'm totally down with this whole like we need to try out ideas that are probably wrong. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. I'm constantly doing that. People are like, it takes, you gotta have some willpower to do this. Cause people will get really pissed off as soon as you start testing out new ideas. Um, so props to you for doing it. I Thanks. love doing it on the show. I'm constantly trying to find new ideas. Um, one new idea that I encountered recently, and it's funny because it's like Tim Pool's always talking about civil war. And I always like kind of threw that away. <laughs> I'm like, okay, he's just like insane. <laughs> But then I read the the fourth turning is here and and the um, Peter Turchin book like back to yeah. back and there's so much overlap. Uh, Cleo dynamics is this science of history. I'm going oh I never encountered any of this stuff before. So now all of a sudden I'm listening to Tim Pool and all the stuff he's saying. You know, it seems kind of plausible here. I mean, so I don't know where else we can go because. In the modern America, we don't really think things can get as bad as they can. But if you read enough history, you realize yeah, exactly. that all the time. <laughs> and I look at our politics where I like we can't agree on anything. Our, we're so silly. And, and there's entrenched interests everywhere where, I mean, people talk about how you buy a house, you have to get your interior decoration approved by the local zoning board. You have to get your, your back fly screen approved by the local zoning board. And it feels like things are so tense. And I don't know if it'll be a civil war. Because, and the reason I say that, I, I I bet good money that we'll have political violence in the next couple of years. Um, I don't know if it'll be a civil war, but I think the right would just win. Um, mm -hmm. And because when it comes to military power, the right has the army or most of the army, the police, young men as a general demographic and aggressive young men, especially, um, it has control of resources, a centralized location. Um, and I could be wrong here. It could be because I always say on my show, I'm betting against God. And there's a billion ways to infinity ways to be wrong and only about a handful to be right. True. Um, yeah. And so I could be miscalculating where enough of the military tilts left that we would have a civil war. But my best guess is the right kills the left. And then we kind of fracture into warlords and conflict between the right because the right doesn't have enough internal unity and um and and also due to the breakdown of law and authority which is something i'm working on a video right now where for example almost no cities in america have budgets so something bad happens every major city in america can't pay for police officers or social workers and what happens once you've, like the Andrew Tates of the world, have congregated armies of young men to follow their orders? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, well, it's I think kind in, of bleak. In terms of like the, who would win this, like a quote civil war, I think it would depend highly on the context of why it's happening. Because yeah. like, if, like, for example, you know, if, if Trump got Pence to throw out the electoral votes from those swing states and they just declared Trump, you know, president, and that kind of degraded into some kind of civil war situation. Like, I'm not sure the military, even if most people in it leaned right wing, I'm not sure that they would say, well, we're yeah. going to support this like very anti-demographic and anti-democratic, you know, thing that's just happened. You're exactly right. The one condition where I see the left winning is where they basically bait the right into doing something retarded. And then the right gets fried um, where and that's a really plausible scenario. Um mm -hmm. <laughs> and I mean, we're saying it i feel like yeah so. i mean you're looking at the next like i don't even know i think we have about a year and i'm 
until stuff gets bad, because I don't think either side will trust the results for this next election, right. unless one side wins by a landslide. Mm -hmm. And then even if like the polls now say Trump is leading by 10 points, even if that happens, I'm not sure the Democrats would accept that. And so, um, but also, I mean, you guys saw how we, we passed a budget for 45 days and it only barely passed. Yeah. And if the government shuts down, what happens next? Um, and I mean, what happens if Trump goes to jail? There's all these, it's, it's, it's like World War I, where there were about 10 places where World War I could have happened because all of the historic forces built up to it. And it just happened to be in Serbia. And mm -hmm. we're in the same place where we have all of these problems built up for a historic crisis. We just haven't seen where the match gets lit, where the f entire floor is covered in gunpowder. Yeah, it's yeah. hard because like, and I, I remember watching this and this kind of blackpilled me watching kind of the build up to Russia invading Crimea. And I'd watch like a lot of the Ukrainians uh, kind of interact with the Russians and all this stuff. And it seemed like everyone was kind of LARPing until they weren't. And I've kind yeah. of come to this like bad idea that people basically LARP themselves into war because it's hard to like, like right now I look around. I'm like, yeah, I see a lot of people are very divided. I see a lot of people very angry, but it's still hard for me to conceptualize how that turns into some kind of like factions fighting each other in the streets you yeah, know, over politics um, or something. One of the points Turchin makes is that we don't have like revolution organizations. Um, but my, what I, what I'd say is that the internet allows that very easily mm -hmm. where I don't think people have really realized the potential that the internet has for group organization or for strategy where you could like, you could, you could launch a revolution out of a subreddit if you wanted. I mean, that might be a bit far because you get banned, but, um, but, um, and also you only need a single match to go off and then people start organizing and I, it, yeah, I agree. It's LARPing until it isn't. And think of COVID where people were saying, People in that field were saying that we were due for a pandemic for decades and then COVID hit. And I remember I was in I was in Peru when COVID hit and I had a friend from China who called me up and he said, this stuff's really bad. You need to get back to America now. And mm -hmm. then I got out of Peru on the last flight that they had to America. Wow. No, it was the last flight. And I got there on the last call. But things like this shit can go down really fast if if all the variables are lined up. And I mean, January of 2020, we had no idea what was going on. And in March, our entire lives had changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I still, I, it's still just hard for me to to think about like, I mean, I, I can, I can see a world where, you know, Antifa or leftist groups and Proud Boy like groups are like basically fighting each other, but it's still yeah. just, it's too difficult for me. My brain, my imagination is too limited they kind of conceptualize like, you know, the Congress is like doesn't exist or like the Republicans yeah. and Democrats are in the streets like shooting at each other. Like even if Trump yeah. gets arrested, I still I can't really see that unless unless something really insane happens regarding the election. They like, have first, I agree with that. They have firsthand accounts of like the Civil War and stuff and people during mm -hmm. the Civil War didn't see it coming. Yeah. So I mean, like yeah, but if, there's a big difference. Like, so in the Civil War, it's like there's literally just this fear of your entire life in the South is going to be changed by getting rid of slavery. Like this entire, like there's like this instant. There's a very specific, very physical, very tangible thing that's happening. Where with this, it's kind of etherical. Like, what exactly? You know, it's people like debating over politics. Like, obviously, material conditions are making everyone crazy. But there's not like a specific a specific material condition everyone's like really focused on is the, the central point here. They incarcerate Trump. Yeah, but that's I don't think that's enough. You don't think that's enough to no. really incarcerate Trump? Election doesn't work out. I mean, for all of the secular crises or most of them, what the thing that spurs it is a budget problem. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how the French Revolution started, where ironically, the, the French government doing the American Revolution was one of the biggest things that caused the French Revolution because they couldn't afford to support the American colonies, um, where the French government just couldn't pay its bills and they convened the Congress together. Um, and then the, the Congress said, 
unless you don't turn France into a democracy, we're not going to let you raise taxes. And then that's what caused the French Revolution. And that's pretty common. And so if I had to bet on anything, it would be that the next time we try to pass a budget, Mm -hmm. um, it just doesn't work. And that sounds kind of nerdy, but like, I mean, it's, it's like, imagine you're married and you hate your partner and you have get into an argument over money. The number one cause for divorces is money problems. Um, and that's my best bet. And I mean, we've barely passed it the last couple of times where, um, and each time it's passed with the Republicans making concessions, but past a certain point, um, you end up in a situation where the the leaders are incentivized to launch a civil war because by launching a civil war, they get to stay in power. And if they make concessions, someone they'll get, they won't get reelected. I mean, I I just, I can always think of a dozen things like what if, what if the election is contested and Putin invades a NATO country during the contested election? What if what if yeah. Pluto invades a NATO country during a January Pluto. another January six? Like there's a million things that I can think of that could happen to really take the wheels off of this yeah. thing. It's like I, I it's interesting where a couple of years ago I would have unanimously supported if China invaded Taiwan, I would have supported America going to war with China. And I don't support that anymore because I think if we had a war with China now, it would break the U.S. Do you, do you think, Putin, look, Putin and China are talking to one another. What, yeah, if China, what if China takes Taiwan at the same exact time Putin invades Poland? One of my uh, friends, Philippe Fabry, he kind of does the same stuff I do, where he uses the cycles of history to predict the future, and he's based out of France. And that's what he predicts, that Putin will go after the Baltics afterwards. I personally think Putin would be insane to do that because the Russian military's performance in Ukraine, like they wouldn't survive an invasion of a NATO. Look, he doesn't have to be insane. He just has to have nothing to lose, which I think you can make an argument that he has nothing to lose. He has to have something to gain. Peter Zihan says is, and I I, I just finished, um, I have a video in the works for why I think Russia will have a revolution in the next couple of years. And I mean, past a certain point, I don't know. Chaos. Mm -hmm. I'm betting against God. It could happen. I can't say. Um, but Putin if, right now is praying for a contested election. You know he is because yeah. he's hanging on by the skin of his teeth in Ukraine, and he knows if um, if America and Europe stop sending them weapons, it's over. I also think that as a young man in Russia, I don't know why I'd be fighting um, because I'd imagine they have the same economic and dating and whatever problems we have in America. And um, if you're just going to be cannon fodder in a useless war, why don't you mutiny? And right. um, yeah, I think the Chinese and the Russians could go for that. Um, and if we had to wage a war, it's like extra couple problem where you have a couple that's already worried about money and they fight over how they spend it. And then their mother has an enormous medical bill and um the husband hates his wife's mother anyway and so he's not going to give away his money for that and then they divorce it's kind of a similar situation yeah Mm -hmm. do you think though it's like is it the budget that's the problem or is it people in terms of how the economy is doing like if we had another if we had like a 2008 housing crash now like again you know they're all worried about the commercial housing market and stuff like that like maybe that would cause the problem because with the budget stuff i mean yeah. i'm assuming with with france at the time they were not on fiat currency so i feel like now the government can just basically print itself out the, of any problem it's a stock market crash so you can't really print yourself that's why i'm saying yeah yeah, it, yeah, yeah exactly. i mean it's it, i think all of the above is going to happen because we're at a place where I think we have to have a stock market crash or some kind of equalization of the stock market. I actually think it's a decently likely scenario that like rightist rebels just wipe out the major coastal corporations. I think if if you have a rightist revolution, there's a solid chance they just wipe out Hollywood and Silicon Valley and uh, they might leave Wall Street. Um, when you but, say wipe out, are you talking about economically or like with force? Like yeah, let's force? hope it's economically. I live here. <laughs> <laughs> with force um mm-hmm. you think like people are gonna like march into apple and stuff like what do you, what do you mean why not i mean okay. they don't those companies anyway right um 
<laughs> and I, I mean, with these historical cycles, you have to see inequality decline, and that can either be violent or peaceful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry if that's a black pill, but <laughs> but um, you yeah, know if- that's that's Turchin's Turchin's thesis: the overproduction yeah. of the elites. The only way that you can deal with it is you make the elites not so elite anymore. And there's two ways historically that we usually do that. It's with guillotines or financial crashes, right? Yeah, yeah, and. I mean, what we've seen recently is the labor shortage. And I do wonder how much of our stuff with immigration, complete open borders, is due to the labor shortage, where upper class left leaning Americans want there to be an infinite sponge of immigrants because of the labor shortage. And um, the thing is, once you have a labor shortage, you can't have a giant stock market because the stock market is driven by the upper class. And um, you would need to see an equalization. And I've been really shocked that we haven't had a stock market crash so far. And what we've basically just seen is poverty among everyone else. But because the upper classes are largely doing fine, the stock market continues to function. Um, But I mean, it's what we would see with inflation to prop up the rest of the economy is that basically the attacks of the lower classes because the lower classes are the ones that get hit the hardest by inflation because they're the ones where if the price of pork goes up 20 percent it really hurts them or if the price of housing and the reason the price of housing has gone up so fast is because of inflation because if you have an inflating currency the housing market is a stable real asset and the government can't push that button for much longer until everything falls apart. Yeah. Sitch, where do you want to go? So I I don't know if you saw um, do you know the YouTube channel History Civilis? I've watched like one or two of his videos. Yeah, he does like a lot of Roman he did he used to do or he does primarily like a lot of videos about Roman history and stuff. And yeah. I recently had a video that I didn't really like, um, that I seen kind of echo this idea that you know, we've basically are like that humans today under capitalism are working longer hours and harder and for less, you know, material uh, benefit than both a hunter gatherer cave people and also like feudal serfs. How do you this feel is, about these ideas? Yeah. This is one of those things where it's a sampling bias where um, people, the hardness of people's lives is dependent upon very specific conditions to that era of history. And so people ask me what was life like in the Middle Ages? And I say, it's a thousand years. You got to get more specific. But when people talk about serfs working less than today, they're talking around 1200, which was the equivalent of the 1950s, where quality of life goes through these cycles that are around like 200 years long. And so there were parts of the Middle Ages where people worked not a lot of hours and they were pretty well off. And there were parts of the Roman Empire, but also right before the Black Death when Europe was really overpopulated and when inequality was super high, people were working multiple jobs and they still couldn't feed themselves. Or there were points in the 1600s where people literally were working themselves to death because the calories they got from working didn't match up to the calories that they could get from they expended more calories than they could buy. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's not really a fair comparison because these things fluctuate really quickly. And I think your average American works like 12 hours a day, six days a week now, or maybe that's too high for average, but um, that's what I've seen from a lot of people. Um, and that's that's a really hard work schedule. Um, but even back in the 1950s, people would work eight hours a day, but also you'd have really long lunches and people would grab drinks in the, in like back in the day, people would drink in the afternoons during work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's just unimaginable now. Right. What, I read so, a book on prohibition and they, I mean, I was amazed at how much people used to drink. I mean, they drink all day long at work. <laughs> it was like yeah. kind of crazy. Yeah. I mean, I wonder how much of that was women entering the workforce because uh, <laughs> like, my entire staff is male and we drink during meetings and it's not a problem. <laughs> nice. That's hilarious. Well, I mean, isn't there's a whole idea that like like uh, switching from alcohol to coffee and tea like made the enlightenment happen and all yeah. that stuff. But um, okay, so so this kind of idea that people are better off under serfdom, 
it sounds like you're saying like, well, yeah, there were specific time periods that it was yeah. maybe I better, mean, but overall, yeah. no. <laughs> like, One of my pet peeves is people kind of use capitalism as a proxy for the human condition. Right. Well, because the irony is that your economic system doesn't matter that much compared to the supply of labor and productivity. And so even in like incredibly economically repressive systems, if there's not under Russian serfdom in the 1600s, when it was a really underpopulated country, it wasn't that bad to be a serf. But under like under like modern capitalism, which is the most advanced economic condition, if you have bad labor and productivity, you'll live a pretty shitty life. And so and and um and so what do you, were, what do you mean by it wasn't like what is the comparison that you're making i guess um there are the biggest thing that matters for quality of life is um how many people are competing for your job and what mm-hmm. your productivity as a person is so we've increased productivity by 70% since the 1970s but we've also increased the labor pool 40% more than our productivity would allow. Mm. And we've done that through a combination of women entering the workforce, immigration, globalization, automation, and a bunch of other things, and population growth too. And so this is one of my pet peeves that I don't realize when no one else puts together. People complain that people are struggling economically and working longer hours, and then they don't fit. And then they'll also say in the next breath, we need to take more immigration. We need to globalize our economy. And I'm thinking you don't realize that these are two sides of the same coin. And so there were points. And so there were points where serfdom, you had an easier chance to live a better life, but every economic system goes through a phase where life is really shitty for the average person. Right. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's a, that's a good point that, well, it's weird because I mean, I don't know enough. I don't know enough about it because I've always heard from various uh, economic people that, essentially the economic policies put forward by the government from like the 40s through the late 70s were very heavily focused on pro labor yeah and then after that reagan comes in and basically demolishes that and brings in kind of like neoliberal economic policies so is is it like the policies that were really changing it or is it just that the labor pool opened up so much because of globalization it's it's hard to say it's a chicken and egg thing where Mm -hmm. um and what you're saying is true, where post-war, post-war period, people were very pro-labor because everyone in the back of their head knew that they had to fight at D-Day or Iwo Jima. And one of the biggest things that Walter Scheidel wrote a book about this, one of the biggest things that collapses inequality is war because we taxed the rich a tremendous amount during the world wars because there was this shared national mission. And... um. What happened with Reagan was that we had kind of pushed that logic and the economy was in decline. And so we pushed towards more, less pro-labor positions, but that also coincided with um, the, we, we, we took an ideology that benefited um, globalization and the lowering of labor at the same time as we did it. And it's kind of a chicken egg where I don't know which mm. really came first. Right. Well, it seems like a lot of these big, it's annoying because it seems like the way these big changes occur in history and in countries is that there's all these forces that are continually trying to pull a country or an ideology yeah. or philosophy in a direction always. And that's just the right circumstances kind of happen at one time that allows it to go down that trackway. I mean, one of my pet peeves is people think countries are designed by their greatest geniuses. Well, the reality is they kind of just happen. Right. <laughs> you over so your true. Life, and one of my friends likes to say, predict what you'll do in the next week and then see how much you actually follow that. And people almost never do what they plan over the next week because we're not, we, we're not controlled by the forces that we think we're not rational beings. We're just controlled by a bunch of different irrational desires inside of us that take turns doing different stuff. And um, you look back over history and it's, it's, and it's, it's those irrational desires are the ones that are calling the shots and the policymakers we pick just reflect whatever the public's will is. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about 
FDR. He's a very contentious president, depending on who you ask. He's either loved or hated. I actually, I like him a lot. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. Uh -oh. Um, I think what he did was, I think the economics of the New Deal were wrong. I don't think mm -hmm. he understood economics. Um, I liked that he brought us through a really hard period of our existence, the Great Depression and World War II. And then that's not something I'd want to take for granted. And I don't throw away good leaders when I see them because history is mostly bad leaders. Um, and I think a lot of what he did was basically just psychological reassurance for the country. Um, and that was what we needed. Um, but I think we could have had a lot worse than FDR. Mm -hmm. If if you buy into generational theory, well, let's say if generational theory is correct, because obviously, <laughs> obviously we're going to see how it plays out here over the next 10 years or so. But if those guys are right, the next president of the United States will be a Lincoln or a FDR. Yeah. And it, or, or George a Washington. Well, it's, it's hard. I, maybe a, a Hitler. I, I mean, I guess it could be the, um, because Hitler was on the German side of the FDR equation. So, I mean, if yeah, it's. Stalin was too. Yeah. So I'm just, it's, I guess it's, I, since you sit, <laughs> since you said that. <laughs> Like, I, I don't, look, we're, I can't imagine Biden being the next FDR. No, <laughs> like, no I'm from the same town as Biden. Uh, we both lived in the town of Centerville, Delaware, mm -hmm. um, which is right in the Pennsylvania border. And the town of Centerville has a um, a diner and a thrift shop, and that's it. It's out in rural Delaware. And, and Biden lived in a state of an hour outside, uh, a mile outside town. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it just, it, it makes me think this election, like this, if generational theory guys are correct this election is a lot higher stakes than most people are even aware I mean, of i don't see any of the candidates being that i personally i try to never talk about candidates on my on my show you uh, don't so think I'm kamala either. harris is going to be the next fdr <laughs> i think she is i mean her, her just raw <laughs> charisma <laughs> And ability to understand the struggles of I mean, Americans. Look, Show Trump has already Trump has already said that he's the next best president to Lincoln. I mean, he's already out there staking <laughs> his flag, right? Yeah, I mean, one of the things with Trump is just I'm 22. I'm tired of silent generation people running the country. Yeah, mm -hmm. because both if we're going to have another Biden versus Trump, that's two people who were basically born during World War II, and I mean, you must have seen the clips with Mitch McConnell or... Um, oh, yes. Yeah. I'm lady. worried we're going to see that with Biden. Nancy Pelosi as well. Um, and the great... I so we've had two Pennsylvanian presidents in our history, Buchanan and Biden. And the reason for that as a Pennsylvanian is we are the most... We are the state that has the most cultural similarity with other parts of the country. That if you if your society is falling apart and you want a candidate to pe appease as many groups as possible, you pick a Pennsylvanian. Because okay. we're close to the South, we're kind of the Midwest, we're kind of the Northeast. Um, and that's why Biden's in power, because Biden can appease different groups inside the Democratic Party. And um, the oh, I can't believe he'd run again, because I don't think he could play a game of guess who. I don't think he could play a game of chess and not pass out, let alone a game of international politics as a society is falling apart. But also you look at the Democrats and I don't see them putting up any similar, any leaders that could replace him. And another Trump versus Biden, it's like you read other periods of history where a nine-year-old child is on the throne and a bunch of corrupt eunuchs and like mistresses manage the government. That's what it feels like now. <laughs> That's exactly what it feels like. Yeah, I, I was, I'm just, I was very shocked for a long time. I didn't think Biden was going to run again. I was like, no, no, no. He'll, I mean, maybe I'm curious if he's only running because Trump is running, which is yeah. possible. You know, people are making noise now that they think Gavin Newsom is going to be the secret replacement. And that's why he wants to debate DeSantis, yeah. which I mean, that could happen, but I just feel like that's also kind of stupid from the Democrats perspective because of like crime. Like right now, like I, I think the what's his target demographic? 
Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I think the Republicans kind of screwed themselves with the abortion stuff in terms of electability. But now the Democrats have basically taken the advantage of throwing the trash can with crime and immigration. And yeah. Gavin Newsom is going to be like the easy focal point to point to and be like, look how bad crime and immigration is. You know, in Gavin Newsom is, yeah. especially in California, yeah, like like Gavin Newsom is like the head of that. So I don't see how he's going to like, you know, defeat Trump or, also, or whomever. This is kind of a strange point, but I think Gavin Newsom as an attractive white male would hurt his position in the Democratic Party today mm, because yeah. – he is the opinion. He, I'm, I'm, he also, I think he's from an upper class background because the Democrats at this point are so woke that they would really struggle to have an attractive upper class white male as their candidate. And mm-hmm. Biden is so old that you kind of like can't look up to him. Um, and, <laughs> and, and so, because remember where they, the reason they put Kamala in power was because she was a, a black woman. And that was four years ago when our society was still more sane. And um, it's it's like, I mean, hot take. And this isn't my speciality. I'm su- it wouldn't surprise me if Michelle Obama takes the lead. Um, but also <laughs> she's polling really low right now. You think she's actually going to run? Didn't, didn't she say she wanted to run? Did she? I know people are making a bunch of noise. I about see it. her in polls, and I'm like, "What? What is this? <laughs> Why is Michelle candidate. Obama in this poll?" Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a year is a long time. It is, okay? yeah. And I mean, we could. I mean, hell, like we could have a famine in the third world. We could have a war with China. Um, like <laughs> a lot of things can happen in a year. Mm-hmm. It is kind of baffling, and I guess that does speak a lot to wokeness. That people are like urging Michelle Obama to run when it's like, well, I'm, what are her qualifications? I mean, she was she's very the, likable. I she, mean, yeah, I she's likable. She seems like a nice person. Uh, she's a lawyer, right? What and qualifications do we even pick for president anymore? Char- like, charisma. I guess. I mean, you could say the same thing at Trump, I guess, or, you know, Biden's He's dying, funny. So. <laughs> yeah, Michelle's not funny. Like, yeah. I don't know. Do you think, um, because do you think wokeness is getting worse or better? Because I feel like people are starting to get fed up with wokeness. Well, and I, and, and how do you define wokeness first? That's a good uh, for the for the class. I, right. I define wokeness as um, an ideology based upon a worldview stemming from oppression, with a focus on um, sex and sex and uh, race. Mm-hmm. Where it's 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 philosophically structured the exact same as communism, and it also comes from a postmodernist background. And right. to shorten that, it's basically communism without a concept of truth, which shifted out the working classes for um, s- the sexual identities and race. I agree. <laughs> I um, concur. Yeah, someone in and, someone in our audience. Uh, they titled it intersectional Marxism, which I think is a good. Way yeah, I mean, it's, it's philosophically the exact same structure as Marxism. Um, and what I'd say with wokeness is that it's reached its peak audience where the, things often go on curves, where empires normally reach their largest geographic extent after they've already started to go into decline. Companies normally reach their largest uh, market share when the factors that already caused their decline have started to appear. Mm -hmm. And so for wokeness, I think we've started to see the factors that are going to kill wokeness already going on. And I don't think wokeness is converting anyone new. What is, what are those factors? um, That wokeness just is retarded. It doesn't make, it is, (laughs) I say this as a person who studied every major philosophy and religion. Wokeness is one of the worst designed of all time. I cannot <laughs> believe that it's real. It's just like, we, it's, and also we, we built this worst ideology when we had the most information ever. Mm-hmm. Um, just wokeness is horribly designed because it actively- So, so it's, it's designed badly to produce truth or to produce political power? Because I feel like it's, yes. it's designed well to that's, produce political power. It's designed, I don't think it's designed well to produce truth. And that's kind of it's the It's designed problem. to shame a self, successful, wealthy society with Christian values. I can only exist in a wealthy society from Christian origin because it's built upon a bunch of 
if we were in the Middle East or China, the societies that don't care about love, that don't have like love and accepting the meek as their dominant virtues, they just mm -hmm. laugh at woke people. Sure. Um, and or uh, and if they don't have the prohibition on racism that we have, obviously, because yeah. that's a giant component. <laughs> Most people. If the Nazis won World War II and you in like race study was still a, a, like an academic discipline, we would never have had wokeness. Um, right. Mm -hmm. But wokeness is horribly designed um, because it shits on its own followers as terrible people. Um, it <laughs> shits on the majority population as terrible people. Uh, it has no mechanization for organization. Standards are bad. And so you can't, if you don't have standards, you can't organize people. Um, it thinks reproduction is terrible. It thinks using force is terrible. Um, it doesn't have a concept of, it, it, yeah, it's just, wokeness is incapable of doing anything as an ideology. And whenever you look at woke organizations, they immediately fail. Um mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um i it, it kind of weirds me out because i look at disney or other woke organizations and i think how do these people survive another two years because disney blew itself up in like two or three years from wokeness and that's true of most woke organizations how do the universities survive another couple of years and it it trips me up that I think about eight to 10% of the population are actually woke where it's 50, 50 right, left. And then most people on the left are kind of normies who don't accept who just want to help people and um, who are sympathetic people or they're, they're sympathetic towards others. And then woke people are like eight to 10% of the population. And they basically lead the leftist normies behind them. Um, Aren't and, all the woke people, like if you look at Turchin's elite aspirant musical chairs game, it seems like the wokeness is a excellent weapon to use in that elite aspirant game. So it seems it, like the 8% right. are these elite aspirants that yeah. are just using wokeness to eviscerate one another. Yeah, I have a lot of relatives that are like super hard left and they're all people who got good college degrees and then that didn't lead them anywhere. Right. And you're seeing with the organizations where they're seizing control and then controlling hiring so their people get elected. In a lot of cases, because that's people who don't have what we did is we over indexed on credentialism or getting degrees as a way to signify um uh, high social like competency. But the degrees don't actually do that, where one of the things I found is for hiring people, I've interviewed a couple of people from Harvard. They're not good employees because they're too stressed, anxious. They can't adapt to the real world. They're not good team players. And in almost all cases, they're from upper class families that built their entire lives about that. Mm -hmm. And so we over indexed on credentialism and um and then that wasn't actually useful. And so wokeness is a way of, um, it's a way of bringing credentialism to override merit because wokeness doesn't have a, and this is something that gets from communism. The left doesn't have a philosophic concept of competency or merit built into any part of their worldview. Right. True. Well, and also, I mean, cause I agree with you that I think wokeness is not able to replicate power in the long term because as you kind of what you were saying is you know if you're going to attack if you're going to try to use guilt as your primary weapon to attack the majority of people in the country you know who are white and and also that are male it's like you're basically who very few people can use wokeness at the end of the day to keep gaining more and more power because if you're white and yeah. male you're kind of setting up the seeds of your own destruction Exactly. So, yeah, I don't think that's going to just, I don't think that's going to propagate long term. There's no way to win as well. And this is like, um, what's his name again? The, the, the Scottish guy, the critical drinker. Um, I was listening to one of his podcasts and he said, it's this strange worldview that tells you that you're a horrible person no matter what you do. And then you're <laughs> expected to accept it. And it, it shocked me. No one realized this cognitive bug until pretty late. Because it was obvious to me ever since I started seeing wokeness. And it's one of my friends likes to say that the left is incapable of thinking over time. Um, and that's really true, where the left predicts emotional reactions, but not real world reactions, where um, 
like the left's lack of strategy shocks me because I grew up playing strategy games. I was addicted to StarCraft Company of Heroes, what civilization when I was in middle school. (laughs) And so my brain works that way. And so I'm automatically thinking, what is the next movie of the other side plays? And the left doesn't do that at all. They're not thinking the incentives they set up with their coalitions and their worldview is entirely based off logic. I'm not sorry, emotion. And so the left is good at predicting the emotional states they will entice among their coalition. They're basically just trying to piss off the right as much as possible. But there's no thought about what happens. How do they keep power? How do they keep their people inside their coalition from working with them? How do they keep the other side from killing them? Um, and I just find it astounding, if I'm honest. Mm-hmm. They do have the one strategy that I find interesting where they they latched on to like George Lakoff and and framing for a while. And they were like, look, we can win Republicans over if we just use the right magical words and talk to them yeah. in, in words that they accept as as valuable, which That's I thought, really woke, I mean, though. That's like the left. Like the, the left is the, the best, but it is it is a, it is like a strategy that you sure. can yeah. see in there. Even though it's like I don't think it's a good strategy. I think it's completely <laughs> yeah. like <laughs> misplaced. But yeah, exactly. But I do see a kind like a a butt of a strategy there. So yeah, the left is incredibly good at language. Um, one of my friends is this is his area of study, uh, and he's done a lot of incredible work here and he calls it gsr or gossiping shaming and rallying and it's basically the feminine form of aggression where if girls it's something women largely use as a way to gain social authority and it's 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 the political version of mean girls um and the left is able to do it because our society lacks a shared moral compass to basically denounce things that we believe are bad and so the left has made a game of saying that everything is bad and they have a better alternative but society never asks them what their better alternative is and that's like i remember when i was in in high school we had um we had uh people running for class president and people were promising all this stuff like i'm gonna make an ice cream machine we'll get more vacation days <laughs> and all of that was impossible but the promise was still nice and so the left's use of language is something that's unparalleled anywhere else in the political spectrum mm-hmm. well it's interesting because like so in a video you made uh like a like i think it's like your last no, it was your previous couple of videos you had like the chart you we were like the left and you had the 10 things that make up the left and 10 things that make up the right. And I, and I broadly agree with um, everything that you said. And the number one thing at the top was the left believes all humans are perfectible and the right believes that humans are inherently flawed. And I've always also kind of conceptualized it that way. And that's kind of why, you know, the right tends to look at society and culture as a civilizing uh, factor yeah. on humans that are born, you know, sinful or evil. And the left kind of looks at society and culture as a corrupting influence that kind of destroys some perfect yeah. human nature. And yet it's weird because like with wokeness, it like, and like as for socialism overall, like the left has kind of replicated the right. Everyone is sinful. They're just putting like the, what creates the sin in a different area, but it's still this like no win situation. Yeah. They have no concept of truth. So this is something I run into with people who aren't on the left is they expect it to make sense. And I just thrown that out the window. I don't <laughs> expect anything the left makes sense to. I don't expect anything the left says to make sense. And, yeah, no, like I, I know it doesn't make sense, but it's, just, it's interesting to see it replicated again. Like it's kind of like with CRT, I mean, you know, they very clearly say like, oh, we're not biological essentialists, but then they just become cultural essentialists. I mean, it's also that... Um, they're all, they also are biological essentialists. Like if you're mm-hmm. the whole thing of if you're white, you can't transfer to being black. Um, like your your race and your caste determines your position in the left. And I also think that it because the left is incapable of acknowledging any the left today doesn't believe in reality. And that I sound like it sounds like I'm making that up, but I've literally I took a course in gender studies. I've read a lot of critical theory texts. They don't think they think you can make reality whatever you want. Yeah. And once you do that, you start to have all these very negative things seep in because you don't have boundaries. And so in your attempt to build a perfect world, you end up with a really bad one because you're not dealing with the world as it exists. And like I like to say that 
communists promise a utopia, and then the actual reality is that they enslave the working classes. Because if you look at Stalinist Russia, it's just mass slavery, where they feed you enough to survive, and that's it, and the state takes the rest. And for feminism, the end result is that we have the worst female mental health in history, and <laughs> people don't have kids, and right. women have lost relationships that were important to them. Um, and what was your question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, it's just it was interesting to see this original sin basically replicated by the yeah. left. Um, it, it's I almost mean, it's funny the way you're describing. It, it's almost like the left is treating the physical world like the spiritual, the spirit world, and that's what's leading them down this path. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Well, another another interesting point about this is the difference between why wokeness is such a horrible ideology and why Christianity is a better ideology. Because Christian, look, I'm an atheist, so I don't necessarily buy into the yeah. Christian philosophy, but I, I can see that the narrative motivates a lot of people, and it seems like it gets the human psychology right, that you know yeah. humans are flawed, and that we need uh, examples in our life to strive for to be better. And the left is more like, you know, whatever inner feeling that you have is perfect, just exactly the way it is, and you just need to like yeah. change society to accept that. And I just, like, one philosophy seems to work at a practical level in the real world, and one I don't think works over time at all. I um, just made a 50 minute video that I'll hopefully release tomorrow about Christianity's impact on history. And um, what I'd say is that religions that are successful long-term acknowledge that the world is hard. And then from that, they offer an optimistic vision. Yes. Religions that fail offer panaceas that with no effort. Um, and so with Hinduism, Judaism, Confucianism, Buddhism, Christianity, every religion ever that's successful, they acknowledge that life is hard, that we make mistakes, that we're not fully in control of ourselves. And then from that, they um, they offer, um, if you take, basically explaining it to an atheist, if you take these standards inside of yourself, you will gradually become more like the standards. And um, the thing with the left, and this is also true of Nazism and Gnosticism and other flash in the pan ideologies that only that don't last more than a century, is that they offer, um, if you just agree with us, we will give you heaven on earth. And then what ends up happening is that doesn't occur. And because there is no feedback loop for self-reflection. People externalize that to the rest of the world. And I actually feel sorry for young women today because um, they have the worst mental health in history. And among Gen Z girls, they're really fried by the mental health and social problems we have today. And the thing is that the cruel thing is that feminism doesn't offer them any real solutions. It tells them that they're perfect and to blame everything on men, or it tells them that they're perfect and, but because they're perfect, they psychologically have to blame things on men because that's the only mechanism that exists if you're perfect. But that's in reality a really cruel thing to do because you're not actually offering someone any advice mm -hmm. or yeah, acknowledging what their lives are really yeah. like. It's yeah. kind of the psychological equivalent of domesticating wild animals. <laughs> then they're not able to, to to exist anyway in the world. They're just functionally I mean, inept. I mean, if we're being real, the left exists to benefit the managerial ben, benefit the managerial class, and the because people with college degrees end up being managers. And if you're part of the managerial class, you want people to be as um, docile, as domesticated, docile, yeah. domesticated as um, uh, hedonistic as possible. Because that way they're not going to ask too many questions. And like the quest, the thing that I would lead back to is why are the biggest corporations in the world supporting um, hedonism and also um, a group that tells them that capitalism and their society is terrible? Well, those things seem contradictory to me. I understand why they would support hedonism because there is kind of a hedonistic yeah. element to capitalism that makes it work. I mean, capitalism runs on sales. With and the um, with with the with the suicidal elements of the left of saying our societies and capitalism is terrible. The reason the big corporations have teamed up with them, in my opinion, is because they both the left and these large corporations 
their end goal is to give the authorities more power. And this is something that people on the left aren't really, they never think about. But I was, I remember I was debating Vouch and I asked him, what are your first policies? And he said, um, raise taxes. And I said, you're, and I thought you're an anarchist. How is taxes <laughs> your first policy? If you ask people on the left, they want to have the stateless utopia. But the biggest thing before that is we need to give the authorities more power. And so by and by the, by the time you get to be a mega corporation, I mean, a joke I've heard is that when you start out with your company, you're libertarian. By the time you're a billionaire, you're a communist because you are the government. And so um, by pushing the left, they end up giving the authorities more power. And the biggest companies are the authorities. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think because like, you know, when you were talking about earlier about how, you know, most people on the left, they just kind of want to help people. And then there's this is 8% yeah. of you know, people that are woke that are kind of taking advantage of that. They also want to help people, but they've pushed it so far that it's morphed into something evil. Right, right. And I, you know, I look, I listen to a lot of boomers who talk about this stuff who are, you know, they're not very involved in internet politics yeah. and they kind of just perceive wokeness and a lot of the stuff as like the continuation of the civil rights movement. They don't really yeah. understand that it's not that that is like the, the far leftist movement of civil rights. It's not like the MLK liberal movement. And I'm I don't know if the corporations that are kind of replicating wokeness, I'm assuming that they don't realize like the Marxist undertones to what they're doing. They're in the boomer camp. Is what yeah. you're saying. I think it's a combination. Um, and like I can't stand boomers with this stuff. And because I was watching <laughs> Fast Times at Ridgemont High last night, and mm -hmm. those that don't know, it's a high school movie set in the 80s. And the thing is, Joe Biden was 40 years old when that came out. And God, for wow. me, as a 22-year-old, yeah. the society of the 1980s was unrecognizable. People, one of the things that shocks me is no one in Gen Z has social skills. Uh, it's funny where <laughs> I was so a true. nerd. I, I saw, I, I'm a nerd, but I'll run into people that are like chads or attractive girls or anything. Mm -hmm. and they'll have worse social skills than a lot of nerds I know. Because just there is no there is no shared culture. And so like Gen Z has no social skills. Um, no one will be talking to each other at the mall. It's like taboo to pick up girls. Like if a girl's your waitress, it's taboo to like try to hit on her. Um, none of these people in high school, like when I went to high school, no one was messing around or like goofing off or. Really? Yeah. Like if you go to Gen Z in high school, it's mostly you like. The, like you do get some crazy parties and like binge drinking is a big part of Gen Z culture, mm -hmm. but it's not like the thing with Gen Z partying is it exists almost as an opiate to cover up how depressing the, your, the rest of your life is. So people get completely wasted because they have poor social skills and they're just looking to cut loose. Um, mm -hmm. But also comparing the infrastructure 40 years ago it's the same like the house i live in was built in the 70s it's the same infrastructure it's just it looks really crappy now and it was crazy because i lived in la for a few months to see the stuff that looked filthy when i lived there was the exact same stuff at fast times at ridgemont high but it looked clean and i couldn't believe the city looked clean back then um but the thing with the boomers is like if you watch even older stuff like the twilight zone which came out in the 50s the buildings that look disgusting now were they looked in like they look absolutely beautiful. And I can't imagine growing up in the 50s and understanding modern America and the, the country I live in. And mm -hmm. um because if you grew up in the 50s, Jim Crow was the law of the land in a third of the country. And so for the boomers, I think it's just incredibly difficult for them to understand what life is like and i'm not going to cut them slack because their lack of empathy has been really their lack of empathy is really just not good it's not mm -hmm. okay um and i also think like george soros george soros has got to know what he's doing and the world that Klaus Schwab got to know what he's doing and so i think it's a combination of that and i think a lot of these elites realize that they're on very precarious ground they just don't understand through what method and so i think a lot of people on the left pick up that our society is not in a good place and then they blame it on they externalize that worry to climate change um and so all the their worries of their life 
have been externalized to climate change. And I, I think the elite has been scrambling and they they're trying to appease the left partially because there's a lot of left-wing sympathies, but also they see the left as the real dissidents that could wipe them out. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Like when I look at Schwab and Soros, I mean, Soros is so old now. I don't know what's going on with him, but with Schwab, I mean, it's, I just get the sense when I listen to them talking that a lot of these people think they they want to build Star Trek. They think that's the future they want. That's a, such towards. a good way of putting it. And they just don't understand. Like that's where their intuitions are kind of guiding them, but they have no clue how to get there. Because I mean, yeah. I think you know, I think you get the Star Trek through basically capitalism creating the material yeah. <laughs> conditions that allows it to occur. And they're kind of like, no, 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 no. Let's try to get the philosophy first, and then then we'll figure out the material conditions. And I'm like, no, nah, I don't think that's how that works. I also think that there's no comprehension among these like boomer elite types about how easily society can fall apart and also yeah. how far we are yes. because you're part of Gen Z. You already kind of live in, I, I don't want to sound dramatic. You already kind of live in a failed society where Gen Z doesn't, it's so politically split where one of my friends said, the only thing Gen Z shares is digital induced psychosis. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm from Philadelphia. It was crazy to look at the clips be because the areas in Philadelphia that were looted and there's shootings, I would jog there at midnight. I, I lived in downtown Philadelphia for five years and I never had crime problems. And I, 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 I don't think these people are aware. And also for like, um, my best friends from a working class background in the neighborhood he grew up in. Um, it's plurality white and almost everyone, they do, they do weed to just get through their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, the social community is completely broken down. Most, almost no people's parents are together or do not have some kind of drug problem. And I think just among like working class, normal people, normal society has broken down. And the chances that you get married and have family and that doesn't fall apart or we have a normal social community is just completely dead. I don't think there's any comprehension of that among the people running our society. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree completely. And it's, but it's hard, it's hard for me to conceptualize because I'm, you know, I'm older than you. I'm in my thirties and I was kind of like, you know, I went to school in the nineties and then the two thousands and we were kind of at like that cutoff range kind of between the eighties, you know, fast men, Richmond high, fast times hit Richmond high and like, you know, kind of what you're describing Fast now. Fast times at Ridgemont High. What are you talking Excuse about? Excuse me. Excuse <laughs> me. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, Xer. But um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of in that like cusp, like between like turning, turning away from that into, I guess, where we're now. And, you know, when I went to school, it was like, I remember cell phones, I think I was like in like middle school when like cell phones first started to become like a thing that like people could have. Oh, and it, there are these like these little crappy, you know, we, we had those like really terrible uh, Motorola flip phones for a while. And then finally they kind of transformed into those little Nokia like bricks. And I remember, it's so funny. I remember being in seventh grade and we had a substitute teacher and she was talking about how cool it is she could play snake on her phone. And that was like the height of technological yeah. achievement. And I'm sitting here as like, like someone who played Game Boy. I'm like, this is the lamest crap ever. And everyone was so enamored with playing snake. And it's like, like I can't even imagine now with kids with the smartphones and social media just being on that constantly 24-7, how that just completely changes their reality and how they interact with each other and how they don't have social skills now. What was a real black pill for me is when I dropped out of school, I was, this is part of the reason I dropped out of school. This is a, I apologize for the flex. I was invited to a social club for talented young people. So they basically <laughs> selected some of the most successful young people across different fields, whether uh, startups or um, uh, entertainment or uh, influencers. And I met a lot of these people. And so I'm meeting the most successful. And the sad thing is a lot of them didn't like lead good lives. They were like most, almost all of them had real mental health problems. Um, the most successful guys, very few of them were in relationships. Um, they didn't like trust the people around them. A lot more had money problems than you'd expect. And so I was, it was, there was this real black pill. Be and also like a lot of my friends back in the day were players and people you'd, this is going to sound cringe, you'd call players and chads. And it was depressing for me to watch because um, 
even these guys who were very good with women, they weren't satisfied at all because they weren't able to get into relationships that they found fulfilling. And you can only live the fuckboy lifestyle for a few years at most before you want to shoot yourself. Um, and it, it was a real black pill to look at the most successful Gen Z people and realize that they had all the same problems that I saw from my hometown or like working class friends I had. And I knew that this is I think a lot of people hold out this kind of myth that if they try really hard, they can live the perfect life. And like, like, I mean, I think, I don't think it's a coincidence that you see all these celebrities crash and burn in really horrific ways. Like, um, like, uh, Justin Bieber or Kanye or, um, or, uh, the various Disney stars or like Demi Lovato. And I just think our society is sick at its core. And I don't think anyone is really winning if you're under mm -hmm. the age of 30 or something. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that the maladies that afflict the youth, the average youth person, I would categorize as very different than what hits like very successful and famous people. Cause I tend to look at it like people's strengths are generally also their greatest weaknesses. So the yeah. people that are going to be, you know, the most motivated to get to these like top echelons are also going to have, you know, no life or they're going to be yeah. you know, driven to the point of basically killing themselves. What I found for both uh, Gen Z across all social classes, from the highest to the lowest, was loneliness. I think mm -hmm. loneliness and lack of any sense of purpose were the things that affected yeah. people of every yeah. social class. Is it just because of all the internet stuff that everyone doesn't interact in person anymore? I, I don't think it's just the internet. Do you know the Mouse Utopia experiments? Yeah. I think it's that too, where I think just our society is in social free fall and people are losing the ability to have interpersonal relationships. And I think that it's also, everyone feels economic instability where um, even if you're like a very wealthy CEO who made a successful company, you have to do another successful company after that. And that's a kamikaze strike. Um, and the payout will be less than you expected. And the thing is, if you're in a city like Los Angeles, even if you're making 100K, which is, um, that puts you in the top 10%, 5% of the population, it'll often be hard to make ends meet with 100K. And the, just the cost of living in major cities means that even if you're incredibly successful, it'll still be expensive to, so I, like, I don't think a lot of people who make 100K want they could afford to have a stay-at-home wife and kids, mm -hmm. which Homer Simpson back in the day could. Right. What's it's so weird because, like, you know, I hear everyone say this, and it seems to be true. Obviously, everyone feels it that there's these massive economic problems, massive housing problems. Yeah. And I keep seeing people post these charts that show that, like, the share of wealth and is for like um, millennials, and I guess Gen Z is usually not on the chart yet, but for millennials is basically on track with the boomers and Gen Xers and that the housing prices haven't really inflated that much beyond the inflation. Like what, is it all just like BS? Like yeah, what's I mean, happening? It's incredibly easy to massage numbers if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's, I, that's just the best thing to say. Uh, <laughs> okay. And I mean, growing up in Rust Belt, Pennsylvania, I knew we had problems long before Trump. And I completely understand why people voted for Trump right. because the Rust Belt is an area with a population larger than Germany that's bigger than almost any country in Europe geographically. And the Rust Belt got completely hosed by um, deindustrialization and no one cared until, it wasn't even a topic of discussion until Trump showed up. And Trump was kind of an awakening because beforehand you had this myth that liberalism would just build it, give it, bring us a utopia. And then we gradually realized that wasn't the case. And it's very easy to massage numbers by not looking at inflation, where one of my buddies runs statistical models for fun. And he found that we've actually entered a really harsh recession since COVID for most people. It's just we don't know how to – inflation means we can't, don't have to measure it. Because if you just look at inflation, the numbers are going up. But if you compare for cost of living, it's it's just horrible where um, the numbers are the worst in Canada. But I mean, rents have gone up some horrific amount over I, over the last um, two or three years. In Canada, they've they've more than doubled. Uh, and I think it's, it's a bit less than that in America. Mm -hmm. um, and the cost of chicken in Canada also went up like, uh, 50 percent or 100 percent and so the prices of basic commodities have been going through the roof 
Um, but people will pick what metrics they want. Where, for example, uh, GDP per capita has gone up a lot since the 1970s. And that doesn't account for price inflation, which has gone up a lot more, and especially price inflation for certain necessary things like health or housing. Like, um, if you just look at housing inflation, your average lower class American puts three quarters of their income into the housing market. And so if you index price inflation over everything except housing, you're just not going to account for how much housing is killing people. Right. Uh, let me see. Let me ask, see some questions in the super chat. Yeah, I started a bunch of them live? if you want. What's that? You guys doing this live? We are, yeah. yeah. Sick. Do you? Uh, oh, did you? Yeah, of course. Do you not know? You thought we were recording? Care. My assumption oh, okay. was I talked to Look, like the chat, the, the chat's in love with you anyway, so it's not oh. you're like you're not getting a bunch of... Um, <laughs> and there's a bunch of super chat questions and stuff like that. We never talked about how long you want to stick around. We've been talking for about an hour and 40 minutes, but um, I mean, this has been a great conversation, it, obviously. It, I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm done for another hour. Okay, cool, Wait, cool. Okay. I just got to run to the bathroom first before we do this. Yeah, go, yeah, sure, go to the bathroom. Go ahead. We'll read a couple super chats that aren't aimed you. guys can gossip enough. about me when I'm gone. We will. We will. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Uh, PC, thanks so much for the 10 gifted memberships, PC. Yeah. Um, I'll ask me about the Taiwan thing, so I'll say that. We've uh, got generic... 10 gifted memberships. Mark Twain's Revenge gifted 20 memberships, Thank which you, is Twain. awesome. We got a, like a 50 gifted memberships here. Somewhere. Yeah, I saw Grendel Vat gave us 50 gifted memberships. Thanks so much, Grendel. Yeah, cool. Really so awesome. And uh, I think Lucy Lemonbug gifted five as well. Yes, so. thank you, Lucy. Despite being a dirty chopper. Welcome new members. By chopper, I mean sticker. Right. Uh, generic we mean seven chopper. <laughs> generic seven. Not gonna get me for, again. For fourteen months, says late and not gay. S class is S team. We were okay. pretty. We were pretty close to being on time this time. I was we were only a late like today, ten minutes so. late. Yeah. Everyone, look. Fast times at Ridgemont High came up, and mm -hmm. uh, fast times at Ridgemont High was really big when I was like twelve years old. Me and my yeah. buddy, we went and snuck into the movie theater. See, it. You, they, you can't see R-rated movies when you're 12. Of course, of course. Yeah. yeah. Different time back then, so. Yeah, it is It is funny because I, I am curious now to go back and watch that. Well, I just, I wish, I, I, I don't know what school is like for Zoomers. I have no clue what it's like. It's got to be so alien to what I would experience. And I'm sure it's even more alien than what you experience. Look, I, part of me would go back in a hot, second to actually live through it with all the technology and stuff because i mean i just my childhood was god um i wanted to make movies so bad but they didn't have any way for so me to satiate that yeah. appetite yeah right. so i if i went back again like i feel like i'd have a shot at having a film career like i'd be like i would have started making movies when i was 10 yeah, but they'd all be terrible and you'd be competing with a thousand million other people doing the same thing. So I don't know if it'd be like easier, but you'd yeah, feel I, better because you'd be doing something about it, right? Maybe. I mean, yeah. maybe. It is an interesting dilemma, though. I do. Mm -hmm. There's there are obvious problems that young people face and there are obvious problems that people faced when they didn't have these kind of technologies. So right. it's a mixed bag. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Born Cell for Eight Months says Historia Civilis is a YouTube History Channel does a video in ancient Rome. His left latest work title, his latest video titled "Work." He goes on a socialist rant. If you gave it a look, yeah, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but I don't think we're going to do like a whole breakdown on the stream or what anything. Any point. Question: Does the chat have? Okay. Well, someone talked about Philip Coggins brought up the regarding we're talking about subs operating the Taiwan Strait. He said the waters are extremely shallow and subs can be seen from the air while submerged. So I know you're talking. I also that. don't know why submarine warfare would be useful for that. Um, mm -hmm. Submarines tend to operate over large geographic areas uh, where you want to disrupt the enemy's movements. Um, if I think the Chinese's biggest advantage for that is just that they've like murks the hell out of the coastline there, where the Chinese have been constructing bunkers with rockets for the last mm -hmm. sixty years, and they've completely dominated that. And so I've heard that. I think the Chinese military is actually pretty bad. I, I, I stand by that. And mm -hmm. so I don't know how effective they'd be, but they have the theoretic potential to de deny any American ships in the Taiwan Strait. And I don't think submarines would be that strategically useful. Do you so think they... Oh, go ahead. What were you saying? Well, I hearted the ones that 
our oh, yeah, direct yeah, yeah. questions to him just help Why you out. Not? But go ahead. But um, do you think that China would have a good chance at taking over Taiwan? Um, it would be like Russia, Ukraine. It's again. funny where it could go either way, and I don't know, but it's basically impossible to find a country with a good civilian bureaucracy and a bad military or vice versa, where you can use like your nation's ability to just get crap done inside itself through bureaucracy to its military. And so I think the Chinese would do really poorly because they have no background. We They haven't fought a war since 1971. And then they failed in that war and the war before. But you look at the Chinese endeavors to do everything else, whether saving up food and iron and stuff for um for their potential problems through dealing with covid through uh their lockdowns and the chinese have just been behaving in a very schizophrenic poorly managed um just bad way and mm -hmm. so i think their military would probably be similar where they because this is actually interesting where all of china's previous invasions in since like the last 500 years have failed for the same reason. The Chinese get a bunch of guys, they launch them forward, and then they don't train them, they don't do logistics right. Um, and then they just get slaughtered by a much smaller native population. And this happened in Burma in the 18th century. It happened in uh, Mongolia in the 1500s. Uh, it happened with Korea in the 1950s. And so I think that would be what would happen where the Chinese would just not get the logistics right, have a bunch of guys die. And also the thing with Taiwan is it's a fortress island where the cliffs are a thousand miles, it's not a thousand, a thousand feet tall and it's jungle. And so wow. amphibious invasions are incredibly difficult to pull off and only the most advanced militaries in the world can do it. And so part of me thinks like, you know, China is the geographic size of the United States and has four times the population. And Taiwan's the size of Ireland. So imagine if there was like an Ireland off the coast of South Carolina and the U.S. failed to conquer that. Embarrassing. That would be pretty embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Especially because, I mean, China does have an air force and stuff like that. So they do. They don't have to scale those walls, right? They just fly <laughs> over there. Air Force doesn't really do much. I mean, if you look over history, um, no, you have you've never been able to use an Air Force to win an on the ground conflict where um, I mean, the Vietnam War is the greatest example. The U.S. dropped more um, just bombs on North Vietnam, which was a third world pre-industrial society than the entirety of World War II combined. And we didn't do a dent in the Vietnamese. Because okay. they have trouble dropping a bunch of people in there paratroopers are bad because they're there's no like you, supply you line there's not enough of them you it's just you can't launch an offensive campaign like that and also like if you just drop infantry they'll get slaughtered by tanks right um, mm -hmm. and people one of the things i've learned reading enough history is humans can be like cockroaches where you can besiege a city for years drop bombs in it every single day every hour and then somehow like 40 percent of the population survives <laughs> this is one of the things from world war one where like you like in world war one they drop ungodly amounts of artillery on like a, a single mile of area for a week and then somehow a majority of the people survive Look, because mm -hmm. you figure it out. You're like, look, I need a bunker quick. You're like yeah. digging a hole and putting cement on the top of it. Mm -hmm. And when shit hits the fan, people will really struggle hard to survive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thoss Apprentice, thanks so much for six months. Says, I don't agree with everything uh, Rudyard says, but I appreciate his historical analysis, even as a lefty. P.S. Rags mentioned Lion King 1.5. Did you DM him? <laughs> I did not. Um, no. Thank you. Um, was there a question there? There wasn't, no. Uh, Just a compliment. Nax, Nax last for 18 months says, I'm very interested in hearing about how the far left are invested in purity. I would have thought they didn't tolerate dissent, not oh. impurity. Okay, yeah. So purity, according to John Haidt, is what values do you hold sacred? And it's very closely related to disgust, where if someone's very high in disgust, um, they'll also be very high in purity. Where, for example, with a woke person, they wouldn't want to go on a camping trip where they'd have to see their friends naked and go through dirt and all that stuff in the same way, like a religious fundamentalist wouldn't be comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. uh, or they wouldn't 
people who are high in purity also don't like like taking rotting food out of the fridge right it's the same psychological physiological force and we don't notice every society has to have purity to differing degrees and too much becomes like a like a strangling force and too little you fall into decadence and um we don't notice the far left's purity because it's not in normal ways. If you're part of a traditional religion, you would have purity associated with sex or with uh, not taking the Lord's name in vain or for following the right rituals. For the left, it relates to word usage and language where, for example, as a person who's basically a libertarian, if I ran an organization and a communist came to speak, I wouldn't have a problem with that. If you're on the far left and Jordan Peterson speaks in your college, he is defiling the purity of the organization with his alternate views. Mm -hmm. If you're on the left, and this is why they get triggered so easily, because their purity threshold is so unbelievably high or so unbelievably low, where, like for me, uh, I get called all the most horrible things every day on YouTube, but it's part of the job. <laughs> um, and um, if for the left, their purity comes through basically extreme emotional reactions to um, things that will not endanger their lives. Has Height uh, redone his moral foundations test on woke people? Because I know yeah, like, classically, um, okay, because I know like pre woke done that stuff. for the coddling of the American mind, mm -hmm. um, where he, because when Height was writing that in like, um, I don't like probably 2016, I guess, when he wrote The Righteous Mind. Um, woke 2012 really... was Righteous Mind. Okay. See, it did. I did change my life. I was like, holy cow. Yeah. Wokeness hadn't really reached its form. And it's funny where I've got some like hippie like tendencies. I have a collection of hippie shirts. Like I'm interested in the spirit world and I yeah. can get kind of woo woo at times where that would be a very left wing trait 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now on the left, like you, you see a lot of people like Joe Rogan or Russell Brand. If those people are on the right, that means the left has gotten very stringent and very yeah. uh, fundamentalist. And it's it's funny to see that sw switch occur because back in the day, if you went to lived in Portland, Oregon, you would be able to live whatever life you wanted, and people wouldn't judge you. And now, if you want to do that, you move to a red state, and so you've seen the purity axes flip, where the left. The left took on a lot of traits that you used to just see in fun in religious fanatics. Yeah, because I know like classically the left had very little care for purity at all in yeah. his original stuff. So I'm I'm wondering if like what we're seeing with woke, is it really a like a disgust that's manifesting, or is it something different? It's just this dissent that's not being tolerated. The left offers I, I, I know a lot of people who are incredibly woke and I know it's on a visceral biological level mm -hmm. because if something bad happens, they'll burst into tears or they'll ruin their week. Um, and that's not something you fake. And right. the left kind of just offers, it tells people whatever they want to hear to get power. And you see those communism offer utopia. The second they do get power, they enslave the populace and kill millions of people. Right. And I, I, I'm going to quote the Unabomber here because I think he has got the correct analysis that the left is a reaction to how atomizing and alienating modernity is. Because back in the day, you'd live in a village. Everyone in the village knew you. You may have had a hard life, but at least you felt like you were a person and you had your own little plot of land that you managed as a business with your wife. And now you work at a giant mega corporation. And if you look at the left's top demographics, and what Kaczynski, the Unabomber, said was that this caused a lot of feelings of repression and alienation, because if you're dealing with all these impure personal bureaucracies, you're not allowed to express who you are as an individual. But if you're in a village where everyone knows you since childhood, you can be yourself. And if you look at the left, their dominant things they talk about are repression, powerlessness, and um, resentment. And that would make sense for a bunch of people who are feel like they're cogs in the machine. And what you would also see with a worldview built off that is a anger at standards and controlling yourself. So they would offer everything. And then once they get power, they turn it into basically an ego trip where they get total power over everything. And the left is powered off 
everyone wanting to be the dictator with total power, which is why they don't structure. The left doesn't have any structures for once it gets into power because everyone wants to be the dictator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all that, though. I do think especially kind of like with Uncle Ted and stuff of that nature, there's a lot of grass is greener going on there because like if you live in a small town and everyone knows you or small village, everyone knows you. Yeah, that can be just as stifling because then it's like the the authenticity of the individual can completely be annihilated because everything becomes like, well, everyone knows Definitely. who you are. You have no anonymity to do anything. Everything you do is a reflection of your family. Everything becomes yeah. very much, you know, about exactly. the family name and everything. So it's like a different type of stifling of your individuality. I mean, I agree with you that we're uncle. I agree with uncle Ted. I'm allowed to say that. I agree with uh, the Unabombers. <laughs> uncle Ted. Now you guys are calling him. What are you crazy? I agree. I do not support. Murder. I do not support the Unabomber in any fashion. Yeah. You know, people I also do, do not support the Unabomber in That's any fashion. That's um, but the Luddite challenge, I mean, is pretty interesting, but go but ahead. <laughs> his assessment of the problems with modernity is correct. I think his idea we need to revert to monkey is wrong because sure. it's, 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 you can't go back. The, like the advantages conferred by nest realization are so massive and people tend to go to conclusions and I jump to radical conclusions. And I think realistically you can warp modernity over time to not have the problems he talks about. And what I'd say is that what you're describing is incredibly collectivist and it's right. stifling, um, but it lasted for thousands of years and our system's falling apart after a century. And the West and especially the English speaking countries are able to break out of that, where if mm -hmm. you're in 1600s England or early America, you live in this very, um, this very rural personal society but also you've broken down the clan and you have capitalism. So you would know the people in your life, but also there was an expectation you'd move out of your town and have social mobility. And I think, I mean, I've said in loads of videos that the breakdown of the clan and the rise of individualism is the biggest thing that resulted in the West's dominance and later stuff like the industrial revolution or right. the scientific revolution or um, the modern world. Yeah, I, I just think it's it's kind of like what you were saying earlier, where you know, you know, we're talking about like the medieval period is like this massive period, and history goes through this kind of ebb and flow of people being in a good spot and people being in a bad yeah. spot under similar uh, uh, systems, a uh, similar economic systems to similar cultural systems, and I feel like I mean everyone kind of does this, like they'll point to they'll just you know, sample bias, point to all the good parts of some system yeah. they like, ignore all the bad parts and say, see, everyone was happier back then. And I'm always just eternally skeptical. I'm like, I, I'm pretty I try, sure there's lots of horrible stuff going on back then. I try really hard to not glorify the past because yeah. it was hard. And I'm like, I live in Texas right now and I would not live here even a hundred years ago because of malaria in the heat. And AC, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like, and it's, yeah. it's like, if I wanted to, I could grab a flight to Paris tonight. That's insane. I could be there is, tomorrow yeah. morning. And right. so we have a lot to be thankful for. And I kind of view history as cycling between tolerable and intolerable, where yeah. when I went to high school, I was like, I didn't have any spending money. I was working really hard, but my life felt tolerable. I had a lot of friends. I was happy. And objectively, I might live a, like, you could be objectively a millionaire with a beautiful wife um, who's famous, but your life is intolerable for other reasons. And I don't care what those other reasons are. What matters is that it's intolerable to you. Right. You could be a peasant in Northern India and you're happy because uh, you just like your life a lot. And history goes to these cycles of tolerable and intolerable. And when things get too, and it's for a bunch of reasons, whether economic, family, um, just you have a lot of freedom and it doesn't really matter what the reasons are. What matters is the outcome of are people happy. And mm -hmm. we're in a system where we may have a lot of material advances, but our society is falling apart due to mental health issues. And so I judge our, we are incredibly, we have a lot going for us, but we're intolerable in the same way that like Europe before the black death was intolerable or Rome right. before it fell was intolerable. Right. It seems like throughout history, there have been times where there's been societal collapse, like societies yeah. have just ceased to exist. I, I don't know if that c can possibly happen 
now that the world is so interconnected because it no, could be easier it's, actually um, okay there's a, thing Let's explain. there's a thing called complexity theory and it stems from the study of the bronze age collapse where um most people have never heard of it but the bronze age collapse was something that happened around three thousand years ago where over a matter of 50 years the entire bronze age world fell apart did they lose know. technology? What happened? What, what did it look really like? We don't really know. Like all the smartest people have tried to study this. We don't have a good answer. And uh, it could be barbarian invasion, climate change, uh, social change. Um, the best answer I would have is that the Bronze Age, and we invented complexity theory as an outgrowth. That the It's funny that we don't think about it because it was 3,000 years ago, but the Bronze Age world was incredibly globalized and was dependent upon getting resources from really far away. And okay. so you would get tin shipped into the Middle East to make bronze from the British Isles or from Afghanistan. And the tin trade and all these exotic resources was spanning the entire world 3,000 years ago. And so what ended up happening was that once you knocked out one part of the trade node, everything else fell apart. So once barbarians knock out the Hittites or the um, Mycenaeans, the entire rest of the Bronze Age world collapsed. And also, there was a technological shift where the governments of that era were really repressive, and there was a shift away from basically a democratization of weapons. And so the peasants were thinking to themselves, why do we need the government anymore? They just tax us. And so it was a breakdown in people feeling like they needed government. And with globalization, we're, I don't know if we'll have a social breakdown. We're a pretty advanced society, but we're in a similar place where there are so many interconnected pieces. And this is something I really admire Peter Zihan's research, where did you know that the third world is completely dependent upon grain from Russia and Ukraine? So if those countries have a civil war, hundreds of millions of people will starve in Africa and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. uh, we're dependent upon the chips in our phone are mined in the Congo, one of the most unstable areas. And then the chips, the, the subcomponents for the chips, and the chips themselves can only be made in Taiwan, also a really, um, a really strategically weird area, or oil. And so if Peter Zihan talks that if one node of global trade falls out, the system collapses. Um, and I, I, I don't know if that's going to happen, but it's definitely possible. We'll find out. Uh, <laughs> Tina Wolfie for $10 says, hello, Alt Hiss, been watching your videos for many years now. Very good videos with a breadth of good information. Um, I mean this in no offensive way, but you speak like you're always giving a presentation. <laughs> maybe I am. That, that's Maybe that's just what my subconscious is. There you go. Video essays are kind of a presentation anyway. So. Of course. Yeah. Um, let's see. Are you, uh, do you have a, a take on the idea that one day robots or AI will actually displace humanity? I don't, so AI is not my area of speciality and I'm very careful to not walk into areas that I haven't studied super hard because having looked into history really deeply, the difference in your comprehension of everything between on one side of the Dunnings-Kruger is massive. Um, and so I know like for climate change or AI, I'm in a position where I don't know what's going on. Um, what I'd say is I'd worry, I think that if AI got too bad, we just have a revolution because the end point of AI is massively increasing inequality. And um, and so if we increase inequality more, I think we'd have a revolution. And I also think AI will, I think for a lot of people, AI is the revelation for nerds where the singularity or history ends. I think that's foolish. And people are always want to say the world's ending and it never does. Um, right. But on top of that, I also think AI is incapable of doing everything we think it is due to a philosophic bug in modernity where AI can't interact with the real world. Its information is purely based off the data sets we give it and off the assumption that's going to producing it. And so in the same way, every side of the political spectrum went through a phase of saying that they were the scientific truth. Once we make AIs, 
I think that they'll just become reflections of the worldviews of the people that make them. And um, it'll be, they won't be able to like tell us, is there a God? Or um, how do I live a happy life? Or how do I run the economy? Or how do I win wars? I don't think they'll be capable of operating on that level. I have a friend, I think what they can do, and I'll use an example. I have a friend that uses AI to look at people's faces and then determine how their personalities and body, look at their body language and use that to determine how their personalities work. Because wow. there's data on people's personalities compared to their body language that you can do that. And it's scarily accurate. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, Turchin also used AI to figure out um, when societies have civil wars. And so the top thing AI would do would be to wipe out a class of white collar workers um, which they kind of run society. So I'd imagine that they'd react poorly to that. Um, and it would also, I could also as a positive, see it speeding up research really quickly. Do you think that we will, like just philosophically, is it possible to create an artificial human, like a robot that is sentient? I don't think so. I think it's too complicated because if we've learned anything from science, it's that everything is much, much more complicated than we give it credit for. Hmm. And what we've found in every field of science is once you get past a certain length, it's just chaos you can't predict. The subconscious doesn't, the subconscious past a certain point is chaos. Physics past a certain point is chaos. Um, history past a certain point is chaos. And we've studied physics and we can't predict where particles go. And so I think we would never be able to recreate the human race with robots because too many factors that just went into the creation of us can't be replicated in the lab. Do you, do you understand well, the, the chat GPT technology? Have you looked into that at all? Um, no, I haven't. Okay. So chat GPT basically takes these large language data sets and it just, yeah. it's only trying to predict the next best guess for what word goes next. So yeah. it's not, it's a, it's a completely different way of thinking. And I'm just, I, ever since I, I figured out how it worked, I, I start thinking about my own thinking and wondering how close it is to actual human thought. Like it, are humans thinking in these large blocks of concepts or are most humans just thinking what next logical word goes yeah, here. I think people's subconsciouses are infinitely deep and things are going on in multiple calculations at the same time. And people have different personalities inside of them that are jockeying for influence. And so, um, well, yeah. the reason that I bring it up is just, just because of the complexity thing. If there's yeah. two ways that it could go, either, either humans are far more complicated than chat GPT or they're as simple as chat GBT and we just have this idea that it's complicated, but really it's just no, I a think very humans simple are imitation. It's like, um, you know, Andrew Jackson had a <laughs> Such is already rebelling at the no, idea. I think humans are way more complicated than chat GBT. I mean, well, like, and maybe just, may, maybe just so obviously humans have two different operating systems here. They have a, yeah. they, they have the emotional and then they have the, logical rational language part of the brain built on top of that maybe just the language part of the brain works like chat yeah, but GPT. even okay. but chat gpt obviously doesn't have well, all of the emotional i listen i think i th operating. well first of all defining what sentience is is very complicated in the first place like how do you define when a robot has gained sentience in the first place i don't even because i think i think it's possible I don't think that we that could hard. create i think it's possible we could create you know data or something like that at some point but you would never really know, is this something that's sentient and has consciousness and deserves rights? Or is it something that's simply just acting the way that we've programmed it to act and it's really just a toaster that looks like nice and says nice things? I don't think we'll ever be able to really make that determination. We have I don't know to, how we though. could. We're going to have to as a society. We're going to have to, but I don't know how we can. Like, I, I don't think also, we can replicate humans, but I think we can make something like like a data in the future. Go ahead, go ahead Roger. What do it's you got? much easier to replicate the external, external forms of things than the right. internal ones. Yeah, exactly. And so like, it makes me think of Andrew Jackson had a parrot that would speak full sentences. And the parrot had no clue what it was doing. Give that parrot rights. I mean, I'm, I'm for <laughs> Yeah. Uh, um, but... What I've found with my study of anthropology is people are much more deeper and irrational than 
we have any comprehension of. And people also think in very different ways where um, men and women think differently. People of different cultures think differently. Just random people, I'm sure all of us, if you did a Myers-Briggs, we'd come out different. And that informs our life in a bunch of ways. Um, and I, for, I think AI will become a reflection of the California data nerds who built it rather than the human race. And we'll end up seeing, it will be useful for a couple things, but it will be in, there's a theory that consciousness is dependent upon individuality or you, your existence, because you can't think about something unless you're in a certain space where you have to grow up and experience the world. Because once you think about something, you're thinking how to get something and how to live your life. And that's dependent upon having an actual life. And so I've heard it's impossible for a computer to be able to think in the same way as a human because life is so wildly different from a human. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, this this is how they're cha uh, how they're training the various robots because they're training them on on data sets. It's just real world interaction between the robot and whatever task. Yeah, they but set what's it up motivating to. the robot and guiding the robot is so vastly different than what motivates and guides a human. Because I mean, is it? Of course. Let's be real. The motivation for guys to dress well is seventy percent getting laid. Yes, yes that's look. look that. You're making my point. Robots here. aren't trying to get laid. <laughs> look, the they is, tell they tell the, the robot get the soccer laid. ball in the and look at what happens goal. five years down the road. Yeah, men will be living in absolute filth. You just that's remove the <laughs> incentive structure, that's and right. your entire society changes. Yeah. The robot doesn't have the incentive to get laid or be liked or find. Why guys. not? You just program no it in. That. I don't know what to tell you. You're like, there's <laughs> there's women here. Look, get dates with these women. <laughs> okay. Hello, I am Omnitron 3000. <laughs> you are Stacy number 3112. What would you pick, like for dinner? You, look, you, look, pick you, up know, you know that robot would be getting a date seven nights a week. <laughs> like, in, in just a matter of time. I mean, what's it look like? Anyway, let's move on to the robot. Um, Luke W for four months says, if any of the stuff is real regarding CIA spirit world stuff, um, how come nobody has been able to claim the James Randi million dollar challenge? What is oh, that? That's mean? a good point. So What's James the... Randi was a famous skeptic and magician, I believe who he basically supposedly offered a million dollars to any psychic that could prove that they were psychic through some scientific rigor or something. This is one of those things that gets kind of weird, but we've mm -hmm. had physics experiments where someone literally particles move differently, whether or not you're looking at them. Right. And that sounds fake, but it's actually true where we've run it, where if you have a camera, if you have a camera looking at something, particles move differently than from, if it's not. And mm -hmm. that strangely corresponds to the like ancient, to the ancient philosophy and medieval philosophy that thought, they believe that consciousness created reality, right. which I don't know how to explain that. But um, and it's it's one of those things where. Again, I'm throwing out theories I don't know if are true or not, but y there are certain things that can't be measured and they can't be measured scientifically like love. Love happens if we were in a certain autistic enough society, we could say that love didn't exist because we didn't replicate it under scientific conditions. Right. Or um, we experience it. That's the only way to know. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Or for example, people, we do this a lot with my field where people say we will never have a major war or political crisis because the West hasn't had one since 1950. And I'm thinking you're using like a bad scientific model where since 1950 is your scientific study and then everything outside of that doesn't exist. And um, I'm not sure that that's the correct way um, because imagine you are a psychic and you say that um, someone you love will have a problem in the next month and that sound, and then um, your grandmother realizes she has cancer two weeks later. How do you measure that? Right, right. Have you, do you know about the Baxter experiments with the- oh, I don't. With the, um, with the plants and the, the lie detectors? Oh, no, with? please tell. There's like, it's so, this is so frustrating. There's a guy who basically created the lie detector on a whim. He hooked up the lie detectors to the, I forget what kind of plant it was, some plants. And he thought like, oh, I'm going to water these plants and maybe the lie detector will like measure- the electroactivity of the water like going up the stem of the plant. And the thing that he knows was really weird 
was that before he started to water the plant, like as he's like leaning in to do it, it started registering on the lie detector. Mm. And then he started to think, oh, like maybe the plants have some way of detecting when moisture is near or something like it's preparing. Yeah. And then, but then it was even weird. So then he started doing stuff where he would like, he wouldn't actually have water. He would just visualize in his mind that he was going to water the plant. And apparently that would register on the plant. And then he transfer. then he would also say like, oh, well, I'm going to like attack the plant with fire or something. And then that would register on the plant. And then he just think about right. attacking the plant with fire. And that would. And he'd always like really wacky experiments to just see what the plants would react to this. And I read, and I'm reading this. I'm like, how has this not been like either debunked by like people replicating this and failing to get the results or, um, you know, or saying that it's true. And there's actually, it was hilarious. There was a Mythbusters where they tried to replicate this and they actually did. <laughs> and they still like said what? like, oh, no way. like, yeah, well, it's it's funny because they, they're like, oh, well, we replicated. We were like attacking the plants, thinking about attacking the plants and it registered. However, after a time of thinking about attacking the plants, it stopped registering. Therefore, it's not scientifically valid or it's not repeatable. Also- so it's not science. Even though that was literally part of Baxter's experiment was he would say, oh, if I kept threatening them in my mind, but not going through with it, they'd stop registering it. And so it's just, it's, I don't understand like why people aren't re- trying to replicate what these I've, experiments. The philosophic jumps I've made that I'm shocked a few other people have is I've come to the conclusion that human societies and everything is alive. When I look at a country, I, I see a country as a living, breathing organism. And I see history as a living process um, because everyone involved is living. And I see countries take on a lot of the psychological aspects of individuals, like countries can go crazy, like individuals, they can go through happy phases. Um, And a lot of our problems in modernity stem from us treating things that are living as if they're machines. Where I remember I went to, when I went to school, I would wake up at 530 every morning to go to school. And that made sense for their autistic bus schedule. But what you're actually doing is creating a miserable experience where the kids don't learn. And so we treat people like they're cogs rather than individuals. And um, with with that, it it makes sense from a living person's perspective where if I hear a giant T-Rex roar outside my house, I will be scared until it happens five times over. My neighbors tell me it's just a boom box and I shouldn't be afraid. Then I'll stop being scared because living things interact with their environments. And so once the plants realize they're not going to be threatened, it stops being a scary thing. Right. And I mean, the reason beforehand is that no one has an incentive to push it. Traditional religious authorities, they would lose a lot of their power if you had to open up a whole new can of worms. Um, academia bases its power off a materialist world. Government authorities, like I read an interesting book, The Secular Age by Charles Taylor, and he made two really interesting points. I mean, there's the obvious point that religion went into decline due to uh, technological progress, but he also said that religion went into decline because religious authorities became buzzkills, and it was also easier for se- like national governments to control their populations without religion because you could appeal you could just make it straight nationalism is your new religion have you read donald hoffman do you know about his research oh you got to check him out we we we'll have to exchange a bunch of book ideas (laughs) after the stream yeah uh jay for 20 dollars says the right has the military he must not be talking about the u.s military yeah people say the military is woke now it's different things so that this actually happened in the russian revolution and the uh, french revolution Um, enlisted men and the officers tilt right. Most of the left are ethnic minorities inside the military who are, they're not woke. And then the government makes political appointments for the highest level of the military. And, um, I have some friends who are attached to that and they're actually using me too, who are, they're using me too, to basically remove the top brass level of the military. Um, even if it doesn't make any sense. And, um, and, um, What's happened in the French Revolution and the Russian Civil War was that when shit hits the fan, men side with their colonels and their officers rather than the admirals or generals because they see those men as identifiable to them while they see the top level brass as political appointments. True, true. Uh, And Jay from another $20. Thank you, Jay. Says, quote, the left baits the right into doing something stupid. Christian nationalism has entered the chat. Yeah, that's yeah. James Lindsay's perspective, and I, that I definitely could see that happening. Yeah, I, I just wish the right would cool it for a couple of years until, like I've in so many videos, I've told the right not to launch a revolution 
because that's the only (laughs) yeah (laughs) no one's driving the ship though i just i I feel like it's gonna that's the problem the mob mob psychology is the worst aspects of individual psychology yep yeah and it always presents itself at the worst possible time yeah there's like like, there's a mob and then there's the people that basically rise to the top by just listening to the mob and giving them whatever they want to hear ibram kendi is not a real intellectual the reason he's worth 50 million dollars is he gave the mob what he wanted and donald trump our glorious god emperor he um he's like i I don't see him as a real politique, like no. political mastermind. He's giving the crowd what it wants. And you look at this last election, um, he didn't launch a revolution, but he said a lot of stuff that was proxy to it. And I do wonder if stuff gets worse, especially if he gets indicted. Does he just YOLO it? I don't know. I mean, you- we, were, we were talking about Civil War stuff. And I mean, you were talking about this on a previous stream, Adam. I do think something that would lead us down a bad pathway is that if Trump gets elected and he puts in some stooge for attorney general and they literally just start arresting obama biden hillary like everyone they can you see look there's a million of these things that could happen that are just unprecedented you you mentioned trump and people are going to want to know if you support trump or if you're agnostic or what's your position i don't publicly state political positions uh on online um i well, you said, look, the only reason I'm asking is because you said Trump are God emperor and people will take that. Oh, I was saying look, that people, ironically. It was, well, um, yeah, obviously, but people, if it's ambiguous, people will take it to mean okay. that whatever they want amb- it to let mean. Let it be ambiguous. I think he is not a good person. I think several of his policies were good. Right. Okay. I feel like that's every politician. <laughs> yeah. I'm Look, I'm amazed at... There's three policies that I can think of that just seem to be policies that walked into his office and he ended up like making a concerted effort to get them passed and passing them in each case. There's the prison reform, which Kanye and his wife brought to him. There is the health care price reform thing that I don't know how he got in contact with that, but I read the uh, this guy's book and it's this I- idea that, you know, we need to reform healthcare by actually putting prices on things and Trump passed an executive order to do it and it's still working its way. And there's, he saw Christopher Rufo on Fox News and did a complete CRT ban. It's like, um, so many people talk about, look, th- nothing is happening in Congress. And here's three things where people just walked yeah. into his office with a good idea and he implemented them. What I saw was he basically limited the American labor pool where the five years after Trump were the fi- were the highest gains in the lowest level of labor um, since the 60s. And he did that through a combination of tariffs and cutting off immigration. And so... Um, he also, Trump rapidly reindustrialized America, where America since in the last, in Biden's kept, except for immigration, Biden's kept these policies, where America has seen exceptionally rapid reindustrialization, starting with Trump. And also Trump was the first president to go against China, where the Obama administration did basically nothing against China, which really shocked me at the time. And so I think when it yeah, he, that's a that's a good one. He basically took the conflict with North Korea off the table too, just by yeah. being friendly with Kim Jong Un. Yeah. Um. Let's see. J- Joshua Fidar says Biden will end the war right before the election and say vote for me end of the war. Um. I mean, what well, war? Well, well, first of all, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I don't think it's up to Biden to just say yeah, I'm going to end I the mean... war in Russia and Ukraine, and even like. I don't know if Putin would want to give by why would he want to give Biden a win that close to the election anyway? Yeah, yeah. it's just yeah, Biden can't end the war. Yeah. It's out of his control. Tell, yeah. Thank thank you. Tell them, Ruddy. Right <laughs> like, yeah, it's I mean, so like, annoying. I does, hear like that, it's it's also like I see this weird obsession. I move my cards out. I support America and Ukraine because I support weakening the Russians because they're our rival. Mm-hmm. Um and that's strategically my apt <laughs> right but i mean we're seeing our top rival basically bloody themselves without us having to have a war with them um well yeah and if they took ukraine easy the chances of them invading a nato country 
become exactly. much higher and then we actually or something else yeah. then I we actually that, do have to put boots on the ground we're trying to I stay think, out of the war i think people saying that like we're spending 500 billion dollars and like not protecting the border that's true but also one right doesn't equal that's like a whataboutism where yeah. we should be doing all those things we should be helping the american middle class but um you can't like you can't have your three course meal all the time you want um and it's also people act like there's such a people just have too many emotions and they should just go home and meditate and watch tv um mm. actually i don't want to say that i don't want to i don't want to throw all of the problems destroying our society under the bus but also you can solve them without going absolutely crazy um and um like there was a poll that came out when the ukraine war started saying that a majority of left-leaning young Americans wanted to have a war with Ukraine. And people were calling me right when the war started saying, why don't we fight Ukraine? And I'm saying, this country's never been our ally. They they had a chance to join and they didn't. And we're already like a third of the world under our protection. We don't need to add more to that. Um, and also there's this just, I think people need to cool their emotions with Ukraine because both the, the right and the left make really like, they treat it, they treat Ukraine like it's Canada, like it's something that's incredibly close. And right. our, the fate of our nation is in, is it is decided by it. But the reality is it's a second rate proxy that we're not an ally with. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of money tied up there that we want back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, war is like, uh, war is like the, um, the trash. The, what's the thing you put in the sink where the trash eats it? A garbage disposal? Yeah, war's like the garbage disposal. Anything you go there gets chewed up and you never see it again. Right, right. Um, but yeah, I just get annoyed when I hear people like on the both on the left and the right who act like there's some magical thing that Biden can do to just be like the war ends and Russia and Ukraine shake hands. I mean, like the war would end yeah. if we just stop supporting them and then you I mean also crushed. but they act like they can just like he can just wave his hand and then they'll come to some magic agreement and then they'll remember when that doesn't end the war. Like if we stop yeah. supporting them and it emboldens Putin to enter a NATO country, we're back in the war again. Like it's it doesn't end the it still doesn't well, they end don't, the war. Yeah, but that's not what they think is gonna and happen. Though. It reminds me of when Trump was running for office and he was running off an isolationist platform where he said, We don't want to support Europe or um the Far East. And he was also saying we need to use the US military to destroy ISIS. I'm thinking. This is a place because by the Trump administration, America was an oil exporter. We didn't need the Middle East at all. And I was thinking, why does the U.S. military need to put its boots on the ground in this place thousands of miles away from America? And it's just we're in we're an incredibly emotional society and choices aren't made over rational decisions. It's virtue signaling inside your own group. You, you got to read yeah. Dictator's Handbook, man. You will, you will love it. Yeah. It's well, maybe so kind of cynical how easy it is to manipulate people based off their emotions in politics, where I think about a lot of these issues, how many of these things are real issues because they're actually, people care, and how much because they had a button pushed, where I look at um, people talking about, like, why is the COVID lab leak, or why is um, calling it like the Kung flu? Why is that controversial in our society? <laughs> and like, I look at that because it's not nothing to do with America. It's China. It's their problem. The right and the left, I don't see why they're supposed to care. And I just imagine for those things, like the Communist Party paid someone in, in the US media. They made it controversial and were so polarized that it became a sticking point because we wanted them to fight over. Yeah, it's, you, it's, it's sad because it's so much of it's all just dictated by tribalism. And I think the Ukraine yeah. situation is such a good example of that. Because, I mean, I bring this up all the time. It's like, you know, in the debate between Obama and Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney says, like, Russia is the number one threat we have to watch out for. Obama laughs in his face, tells him the Cold War is over. Like, and it used to be the, that was like the right wing position. Got to watch out for Russia. Yeah. And then during Obama's like two years later, you know, Russia invades Ukraine, takes to Crimea. And then since Obama's like... You know, the, the Republican strategy at that moment was we can't support Obama in anything. So then when Obama starts supporting, you know, kind of moving against Russia, the Republicans are in this weird spot. They're like, well, even though this was our position for like 30 years, we can't really <laughs> necessarily yeah. support Obama. 
And then it's like all this stuff with Hillary's emails and Russia and Trump and like all this stuff just creates this narrative that feeds people down this pathway of how they feel about Russia and Ukraine yeah. as opposed to like whatever's actually I mean, happening. What I've seen as well is, um, is what's the example? Um, COVID vaccines. The Trump administration developed the COVID vaccine. Yes. Yeah. The left hated them. The left got the vaccine and then made it their biggest issue. Or, or like, <laughs> the Robert Mueller case was a total meme because the left's view on him flip flopped like four <laughs> times. <laughs> yes. Depending yeah. on the moment. And it's like, I've come to the conclusion no one has lives because if you have a life where you're taking care of your family and you have a job you like and you're watching a new like one of the things that really gets me and this is a bit of a tangent is we don't have new music or movies like our society is that broken and so people focus on politics because they just need something to do right mm. no I, I think that's a good point and even even worse than Mueller I think was Comey because it was like the flip-flop on Comey was insane because at first the left was like, oh my God, you know, Comey came out and he totally ruined Hillary's ability to win the yeah. election. And then, and that's like, oh, Comey's a hero. He stood up to Donald Trump. Like, it's just like, <laughs> like make yeah. up your mind. And like, I'll see figures like Shu on Head where Shu on Head is, she's a socialist. And then the left totally dejected her yeah. for a handful of opinions. And it's all like that, where right. it's just complete. And I, I purposely, tr I keep, I think part of the reason I haven't gotten canceled is because I try not, there's a handful of issues that I try to not touch. Like I'll never talk about COVID. I'll never talk about the 2020 election mm -hmm. because I can keep my audience and talk about interesting topics. And if I can talk, make a video talking about historical cycles and what that means for the next 20 years, the public, that's just like, <laughs> someone once joked, the reason you haven't been canceled, Rudyard, is that would involve the mob listening to your videos for longer than 10 minutes. <laughs> There you go. That's true. Very, very true. <laughs> you need, yeah. you need a, a clip. Uh, Mithram six for five hundred Kazar Kazarks. Thank you. Says the U.S. was built on the idea that people with different values can live side by side, but now the government grew so much it's being regularly used to impose values on one group or the other. This zero sum situation is what's driving the polarization. I mean, I think a bunch of things drive polarization. I, I wouldn't. I. I... I, de I definitely agree with what he said, and I've said that in my videos, where the U.S. was designed as a very libertarian society, where like the, the South back in the day, and this is true to this is still true. We don't want to say it. The South, the middle states, and New England were like completely different societies, and so we built the country around how do we tolerate these very different people living together? And then over time, the government and the bureaucracy became a force that wanted to destroy the American societies. Um, but I, I don't think the reason the government's pushing so hard is because of polarization, because if you're in a society where you view the other side as Satanists who want to completely destroy everything you love, you will try as hard as possible to push your faction, even if it's immoral. We're back in the 50s. If Eisenhower wins over who is the Democrat candidate in 1956? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Over a random Democrat. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter because you've got the same values and you'll live in the same country. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. Orion nine one nine one says, "Hey, what if all his? I wish your podcast audio was better. I want to listen to the podcast." Yeah, I yeah, wish I that too. Um, <laughs> what, um, what's going on there? Do you just have bad so the audio? podcast was horrible for the first couple episodes? So don't judge okay. the later podcast based off that, um, because. Um, I, so you got the audio issues worked out. I've got, like. I use the microphone as my main channel. And this is, I've got um, a couple microphones that are between 200 to $400 in cost. And they're good quality microphones. And I use them for the main channel. But the problem was for the podcast, they sounded incredibly quiet. And then, so I just stopped using those microphones and I just talk into my camera and my computer. Uh -huh. And that makes an okay sound. But I'm talking to an audio expert this Monday to figure out how to fix it. So it's cool. not going to be a problem for much okay. longer. Uh, great. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mark Twain's Revenge, thank you so much for the $100. It's very generous of you. Says, there's something seriously sick in many of our older inner cities. I spend two to four days a week in New Haven where we own property, where you have Yale juxtaposed, juxtaposed to multi-generational poverty welfare families. Yale is there and they can't figure it out. Yeah. That's I'm from Philly. Philly. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. You guys good to wrap this in 15? Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, we can wrap I, up I, now I, if you're, if you got to go.
I've got company later, so I, I want to like make dinner and get ready. And well, stuff. let's just let's just just wrap up now. Then we um like we're gonna stream longer and we're gonna watch a video and react uh, to a contrapoints video. Oh, I don't so. I don't need to get going now. I'm fine if we go for another fifteen. Okay, sure. We'll yeah, ask okay. a couple more questions yeah. then. Yeah. Um, let's see. Hey, Theo Wolf for twenty dollars says, "Hey, Rudyard, what do you think of modern architecture? Does it have to do with political ideology, or is it just representative of dying culture? And what do you think of people who want to remake the Roman Empire?" Yes. Um, yeah, the answer is yes to that because <laughs> um, modern architecture came out of the World Wars, and there was this concept that you shouldn't have political or philosophic ideas. Um, and that's actually it's one of those catch 22s where maybe we shouldn't have philosophic or political ideas becomes a philosophic and political idea and it's juxtaposed of the human condition where we're biologically engineered for those things and so um wokeness is like an interesting philosophic endpoint of that because the concept that you don't have you shouldn't the underlying assumption behind wokeness is that the majority culture has no value. And then if the majority culture has no value, you have to glorify everything else. And like modern architecture isn't, it's not woke. That would be a silly thing to say, but it's mm -hmm. part of the same nihilism that ended up with wokeness. Because with wokeness, our idea was, we're not gonna believe in anything. We're just gonna be practical. But then that wasn't sustainable. And then it evolved into wokeness. Um, and so modern architecture, there's a great book called The Geography of Nowhere about this. It's not political, but through not being political, it becomes political. And um, if you want to revitalize the Roman Empire, that's insane. Like, that's not going to happen. I don't know <laughs> what to tell you. I mean, America is kind of the new Roman Empire. We've unified the European continent for the first time ever. Um, and like in sheer scope of power, we're stronger than the Romans. But like, is Italy going to conquer the entire Mediterranean. They tried that under Mussolini and mm -hmm. they, they couldn't beat the Greeks. Right. Yeah. I mean, when people say that, are they literally talking about Rome or they just mean like the spirit of Rome? I mean, a lot of history dudes are just LARPing. Like right. I've run a history show for 10 years and the biggest views are just topics people like to LARP on. People like the LARP is Romans, Crusaders, World War II, et cetera. Yeah. I actually made a meme. I was going to, I never ended up posting it. That was like, the Wojak guy, you know, the whole men are always thinking about Rome. And it's like the men are always thinking about Roman, like the Roman people. And then it's like the Romans are always thinking about some previous empire and the previous empire yeah. is thinking of a previous empire. And basically like the hunter gatherers thinking about being like a monkey. It's like everyone's just thinking yeah, like, exactly. yeah, there's some magical time in the past where everything was better. It's like, OK, maybe. Trying to think of what the Romans were aspiring to. The Romans really admired the Greeks. Um, yep. mm -hmm. I don't know if they had a bigger empire in mind that came before them. Um I found the whole Roman Empire meme interesting because it highlighted a gender sp split that I was aware of, where my YouTube channel is 96% male. And I'm not like a, I'm not a boys, boys, boys channel. No girls right. allowed. Uh, it's just, I make history content and it kind of self-selected. And so it was, I found that pretty funny because it was something that I had been aware of that I hadn't seen anyone else draw attention to. Mm -hmm. okay, you should make a history of fashion video and see what happens. Maybe you can like, <laughs> uh, I had one video that was sixty percent female, which was the uh, the Handmaid's Tale, and it was um, what would happen if the Handmaid's Tale happened. Oh, there you go. And there was uh, sixty percent female viewership on that video. Of course. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Hmm, they all want it. That's the truth. That's I know. That's what I was, I'm wondering. Like, does that mean they're interested? They're looking at it like a how to or how to avoid. Handmaid's Tale is one of my favorite books ever. Um, I think it's really well written. Um, I'm not going to get too red pilled on that. Um, I will say that Fifty Shades of Grey was the most popular book in the country right when Me Too started. There you go. Right. Uh, Bloomer Media for five dollars says, "Hey, what if? Please make a list of books you've read and or recommended." I mean, bro, like this is my shell on <laughs> Asian and classical history. Yeah. That's European history. It, I've tried to make the list and it's too long. Well, you can make like your top 10. How about that? Yeah, yeah. that's what you do. Yeah. Uh, my make... Goodreads is publicly available and that is a record of basically every book I've read. And I, it's something I've been wanting to work on for a long time. And I tried to record a video and that just became three hours. <laughs> mm. 
Uh, let's see. Someone said Marcus Marcellius Dorada says, uh, "What if what if alt history? Why do you play Byzantine and EU four so much?" I don't. I've actually never played EU four in my life. Wow! Fake news. Oh my god. Okay. Maybe yeah, somebody I mean, has your like, screen name or something. There you go. This is one of those LARPs where because I've talked a lot about the Turkish Empire in my videos where I think Turkey, this was a meme like a year ago because I haven't spoken at the Turkish Empire in a year, where I've frequently said um, Turkey's going to have a major empire. Um, but people, and people have like extrapolated this, that people, there's a myth I have a Turkish girlfriend. <laughs> there's a myth that I like am paid by the Turkish government. Yeah. And none of that's true. And it's funny, like, Myths still spread around the internet and they're just not true. And people will say, Rudyard, your only area, you just play Hearts of Iron and Europa Universalis. You don't actually study history. And the irony is I've never played any of those games. Uh, mm. I, I've played Hearts of Iron for about like 40 minutes. And I stopped because it felt too much like homework. You said you played Civ, I thought, a bunch, didn't you? Yeah, I played Civ a lot. Um, but right. people always go for the Paradox games to say that, um, to say that I'm not like serious. And it's funny my critics go for the things that are the most easy to disprove. Like they'll say, I don't do research. They'll say I'm making this crap up. And I think there's a million things you can criticize me about. Mm -hmm. Criticize me because it's correct. Right. <laughs> uh, Rogue Elephant for $20 says, so any suggestions on where in the U.S. to ride out the civilizational collapse? Asking for a friend. <laughs> Love you all. Have a great day. I don't know. I think um, near food. It's stable. Yeah, I feel comfortable in Texas. You'll probably be like, you're probably safest in, I don't know, like Iowa. Mm. But I mean, lots of people over prep and life is life. And you just got to see how things happen because it's impossible to predict the future. And think of all those guys in the 1980s who built bunkers in the middle of the Rocky Mountains, thinking right. there'd be a, a civilizational collapse. And maybe we'll have one now when our society's falling apart. But those guys wasted 40 years of their lives in bunkers in the Rockies where they could have been having fun. Oh, my God. You know how I can fall out? You know, the everything's the 50s aesthetic because that was like the the, the trend that was popular when everyone went into the bunkers. Could yeah. you imagine how awful it would be if like the future is fallout? The aesthetic is like awful Zoomer speak because it's the aesthetic when we I all go into the bunkers. I think Zoomers want to kill themselves too much for that. I don't think <laughs> like, it's fun. One of the things I've picked up on is the two sources of Zoomer slang are 4chan and rappers. Mm -hmm. That is not a good society. <laughs> when incels are inventing the cultural terminology for young yeah. people, you are completely broken as a culture. Right. That's a great point. That is. Yeah. Uh, Paul... One of the other things is all, except for rap, and I don't consider rappers be part of the left wing because- they, they they're just not culturally um it's interesting to see how the right invented all the new slang which is something that would have been insane 30 years ago i know i know it's so weird because like i'll talk to left-wing people and i'll say what slang do you use and like woke people don't have slang i mean like you could say cancel culture or woke or that is a form of slang the terminology the left uses but it's different from um, what the right does because the right slang encompasses all of life. Wagey, Stacy, uh, Beta Bucks, uh, et cetera. Based, soy. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, it feels like whoever is, it's weird. It's whoever's counterculture creates all the memes and slang essentially. And since yeah. the, you know, the woke has become like the managerial uh, overlords, like it's weird. You have the right wingers who are supposed to be the conservatives, at least the young right wingers who are like the rebels in this bizarre. Like, and it's it's way. funny that the left can claim to be, this is a shell game. I see the left play a lot. Um, they'll claim to be like the outsiders and the people who are downtrodden and they're supporting the weak. And they run all of society's institutions. Yeah, they're That's the thinking. establishment. What yeah. evidence would you need to have to, for that you guys run society that you don't have? And this is like, there's no feedback loop for evidence in the left's worldview. It's about psychological stability. And this is one of the arguments I get into where people say real communism has never been tried. And I say, you guys got a third of the human race. If that's not enough, your ideology is horrible. <laughs> I, I don't, like, because the thing is capitalism started with the Netherlands and Britain in the 1600s who are constantly under attack. And that 
And in the parts of the Cold War, you could have made the point that the capitalists were the ones who were the underdogs because they owned less of the world, less of the population, less resources. And it's just, if pick a theory that works. Yeah. That, but that's such a testament to the, the flimsiness of the theory, because if the theory can dominate a third of the minds of the world and still it doesn't work, I mean, obviously... It's, it's a terrible ideology. Also a testament to how um, emotionally strong the theory is. Oh if yeah, the theory yeah. Can propagate that hard and has faced that many defeats. It signifies like how well constructed leftist theory is for the human mind. Well, it's it's based on very primitive moral intuitions. You know, yeah. back when we used to hunt and you know, share everything equally from the hunt. That's basically the same primal moral intuitions that go into socialism. So yeah. obviously it would never work in a modern economy, but those moral intuitions are what still people crave. So it seems intuitively correct, even though every time it's actually been attempted in the real world, it's been a catastrophic failure. Yeah, really? uh, I agree with that. Um, any final points you guys want to make? No, no, this was uh, this was a great talk. Yeah, this thanks was a real for coming pleasure. on. You guys are a lot smarter than a lot of other podcasts I've been on. Well, you, you know, <laughs> look, you. you you have a you have a standing invitation here. You reach out to me if you want to come on You're and just and uh, just review a video with us. Just test out a new idea, whatever you want. Like we have a bunch of people that just pop in and come on the show whenever they're available. So, okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank cool. You. Yeah, we'll let you go. Okay. Peace. Take care, man. Thanks for Later. talking to us. Bye. Nice. That was great. Yeah. Roger's a really cool guy. You got yeah. any final super, thoughts before super we Super smart. Super smart. Super yeah, knowledgeable yeah. about things. Um, I mean, I'm not as um I'm not as uh doomy as you and him are, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but he <laughs> looks very knowledgeable about things. I I don't man, I I am an optimist. Okay. At heart. Okay. And I look when I looked at started looking at the generational theory stuff, I just I'm constantly looking at the optimistic part of it. I look I without okay. the look, without the civil war, you'd still have slavery. Sure, sure. Without sure. World War Two, I mean the the entire United States um Social safety net was basically developed out of the Great Depression. Without the Great Depression, you don't have a social safety net in America. Like, these are good things. Yeah. No, yeah. So I'm looking yeah. at a giant opportunity here, and I'm thinking, how do we take advantage of that opportunity? Sure, you can look at the the dour or bad shit that's going to come out of it. Why don't Why aren't we looking at what do we want to accomplish? Like, I think UBI is actually a possibility in this in this transformation. Well. Listen, I hope you're right. I could doom pill it a little bit by saying, unlike the Civil War, unlike World War II, in this fight, there's not like a clear side that's the good side. And that's kind of right. the problem. You're, you're, look, even if you're worried yeah. that we're Germany in this situation. Well, we're not Ger No, there, we're not. There is no Germany. But I'm just saying, like, it's just there's, there's, there's both meh. Like, there's meh on both sides. I'm like, oh, there's no one that's like the roof for you. I look, I just. I don't. I feel like the people in the time of the of the Civil War were thinking the same thing. The people yeah, okay, in the time but that's the, okay. Slaves, the Great Depression not slaves. were thinking very the same easy, thing. right? We have slavery mm -hmm. and not slavery. It's very easy to say what's the right side. We had you know Holocaust and not Holocaust. It's very easy to say like okay, there's a clear side that's the right side here. We have the establishment corrupt corporatists who are yeah, trying we to. Have, we have enslave like the, us all. What are you talking we have about? The, we have like How's the corrupt clear? corporatist slash woke on one side, and then we have like the MAGA into Christian nationalism on the other side. And I'm just <laughs> like, okay, we're just, you know, can we have something that's actually like good here? I think we need to put, we definitely need to put some more thought into this. Yeah. I see, I see why you're saying it's, it, we're doomed, but. I mean, I mean, I'm just, I'm trying it, to think of the positive. Here. It's very possible that whatever arises, like if there is this issue, okay, there is this conflict. Um, it's very possible whatever arises from the ashes will be something good. Isn't? It's, yeah, it's definitely possible. 
Look, I, pa- it's, Lincoln. It's, still, it's just hard for me to imagine. Well, whatever. I don't want to rehash. During that. the Civil War, yeah. Republicans weren't a party. There was a third player that came onto the scene during mm-hmm. the Civil War. Right. It was the it was the Whigs versus the the Democrats, right? I don't remember when the when they became. Look, I, I'm saying that there. You're looking. You're saying basically there's no one to pick from here, and I'm saying there might be a third option on the field at any time now. Yeah, no, I agree. That's what I'm saying that there can always be someone else. Something else can always manifest. That is true. Yeah. Look, okay. we're not. We don't have to circle the wagons around a bunch of shitheads. That's true. Okay. We might me, have a third option that comes into play here right. and uh, could change everything. Okay, so let me read the $20 and up Super Chats that we didn't get to, and then we'll watch the ContraPoints talking about LGBT conservatives. Yes, indeed. I have a new thumbnail, too. It's very interesting. I very did a second video. thumbnail just for the... Okay. I'll take care of that first. Uh, Mark Twain's Revenge, thanks for the 20 gifted memberships. Thank you, Mark Twain. Um... Let's see. Grendel that for twenty dollars. Thank you. Says day drinking during work is a standard we need to get back to. Maybe not with manual labor intensive jobs, but you know. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Jay for twenty dollars. Thank you, Jay. Says does wokeness need to persist long term? It's a Marxist vanguard movement. It just has to function long enough to destroy its host civilization, a la Mao's Cultural Revolution. Well, it's weird because. On one hand, I do think that a lot of wokeness was designed intentionally to be that. But on the other hand, wokeness is sort of its own Frankenstein's monster. Um, in terms of, like, this is why when you talk to actual Marxists, they all try to, oh, wokeness has nothing to do with Marxism. They actually kind of hate wokeness because they feel like it's going to steal all the revolutionary energy away from them, which it is actually doing that. So the question is, even if even if wokeness does destroy the country, to me, it's like almost inconceivable that Marxism or socialism, at least in the next 10 years, would be the thing that would replace, that would come from the ashes. Like, I think the only chance for socialism to really have a shot in America is if the big, you know, collapse civil war thing doesn't happen in any time soon but happens like 20, 30 years from now when all the socialist, you know, generation boom, uh, zoomers are basically like 40 or 50 and in positions of power. And they, if they've retained those socialist ideas, because the majority of the people in power, very (laughs) anti-socialist still. So, um, Eric, the great for 20 Canadian. Thank you. Says, I think woke plus white nationalists emerged because of federally imposed desegregation. People lost ties with their inner local city conservative ethnic churches. The LGBT reverence for femme, men, masculine, women among under 40s equals ex Christian uh, monasticism. Um, ah, I. Th- I don't I don't know if I track that exactly because federal uh, imposed desegregation happened in the 60s and it's been what 50 I mean 60 years now that wokeness and white nationalism has kind of reemerged so I'm not sure I would draw such a clear connective tissue between the two um I mean obviously a lot of wokeness stuff you know, a lot of woke stuff kind of derived from the 60s independent of desegregation. And it's interesting because wokeness is kind of pre, is, is in favor, is pro-segregation. Uh, again, just in a kind of opposite direction. So I'm not sure I would, I'm not sure I would say it's that. I think it's, I, I think it's, well, I've always said, I think it's the housing crash. And I think it's people losing faith in the systems that exist. So they look for alternative systems. And the alternative systems that exist are kind of like, you know, on the left, it's wokeness and the right, it's white nationalism. You know, uh, Rudyard brought up a really good point where that when people, when order fails, they look for a new order. And I think wokeness is a new order, white nationalism, new order, conspiracy is a new order, because the idea that we're all like manifesting under chaos, I think is more terrifying or un- our brains are unable to kind of process that. So we look for some new order to make sense of everything. 
Yep. Yeah, definitely. That's the paradigm shift Rudyard was talking about. Yeah. Uh, Lizzie does well specifically for twenty dollars. Says I think there being I think there's been good if depressing analysis of the current state of society. So what do you recommend we do about it? I don't think society can be fixed when citizens have an external locus of control. Well, I mean if that's the case, it's bad news because I'm pretty sure people had an external locus of control for like all of existence. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I don't know what the recommendation is. What is the recommendation? I don't I don't have one. That that is an interesting question if the internal locus of control was something that evolved later as kind of a cultural adaptation cuz I I mean I do just intuitively it seems right that more of the population had an external locus of control in the the fact that they thought, you know, gods were were controlling their lives. This happened or that happened. It was the work of the gods. So that's mm -hmm. very external locus of control. The the internal locus of control that you know really is spawned by an individualistic type of ethic. Seems like that's kind of late in the game. Well, it's also super weird because when we talk about locus of control, generally it's conceived of as like the right is the one manifesting the internal locus of control in terms of like pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, yes. life gives you what you put into it. And yet the the right is traditionally more religious. The, the religious side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's totally. super bizarre. Like how exactly did those two seemingly contradictory things manifest? I mean, I guess it's kind of like Height talks about how the right believes in karma. And so maybe that's how like those two contradictions kind of meet match or meet each other is that you're basically, you know, you're creating karma by putting, you know, good things in, in work into your life, essentially. Well, and the Christian narrative does seem tailor made to facilitate external locus of control. When you think of things like the Protestant work ethic or or the idea that we're imperfect and we need to struggle to improve ourselves to fight against sin sure. that's very much internal locus of control type stuff i guess you're right yeah because if you say that you're starting in a position that's sinful and you have to work to become saved yeah i guess even though it is that's an external all locus, you <laughs> well it's like well it's like an external locus of control that creates it's like since it's detached from physical reality it creates like the illusion of an internal locus of control yeah i guess the two are at odds with one another because right. there's the the world that's trying to lead you astray off of your path. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I, you know, I was thinking, you know, what, what Rudyard said kind of about the physical reality and no one's going to, very few people don't understand this, but I think it's true. I think the right are the people of physical reality and the left are the people of spiritual reality. And I think that's a lot of the contradictions between the two different uh, groups is trying to merge, you know, these very different ideas of reality together and not being able to do so. Well, and they both, the cover story for both sides is directly opposite. I mean, if you just superficially looked at the right, you'd say, look, they're all religious. Obviously, they're the spiritual ones. And you'd look at the left and you'd say, look, they're all atheists. There's no spirituality in there. Right. What I meant is in terms of he was saying that like the physical world is hard and difficult to change. And the spiritual world is like ephemeral and easy to manipulate. Right. And it's kind of like like that's kind of the worldview in which they're both operating. The left is like operating under this worldview that like the world is this fluid, very easy to change. Like you can just give someone the right words, teach them the right things, and everyone's gonna change and kind of agree with something. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, that's not really possible. Yeah. Um Soto for twenty dollars says I sent a few stream labs because it was too long to get out here. TLDR, I reject all this pointless black pilling. Oh, woe is us. And I hope all the black pillars sprain their backs in the process of sniffing their own farts. Well, I mean, listen, I, I hope even if you don't agree with sort of like the doom saying, you know, I think um, Rudyard says a lot of things that I think are true and are very knowledgeable. And I hope you can get other useful insights from our conversation beyond the doom saying part of it. If we are facing tough times ahead, I don't think ignoring the signs is a good way to go. I mean, I look, I, I, I tend to have a very realistic outlook of things. So 
I mean, this stuff could be nonsense. The the generational theory stuff could be complete nonsense. And it could yeah. be, look, we could be on the verge of putting together an AI that we type in, look, um, fountain of youth, where is it? <laughs> like, sure. And, you know, how do I make humans live to be 200 years old? And they could come up with some therapy. Like, we could be on the verge of something no, like that. No, yeah. I, I agree. You don't want to bury your head in the sand. Um, but you also have to be careful because as we talked about, you basically, we LARP ourselves into revolution. And so it's like, you could basically, like things could be not so bad and we could LARP ourselves into thinking they're much worse than they are. Well, look, uh, the LARPing I think is part of the problem yeah. because LARPing gives you the sense that none of this could ever happen. And yet we're literally talking about a world where people LARP themselves into catastrophe. Right. So I do think there is kind of this mismatch with the the stakes at hand here that I think are part of the problem. No, I agree. Um, Mark Twain's Revenge, thanks so much for $20. says, meanwhile, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where we own 220 apartments, we rent 1,400 square foot townhouses for 11,150 a month. And our tenants regular, or sorry, one thousand one fifty a month. And our tenants regularly leave to buy homes, and that city is literally surrounded by corn. That's great. Yeah, I wonder if you know, with a lot of the things where people talk about, like the cost of living and housing. I'm I'm wondering when we look at these charts because these charts are averages generally of like the country. I'm wondering if this. I mean, there's always going to be a massive disparity between cities and not cities, obviously. But I'm wondering if there's just some huge disparity, but like like the gap has increased between cities and not cities, like these big areas. And like maybe it's like these big areas are really, I'm not sure how it is in the not like not super populated, massive areas that everyone wants to live in. Like maybe it's totally fine in other regions of the country. So. I Did I share you with you? I Someone tweeted out something that showed the economic inequality is not as bad as some people say. Yeah, that's, that, that's what I'm talking about, because I've seen so many, like, I don't know enough about the data. I've seen so many charts that make these claims that it's not really as bad as people make out to be, and yet people all seem to have the perception that it's so bad, and I, I can't, I don't know what is real. Like, I'm not yeah, sure what's going on there. Their perception could easily be wrong. <laughs> right, <laughs> no, but, or the charts could be wrong. I just, I have no clue what's happening. Yeah. Or, and I, I was actually going to say this earlier, right but I forgot. Listen, I wouldn't be surprised, and it would be kind of funny to me if we're going to find out like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, that literally, you know, there's just a chemical that's making us all hyper anxious and upset with each other. Yeah. That we're all like ingesting. It's the like, you know, the, thing. yeah, like, you know, we had lead in the air for so many years, making everyone crazy. And then they're like, oh, obviously you shouldn't put lead in gas, right? Oh, you shouldn't put asbestos in the, the ceiling. Like, we're going to find out like, oh, well, obviously we shouldn't be putting corn syrup and everything. It makes you all super anxious. Like, I feel like there's going to just be, we're all kind of like hyper fixated on all these like very deep, complicated, psychological, ideological things. And we're going to find out, oh, we were just eating something that was making us all crazy. <laughs> like, and no one realized it. Yeah. Uh, Jay, I know. Jay for $20 says, a collapse at this current point in history would be irre ir irrecoverable. We've extracted all the easy... We've extracted all of the easy to access fossil fuels. If widespread collapse occurs, we may never be able to access oil again. Oh, well, that's not good. Mm. I do think um, regarding what you guys were talking about in terms of the interconnectedness makes it easier or harder for the world to collapse. Because um, I had heard that about the Browns Age too, that like they were so inter interconnected in trade and they required bronze for everything. That one one element of that collapsed, everything collapsed. I do feel like something that Scott Adams says, which I do think is very true, is he talks about the law of slow moving disasters, which is that humans are very bad when something quickly occurs. That's a disaster. People can be very bad at dealing with it. But no, if there's good something with on dealing it when it's a quick disaster. No, he says it's the opposite. Um, but he's saying if there's a slow moving problem that's a that's coming towards us, that we're very good at figuring out how to solve it before it gets there, or something that's ramping up slowly and getting worse and worse. And oh, worse. okay, so, okay. Um, and I do think that that is true. Um, and I do think so. I don't think I, I do think that America is working towards this. And even you know, Roger did say this, and I, and I do think you know this is true. That even if there was some problem, 
at least in America, maybe some other place in the world would be kind of screwed over. But if there was some problem with like Taiwan losing their chips or, you know, losing the grain from Ukraine or, or some, you know, losing the metal from Congo, I do feel like America in a lot of first world countries will be able to figure out a way to keep moving forward. I don't think there's going to be like this massive Bronze Age collapse because there's just so many mines you know, dealing with so many problems that, you know, even, like, even if we had to cut back on microchips, we would survive. I mean, it's not, you know, obviously we existed for thousands I of mean, years without microchips. Really? I'm not we sure. Would. Look. So, and I think we'll find, I think we're going to discover alternative ways to do all this crap anyway. So I think we'll be okay. Oh, I found the tweet. Gen X today is significantly wealthier than boomers were at about the same age. So it's it basically breaks down the amount of wealth people have at each age, and the generations are like right on track with one another. Mm -hmm. So really, it's people are poor because they're just at the age when everyone is poor. Right. I'll send you the tweet. You can look at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but that's the thing. I So I don't know if that's true or not, because obviously the perception says that that's not true. So I can't tell. Um, so I read that one. Cameraman 502 for $20 says the idea that life for peasants in medieval Europe was stone age because they only need to work less than 40 hours a week is laughable when unseasonable weather meant huge risks of starvation and most leisure time was upkeep. Yeah. And there was something, um, you know, I forget who sent this to me, um, but there, there was something about like a lot of the original studies that are kind of used to base off this idea that they had all this leisure time and everything. When I was kind of like looking through it, like the, what the guy was considering leisure time for hunter gatherers was like not leisure time. It was like food preparation, cooking, cleaning. It's like, it was like, what? Like, what? Ha like, what? This is insane. Like, it was just only talking about like the actual hunting and gathering process and not like the preparation or like the maintenance of living process which no one considers leisure time in my opinion number one leisure time is walking two miles to the well to get water for the day <laughs> yeah exactly it's like what um and then number two and it's funny because i tweeted this out i said you know because there was this graphic that history Seville's puts up and he's like oh you know back in the day you know they worked um let's see, well, let, me, let me bring up the graphic real quick it was like oh back in the stone age People worked limited uh, hours of four to six hours a day. And I'm like, how exactly do we know how long cavemen worked for, right? Did they find their like Flintstone stone planners like buried next to them that like, like, you know, they wrote out their day plan of like, well, it took four hours to hunt the mammoth today, right? Like, how do they know this? And when I was kind of like, people were responding to this and I was kind of doing a little bit of research on this. It seemed like most of this was guesswork based on um, hunter gatherer societies that still exist or existed, you know, 50 years ago. Oh, really? That's not a good metric. And I was like, and so it's funny. So I said this kind of in jest, but it's also, I feel legitimate. I said, um, I'm not sure why we would think people who never, who never made it out of the stone age would be a good model for people who did thousands of years ago. <laughs> like, I'm not sure, like whatever environmental circumstances, which allowed groups of people to exist in the Stone Age forever, essentially. Why would we imagine that those are the same environmental circumstances that would be replicated all throughout the world where people basically, I'm assuming, had to innovate or die? And that's why innovation occurred in those early days. So right. the whole thing seems really stupid to me. So there's like a survivor bias going on because- It is 100% a survivor's bias. Those yeah. people live in right. some climate that's just easy for them to maintain leisure hours and- yeah, exactly. The people who lived in the cold climate, they all died. <laughs> well, the cold or the desert or I don't know. I mean, I have I have no clue sure, yeah. what was going on in the rest of the world that would because yes, yeah, survivors bias is, is the perfect way because it's it's foolish to say, oh, the hunter gatherers of today or fifty years ago or even a hundred years ago would be the same, you know, that everyone like the rest of the world was operating under. It's very silly. Yeah. So um anonymous coward for oh wait i skipped one i skipped a couple i go back rotisserie protocol for 20 dollars says i'm convinced ai will never wipe out humanity because it will eventually recognize it needs something to validate itself humans are a great catalyst for that i mean i don't think ai will wipe out huma humanity because i just it's hard for me to imagine this idea of like the machines becoming their own independent conscious thing that want to live and do their never. own thing 
500 I, years from now, you don't think there's going to be sentient robots? A thousand years from maybe now, you don't thousand, think there's going to Yeah, maybe a thousand years. Look, it's hard I just, for me to imagine. That's why I'm asking you, just philosophically. Yeah. Like any, you just put a time on the timeline. A thousand, I mean, well, I think what's more likely is that we'll still, a thousand years from now, that we'll become like cyborgs. I don't think there'll be like android life and human life. I think everything will just be cyborg life. Look, I think really the the Fermi paradox, where are all the aliens at? Yeah. I think the aliens are probably everywhere and communicating in a technology that we are just unaware of. I agree completely. I, yeah. I do. I think there are going to be, there's going to be robots that are immortal. That's like our yeah, but they're evolutionary not robots. They're path. cyborgs. They're, they're biological beings mixed with cybernetic parts. Right. That's what I'm, look, I, think, I, I see that a, a thousand years. I don't see that as this. What is like, there's no even reason to make sentient robots. That would be like, there's no reason to even want that. The there is there's advantages and disadvantages to using organic material. The advantages is the organic material can replace itself. You know, obviously a robot that can heal and and do these those kinds of tricks that biological organisms do are useful. The problem is that they're very fragile. Like if you made something structurally stronger um then i think that's when okay. you get into the advantage of having a robot this is this is where your 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 leftism is, is showing okay leftism that's, yes look you, you're being more socialism. on the left no you being more on the left than me and me being like a super right winger okay um most people believe that there's some etherical essence of humans that exist, whether it be a soul, whether it be consciousness, whether it be whether it exi exists in some fashion, there's some magical thing that we don't know that exists that explains what makes us special. Um, even and I don't think that's really ever going to go away. So I I cannot conceive of in a thousand years of our culture basically saying, well, whatever makes humans unique biologically is just worthless. So now we're just going to not reproduce biologically anymore. We're just going to literally create androids based on our thought patterns that have no human parts in them whatsoever and that will be humans from now on i cannot conceive of humans ever being on board with that idea ever they don't have to be okay then i don't know what you're talking about then well the look first of all i'm sure you're willing to concede that some humans are on board with that i think they're in the gross minority if they're able to to embark on a project where they do this it doesn't matter if they're in the gross minority yeah, but they, well, it depends if they can, yeah, you're Look, right, if right they can now, do it. Right now you've got the transhumanists. destroyed. Look, transhumanist the trans is not what you're talking about, though. Right now you have the transhumanists, which yeah. just so happen to be most of the billionaires. Transhumanists You don't is think not that they have about. the resources to do this project without the consent okay. of me, most me, people who feel icky about it? Okay, let me lay out some terms and make sure there's no confusion here. Okay. So a cyborg is a human who's been modified with robot parts. Anything up from a robot arm to literally just taking a human brain and putting it in a robot body. These would all be considered cyborgs. Okay. I, I agree. I right. understand. That's the term, what transhumanists yeah. want. They no, want they want that's not yes, true. That is true. They want to be cyborgs. Okay. They want to be they want to live. They want their consciousness to continue forever into the future. That's what a transhumanist is is moving How from many, the biological to the robot. Who's your favorite transhumanist? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Androids are just saying, listen. We're just building a bunch of datas from Star Trek. Something that has no human parts in, in it whatsoever. It's just a complete artificial being. Who the fuck wants that to be the future of humanity? Who is your Why favorite would anyone want that? Who is your favorite transhumanist? Wait, wait. Why would anyone want that? Who is What's your the, favorite? Hold on a second. You're, you're my make, favorite transhumanist. You're right? making a wild claim here. Yeah. You're saying that all, transhumanists are only interested in being cyborgs and not being full robots. Mm-hmm. That's completely factually incorrect. Okay. I would say that Ray Kurzweil is probably the most well-known transhumanist on the mm -hmm. planet. He's the guy that literally came up with the singularity, the idea of the singularity. And he's laid out many different ways to gain immortality through some sort of technological advance. And did he just... Cybernetics or, or becoming a cyborg is just one of them.
Well, like wait, complete you... consciousness transfer into a robot is another way. That's still a cyborg. How is it? Look, if you could, if you could copy. You, by your, look, by your own definition, you just said a cyborg is a robot with biologics attached to it for some reason. Yeah. If you can copy digitally the mind and put the mind into a robot, you have zero biologics involved. Okay. How is that a cyborg? This kind of came up in a previous conversation we had earlier too. If it's like a copy of you, so like you lay down on a table, you put on the brain helmet, it mm -hmm. somehow copies your brain patterns and there's a robot that looks like you that gets up and now there's two of you, right? Then yes. first of all, I don't know why the fuck anyone would want that. But but number two, then I agree with you, that's an Android. But okay. if there's some way- that's, but, look, if, but wait, if there's some way- That's a way, transhumanist right there. Wait, that, okay. If there's some way to actually transfer transfer your consciousness into the robot, that's completely different. So that when you close your eyes as a human and you open your eyes as a, in, a, in a robot body and your body's laying there lifeless, that's a cyborg still because there whatever, is, there whatever is a way you to do has that. been transferred. There is a way to do that, but you're not going to like the technical aspects of it. Well, we, what do you, we don't know how to do that. What do you mean? Yeah, you just do lethal injection on the sleeping okay, body. That's, <laughs> okay, that's retarded. You're, you, you, you understand, and this kind of came up in the previous conversation, there's a substantive difference between copying brainwave patterns to digital and being able to transfer some essence of yourself into a digital uh, medium. Do you understand these are two very different things, right? Yes, but we okay. can talk about them both in the hypothetical very easily. No, no, I, and I'm I just, understand that, I'm but I don't... Saying, yeah. Our future, look, you, you, you're making a claim here. You're saying nobody ever is going to want to do this in any great numbers. I think that's just a wildly okay. inaccurate claim. A small number of people could want to do this with the resources to do it, and they could do it. They, they could I, I would be, succeed at accomplishing it. I would be very surprised if you had Ray Kurzweil or any you know billionaire or any of these people, and you said, listen... Here's your two options, okay? We can either transfer your consciousness to the robot or we can make a copy of the robot and then kill you. Which one do you think they're going to choose? Well, obviously they're going to choose to keep they're going to choose to live, but the Right. they're going to take the robot op option as well. Right, but that's why so that's why I just I don't understand why people would be Ray, pushing for this weird option. Ray Kurzweil is literally funded by Sergey Brin and I don't know what's the other guy's name for the Google guys. So he's he's got plenty of money to do all this kind of crazy research I, okay. in this realm. I understand that. I, I guess I don't understand why Why do you think that they would... Perf like, the only reason I would think this human copying thing would even be a thing that's discussed is because it would probably be much easier to do technologically than the transfer thing. That's the only reason I think it would even come up. I don't know why anyone would want to do that versus the transfer. I'm not even sure it would be legally allowed to do this copy thing. All the only, the only we've, what started this conversation was me just asking if you thought that there was going to be a Sentient human robots equivalent. Yeah. Yeah. At any time ever. And you s appeared to make the claim that no, because humanity would stop that. And I, then I said, that just seems like a wild claim that humanity would stop that because small well, numbers of people right. could engage in that. Small numbers well, of people are engaging in that project right now right. and no one's clear, stopping them. Right. To be clear regarding the super chat, I was referring to the near future because I could see a thousand years from now, a bunch of data is running around, but I do think humans are going to be very careful about creating sentient life that exists completely detached from biology because we've all had the idea of robots taking over basically implanted in our mind from the idea of robots existing, essentially. And that's not going to go away. Yeah, People I disagree. People are, are aware of this. And so, okay. I just And I just don't see, again, I think so much of what humans do is the quest for immortality. And I think so much of what the transhumanists do and what these billionaires are doing is they all just want to live forever, which is fine. But living forever as a copy that you that is not you is entirely different than you living forever. And that's what they really want at the end of the day. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Duke, New Duke Norton for $20 says, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? <laughs> S-Class is the best class that will revive the Roma. Um, I mean, I think about it, I don't know, once a week, maybe once a month. I, I don't I don't fit the everyday meme, but uh Rome is cool. I like Rome as much as the next pro next much as the next bloke. It's a funny meme. Uh, Anonymous Cow for twenty dollars says thoughts on Destiny's cringe inducing DC meet with Vosh and Emma. He mentioned not wanting to debate Rokana on minimum wage since it would be bad optics for Democratic Congress and to lose a debate so much for truth seeking. That's hilarious. I didn't see I haven't watched his conversation with Rokana. I only watched his conversation with some journalist whose name escapes me. The conversation was incredibly boring. Um, and at the end they go full delusional about not understanding the right. And that was the only part that was interesting was like the last five minutes. Someone I, on his channel, he posted, I think they're, they had like a VidCon or I thought it was VidCon or maybe it was just, they had some kind of debate presentation or something on a stage and the audio quality was so horrifically awful. I cannot listen to it. Yeah. I, which, I, I listen to like 30 seconds. Yeah. So. I just, oh my God. So <laughs> I don't know. Like what, out of I don't know what's said in that conversation. I haven't watched the Rokana one yet, so I'll check that out. But, um, I listened to more of the Rokana one, but not much more because it was just right. boring. One had right. bad audio and one was boring. I think there's three. So there's a third. What's the third one? Rokana was not the one that you, that we were talking about the DMs. I listened to all of Rokana and Jank. Oh, okay. So he talked to Jank. I don't know if before or after them, but right. Yeah. Um. Okay. But anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's weird to see them all interacting because they all kind of, well, I don't know how Vosh and Emin are, but I know they have all strong disagreements. So I know they're trying to do this, like, we're going to all agree together to, to try to get the Biden elected or something. But uh, Via Red for $20 says, rent control grandfathered in and restricted to newer properties might be good option. What do you think? I mean, my understanding is that rent control never works, um, that whenever it's been done and studied, it just never works ever so i don't think rent control is a solution i think the solution is just you have to massively incentivize building more and more and more property um i mean i guess you could do something to disincentivize people restricting property but i, I think that's the only solution is just to build more so do you agree adam uh what was that Rent control versus rent control just building is, more property. Rent control is terrible. Okay. Yeah. Because I just don't of, think it works. Look, the price level begins with wages. The idea that you can just take a product or service and set a price on it when wages continue to fluctuate is retarded. <laughs> so you're just you're creating a, a whole nother problem with any kind of price control. The, the the place to deal with prices is with wages. Right. And nobody wants to think of it that way. They're like, look. <laughs> yeah, it's Well, dumb. it's just annoying because everyone, everything that comes up about economics is so ideologically motivated. Um, so it's hard to always to see because when I've, I've read studies about price control that say they don't work, you know, maybe it's all right-wingers or something. Maybe the ones that all say it do work are left-wingers. You know, whenever I see people talking about uh, Nixon, you know, price controlling... And they say, oh, he actually made things really worse. You know, I, I don't know. Because I don't know enough about the under, like all the underlying facts to make a good conclusion. But there is a way that you can I'm price skeptical. control. I am skeptical of price controlling working. There is a way that you can price control, you, but you have to control the product. You have to have like enough of whatever product is you're trying to price control to actually create a price. Yeah. I mean, I, I think if we built more houses, massively incentivized building houses, got rid of, you know, here, here you go. Here, here's, here's the right wing. The give me for the right wing will be the, you know, limit lower immigration. Um, I think those would solve a lot of the issues. So, yeah. anyway, yeah. Look, okay. I don't, people are fundamentally against government getting into building houses, and I just. Well, I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying government. Why? Government. I'm just saying incentivize to build as much property as possible. So. Look, I just, 
for me, I, it, look, the private sector is not building enough houses because people want to control the price of housing. They're literally, you know, putting a thumb on the scale of the market. And if yeah. the government just stepped in and said, listen, we don't like you putting a thumb on the scale of the market. And we're going to, if you're not going to build houses, we're going to build houses. <laughs> Yeah. Then the private to... sector would step up and build fucking houses. They would. Sure. Well, actually, there's a problem now because go the government, government regulation is really the constraint. But not in yeah. all areas. Like Texas Lo doesn't have a lot of government right. constraint. Right, local government. Yeah. yeah. And supposedly there are, there's a lot of uh, innovation in terms of these, like making it easier for people to build houses in terms of making these like weird Lego houses that people yeah, prefabricated. Kind of, yeah. That are either prefabbed or like the pieces are prefabbed then people can kind of just like do it themselves and then hire, I guess. And all you need is an electrician and plumber, I guess, to like connect everything. Another so. Elon Musk business. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Did you know that? I did know that. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. That's why it's so funny that Elon Musk gets hit with being a right winger. Cause he's doing all this like very left wing <laughs> bleeding heart stuff. So I know it's hilarious. It's so crazy. Okay. Anyway, let's watch this video. This is uh, ContraPoints. Contra ContraPoints is talking to someone named Matt Bernstein, who I believe identifies as a gay male. And they're talking about LGBT conservatives. What's the deal with them? Right. Do you think, um, do you think they're going to have a good like foundational understanding of the deal with LGBT conservatives? Of course not. Okay. Look, I I start I didn't listen to much of this. Maybe I listened to 30 minutes or so. And I just it's fascinating. It's a it's a fascinating talk. I have plenty to say about it in terms of politics. What are your what are your big takeaways? Um I mean, it feels like a lot of not again, not understanding the left right divide at all. Like just the classic not understanding what motivates people to do anything. Um, they're both looking at this from a critical queer theory perspective of uh, and, a, and a conflict theory perspective. And I think it doesn't allow them to see what is actually happening. Yeah. So bad, bad model. Bad yeah. Bad world, yeah. worldview. People bad have a lens. problem. Very bad lens. People have a problem where very often they're talking to someone who's trying to convince them of something and they're trying to convince them using th like they're trying to be persuasive. So they're tailoring what they're saying to try to fit that person's worldview. And the person misconstrues it and thinks, well, that's that person's worldview. That's why they're doing what they're doing. When it's like, no, they're not telling you what's motivating them. They're telling you what they think will help motivate you because it fits into your frame. Right. So, cool. Let's anyway, check it let's out. Jump into it. Pretty. Thank you. And thank you for your very generous intro. So I wanted to start. Thank you for skipping that very generous in intro. You're <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Why'd you skip the intro? Because like two minutes and 30 seconds of like garbage. Just Fa fawning over yeah. contrapoints. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Today, uh, by showing you a video by a one Jeffree Star. So Jeffree Star, how would you describe Jeffree Star visually? Uh, visually, Jeffree Star is a femme queen. Like, what? Like, what? <laughs> like, there's not, there's not really any ambiguity about the gender presentation of someone who's in a full face of makeup, fake lashes, long nails, often like f f some kind of like Gucci <laughs> tracksuit, like his visual aesthetic does in no way shy away from signifiers of queerness. It's, it's loud. It's very. So what's a, what's a femme queen? What is this? You think I know? Sitch, I don't <laughs> know the terminology here. This Let's is one see. of the things that's femme. fascinating about this because it's just, it's like a window into people who just think completely differently than me. Well, what? it's weird. So on urban dictionary, it says femme queen means any male taking hormones and or sexual reassignment to live as a woman. But they're specifically not referring to Jeffree Star as that. They're referring to him as a, as a man who is gay and is but is using a lot of aesthetics to make themselves look very feminine. You know, makeup, long hair, all that stuff. 
Yeah, it's weird because it is a very, it feels very conservative to think, okay, this man dresses like a woman, so therefore they're trying to be a woman when the guy is just, no, I'm gay and this is what I like to do. I mean, I, I, yeah. Boy George wasn't trans. Right, right, right. I don't well, think Jeffree is... Star is trans. No, I don't believe Jeffree Star is trans. And that's the irony that I've always talked about with like non-binary and all the trans movement is that it's essentially seeding the argument to conservatives. It is. Of saying like, yeah, these are male stereotypes. These are female stereotypes. If you don't exist neatly in one of those boxes, then you're not one or the other. Right. Then you have a mental illness and you need to transition. <laughs> it's like, yeah. what? Or you have to identify as non-binary. Whatever right. That means. Yeah. Right. Very loud. A hundred yards. Right. <laughs> it's it, I feel like he was one of the first people to really do the like non-binary alien thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I think about how Jeffree Star presents. Um and it's it's so that that really shows you like how so much of fashion and aesthetic is just reactionary. Because it's like, oh, what is considered cool or attractive is to make yourself look like as bizarre and outside of the normative as possible. In that, in the queer aesthetic, yeah. Yeah, course. like, like I want to like make myself look like a gay alien. It's like, okay, why is that an appealing aesthetic? Well, but they're they're calling Jeffrey Star a conservative in this. Yes, yeah. Which is the weird thing. Well, supposedly, of course, I mean, I don't follow Jeffrey Star enough to know what's going on, but. And so Jeffree Star is on a podcast a few months ago, and he was asked about his feelings about pronouns. And so I'm going to show you a quick like 30 second clip uh, and let's watch it. I might into all the other bullshit. I think what other bullshit? The they and them. Yeah. And all that extra shit that we added during the pandemic because everyone mm. was so bored on their fucking houses. They just started to make up more shit and more, more shit. stuff, more stuff. Yeah. That's where the like, conservatives like me because I'm just real. Yeah, you There's do no have a conservative vibe to you. You're not them. You're trans, <laughs> you're male or you're female. And you're standing and on that. Get so mad when I say that. How are you a they? What the fuck does that mean? It's stupid is what it is. Yeah. But you need someone like me that looks like me to say it. Because if you say it, it turns into you're homophobic. You hate trans people. You hate gays. And it's just how you feel. You don't hate anyone. You just think it's stupid. So, so Jeffree that, Star is a turf. <laughs> When that person said that they um, had a conservative vibe to them, I think they were being sarcastic. I don't think they were being serious. Jeffrey Star was? No, the person interviewing Jeffrey Star. Okay. You don't think so? I mean, look at. Jeff well, I didn't like, catch that. Yeah, I didn't really. Like, like, look at Jeffrey Star. You're like, this person comes up to you. You're like, oh yeah, this person has a, a conservative vibe to them. No. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah right obviously not yeah but um but i mean it yeah it's i don't know it's weird because i know jeffrey star got canceled supposedly for doing bad stuff so maybe that's part of it or maybe maybe part of it's that they do have maybe they literally have some conservative moral foundations kind of like um caitlin jenner or maybe it's just i think with a lot of these people it's like everyone has their own line of what they think makes sense and then when they see someone go beyond it, they're like, this is stupid. And then it's like, oh, how dare you? You know, like you're allowed to call straight white people stupid. You're allowed to call like whatever this thing is stupid. But if you call my queer, you know, non-normative, whatever stupid, then you're a conservative. It's just, it's odd to me that anyone would look at this person and think this person has a line. <laughs> Well, they do apparently. The line is they're against they them pronoun. Which is just that's the that's why this is so amazing to me <laughs> because it's like yes, even this person has a line. I mean, everyone has a line, right? Whether they want to acknowledge it or not. Of course, yeah, of um, course. There's always a line somewhere. So they, but uh, they, can... they them pronouns. I mean, yeah. that's a, that's, I mean, a lot of people, that's not their line. <laughs> that's not their hill to die on. Sure. Sure. Them, you're trans, you're male or you're female. And you're standing and on that. So mad when I say that. How are you a they? What the fuck does that mean? 
It's stupid is what it is. Yeah. But you need someone like me that looks like me to say it. Because if you say it, it turns into you're homophobic. You hate trans people. You hate gays. And it's just how you feel. You don't hate anyone. You just think it's stupid. So what do you make of that? Well, I just know for a fact that he doesn't believe the things that he's saying. Because I remember 2018 or so, Jeffree Star was saying that they were any pronouns. Like... There was an era of like basically non-binary Jeffree Star. I think I made a video in 2019 that referenced Jeffree Star and I referred to him as a man, but a bunch of people in the audience corrected me. They're like, oh no, Jeffree's non-binary. You shouldn't say that he's a man. Um, and so I think it's a pivot. So, so, so the idea that all this new stuff, quote unquote, the pronouns and the they, thems, it was invented during the pandemic, <laughs> I know that he knows that that's not true, but he must feel that saying it to, that the audience will believe that it's true or the audience, at least even if they don't believe it's true, will still like hearing it. Right. And I mean, this is not going to be an episode about Jeffree Star, but it is worth noting he he's had this like kind of conservative nosedive rebrand thing where i feel yeah. like it's less about the makeup now and more about like he has a lot of guns and lives in wyoming and like farms yachts i saw the pink the pink beretta <laughs> the pink or what is that what is that gun is that what that gun called sorry I don't know, guns i think it's a beretta i i'm gonna google it yeah you should <laughs> fact check that one but it what's so fascinating about that too so the pink beretta I can't believe ContraPoints doesn't have a gun. Like anybody who's a celebrity who doesn't have some sort of personal protection, I just, I mm -hmm. wonder about. How, how can that not, how can you not have, how can you not be prepared, right? There's a lot, like, you know, the, like a lot of the left, it's weird. A lot of the left's brain rot on guns is like very troubling to me. Is terminal? Yeah, like, like I know. Like my parents are a good example. Like, you know, they're so like, oh my God, we can't, you know, they'll never allow a gun in their house. Right. Right. For any reason. And it's just so, it's like, and, and I, like I, I had that for like that debate with them. I talked about like, you know, I don't know, a couple of streams ago. And then they're giving me all like the BS about like, well, statistically, you know, you're more likely to, you know, get shot by some, by the bad guy if you pull a gun, like all this stupid crap. And I'm like, listen, okay. You're going to be in a situation where someone breaks in your house. You know, I'm going to roll that dice. I don't care what the statistics say. I'm not going to take it lying down. Like, it's just totally insane to me, this idea about not wanting to protect yourself. Yeah. Yeah, you jump out the window and you shoot him when he's coming out the front door. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, exactly. You know, but with Jeffrey Star, it's, it's just, it's, it's weird because like, I don't, believe jeffrey star is doing a right-wing pivot in terms of trying to like win over the right-wing audience or something it's just like so, that's obviously yeah. not what's happening here so. that is the brain rot part of the the podcast here they cannot conceive of someone actually having opinions different than them without yes. being some sort of right-wing grift some sort of opportunity to make money off of right-wing people Right. It's so right. weird. Yeah. Like maybe Jeffrey likes guns. Yes. Maybe Jeffrey thinks non-binary legitimately is stupid. I don't know. Maybe no. Jeffrey's tired of getting harassed in public. Right. Or maybe Jeffrey's just a dumb idiot. Probably. They're probably just a retard who just does who stupid stuff. Who knows? <laughs> it's just so weird. That's like the only way that they're capable of understanding right. the right wing. I mean, and, and they're just, doing it to grift. You know, you, you look at someone like Jeffree Star who, you know, they have this like really bizarre androgynous look that they intentionally do to themselves. Okay. Um, they're tatted to hell. Like their entire like arms, chest, everything's covered in these like mismatch of tattoos. You cannot, and this is what's always bizarre to me about a lot of the queer aesthetic. You look at someone like Jeffree Star. And you know what's the first thing that pops into my mind? And the first thing that pops into like any person's mind who's not in the queer spaces? They say mentally unhinged. <laughs> or I'm sorry, <laughs> that's too strong. Mentally unsta unstable. This is not a stable person, okay? You look at someone like Jeffree Star and you're like, this person is not in a mentally stable place, right? 
I don't know. How do you know? Okay. I'm going to send you a picture. No, I, I mean, they showed a bunch of pictures. I know what Jeffree Star right. looks no, I just like. wanted to bring it up for, like, everyone to look at. Okay. But, yeah, I can do that. Right. But, I mean... There is kind of a branding thing that's going on here too. Like, do we know that we know who the real Jeffrey Star is? Whenever we encounter Jeffrey no. Star, we're encountering the brand. That's, we're not that's encountering right. Jeffrey Star. For all I know, you know, he hangs out with his mother ninety percent of the time. Sure, sure. But that's what's interesting to me. Even if it's all a persona, is that the persona of mental instability is popular <laughs> to some yeah. people. Look. Uh, this is this is probably why ContraPoints is so angry because Jeffrey Star is is uh, getting a piece of her brand here, right? Her brand is mental sure. instability, right? Well, like, look, just did you bring up the picture? I'm in the process of okay. doing that now because, yeah. like, I'm just saying, like, if I'm listen, I'm not saying anyone should be bigoted or biased or anything like that. I, I'm certainly, I certainly don't believe you should be. Um, and if I sat down the lunch with this person, I wouldn't be an asshole to them. But I'm just saying, I think the average person, you sit down at a lunch table and you stand across this person, you're like, oh, this person, there's something going on here, right? <laughs> there's some problem <laughs> that's going on here. It's just, I'm not thinking this is like a happy, well-adjusted person in society when I, when I look at this individual and how they've chosen to present themselves. Now, it could this could be a bad... Um, Q, because obviously this is a person who is famous and becoming famous makes people go insane. <laughs> and especially if they become famous for looking kind of odd, then they can specific, then they could definitely lean heavily into that as they become more and more famous. So this could all be like very bad proxies for anyone who's not famous at all. So we always have to be careful, I think, when kind of like uh, taking famous people's behavior and kind of putting it onto anyone else's, you know, spreading it out to other like non-famous people's behavior. But I do look at this person and I do see you, I think you see one of two things. You see either mental instability or like kind of, as you were saying, it's all just a showmanship, right? It's a person who's just putting on a show. It's not real. Yeah. I don't know. That's why, look, if you, Look, I'm sure you've heard of the band Kiss, right? They do concerts in full makeup and stuff. Right. If you sat down to lunch with Kiss and they're wearing their makeup, you're like, okay, this person's unhinged. But I yeah, don't but necessarily think that's a normal, their normal yeah, but that's, aesthetic. That's the difference, though, is that, you know, we all know what Gene Simmons looks like without the makeup, right? Like all right. these guys, they walk, they're not walking around doing their daily life looking like Kiss, looking I like can't. normal people. Right, but I at some point, Jeffrey Star goes to the grocery store, looking like a normal person. I don't like, think that's true. I think Jeffrey Star is always in Jeffrey Star mode. I, okay, so look, it's I I don't know enough about this person to know to mm -hmm. know if that's the case. If this person would never go out of the house if they weren't in full makeup. I mean, they have like a face tattoo. <laughs> well, look, that uh, you don't have to take on and off. So yeah. look, if Kiss did the full face tattooed instead of just the makeup. Okay, we're having a conversation. Right. I mean, they have I'm... a face tattoo. They've also, it, it looks like they've done fa like uh, female facialization surgeries and things of that nature. So, okay. I don't know. I just, I think it's much deeper than Kiss, the band. I would I would literally have to talk to them. I agree. To I agree. get some sort of separation from where's the, what's the brand and what is the real you. But yeah. I don't even think you could have that conversation without them. I mean, they're not gonna they're not gonna admit that the it's a branding thing. They're gonna say this is my authentic me and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But sure. But it's, I mean, what does that mean? Well, uh, you'd have to have them talk to a psychologist and say, like, do you suffer from, like, w when you say unhinged, does that mean they do unhinged behavior that's, like, illegal or, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I Look, I tolerate a lot of crazy people in my life just because I find them interesting. Should we continue or? Yeah, hit it up. Is that the name? 
Yes, I'm correct. <laughs> yeah. Jeffrey Starr, when he shared that he got this customized gun, which I guess in in the gun world is like a big deal that like this gun company made him a hot pink handgun. See, this is just, this is a branding opportunity. They probably paid him half a million dollars to take this gift. Yeah, probably. And if he showed up in not Jeffrey Star mode, <laughs> and he just showed up like... Look, he looks like the dude from The Big Lebowski. He's got his bathrobe on <laughs> and his slippers. Like, what the fuck? Right. We made this pink gun for you and you show up like this? Right. How dare you? Well, I didn't want them to think I was unhinged. Look, I'm getting a gun. <laughs> I got a beverage here, man. And it's funny because, like, they're talking about this being conservative. When I know that they both know that, depending on the time period... You know, a like a very queer person with a pink gun that's like got like a it has you can't see it from the picture, but it has I think Jeffrey's like eyes on it or something. You know, <laughs> it's like that would be like the most like queer stuff ever in like you know the 1980s or you know in like the right time period that would not be conservative at all. This is like the best scene for a movie where there's a very very conservative character and somebody breaks into the house. And he can't get his gun safe open. So he, there's only one gun in the house. And it's like the pink Jeffree <laughs> Star gun. And he's like morally conflicted. He's like, oh my God, I have the robbers I have to deal with. And then but I'm right going to look like a, a putz with this pink gun. Right. And as they're being conflicted, Jeffree Star comes up from behind and knocks him over the head with a Bud Light bottle. <laughs> exactly. I'm making them unconscious. There you go. Exactly. And they're like, ha, the pink gun gets him every time. <laughs> they steal the gun from him. Anyway. Was Jeffree Star the one breaking in? That would be no, good. No, no. The gun company posted it to their Instagram. And there were thousands of comments being like, the gun world has gone to shit. You know, we're like caving to the woke mob and the fags and the this and the that. And it's like, wow, like. Jeffree Star, as much as you're trying to appeal to these people, this is their reaction. Guns have gone woke. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right, too, because they're assuming it like, why are they assuming Jeffree Star is doing the gun thing to try to appeal to the right when it's more likely, as you said, Beretta's paying Jeffree Star to try to appeal to woke people or something. Yeah, it's completely <laughs> opposite. Yeah. And not only this idea that you can look at the comment section and think, okay, look, conservatives absolutely hate you. Why are you right. why are you trying to appeal to them? I mean, some conservatives hate them. Some conservatives are, you know, some conservative women are probably gonna buy a pink gun. The right. and that argument completely transposes to the left. Look, counterpoints can't come out with a video with a bunch of people on the left hating her for everything right? right nitpicking everything that she does so i mean everyone's going to have their haters it doesn't mean you know when there's a lot of haters that come out look all of these personalities on the left have been canceled two or three times by people on the left mm -hmm. does it mean that their people on the left hate them for their identity right i don't think that works so it says um Jeffree Star has moved to Wyoming in 2020 and they bought a bunch of guns after that. And they said that 95% of their audience comments were positive, but Beretta saw some controversy. Star said it ruffled a lot of feathers, likely old men and maybe Republicans who don't understand that I'm a free spirit. I mean, <laughs> does that seem like you're really trying to like suck up to the right? If that's your comment on it, that doesn't, doesn't track, doesn't track to me. Not really. Um, yeah. Right. Because I mean, like, so this is what the, this is, and this is it's funny because this actually goes completely into the queer aesthetic. Uh, Jeffrey Sarr says, I love random stuff. I like fashion and makeup, but I also like pinball. I like things because they're not normal. I have a flamethrower from Elon Musk, the boring company. I have a gold plated Russian AK 47. I like collecting badass things. People make guns and certain things, certain things seem scary, but it's so normal. So, I mean, it's funny, like, Jeffree Star is literally attracted to guns from a queer aesthetic purpose that they just 
don't understand because things have been politicized. Right. Because they're different, unusual. Is it true that the uh, Beretta 92 is the gun of choice for Jack Stryker, Adam? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sad. The wokest of, uh, of, of assault weapons. So today, as you, the listener, may be able to tell from the title, we're going to be talking about queer conservatives. And that may sound incredibly niche. And a lot of times when I bring this up, this topic up to people who are not as online as you or I probably are, they often are like queer, like, you know, gay Republicans, trans Republicans, that's, that doesn't make any sense. And I agree, but they do exist. And we're in a moment in time where I do feel like there is a genuine fracture among different political groups of queer people that is worth talking about. You know, we have these hashtags that are popping up lately, hashtag gay, not queer, hashtag LGB without the T. I almost said LGBT, LGB without the T. This group called Gays Against Groomers, which is which are which are just gay people whose entire political identity is furthering the kind of like groomer libel against us. And I do think it's worth talking about, um, not only because I like you know, disagree with who these people might vote for come election time. But I think the idea of a conservative queer person, like there's a lot to learn there. Well, can I say, I, I, I love I love that you say that when you bring up the topic of LGBT conservatives, people scoff at it like that makes no sense. Yeah, it makes no sense because people don't make sense. Like when has people's political behavior ever been universally rational? Like never. Um, I, I don't know. I really think awareness should be raised that this is a thing because it's, it's, so it's a little annoying to me. And I hear people who will say like, yes, people are irrational actors and their political behavior makes no sense. Um, but that but only me, applies to people on the other hand. <laughs> yeah. But it only applies to people that vote on the right. For some reason, everyone on the left is like a rational actor behaving in a rational <laughs> I fashion. Know. And it's like, well, how does that work exactly? All Look, the they under the, the only difference is they understand the reasoning yes. on the left. They don't understand the reasoning on the right. Right. So it appears yeah. irrational from that perspective. Yes. People on the right look at the left and go, look at all these irrational, insane people. <laughs> right. Who have been guilted into voting for some awful thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Look, you tell them that the you scare them with the white privilege stick, and look, they'll vote for anything. Right? That's rational. <laughs> I mean, I think there's a lot of people who are gay or trans who have uh, right wing moral foundations and right wing moral intuitions that essentially guide them towards the Republican Party, but they're just gay and trans, and that's the only like thing that's different. And so it kind of puts them at this weird crossroads. In terms of like, obviously, the Republicans have been seen as and you know, have been obviously and still are far less accepting of gay and trans stuff than the Democrats. But that doesn't get rid of those moral intuitions. Right. And a lot of these um, gay and trans conservatives, they basically what they want to do is they want to they want to sort of bridge a divide where their moral intuitions can be satisfied. They can still be conservative and yet you know, uh, fight back against the, like they, I think, I think what's going on is they believe this would be my guess. They believe if they could just fight back against like the, what they consider the insane queer stuff, then conservatives would accept gay and trans people. And then they'd be ha They wouldn't feel like they're a contradiction or they wouldn't feel like they have conflicting, uh, moral intuitions with their identity. That'd be my guess is what's happening. The, the gay conservative people are thinking that. Yeah. If we could eliminate the like awful woke queer stuff, then conservatives would be accepting of like nor quote normal gay. Yes, and, and I normal trans. I one hundred percent agree with you. Yeah, right. Their then, their yeah. perception is. I look. I I would like to think that that is true, but I'm not sure that it is. 
Well, like that it's happening or that they would accept them? That they would accept them. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I've seen a lot of real homophobia on the right. Well, I think there would be, I think it's true-ish in terms of, I think there would be significantly more acceptance. And I think pre-wokeness, it definitely seemed like acceptance for gays on the right, obviously on the left, but on the right was increasing too. And it just definitely seemed like acceptance for gays were just increasing, 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 increasing. Um, and I do think wokeness has kind of done to the, the LGBT community the exact same thing it's done to the like the race relations. It's made everything worse because it basically, you know, for years and years and years, the right said, hey, we can't allow uh, gay marriage. We can't allow gay people because at the end of the day, it's going to end with a bunch of weird stuff where they all want to bang children and do a bunch of creepy shit. Right. right. That was always the argument. Slippery and slope. Classic slippery, slippery slope. slope argument. Right. Right. There's always a slippery slope argument. And right. people on the left or people that were in favor of gay rights would say, no, 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 no. We know, promise we won't overreach. Cross right. our there heart. Will, yeah. <laughs> right. There won't die. be overreach. Right. And then, and so then what happened? <laughs> yeah. And so then what happened is you had a bunch of um, like insane uh, leftists who are like in favor of destroying society, or in favor of destroying normativity, who don't usually are younger so they have no um they're like incredibly privileged in that they have no conception of like the culture war fights that basically got them the rights that they have right. and so they're willing to basically toss them to the wind to just say yes let's just go for broke let's just go to this insane place and then all the right wingers to the point say aha see we told you slippery slope yeah, they don't realize what they're risking. They really don't. Yes, they don't. It took a long time for gay people to be able to live out in the open. Yes. Not, not live in the closet, as they used to say. Yes. And all of all, wokeness pretty much puts that all at stake. Look, I'm, yep. not, I'm not in favor of those. I'm not in favor of you know, gay, gay rights being limited. Yeah. But right. I look, I'm not, I don't control society. I'm one person. Right? right. Right. And I do fear a backlash that will prohibit a lot of gay rights. So, I mean, that's yeah. a, that's a, a possibility that I don't think people are, are aware of or, mm -hmm. you know, they don't, no, I they, agree. they don't think it could happen. I, They're yeah, kind of I think, Pollyanna about. I think what's important to think about is that I don't think slippery slope works the way people think it does in terms of um, like people tend to think of slippery slope like there's some intentional subversion by someone to try to get you to the, like the extreme point, which I mean, obviously there are people like that, right? There are obviously people that are doing that. You know, we watched Hassan essentially saying that he's doing that for socialism. But I think broadly what happens is it's just a generational shift. You have the next generation come in. They're not really, they were not alive or cognizant of the fight of the previous generation. They've grown up in some privileged time accepting whatever rights they currently have as like the gospel of reality. And so they're not really afraid to gamble and lose those rights because they've never experienced not having them. Right. Yep. It's actually not a niche thing. Like people think that it's a niche thing, but it's a lot of people. It's a sign. I mean, if, if you add up, it's probably a significant percentage of LGBT people are conservative. And uh, I mean, there's a long history of it. They, they used to be called log cabin Republicans. We're going to get into the log cabin. Republicans. Okay. <laughs> They're not escaping us this, this hour. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very common. I don't know if you want to bring this up, Adam. Uh, Carl sent this to me. Uh, he wants you to know that the gun you used in Social Justice Detective is a Beretta. It's the same gun, or I don't know if you, I'm assuming it was yours a real gun or was it a, a fake gun? It's a prop gun. It's a prop gun. Your prop gun was the same model gun as Jeffree Star's pink gun. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so there you go. That's great. There you go. Oh, whoops. I sent it to Dr. Diller for some reason by mistake. Well, there you go, Dr. Dylan. <laughs> well, now he knows too. Now he knows too. Okay. And like you say, it kind of, there's a million versions of it. It kind of exists at every level. And it does seem to overlap with this desire many queer people have to create 
a new dichotomy between the normals and the freaks. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so you, yeah, these days it's a lot of LGB without the T or drop the T, a lot of cis gay people trying to throw trans people under the bus, but the distinction gets like way more fine than that. Like, I mean, if just like within the lesbian community, you have like femmes trying to throw butches under the bus. You have like, I mean, like any version of this you can imagine exists. Yeah. And I feel like if you're a queer person listening to this, you've probably witnessed it in some level. Like I know within the gay yeah. male community, like the mask, the quote unquote, like mask, masculine gays do it to the feminine gays where they're like, yeah. well, if you just tried to fit in a little harder, maybe you wouldn't be gay bash. So the problem is actually you. And yeah. And, and gays doing it to trans people, trans people who pass doing it to trans people who yeah. don't pass, trans people doing it to non-binary people. And, and, you know, it's not. The problem is attitude. And it kind of annoys me because it's like, it's like when you say, hey, hey, lady, um, maybe you shouldn't walk outside wearing a dress so short that if you like a, like the slightest of breeze or if you have to like bend over even slightly, your ass and thong are hanging out and your tits are hanging out. And maybe it's not a good idea to walk outside in an unsafe area wearing this like this outfit. Right. right. And they say, whoa, you shame her. <laughs> yeah. Are you victim blaming me? And I'm like. No, I'm not saying that you're at fault if someone sexually assaults you. I'm just saying you shouldn't behave. If, like if you're trying to avoid trouble, you shouldn't do that action. Like like women don't go to parties and get blasted drunk. How like, dare you, Sitch? How dare you? Society but, needs to bend over backwards. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like okay. I'm not saying it's if you get blasted drunk and pass out. I'm not saying it's your fault if someone you know sexually assaults you. But I'm just saying if you want to be, you know, safe, if you want to take responsibility and try to in increase your odds of safety, you shouldn't be engaged in these specific behaviors. If you're driving your car without a seatbelt, right, and someone else, it's not, and you're driving perfectly safe, someone else could still hit your car and make you die, right? You can still fly out your windshield, your door opens and you flies out because you you're not wearing your seatbelt, your doors are unlocked, you fly out of the car, right, and die. Like, and you're like, well, are you victim blaming me? It's like, well. I mean, it wasn't your fault that someone crashed into you, but you should take, people need to take precautions in their life. Yeah, it's weird because obviously you're having to tiptoe all around this topic just so people can't throw an accusation of victim blaming at you. Well, okay. no, there's, there's a difference between vic victim blaming is saying you were asking for it or you deserved it, as opposed to saying, well, no. I'm not saying that, but you well, should still point, teach people that are asking for it though. They don't deserve it. I'm not going to go that far, but I mean, look, if you yeah, get blasted sure. drunk and pass out in the street, <laughs> like in a bad neighborhood and you're literally going to stay there all night long, like at some point you got to say that that wouldn't have happened if you didn't do that. Right. Yeah. But okay. But wait, let's, let's, this is an important distinction. Okay. If someone gets some lady gets blasted drunk and passes out in the middle of a bad neighborhood. Okay. Right. I would not say they're asking for it unless they literally had the intention to get blasted drunk and pass out in that neighborhood. Right. Right. Like if they're just out with friends and they're just getting wasted because they're not thinking about it and they just happen to pass or they ha happen to pass out, they're not asking for anything. They're just not cognizant and being an idiot. Right. And that, that's the distinction to make in this. And that's what I'm saying. So Asking have... for it is like a tough, that's a tough phrasing because obviously it doesn't, usually when people say you're asking for it, they don't really mean you're literally asking Yeah, for they mean it. you're doing something that's highly irresponsible. Right. That you're basically tempting fate. You're tempting fate. That's a right. better, better phrasing. And yes. Mia, you're right. You, you sh We shouldn't use the word asking for it because the connotation of that, especially around sexual assault, is so bad and right. muddled. Um, because it has been used as an excuse to basically excuse uh, sexual assault per, uh, pep perpetrators, people that were right. doing the sexual assault. And so, yeah, we should talk about tempting fate is a much better, better way to say is that like, yeah, people should not be walking around tempting fate. And I think yes. we can teach people to not tempt fate, but also try to improve society. Like theoretically, it would be nice if we could live in a society where a person could be blasted out drunk pass out in anywhere in the entire country and there would be no fear of sexual assault like right. that would be wonderful i would we should be working towards a society 
Right. But until we get there, <laughs> we should also be teaching people to not be tempting fate on an individual level. Yes, very much so. It's a weird thing, though, because we're such an individualistic society. Nobody wants to tell anybody, oh, you shouldn't do that. Like right. As soon as you tell someone you shouldn't do that, then all of a sudden you're the bad guy. You're like, yeah, you shouldn't get blasted drunk and pass out naked in the street. What? Why are you trying to cramp my style here? This is me. I'm a, this is my authentic self. Right, right. Um, Blaine's Escape Corner for $20. Thank you. Says, when I worked at the gun shop, I sold tons of pink and rainbow guns. Because if you use it in defense and get pulled in the court, imagine a lawyer holding up a pink gun saying, is this the weapon that shot the deceased? <laughs> That's actually... I wonder if there's been some psychological study on like if you use a pink or rainbow gun in self defense, are you more or less likely to to be found uh, innocent? Because like if, if you have if like there a pink... was everyone would, they'd be flying off the shelves. Well, no, not not necessarily because like a lot of people they want the cool gun that's got like the camo on it, right? Or it's like all black or steel or something, you know, like. Because that a jail know. free card with the color of your gun is pretty hard to resist. Well, no, I'm just saying, like, I, I would, I would intuit. I don't know if this is true. I would intuit that if you were, I mean, I don't know how often it happens, but I would intuit that juries would look at someone. And it's, and it's like a self defense situation too, um, who's claiming they, that they shot someone self defense and they have some pink rainbow gun because that's going to put out of your mind that this is a person walking around looking for trouble, right? Right. Like if they got like the Rambo you know, uh, camouflage on their gun. Yeah. You might be more likely. Yeah. You high. might be more likely to believe like, Oh, this is a vigilante. Right. Right. Pink gun. You're going, this is not a vigilante. Yeah. So. Not everyone within any of these groups who does this, but like you said, it's a lot of people. And the reason to me that this is worth talking about is I think we can learn about why people don't behave in ways that are like politically rational i think we can learn a lot about shame anyone who anyone who doesn't vote or think exactly like me just irrational completely <laughs> irrational yeah. just asked at like, uh some people levels of stupidity off the <laughs> charts just and the levels of hubris like oh i am obviously the intelligent person here of course, of course. It's funny because in a different context, this person would probably make a an argument about how people who are raised with a certain religion obviously believe that religion, right? It's not really true, but they believe that because that's what they've been taught. Mm -hmm. But they never stop to think, wow, I was raised progressive. Hmm. <laughs> I wonder if all the things I was taught were true. Ah, no, let's not think about it too much. Let's move on, right? <laughs> Shame, scapegoating, the need for validation from people who will never give it to us. So I did want to lay just like a teeny tiny bit of historical groundwork because I was doing some research for this episode and I learned that the basic thing that we're going to be talking about today has gone back to like pre-Stonewall. And that is that there have been in the gay movement, you know, now we call it kind of LGBTQ movement, but it was originally just the gay movement or like the homophile movement. There were two basic strategies for how gay people. What? I've never heard the term homophile. Homophile? What Someone Dude, what who is loves that? the gays? Homophile like, movement. Like instead of a homophobe. They're homophile. All of these all of these new words. Oh, I guess homophile is someone who loves gays, right? If homophile, a, homophobe... a, gay, a person active in supporting the rights of gay people. Okay. That's the Look, worst. Sitch, oh you're God. a homophile. I had no I know, idea. I was going to say, that's the worst branding of all time. What are the gays thinking? That's Look, awful. Who wants to be called a homophile? That sounds Look, terrible. I, I, support, I support gay rights. I support gay marriage. As soon as you call me a homophile, I'm out. Th those things are on the table now. Like, I, like, I might withdraw my support at any minute here. Look, don't so, call me a homophile. Oh, I sent you a DM. But um, it said in the 50s and 60s that homophile kind of came out in the 50s and 60s to be like people advocating for gay rights. And I mean, that's just, that's the worst branding of all time. 
I don't know what the, I don't know what they were thinking. Come on, gays. You're usually better at branding than this. This is bad. Uh, Twitter socks for twenty dollars says it's really funny how the crowd that says quote birth control should be free says that preventing a bad situation from occurring is victim blaming. Both are preventions, right? But makes dressing like uh, a salute appropriate. Yeah, I mean, essentially, I think a lot of the victim blaming stuff is people just they're just using it to justify whatever behavior they want, essentially, and then it, that obviously the consistency of the argument falls away when it comes to something they don't care about or don't want like limiting birth control. Birth it's too bad that we don't have a bisexual to talk to us about this because <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not, look, I'm, I'm straight. I'm like, I'm technically super straight. So, uh -huh. and Sitch, I think you're super straight too. So I like, am. Yeah. If I'm we had someone that straight. could, if we had someone that could join the call that was actually bisexual, <laughs> they might be, they might help us. They could give us some insight. Into yeah. You don't know anyone we could reach out to, do you? Uh, maybe. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll see. I'll see if... Uh, well, think about it. Think about it. If here. someone... Yeah, think yeah. about it. If you have any bisexual friends, if you guys in the chat know of anyone bisexual that might like... Right, right. ...could come in and give us their perspective. Is Dev really bi, or is he just straight and he likes uh, uh, see, trans, look, that's, trans look, girls even, and uh, femboys? That's something I don't even know. Look, yeah. I, I can't... I don't even know if if Dev is technically bi. Look, if Dev has like, like if he's given a blowjob, let's just, I think we can call him by, okay? <laughs> like, I'm, where's, where's Dev in my DMs? I'm gonna ask him this I'm comfortable. Look, I'm comfortable. If you're a guy and you've given a blowjob, I'm comfortable calling you by, okay? Dev, okay. are you by, by and have you ever given a blowjob? Look, I, this is, he's going to answer back that he's given a blowjob to a, a female penis. So it's not, it's technically straight. I, it's going to be, listen, it's confusing. I know. Well, uh, this is the wacky world we live in now. Figure it out, all right? Try to get look, to the Look, I, I guess, it. look, if you don't, if you don't want to be called gay or bi and you're out there sucking, <laughs> blowing lady penis, look, I'm trying to be, trying to be sensitive here. Right. Look, I don't want to be called a homophile, so I'm, da I, under I get it. <laughs> I get it. I I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Guys, you're straight in my book, okay? <laughs> you're not super straight, but you're straight, okay? You're straight enough? <laughs> straight well, no, su Super straight. Don't you remember super straight is the meme about yeah. people, uh, about being straight but not wanting to have sex with trans women, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe super straight is actually useful here because if you're just straight, <laughs> you're, in de you're in Dev's position, right? Right, right, right. He's just straight. Yeah, he's straight, but not super straight. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think femboy is pushing the... I don't think you're straight when you get to femboys. I think that's... Push, pushing the line? I think that's pushing the line. Sitch is so conservative. I How can't does our token you. bisexual feel about this? I feel like Zoom is cursed and recorded, <laughs> and I hate it. What? Hold on, Sitch, you know, really? You know, oh my God, welcome, Rags. Do you know the inc incredible pressure that you put me on when <laughs> you're like, oh, holy, we do a hey, 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 and then <laughs> I'm sitting here, and I get a link, and I click the link, and then Zoom takes 17 minutes to open. I'm like, okay, this is strange. I know it's not my fucking supercomputer. <laughs> Zoom is just being slow. And then it opens up, and I'm like, well, let me check my settings just to make sure. And it crashes because it can't handle opening the settings. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> Well, let's go back to the link. And I click the link again, and now Zoom's like, no, we're doing something different this time. I want you to log in. <laughs> and I'm like, log in? I don't know my login. Shit, I didn't have to do that before. Let's close it and try again. And the third time, it's like, we want you to log in, but also don't worry about it. Here's the room. <laughs> and so I go to the room, and I'm like, okay, I finally made it in. Hooray. See, well, look, welcome. you just had to keep clicking it, and it just works. Yeah, Zoom's great. It's really, yeah. it, Zoom's really good. I really like it. Hey, listen, we had... Uh... What if all hissed on? And he had someone mowing the lawn outside. And we couldn't even hear it. Can't audio do that crystal, on Discord. Yeah, crystal oh. clear audio. Well, on Discord, Discord has noise cancellation. It sucks. Anyway, no, all right. We, it's pretty what's good. Your, what is your perspective on this? Rumor has it you're actually bisexual, Rags. That, those are the rumors. I won't confirm okay. or deny them. This is all alleged. Everything that I say in this <laughs> podcast is alleged. <laughs> alleged. Okay. This is all alleged. Just for right. the record, all of this is alleged. Mm -hmm. Um. 
I think I was listening to uh, kind of throughout your conversation with what a fault hist, and that was an interesting conversation. He seems like an interesting fellow. Yeah. Um, and then you, you started talking about, I guess, the main topic, and it got to the the recent gun parts, the uh, the the um the like the pink gun. I, I forget which kind it was. Bread is a company, so a Beretta can be all kinds of different things, but um, the, the the pink gun, right? A ninety-two and, Beretta. In the uh, Beretta 92, yeah, uh, like an FS or an, yeah, something like that. Um, but they, they were um, talking about the gun and, oh, I got a pink gun. And, oh, you think you're going to win people over. And some people are bitching about how the guns are getting woke now and everything. And I'm thinking, well, let's assume that that's all true. Let's assume that a lot of conservatives or gun people or whatever don't really like this idea of i guess pink guns or whatever even though they've been around you go into any gun store and there's going to be a pink gun oh, or yeah. two there's going to be a couple pink guns or like a, a, a light blue one a, a ladyish color because it's more whatever and because sometimes guys bring in their wives or girlfriends and they're like hey let's get you a gun or whatever and then so you know people do that sort of thing but i'm thinking well a lot of the stuff is incremental right if you ask a lot of people today who are fine with gays and gay marriage and stuff like that a lot of conservative christian types and really really whoever i wonder if you would have said well decades ago how did you feel about it things take time and attitudes take time to change and writing off one side as oh they'll never like us is already admitting defeat not just Great in your point. own ability to um, get points across or to normalize things but People really are willing to accept new things if you present it to them in an often um, unceremonious way. And I think that with um, I think think back to the 90s and early 2000s. Well, I, I would say non-confrontational. Like, yeah, non-confrontational yeah. is a good way to put it. Back in the 90s and the early 2000s, right, was, you know, race wasn't on everyone's mind back then. It was very matter of fact. My parents, when I was growing up, never gave me a talk about race. And so I grew up just thinking, oh, some people are just, they just look different. Some people have big noses, small noses. Some people have bigger, small ears. Some people are tall. Some people are short. Some people are black. Some people are white and blue, green and everything. And it was just so matter of fact that it was not even worthy of really talking about. And I feel with the gay issue, right, it's probably very similar. If you're not going out here and looking insane and saying terrible things and sensationalizing everything, and you're just really, you really are doing the thing of we're just like you, but gay, we're just mm -hmm. normal people, but gay, then no one will think twice about being around you or having you as part of a society. You're not trying to big it up or play it up and make yourself seem like you're, you know, like, like you're <laughs> crazy and insane in a lot of situations. That's your liberal assimilationist attitude. Yeah, that's my liberal sim assimilationist attitude. I'm yeah. I'm not like a big into super insane revolutionary sorts of things. Um, now I'm for things like Talk. probably good that we made an amendment that said slavery was no longer okay. You know, stuff like that is a okay. <laughs> probably. You know, making it to where gay marriage is legal in the U.S. on a federal level. I'm totally fine with that. Pro it. Right. That, that was a good idea. But you do want to change attitudes and you do want, want to win people over over time so that one day you don't have a president get elected and he puts in three Supreme Court justices or something like that. Right. right. You want to get people to elect people based on their attitudes uh, because that stuff that stuff carries forward. And if you don't win them over, then they could fall back into worse ways. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a in a lot of ways, it's a slow and steady kind of yeah. kind of fight, you know, yeah, definitely. Uh, I agree. And I think and a part of the problem is, as I said, I think wokeness is basically unraveling a lot of the success that we've already achieved. So I think a lot of it has to do with like um, the, when the kids get brought into it, like, wow, you guys really want to want to read books to kids a lot. That's weird. Yeah. And you really want to do drag shows for kids a lot. That <laughs> seems that seems really weird, guys. Yeah. I don't know about that. Yep. Uh, then people start to raise brows and the, the reaction to that is going to be probably exactly what you expect. Exactly. So if it wasn't for a lot of that stuff, I, th I think a lot of that has really kind of hurt the movement and hurt the perceptions of uh, trans people and the LGBTQ, AI, 2S, whatever it is. Now. <laughs> um, Three spirit. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I think part of it is 
on the left, I see this a lot. On the right, a little. I, I see it more on the right, but I like never see it on the left, really. This uh, this idea that you need to kind of keep your own house clean and you need to police your own side a bit. Uh, I'm not talking like purity testing, even though it technically is purity testing, I guess. But mm -hmm. like the reasonable nature of how like people on the right, they see like an actual racist a lot of the time. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're y'all are nuts and crazy. You're not actually a part of us. The left needs to do that with a lot of people who are super crazy as well and say, no, 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 y'all are taking this way too far and you need to quit that. Even the furries are doing that with like zoo files and stuff. They've got their yeah. shit together to some degree. <laughs> so like, damn, come on. Yeah. And the dangerous part and the dangerous thing is when the right, because um, I agree, the left doesn't do that at all. And the dangerous thing is that I feel like the the right is starting to do that a little bit less and less to kind of compete with the left not doing it all. Maybe. And it's and weird so it's because like, that's I mean, how you now it's compete. like everything is like whenever you see um like white nationalists doing some kind of march or something, it's like, oh, those are all feds. Those are all glowies. They're it's not really all feds right or they're yeah. not really this or that. Yeah. And we're, we're kind of caught in this weird um this weird space of the, the like the word racist, homophobic, transphobic, yeah, 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 yeah. It's been yeah. overblown and used way too much. So it's lost a lot of its power that yeah. sometimes you actually forget that those people, there are actually those people out there. And when yep. they rear their ugly heads, you do have to address it. You have to yep. say, oh yeah, in, in this movement, we like, you know, we, we have fun memes and everything, but like for realsies, you know, black people are cool. Y'all can't be over here. <laughs> Y'all are, exactly. are like yeah, fucked I, up, yeah. right? You're not, yeah. you're not True. part of us. True. And another thing that I, I was thinking as well before we continue um, is I think that as when I, w I grew up as a, um, relatively middle-ish class at least for my area uh christian uh conservative kind of person and my parents still are though i would say they're, they're pretty cool um they're not like crazy or anything like that but they're both conservative and they're religious and um i think that uh some people maybe it's people's ability to compartmentalize the way that they think politically speaking is when i re when i started having like gay thoughts and i was like oh I guess I'm gay too. So I'm like, I it's just this realization that you're bisexual. Um, I was like, okay, I guess that's a thing now. Neat. I didn't have any weird dark night of the soul about it. And I, you know, I was, it was really easy for me to compartmentalize. Like my sexuality isn't like this important thing about me. Really. I can mm -hmm. still have conservative opinions in terms of family, this and community, right. that and financial, this and economic, that that has nothing to do with me being gay at all. Just because I realize, oh, I have gay thoughts now. That doesn't mean that I have to like throw it all out. And now I'm a, now I'm a leftist. Like, you know? yeah, that being gay doesn't or bisexual doesn't define yeah. your entire personality. Well, yeah, it turns out that it has shockingly little to do with the rest of your life. <laughs> um, right. It really is not like a huge part of your life. But when it's a part of your life, it is a huge part of your life. But normally it isn't that part. Right. Right. Um, it's like swimming. You probably don't swim that much. But when you are swimming, it's really important that you swim. Uh, so being able to compartmentalize in a healthy way, that doesn't mean like be get really good at cognitive dissonance, but being right. able to compartmentalize the elements of your life and who you are and how you see yourself is really important. And if you're able to do that in a healthy way, then you have a, you end up having a healthy mix of all kinds of different ideas, which is why I can still have some conservative ideas and I can still have, I guess, left ideas, liberal ideas, whatever that word means, depending who you're talking to. And I don't feel like I'm like, I don't feel like I'm weird. I don't feel like I have anything in my head that's fighting. I, I don't have any like internal conflict. Everything kind of works with itself. Right. There is this weird social environment, though, now where you do get a lot of head pats for being queer or or gay or coming out as LGBT. Yeah, it's which like, I do it's think like easy kind mode of incentivizes that. In a way, there's a lot of communities and a lot of spaces where you can just say, oh, yeah, I'm queer, demi pan, whatever my pronouns, pronouns are she, them, it, whatever. And then you can, it's instantly like, oh, he, there's one, they're one of us. They're friendly. I can assume already so much about your opinions. And a lot of the time it's true, right? If I go into someone's profile and they have the pronouns listed, it's like, I probably have about 70% of you pegged down pretty accurately, you know, right. but um, it, it does seem in a lot of places it's easy mode. It's a, it's a ticket to acceptance in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So I know it catches people 
kind of out of the loop a lot of the times when they come to me and they're like, oh, you, you're LGBT. And I'm like, yeah, but I, I guess technically I am, but I don't advertise it and I don't I don't fucking care about it. You know, I don't I don't have pronouns. Don't address me. <laughs> what was it's, the uh, what was the hardest? A, what it's was the, the gay thing? fascists that are really I mean, they're the marginalized group. That's here, the right? the be gay do crime stuff. Oh, I fucking hate well, it you, so you much. You know, like if you're a gay fascist and you go into one of these groups and you tell everyone, look, I'm gay. Well, I don't know. Look and, at Nick Flint. He's doing pretty well. <laughs> he's like the leader of the movement. He's a gay cowboy. Hey, Look, I'm, I'm not sure if that's it. Look, I'm not sure if we know Nick Fuentes is gay or We not. know. Come on. He's I'm, not straight. Look, we know that more. We don't know why I'm he is. I'm talking about straight. the marginalized gay fascist. He is, a, he is tried... a gay cat boy lover, all right? Who does the gay... Look, we're talking... Look, this podcast immediately became about intersectionality. Who does the gay fascist go to to become friends? You can't be friends with other fascists. They become fascists. a griper. What do you mean? <laughs> It's already there. It's right there, Adam. It's right there. I don't look. Obviously, you don't know this. Hitler was gay too. It turns out all the gay, all the like the most worst dictators, he lost were all his. Gay. Well, he he lost his straight ball, and then when Dude. that happened, it was it was a slide into true. Yeah, Do you true. think a fascist can be openly gay in a fascist community or a a gay per, a yeah a yeah can go no into a gay why. community and be openly fascist theoretically yes but it'd be yeah difficult. i don't see why not i mean i'm not like a, a big political guy i don't know much about political I theory you're gonna say i'm a fascist <laughs> now I, as a fascist allegedly <laughs> um i i want to outlaw heterosexuality in my fascist utopia <laughs> my word <laughs> yes my word absolutely and women what was okay? What was the most difficult thing for your parents to accept? You coming out as bi? You coming out as a YouTuber? Or you coming out as a dog? They don't know that I'm bi. It's none of their okay. business. I haven't told they, them any of that stuff. I haven't they, told them about like I'm an atheist. I'm bisexual because it's just none of their business. Do they know you're um, a dog and a YouTuber? They do. They okay. do know that I'm a. They they know that I'm a YouTuber and I do a podcast and I have this dog character and that's really as far as it goes because we just sort of live in in, in separate worlds in that regard. Uh, right. they, they're just not like interested in the kind of things I talk about enough to like engage with it. It's not really their wheelhouse. I do my thing. Um, I don't have to come and ask them for money or anything like that. I, I visit them often. It, we, we get along. Things are great. Right. And a lot of things are just not, it's not their business to know. So you know, I don't worry like about it. like a big it. shirt with lights that says, Hey, LGBT hey. rainbow flag. You have yeah. to, you have to accept this. Boy, I sure do love being gay, mom. Let me tell you, uh, it's great. Uh, thank you so much, our surrogate father, J Mac, for the 50 gifted memberships. Wow, awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, let's get back to this video. Well, thought that. We oh, wait, you're not in the wash again. Oh, yeah, I need to click the other link. The first one that. was throwing me for such a loop. I uh, you were so again. confused by Zoom. I was. Rags, did you have any opening thoughts on what we watched so far of this video? Oh, did we not do that? Um, well, you kind of did. We kind of did. did. What does the H stand for? What? On the person's, this lady's. Oh, it's uh, a guy. No, it's a guy. Damn it. This guy's, what's, oh my God, those nails. I know. What the fuck? How do you use your phone? How do you use life? <laughs> it it's, it's funny, like, when you look at certain aesthetic things that are so not practical to whatever you're trying to do you're like it's got to look so good for you to, to do that and then you see these giant nails and you're like they look so awful i like, can I understand because like we've i think everyone is willing to accept a certain level of discomfort personally in order yeah. to look a certain way yes i mean everything from well, suits to, to shoes look good <laughs> no right. to look a certain way i yeah. think that there are people who like let me tell you okay recently i went to my first furry convention i was invited to a furry convention <laughs> had a good time it was very interesting what a fucking strange place wow. but a lot of people in fursuits right yeah. did from they, what i did hear they know because... you as rags a youtube personality or was it were you wearing got, a big got, rags head no i don't have a fursuit no oh. I, I just showed up i got a little badge made by a friend of mine uh, and about a dozen people recognized me just from seeing me wear the badge that said rags and it had the dog on it and so that was neat. You know, it was positive interactions. But people are willing to do the fursuiting thing, even though you sweat buckets in there and it's often very uncomfortable. But it puts out a look and a vibe and it's being part of a community and a little subculture within a subculture. So people do it. 
So this was about long nails originally before we went into this horrific rabbit hole, so to yeah. speak. Um, but yeah, some people are willing to put up with levels of discomfort in order to look a certain way. But I think uh, there's no way I'm attaching those talons to the end of my fingers. That's they ridiculous. Don't, they don't even look good. They, they look awful because the moment you see them, you don't think about how they look. You think about how ridiculously impractical they are. Like the first yeah. thing I said was, how does she use her phone? He, you know, he. like or type on a keyboard. A boy. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. I'm legitimately sorry. You that was bigot. I'm I'm sorry. I that was this legitimately, is a he. Uh, yes. What? He wait, which one did I say? Pronouns. That's a he him. That's a gay boy. OK, okay. I'm Femme gay boy. Apologies to all of my gay brothers and sisters yes. and whatever you call the ones in the middle. I don't I don't actually give a fuck, but I'm just I just I see that my brain just takes over. I'm on autopilot. I it's funny because yeah, nowadays it's like who knows? Who the hell knows what's going on? Okay. Anyway. We should become, you know, accepted in society. One is assimilationist and the other is liberationist. So assimilationists are people who want to integrate into social structures that already exist. And their main tactics for doing that are things like lobbying with politicians, working within the law, litigation, and, and whatnot. Liberationists want to expand the social structures to include them. Um, and those are, you know, involved more in protesting and demonstrations. And the tensions between these two... Okay, wait. I So I agree with, like, the assimilationist thing. The liberationist one is completely way off. It's not about expand... Like... Well, I guess maybe that it's true in like a very um, putting the best spin on it. Because I'd say liberate the liberationist attitude is essentially we are being oppressed. Whatever we feel, whatever we want to do is oppressing us. So we basically have to force that society accepts who we are or we're going to destroy society and burn it all down. I see it as working within the establishment or being revolutionary and taking tearing down the establishment i think that was the mm. classic yeah, actually, you, marx yeah, divide that's a better way of of sort of saying like we're going to achieve equality by destroying society well, would, versus working within society consider one of them is bottom up and one of them is top down um yeah i mean that's definitely true ish the assimilation is more likely to try to work within the constraints of the top right to say to you know pass rights and legislation things of that nature basic ideas um, goes back to like the 50s and, and before Stonewall when people tended to be more assimilationist. People wanted to be like, we are going to find a way to fit into society. And it is kind of hilarious that the current queer movement is not seen as a highly assimilationist movement among Zoomers and young people. When it's all, it is a completely trendy thing. It is an assimilationist aesthetic that they're all trying to kind of ape from each other. I see the divide that's being made here. It's b between changing yourself to accommodate society or changing society to accommodate you. That's the divide right. they're trying to eliminate. Yeah. Yeah. And then Stonewall marked this paradigm shift because Stonewall was a very liberationist act. It was, we don't care about the, you know, the fact that we don't, we're never going to fit in, you know, we're never going to fit in and we're fighting back against that. So you're going to make room for us no matter what you can kind of so there's like this weird mythology that was created about Stonewall that I just it's completely a fabric like a fiction. And we've talked about this in the show. It's like Stonewall existed because in New York they had they literally had laws that made it so that men could not dress up as women and women cannot dress up as men. And there were LGBT clubs where people were in drag or trans or whatever and they liked to do this. And normally the police, before they would raid one of these places, they would give the gay like the club a heads up so that all like the the offending gays could hide in the back or something. <laughs> and for some reason, this didn't occur this one time. And so the police basically came in, they started arresting, you know, a lot of people wearing, you know, uh, illegal outfits, essentially. And people got really pissed off about it. And it kind of broke down into a riot. And I, like, that's all that happened. It wasn't like the people there had these like deep thoughts about like, we're never going to be accepted in society. So now it's time to revolt. Like, it's just like, no, people were just pissed off that people were getting arrested like, and it became a riot. That's all that happened. They have totally reimagined it as like a political meeting. 
They were yes. like, yeah. <laughs> meet yeah. here at this time and we're going to talk about the future of our movement. Right, right. Well, for, I think for a lot of uh, queer individuals, simply existing as queer in a queer space, they would argue is a political movement or a political action. So, Yeah, but they weren't talking about how to change society. They no, were like, no, no, they no. didn't even really have that. It was a bar idea in their heads. Yeah. yeah just they were like, look, we're not allowed to, do it. it was probably a bit bigger kick for them when it was, they couldn't do it. Well, doing it subversively. I mean, Stonewall, the, the bar seemed pretty awful. So I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> People are still acting like what they're doing is subversive, even though it's, it's completely yeah, accepted with, yeah. you know, all the major corporations, McDonald's, Nike, Target, right. <laughs> they're all in that's favor true. of it. So subversive, right? That's why, look, the true subversive act now is being a conservative. It's being uh, Jeffrey Char or Jeffrey Star. Well, oh, uh, what? That's what people are upset about. Okay. okay. It's Jeffrey Star, right? Jeffrey Star is not really conservative. Well, okay, whatever. Draw this through line from that very divide to what we have now, which are people who I think hold the beliefs of, you know, Natalie and myself and many other people, which are that we should be fighting for greater acceptance of all people. We should be learning more about identities, expanding Not our ideas, people. being open to learning new things versus these kind of... Con yeah, exactly. If that's um, yeah. gay, you gay see, fascist, they, they say obviously. That, but, yeah, they say that, but you don't really mean that. <laughs> Not at all. That's what's so ironic. If the person is the slightest bit conservative... Oh, of course, they're fascist. <laughs> Conservative gay groups um, that that are arguing, you know, well, maybe if we were just a little more normal, then then we could fit in and then society would accept us. And really, it's the crazy gays and activists and the people who wear, you know, long nails and 37 pronouns. And it's their fault that we don't. Yeah, it kind of is. Well, probably. it's always a that's there's probably a lot of truth to that. Um, the weirder and stranger you make yourself, the harder it is, uh, the harder it is to get people to accept you as normal. But that's just, well, of course, the stranger you are, the less normal you are. That's like tautologically the case. Right. Um, so if everyone was like super duper, like if we had a world where culturally and aesthetically there was no like gay aesthetic, I bet gay acceptance would be have, would have happened a whole lot quicker and be a whole lot smoother. And I'm not saying there shouldn't be a gay aesthetic. I'm not saying there should. I'm completely uh, neutral on that topic. I just, there's just seems to, things are the way they are. But you, I think you th there should be this understanding that the weirder and stranger and more out there you are, then that's how you'll be perceived. I just, yeah. that, that's the way of the world. That's how human beings are. I think that's completely true. Um, but I think what they're missing is that from their perspective, they think that these LGBT conservatives are just conservatives as like a tactical choice. Like they're saying, oh, we need to become assimilationists. We need to do all this just to get the conservatives not to hate us. When in reality, I think what's going on is that these are people who just have conservative moral intuitions that line up with conservatives. And then they also happen to be gay or trans. Right. They're and just I trying think, to be themselves. Right. I think a lot of this isn't, it doesn't even have anything to do with, um, like a lot of this isn't really moral or really deep in thought. A lot of this is just, I see someone who's wearing an extremely strange outfit, showing off a lot of skin in places where the sun don't shine and they look hideously ugly. And there's just that <laughs> natural, that, that visceral reaction to it. That's just instant. And right. it's really hard to get over, you know, for a lot of people. You're saying your a disgust lot of, intuition gets <laughs> a lot of time. Yeah. A lot of the time it <laughs> just, just, uh, uh, disgust and uh, it's it's a hard hump to get over especially when it can be i'm gonna say obvious but very obvious <laughs> you know i yeah, don't know I agree. look i don't i don't necessarily know how to say this but it's it's there's this idea that they're putting out there that the gay conservative is never going to be like straight passing enough for the conservative people but at the same time, they are basically saying, well, you know, you need to just be a little more progressive to be accepted in the in the gay community. So they're doing basically like the exact same thing. They're they're saying, look, you're not progressive passing enough to be accepted with us. 
Right. And if you could just be a little more progressive, you know, <laughs> then you'd fit in over here. Like they're doing the exact same thing. And it's just as these, like these, these I just, I feel, I'm more empathetic towards the people that are like kind of outcast by both identity groups that they, they affiliate with. I think, you know, obviously they're going to go to the one that's more accepting of them. And at this moment in time, it's just the conservatives, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> it depends on who well, you're talking about. Look, it, it, I don't it, think the, the conservatives are probably going to be more accepting. I think than most the LGBT big people. chunk of people in the middle are pretty darn chill about that sort of thing, from yeah. my experience. Right. Um, right. I don't. If I am ever denied uh, a service, then it's it's by people who are super far left because they hate me for whatever stupid reason. Right. Um, it's yeah. not from anyone who is on the right. Look, yeah. if gay, if gay, if gay conservative, if those are your two top identities and you're an outcast in both those communities, that's just a horrible place to be. Sure. Yeah. Back and forth, right? When you look at the hi history of these things, because pure assimilation can't work because if you try to make yourself smaller and smaller and smaller until you fit into a society that's basically against you existing. What's that? I don't think calling you, I don't think framing it as you're being, you're making yourself smaller and smaller and smaller by necessarily trying to fit in. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's a good way to sort of look at it. Um, I think that there might be an element of maybe trying to understand that I, not everything about you has to be certain things maybe, but I don't know. Like wh when you look at all the cultural groups in this country that are just accepted as normal now, Italians and the Irish and German and things like that. I mean, there was absolutely a level of, I guess, assimilationism that they did. People changed their names. People came here. They had their own little sort of sub communities, but they still wanted to fit in with, you know, the idea of America and stuff like that. And now it's just normal. In fact, it's right. weird to not have those things around. Like, what do you mean there's not an Italian restaurant in this town? That kind of stuff. It's just normal. Um, this, is, this is interesting from a moral foundations theory perspective, Sitch, because the two, the two identities in conflict are the, the gay identity and the conservative identity. But the reason why they're in conflict here is because people accept the, the gay identity as unchangeable and mm -hmm. the they think the 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 conservative identity is obviously you know you you can change that that's not immutable but with moral foundation theory the idea is maybe it is immutable well it, it, in terms of like i think people are born with kind of being on what we call the left or the right or having those moral foundations but the beliefs that constitute the left and the right i think is highly malleable and I think people can definitely change their perspectives on this. I mean, we were talking about this all the time about how, I mean, you know, the right used to be all in favor of big corporations and now they hate big corporations. Yeah, right? that's a good, and that's so, a good counter. You know, yeah. you can, you can kind of argue a lot of things from a lot of different moral foundations. Um, but I think regarding the assimilation point, I mean, I, I think Contra is using the word smaller because Contra is kind of going on the arc of seemingly the anti-liberal anti-assimilationist arc, because like, like to, to give Contra a little bit of charity, it's true that like if you have a, an attitude of like full blown assimilation, then you lose what makes you unique at all. Then you are just if you go of, all the way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If you just go all the way. But but obviously not going assimilating at all is just the other end of the awful yeah, spectrum just as bad. where it's just as bad. Right. You have to find that kind of middle ground melting pot togetherness, which I, you know, I believe is kind of the example you're bringing for like Italians and Irish. I believe all these communities have essentially succeeded at doing this, you know, finding that middle ground in America. So. You're going to shrink to the point of annihilation, right? And some people do try to do that. Well, and also this could actually be a really bad example too, because when we're talking about like assimilation, usually we're talking about immigrants. And so you have people who come from a different country that have different cultural attitudes and values. And those cultural attitudes and values are like mixing in. That's like, with... like your culture, like in a very strong sense, your culture and your heritage. Right. And right. when you compare that to 
I'm being gay. gay. <laughs> yeah, like, like this, what? Like, what are you? What exactly are you giving up? Where are you making a sacrifice? Right. What is it well, that you're losing when you're quote unquote assimilating into, I guess, modern American culture? Like, you're not what fucking in public. You're not <laughs> wearing a dog mask walking down the road. You're not like half naked with your junk hanging out. What, what exactly are we talking about? What are you losing and what are you giving up? What sacrifice is being made? What are you turning right. down? Because it's not like gay people all come from the land of gaytopia who have like a rich gay culture <laughs> that they've been like building for the last thousand years in the gay empire. And now they're coming to America and they're like assimilated. Like, no, it's like these are Americans who are just gay or trans or something. Yeah. And it's like they they exist in whatever cultural avenue that all the other Americans around them exist. Now, it's a little bit obviously there's gay, you know, gay communities and things a little bit different. But so much of these sort of aesthetics and these cultural attitudes along a lot of the queer lines are entirely reactionary, are entirely saying, like, we need to be different from the straight community. And in, in some respects, okay, fine, some of that stuff should not be assimilated, but some of it should be. So... I mean, I don't think it's I don't think having a cultural attitude of we just need to be the opposite of the dominant culture is a healthy or good one to have. Yeah, there there is that level of pragmatism that's like, well, guys, maybe if you just like go at 90 percent for a little while, you can go at 100 percent later, you know, just. <laughs> well, no, I mean, relax. no one is ever at 100 percent. I don't think society can function and everyone being 100 percent of whatever they want. Building a culture that's cool is the most important thing. The coolness level. Yeah, coolness level. And but there's also we all have to compromise with each other. We have to live together. We have, there has no, to be some level compromise, of compromise is not cool. No. Nope. Compromise <laughs> is losing. If you compromise with conservatives, that means that you are a, you hate them and you're fascist. Based. Because if there's nose. anything the fascists That's are known right. for, it's compromise. There you go. Exactly. No compromise. No compromise. One hundred percent full yeah. speed ahead. There you go. Yep. Die the fast before trash. you compromise. <laughs> to a society that's basically against you existing, you're going to shrink to the point of annihilation, right? And some people do try to do that. They, they think that if they can just try to be normal enough and just try to keep their gayness in the bedroom and if they how do you, just you need to the Rag, same way that people should probably keep their straightness in the bedroom, you know, Rags was totally right about this because it, it really is like they've adopted the what position do you want? That, that conservatives do. are never going to accept them. They just can't be accepted, which I, I right. don't believe that. I really don't believe that. I mean, if we're talking about like what displays in public of your, what gayness do you want to display outwardly that you can't now? Is it, is it just kissing? Because if people like don't allow you culturally to kiss your gay significant other in public, yeah, I'd say that needs to change. People need to chill. But well, no, I like, think there is that be a constitutional amendment about? against public displays of affection, though. Like <laughs> that's look, I'm not in favor of that. Look, uh -huh. you can be, yeah, kiss your significant. If you're just other. smooching them, no one, no one really gives a shit. No one, no one cares, right? Nah, if that, slippery if, slope. Next thing you know, you're having. They'll sex be in marrying the dogs. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. The you know tr try to oh said you want to say the uh, don't say gay bill. Or the parental rights education was a huge misstep because I feel like, like the first thing I'd have if I asked contrapoints someone like this, I would say, you know, like you're acting like we're living in the 1950s, like people like we're living in the probably the most free time for gay and trans people to be out and open, or they're basically you gain, and in a lot of communities, I guess it depends where you live, but in a lot of communities you gain, you literally gain social capital for coming out as being gay and trans. So this idea that like oh you know. The queer people are being told to shrink themselves smaller, smaller, smaller. I just, I don't know. That's just not true. It's just completely not true. And I feel like the only thing that they'll point to if you bring this up is, well, you know, in Florida, you're not even allowed to talk about being gay in schools or something. And it just seemed like that was such an easy misstep for the Republicans of Florida to insert in that bill just to allow this kind of like insane straw man to keep getting passed down the road. The insane straw man, I totally agree with you that it was a misstep to put that in the bill, but the parental rights and education bill was totally necessary. The other and parts no, of it. Right. And no matter what they did, 
even if they didn't do the overreach, it was going to be branded as a don't say gay bill. None of that is Well, it didn't have the word gay in it. They literally couldn't brand it that way. It had they would. Nothing to do with being gay. <laughs> they would. I don't think so. Nah. It would be the don't say trans bill or something, which people would be a lot more tolerable to dealing with. Wow. That's an interesting, that would be an interesting twist. Yeah. If they're like, oh, they did a don't say trans bill and it well, completely think about it. The ripped don't apart say, the, the trans community. The don't say gay bill is also a don't say trans bill. And yet no one labeled it that way. And that's because they know they labeled it don't say gay because gay acceptance seems or being anti-gay acceptance is seen as so much more egregious than trans acceptance. And that's why okay. it's got labeled that way. I feel the read like on I, it's just going to be just like, don't talk about that stuff with kids. Don't talk to them about sexual stuff, right. any sexual stuff. That's between I, the parents and them or when they learn how babies are made when they get to sixth grade or whatever that happens. I don't fucking know. I feel like if they branded it the don't say trans bill, it would be a giant wedge because I, I do feel like half the gay community is anti-trans anyway. Yeah. They're just like keeping uh, yeah, it to themselves. It, yeah. It's like they're that we're the, they're that they are a, a subunit of a subunit. They're not part of the others in a way they're doing their own thing and they're the the really weird ones of the group well a lot of gay people feel like a lot of trans people are just future gay people that are getting transed at a young age so they feel like this personal affront to the trans movement repeat the other conservative talking points and join in with other forms of bigotry then they'll be one of the good ones and they'll be accepted and what's I've this watched with joining in the bigotry can you imagine such a thing like oh joining Blair White can you come on our podcast and, and be anti-gay anti-trans like when is that happening what is no, that it's never going to happen where where is that happening it's so weird uh Twitter sucks for twenty dollars. Says, don't think of hierarchies as top down or bottom up, but rather as power bottoms and submissive tops. Nice. I'm a spicy power bottom myself. There you go. And Spencer Harmon, thanks so much for the ten gifted memberships. Thank you. Multiple people over the last five years very publicly attempt and fail to do this by becoming gay Republicans or, God help them, trans Republicans, and uh, that doesn't work. Um, but I think, and then, then, then there's another extreme, right? Where like the, the, you know, you can get so disillusioned with the homophobia or the transphobia of society that you, that, that you almost you kind of give up and you, this will sound strange, but you'll agree with me. So I should preface a lot of things I say like that. So the other day I watched a very good movie called Ratatouille, right? Great and movie. Remy's Remy wants to cook. He wants to be a cook. He wants to be creative and he wants to express himself in a world that uh, maybe <laughs> despises him. That doesn't like who he, what he is, the very core of what he is a rat. It is not accepted in the human world that he wants to be a part of, except for of course, Linguini and his cooperation with him. And Remy's father warns him in a rather ballsy scene that you don't see in Pixar movies anymore. Remy's father takes him to a, an exterminator shop where they have displayed the corpses of rats on the window. And he says, take a good long look, Remy. This is what the world thinks of us. They'll never like you. They'll never accept you. You can never be a part of that world. But Remy says, no, no, there might be hatred out there, but change is within our power. In fact, nature is change. Change is nature. And we have the power to change things. I am going to go to that kitchen and I'm going to cook with my friend Linguini. And so he does. And, and that's uh, one of the big messages of the movie Ratatouille. It's one of the reasons that I really, really love it. Don't accept the world for the way that it is, even if it seems cruel and against you. You can change it and you can work towards it. So, Which is weird because that's usually supposed to be like the left wing thought process. Yeah. And yet this is the opposite. <laughs> There is uh, there's going. Yeah, there's this defeatism almost. I see a lot of times conservatives will never accept you. They'll never do this. They'll never do that. It's like, well, maybe it's just a matter of how you're going about it and how your messaging is. Maybe that's maybe that's the issue, you know, um, maybe defeat is kind your... of like um, tactical, it's tactical defeatism. Well, is maybe if you ch changing the way that you present your message doesn't change the message. It doesn't change any fundamental part of who you are or, or what you are. If you maybe act a little tactical for God's sakes and maybe right. don't you know, go, go crazy and out there. I think it's just like we, we don't want to compromise. 
So, so you don't want to compromise. They're the ones who have to change, not me. Yeah, exactly. You become like a, a separatist. And so I've met queer people like this. They think, look, there's no place for us in this society. So we need to go our own way and we need to become separatists. And they, and they often think of this as like a very radical position. But in my opinion, it isn't because separatism isn't going to change society. You're just leaving, right? And I mean, it's like, it's like that type of radical feminism that's like, okay, it's all the women are going to go out into like the wilderness and, and have a, you know, it's pretty a, fucking a, a radical. radical feminist commune. It's like, well, yeah. is that a, is that a challenge to patriarchy or have you simply created a, a convent? Well, and is, is there a world in which that happens? I personally have never thought that it's, a, that it's, an effective way of, of doing anything because you you sort of need to balance the the two approaches right you need to, someone needs to assimilate a little bit in order to get the power to change society so mm. you know you, you're gonna need someone like harvey milk to get elected and then from that position can start making these changes that need to be made if you're so against assimilation that you won't even engage with, you know, government or with, uh, you know, any kind of existing power structures, then you were never going to have enough power to affect the change that you're trying to affect. Um, so th that's the way I, that I see, see the history of this is sometimes like assimilation goes too far, and then you have to do something like Stonewall. Um, and then, you know, but, but, you know, a, there's a has, some, something has, there has to be a follow up to a riot, right? Like a riot ignites a new era of activism but that activism then yeah, has to get organized happens, it can't just be a, an ongoing riot because a riot is too chaotic to you know change uh a riot on its own that is you know it, it can ignite a movement that will affect change but a riot on its own is is too destructive to really change anything speaking of so contra said this idea about how you have to assimilate enough in order to basically get into positions of power to enact change, which I think that's the wrong way. <laughs> like, I, I understand that she's talking to a leftist audience. So maybe this is her trying to persuade a bunch of these Zoomer socialists to not be full blown revolutionaries. And if that's the case, then I'm then fine. Um, but from and like that's a, good, yeah. You want to temper yeah, that a bit, yeah. right? But from like a more neutral perspective, I mean, the assimilation—the goal of assimilation should not be assimilate enough to become subversive. Like that's not a good way. Of, like, <laughs> yeah, there's a difference between enough. being like subversive and just being like, well, I mean, if we want to live in a society and change it, then we have to show that we're a part of this society. You know? Yeah, we're teammates here. You need to become just enough assimilated that you can outlaw heterosexual marriage and then true. that's when the true utopia spawns <laughs> sure yeah the i don't journey look, I don't to know. banning women begins with the first step yeah <laughs> yeah i don't i don't agree with this strategy either so. okay. <laughs> trans republicans <laughs> one of the most popular trans influencers at least trans political influencers is a Republican. I know you're probably tired of this, but we're. I have no, I have no idea who you mean. <laughs> We're talking about you, right, Rex? You're trans now. Uh, yes. Okay. I am trans canine. <laughs> um, I was born a dog, but sometimes I pretend to be human, uh -huh. and I feel like I'm a human on the inside. But you know, we accept you for that. Yeah, we'll always call you human here. Here on the Sitch and Adam show, we'll always call you human. Oh, thank you very much. If I someone really, calls I really you a good boy, that. is that like a is that offensive? The no, they're they're still a part of me. That, uh, <laughs> there's there's just still a part of me that my brain. Yeah. And I just I can't, I can't say no. I can't it's say no. It's not a microaggression. It's too good. No, <laughs> okay. it's not a microaggression. You can't change your nature. Is this Caitlyn Jenner? Is that who they're talking about? No. Me neither. Let's go on to the next topic. Yeah. <laughs> um. So so Blair White is a trans conservative influencer and. I know you've both had a lot to say about each other over the years. And she is just, to me, a fascinating case study. Um, and so I want to, I'm going to show you another small video clip of, this was from a Vice debate 
um, where it was conservative queer people debating progressive queer people. And um, this is what Blair White had to say at one point about non-binary people. I think that a right. large reason why a lot of people do not understand trans people is because of non-binary and because of all these other identities that we've all talked about are constantly tacked onto the acronym that has always what worked. People- okay. She says that non-binary people are the reason people don't understand trans people and all of these other identities that have been tacked onto the acronym that before this always worked. There's a lot there. Is there Basically any validity true, though, to think, that? And, I think Blair White's you know, quite correct. What would lead someone in her position? Yeah, well, to an extent. I mean, getting, you know, yeah, probably, probably to a, I'd say more than a, a more than unsubstantial extent, right? Mm-hmm. Telling people that there are, okay, we got boys and girls and boys like girls and girls like boys, pretty simple, pretty easy to understand. Right. But then we were like, oh, wait, some boys like boys and some girls like girls. All right, there's not that many of them and it's not a big deal. And we can still, they're still boys and they're still just girls. And that, that's pretty simple to understand. That's not a big deal at all. Nice and simple, nice and easy. All right. And then now it's like, well, now the boys and girls part, we need to expand our horizons. And that is understandably a very difficult thing for a lot of a lot of people to wrap their heads around. Right. A boy liking a a boy and a girl liking a girl. Pretty simple to understand. But when you start throwing in more than other genders and this gender isn't a gender, but it's gender. And like, yeah, that's understandably a bridge too far for a lot of people. And it's just it's just stranger. It's just flat out a more strange thing. Yeah. I mean, I think from an, from like an ideological philosophical perspective, a lot of the non-binary stuff does not actually mesh with a lot of gay and trans acceptance. And it kind of, it kind of destroys a lot of what makes the acceptance of those movements like work. However, most people don't care about any of that stuff or think about any of that stuff or have a conversation about any of that stuff. Because like the way that I look at it is basically we sort of had trans acceptance started to happen in the country. You had Caitlyn Jenner, you had jazz, you had some other things that started to push like the trans acceptance. And then a lot of the non-binary stuff kind of just like snuck under the door with it. And I don't think like, I don't now think you go now on the, the internet, pushback, it hits you like a freight train and you're like, what the fuck's going on? And yeah, then- exactly. Right. It snuck under the door. And now it's like, but it's like much larger than the actual trans movement itself was. Um, but I don't think like the backlash against some of the trans stuff has anything to do with the non-binary stuff in terms of people understanding it. I think the backlash is almost all just because of the kids stuff. Trans and the kids the, stuff. Yeah, yeah. The kids transitioning stuff. So like if, if the kids transitioning stuff wasn't happening, I'm not sh- like I would still wouldn't necessarily agree with the non-binary stuff, but I don't think I don't think anyone else really cares about it. They just say, oh, that's weird. And then they kind of like walk away. <laughs> so I don't know that I agree with the scientific understanding of the trans stuff. Mm-hmm. I but there is. What's that? I said you're allowed. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I understand. I at least understand the logic of the argument that they're making, even if yeah. I don't agree with their evidence or right. the, the science behind it, if they're, if you can even call it that. Yeah. With the non-binary stuff, I don't even understand the logic. <laughs> like, I don't... How... that I think that is the problem with the non-binary stuff. I think the 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 bar for selling non-binary is without explaining it in a way that just sounds like fashion is mm-hmm. so high <laughs> that it, I just right. normal people just it does it's it's an unsellable product to them so I do think it it hurts the credibility of the trans stuff which I mean you, there's this whole idea of you know you're born in the wrong body you have well, that's still uh, working within like brain. a two gender sort of paradigm that civilization is known exactly. since essentially its inception. I'm a boy, but I'm going to like essentially be a girl for the purposes of my interaction with society. It's how I feel and want to be accepted as and all that. Well, stuff. and I, maybe I have a brain that's uh, the, the opposite sex. You know, there's yeah, some I'm just sort of... wired a bit. You know, I was like, I'm, yeah. I've got this hardware and this software, but it's, there's it's a logic all male, you female. can follow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What is the logic of non-binary now, Rags? I, it seems to be like, I don't know. I think you calling it like an aesthetic kind of thing, a trendy thing kind of rings really true in a lot of cases. 
where it's like, I don't even know. Like, I, I totally buy the like, yeah, there's trans people, of course, and there's gay people, straight people. Yeah, pretty clear. But it's like, oh, I'm a, I'm a neither a male nor a female. I'm like my own thing over here. I'm like, I don't even know if I buy that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what is the what is going on here? How do I understand this from a scientific perspective? And I just think that's the that is the bar that people are encountering. And a lot of people, obviously, if you're in this and you just accept it because it's a social thing and everyone is doing it, you don't need to understand the logic or the science of it. But most people are not in this club. So there's like, you know, explain it to me. Explain this to me like I'm two years old. And, and they I'm, just can't. And I'm luckily, I'm, I have a, a general political and philosophical and moral disposition such that if you want to, it's like, I don't have to agree or understand or really know what a non-binary really is. But man, if you're over there doing your thing and you want to be non-binary and you're just having a great time, man, that go, go for it, man. That my inner libertarian blesses you go about your merry <laughs> way and enjoy yourself. Well, I so, totally agree on that level. But the, yeah. the problem is when you want to come in and say, look, th there's a truth claim here. Yeah, that you we have can to study. call me this. You yeah. have to call me this thing. Then I'm like, hmm, uh, okay, well, let's look at that truth claim. Let's examine it. Let's uh, study it. But you can't. Yep. As a trans woman, to feel that way. Is there any validity to it? No. Right. Um, what would lead someone to feel that way? Well, I think it's a combination of incentives to think this way. I think that in a way it's a way of like defending yourself psychologically because at the moment there is a massive amount of animosity being directed at LGBT people and at trans people in particular. And when you have, you know, very prominent political figures, Ron DeSantis, um, you know, Christopher Rufo, et cetera, saying loudly and publicly that trans people are groomers or pedophiles, the shame and the stigma of that is a lot to deal with psychologically. So I think one thing that people do is that it's almost like trying to reassure yourself. Oh, they're not really talking about me. Of course, this has, you know, I'm not really the, the object of this scorn. It's, it's because of the non-binary people. That's, mm -hmm. that's why they're confused, right? It's, it's them. And then you can sort of reposition yourself where you're on the side of the accuser instead of on the side of the accused. And I think well, we're already see. drawing sides. We're already bringing up the tribes, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of trans people, gay people, bisexual, whatever, I think they're fucking cringe as hell, and I don't like being lumped into that group, right? <laughs> so I don't like that, and and I'm not going to drop these lines of that, just because I don't like a, a lot of the social stuff or the aesthetics of whatever, that doesn't mean I'm on the straights side now. That's not, that's not how this works. You're He's, betraying your kind. What do you mean? Yeah, These gays like against kind, groomers kind, going after non-binary non people. Like, she just so casually throws out the... The groomer people, the people labeling people groomers are going after non-binary people. I don't, that seems ridiculous to me. Uh, I thought the gays against groomers usually, I don't know about non-binary stuff. They're usually doing like, I thought the anti-transing the kids was like. The yeah, they're, they're, they're talking kind of... about political activists in the classroom. The fact oh, that wait, she no, doesn't. Oh, wait, no, here we go. Gays against groomers, that's probably what they're referring to. This is from, I do remember this. Gays Against Groomers tweeted out, Beloved children's show Paw Patrol has created a non-binary character. The episode was, of course, written by none other than Queer Kid Stuff host Lynn Oh, Zamer. I haven't heard that name in a while. I know. Who we recently did a radar watch list report on. But so this that go. makes my point. that They're not attacking non-binary people. They're attacking purveyors of the ideology. Right. Well, let me keep reading the tweet because I think this kind of elucidates this if you actually look at the character in the show she's clearly just a tomboy this is an example of the gender cult's attempt to transition and recruit into their ideology it's sad and infuriating tomboys are perfect as they are and don't yes, need they to are. identify as anything else gender non-conforming children are not trans or non-binary hashtag save the tomboy any physical movement that lowers the number of tomboys in the world is morally evil <laughs> and should be eradicated. Is that your favorite subclass of women? It's like burning the Mona Lisa. <laughs> Again, uh -huh. I still I feel like they're going that. after the the teachers, the purveyors of the ideology, and not the not the well, non-binary people. It the problem is that there's a bunch of things going on here. Because as I said, 
um, the non-binary ideology destroys a lot of the ideology of what's going on with, with children transitioning and with gender and gay acceptance. Mm -hmm. And I think that Blair, who engages in all these conversations and the gays against groomers people engage in all these conversations, that's where their headspace is because they, they, they know that these contradictions exist. However, I don't think that the average person knows or cares that those contradictions exist. So that's not what's motivating their behavior. I think it's so, more just the, the children stuff. Yeah, totally. I agree with you. But she's making it seem like the gays against groomers are attacking non-binary people. And I, yeah. I'm saying they're not saying non-binary people are pedophiles. They're saying that people who are introducing children to this ideology are, are bad. groomers yeah. yes are grooming them for an ideology yes right because yes. their 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 view is that you know the, they're gay right and they're viewing that well they're tomboys or effeminate gay men and essentially society or these quote groomers are basically tricking them into transitioning their sex to as opposed to just being uh you know lesbian or gay right yes so. That's the perception, but I don't right. know that Contra or the host understands that. Well, they probably they've I'm sure they've heard that argument. They just don't even want to. I guess they don't accept it, and they don't want to even give it any space to even debate debate it at all, whether it's like valid or not. Right. So, I think that sort of helps with the anxiety of you know this environment of, of bigotry. So that's definitely that's that's one psychological factor. Another, I think, is more material. I, th I think that when you're talking about commentators and influencers, it, it sounds like a, it sounds like kind of a, a, a cheap accusation to be like, oh, they're just doing it for money. But also, like, I don't know, influencers are often motivated by what is a financially viable time. position to advocate for. And there's off there's there's always going to be a job opening for a queer person who wants to talk about how homophobia is gay people's fault right totally like there's always going to be people who are going to pay to hear you say that and so there's you know there's always going to be this, uh, some cynical person who's going to come along and, and be willing to perform that part i so i don't think that's how audience capture works i think audience capture works is that people are operating in a space that they are saying things that they truly believe they grow an audience around that and then they become afraid to kind of move away or against the views of the audience, you know, but there's still a core that they agree with there. Cause I mean, it doesn't yeah, make I sense. Agree. Like, like I don't think Blair white or a gay or trans person is going to sit around saying, Hmm, the way for me to make money is to try to fit this incredibly niche, like niche area of being like an accepted by conservatives you know, conservative, <laughs> gay, trans, like, like who, like, that's the dumbest way to make money. That doesn't make any sense to me. Like Blair White would make crap tons of money being, you know, super wokey. Like it doesn't, none of this makes any sense. At, yeah, at some uh, point, at some point, homophobia is gay people's fault though. Like you can't just say categorically homophobia is never gay people's fault. Like there's this, there's a point, right? What is the context of your statement? Cause it's going to be taken wildly out of context so look you, if, you if, specific. if gay if gay people yeah. gain political power and right. make straight marriage illegal people are going to hate gay people sure but that doesn't really seem to be on the table right well look a lot a lot of people the gay pride stuff happens every year and a lot of people are saying look this is getting more and more pornographic right yeah. if gay pride gets so pornographic that they're literally having gay sex in the street in front of children I think uh, I the homophobia is going to be off the charts and yes. ContraPoints can no longer sit on her comfy podcast couch and say, look, it's uh, the homophobia is not our fault, right? At some point you have to, to take responsibility for your community. Sure. Sure. So <laughs> like, okay. okay, you disagree? I, yeah, no, I mean, I do agree that that's the, the bridge between trying to quote assimilate into you know, normative uh, values and quote, being your authentic self. You have to find the golden mean there between the two. Yeah. I just look, it's, you, you can't, there has to be some sort of compromise I mean, here. And I just, I don't like the, I don't like this. We're starting the conversation with our community can well, do no here, here's wrong. Here's the problem. Here's the problem with the, 
I mean, suspicion. first of all, I think I think your phrasing is bad. You shouldn't phrase it the way you did because it's going to sound like victim blaming. But um, I do agree. And I think what's going on is that, like, for example, there's lots of guys out there, straight men out there who would love to, like, fuck women in public and just be like, disgusting oh, yeah, things, voyeurism right? and exhibitionism. Yeah, yeah, those are high tier fetishes. Right. And so high tier. there you go. Rags those are patrician tier fetishes. One of them. OK, he's one of them. Yeah. And so it's interesting that basically our society for thousands of years has said, listen, you shouldn't like fuck men shouldn't just be fucking women in public. You know, that's degenerate. And everyone kind of just said, OK, fine. You know? <laughs> yeah. OK, fine. Okay, fine. Exactly. Right. And, yeah. But then suddenly it gets lumped into like queerness and being gay. And it's like, oh, well, now it's a revolutionary action. Right. How come having <laughs> sex in the street with animal masks is now a, a, an inherently like left political? Yes, thing? it becomes a moral action, even though everyone agreed that it was like not like it's bad. And if straight people are doing it, it's bad. But if, if queer people are doing it, it suddenly becomes magically good. And it's just because so much of and this is something that I think Contra and the other people have to accept a lot of queer theory and, and a lot of queer aesthetic is to just do is to just be counter whatever the normative values are. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I'm just saying like, you gotta, at some point you have to take responsibility. You can't just blame yeah. the sure. other. Yeah. There, there is an element of introspection on how you behave that you should take into account. Not every problem comes from without. Um, sure. Uh, there is a way that you could like moderate yourself. I mean, everyone has to do it. This is not a thing that is exclusive to one sexuality or identity over another. Literally every fucking human being has to moderate the way that they behave when they're in public. My naked chair is in my house. It's not outside of my house. <laughs> all right. The way that the I behave in the, yeah. The way that I behave in the privacy of my own home is not the way that I behave in public. And that's and I'm not going to cry foul because of that. I I'm glad that's the case because I don't want to be subject to all the weird shit people do in private. And I, when I go out in public, right? right? Yeah. Just because you can't behave the way you want to behave out in public, that doesn't mean it's necessarily some kind of, uh, you know, oppressive thing. Sure. Well, well, I do. I mean, I hear gay people sometimes talk about the propriety of the gay pride month and pride parades and stuff like that. And a lot of times they're just shouted down by other people. And I feel so bad for them because they're trying yeah. to address this point. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's kind of funny. Cause the whole, like uh, doing <clears throat> open sex stuff at pride is kind of, I would argue is a form of misogyny because I think it's women that really like temper guys sex like being disgusting sex perverts especially in public i 100 like, agree oh my god there's just like no limit like when it's a guy's sexuality and a guy's sexuality meeting together and they're all for it and they just there's, go there's, on. Just, there's no Oof. breaks just gas there's just no yeah. breaks on this crazy right. train man because like I, we could all imagine like if hypothetically every there were no women and all guys were just gay like i'm pretty sure society would be very different in terms of like like guys would be just fucking each other in public like constantly and like i'm like ah oh, whatever you know? it would <laughs> probably just be more normal there's a there's a yeah. general feminine approach to sex it seems that is a lot more reserved and yes. tempered selective than, and tempered yes yeah then right. uh then you know men men are just so all for it yeah men are women just horny fuckers women in pride women and women in the pride movement have to be like listen you misogynist keep your dick in your pants okay do, do it it it's interesting because I wonder if the part of this problem is that they've kicked all the con gay conservatives out of the movement because that yes 100%. that would have been a tempering force. I yes, think, exactly, in terms of their exactly. The propriety of the gay pride stuff might be more to uh, the heterosexual community's liking if they actually had those gay conservatives involved. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like colleges, like they didn't kick them out, but for whatever reason. You know, a lot of college professors was not a, it wasn't a profession that was attracting conservatives. And if you have any area that's not attracting like conservatives or or progressives, one side is going to basically slowly dominate, you know, that that ideology of that field. So. Right. And their aesthetic, their ethic is going to prevail. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I feel like at this point, Blair White has helped carve out this like actual field 
in a certain part of conservative media that like you see more and more queer people occupying, which is the conservative queer influencer, mm. which is, I mean, it's, there's Blair White, there's Ariel Scarcella, there's Christian Walker, um, this boy on TikTok, this like. <laughs> this is so disgusting. Isn't it? They're not addressing any of the re their, their reasoning for being in the position that they're in. They're just no. attributing it all to like a aesthetic grift. Yeah. What? When our, and like, I don't know about the other one, but Aria Scarcella was very motivated by, you know, she's, she's a lesbian, lesbian. and yes. she's like, I feel like a lot of lesbians are basically uh, falling down in the, the rabbit hole of transitioning when they don't need to and I'm regretting it. That's yes. kind of what's motivating her. And th this kind of reminds me of, you know, when we covered um, the Blair White versus Jonathan Doyle uh caitlin borshenko oh that was a good side. one that was and a crazy <laughs> and uh lauren the lauren witzke is that her name lauren witzke yeah. debate yeah yes. lauren, lauren witzke and jonathan doyle versus blair white and carlin borshenko and in that debate it's like insane because like lauren witzke is like like becoming she becomes like the preacher at the pulpit like thumping her bible and telling blair she's gonna like burn in hellfire for a thousand years and so many people on the left the reaction to that is oh my god Blair White is such a disgusting sellout. She lets this horrible right wing bigot just, you know, thump her Bible and it's shit all over Blair. And Blair just takes it and she looks so weak and pathetic. Blah, blah. They're just going on and on and on about how awful Blair was. And I don't remember, I don't remember who I was talking to. It might have been Doomer, it might have been someone else who was more on the left. And I was like, have you ever looked at the comment section of that video? Because if yeah. you look at it, it's just nothing but conservatives talking about how much, how bad they feel for Blair and how disgusted they are with Lauren. Yeah, she and, won and that's over. what all the comments are. And it's like they just completely misunderstand that, like, no, like Blair's existence actually does help your movement massively. It creates empathy for, yes. from the conservatives. Yeah, yes. it humanizes right. them. Yeah, and it shows that like not every person who is gay or trans is like buys into all the rest of the ideology. Yeah, that you like, like this is, and this is one of the things that I want to ask, you know, someone like Sam or someone else in the future is like. What part of trans issues are you allowed to disagree with without being labeled a transphobe? Because it yeah. seems like the answer is like you have to buy this entire package or or none of it. Unfortunate. <sighs> Insufferable Twink Clarkson Lawson, who just they all make the same videos, which is that they just go on and they're like. Well, maybe if trans activists and non-binary pronoun people, blue hair, yada, yada, weren't so crazy, they'd finally start accepting us, you guys. And it's like they it's amassed these true. really big audiences <laughs> yeah. immediately. And also they immediately get put on like Newsmax. I don't know. It's like, I'm sorry that your reaction to someone telling you to chill the fuck out is like incredible revulsion and disgust and like disbelief. But I don't know. It's the kind of thing that a lot of people learn at a pretty early age. It's never too late, you know, to learn to temper your behavior and have some introspection. But uh, might as well start. Might as well start now, you know. Might as well start today. Their and they get these hurt. like primetime specials where they're like, "So it's true. Like homophobia doesn't really exist in 2023." And they're like, "Yes, Tucker, that's true." And. <laughs> That's why I made the joke at the beginning where it's like, sure I don't actually think for these people, for these specific like commentators and influencers, it is cheap to be like, well, they're just doing it for money. I think there's a, I think like you said, there's a number of psychological reasons why you might want to believe that because like you said in one of your videos, you know, well, pointing the finger it, away maybe. from yourself and not like the weirder queer people, it, 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 you know, it takes the blame off you. No, but but that might be valid. The blame might not be on you. It might it might be the freak standing next to you fucking in public that is standing next to you that might be the issue. Whenever there's an issue, like in general in life, it costs you nothing to begin by looking inwards, right? It costs you nothing to just say, you know, let's see, is this problem that I'm facing because of me? Could I do something to alleviate this? Is this coming from my own behavior or any action that I'm taking? Or is it coming from outside? Because it might be coming from outside. It's very possible a lot of problems are. But maybe it isn't. And it costs you nothing to have that little bit of introspection. And it builds up a really healthy mental habit for you as well. 
few, it's like the witch trials. You just pass along the blame and the shame and the accusation. But also there's like a pretty well-defined route to like having a primetime right-wing media show at this point as a queer person. Yeah. Why? Caitlyn Would Jenner did it. Will we explore um, that? She, that's a start. No. Because um, maybe they don't not... actually have a problem with the identity. It's the behavior and the crazy beliefs of people who might have that identity. And if a lot of people who have that identity often have those beliefs and those behaviors, then maybe there will be a correlation that is not necessarily causative. Well, I do think, obviously, there are a lot more gay people on the left, which means it's going to be a lot more competitive for being entertaining to, to have a show and whatnot. And if there's less gay people on the right and that's something people want yeah show it does of, make you stand out there is this there yeah. is an element of you know i'm there's an element of for lack of a better term i'm the gay one um, but I th- it does I think, make you stand apart i think the thing that they're missing though is i don't think you can well i, I guess you can to some extent but i think it's not something you can do indefinitely i don't think you can fake like being a conservative i think sooner or later people can tell if you're they authentically conservative or not. Yeah, exactly. Do you, do you, it look, takes a I, special there, kind of person to really go through 100% with that kind of charade. Look, I, um, I never, I never thought Hunter Avalon was conservative. Like I never really felt like he was authentically conservative in really? any way. I felt like he was just putting on an act. Yeah, exactly. Mm, I look, I do, that, but... I do look at people and sometimes I think, oh, this person, I mean, I could be wrong, I, I, but. I Hunter Avalon is an interesting case because then he was like, oh, I'm not conservative anymore. I'm going to totally flip my politics, which makes me think, okay, well, I never thought you were conservative to begin with. So mm-hmm. that seems like an easy move to make. The But you you understand what I'm saying. They only, they think that some, there is no such thing as a gay conservative. They're like, there's yeah. gay people, there's gay leftists that that act as though they're conservative to grift. That's the world that they live in, which is well, just, I they're mean, looking at thing. it from the perspective of, you know, we're looking at it from the perspective of like people have these kind of political moral intuitions, which they're kind of a large extent born with. Yes. And then people kind of slot into various political parties based off of it. Yes. I think, I mean, they're not looking at it from that perspective. They're looking at it from the perspective of just like, no, people just are like these rational actors. <laughs> that are like you know well i guess i guess Le- I mean, you mean progressive so that's not true but like that people are just like making some either rational or irrational decision about like what political identity they want to fit into and i don't yes. think that's how that works at all and if they're rational they pick progressive and if they're irrational they pick conservative sure sure <laughs> yeah i mean that's kind of the the lens that they laid out early on yes yes stone that you know, we're not going to leave unturned in this episode either. Um, But the other thing I wanted to bring up with Blair White was her, (laughs) Blair White's pinned tweet right now that's pinned to her profile for the last several months is a selfie of her looking hot. She looks great. She's wearing a bikini. She's serving kind. Is she wearing a bikini? And the replies, there are 5,000 replies. I guess I'm mostly... There was a picture on the screen, Rags. What are you doing? Go back. I don't. No, no, no. I was. I was looking at the picture. I didn't. Could you go back? I. There it is. Where's the big? I'm missing something here. Where is the bikini? You don't see Blair White in a bikini. I see Blair White, but I don't see the bikini. What? What is? She's wearing a. What do you call that? The camo out bathing suit. Oh, is it camouflaged? Is she like? Oh, oh, is she like melding into the wall or something? I, no, like, I see. I see. That was camouflage. Is this a joke? I, I didn't, right. notice, I didn't notice it because it was, it was are camouflage. Are you making, I yeah. see, are you I making a camo joke? Yeah, he, it, was, he could, it was really yeah. good. I was, I'm sorry. I Carry on. I My eyes aren't that good. No, he I just, guess I just didn't notice. Yeah, he saw, all he saw was just like a wall with lips and eyes and a gun. No, I was just confused. I wasn't going to say anything until someone had mentioned it. But that just really seemed really weird to me. But no, I understand now. We can Are they objecting? Are they objecting to the gun? Well, so the original, okay, so the tweet was that Blair White put this out. It says, um, if you see a bulge in a conservative woman's pants, it's a gun. If you see a bulge in a liberal woman's pants, it's a penis. Right. And of course, the irony is that Blair White has a penis. So, but that's obviously the, you know, part of the joke of the tweet. 
Does Blair White have a penis? Is that? I believe oh. so. Yes. Okay. Damn. Nice Thank tuck work I mean, there. A pretty good tuck work. Yeah. Yeah. Bravo to you, good lady. <laughs> she looks great. She's Noble wearing a maiden. bikini. She's serving cunt. And the replies, there are 5,000 replies, mostly from conservative men who are arguing with each other about whether or not it is gay that they find her hot. They don't it even mention It is not guy. gay that you find her hot. They don't. First of all, there's nothing wrong with arguing over whether or not it's gay to find her hot. <laughs> like, what don't is you wrong want with the con that? Well, don't you want those conservatives to, don't you want them to have that discussion? This is where it begins, guys, when you start finding trans people hot. That's the right. gateway drug. And what is, hold on, what is so offensive about having that conversation? Why is that an Nothing, offensive conversation? I don't conversation? know what these people want. That's so weird. They don't, look, they don't even mention the gun once. The first 20 minutes of this. Because it's a basic bitch air 15. <laughs> they, couldn't start, they couldn't <laughs> start, they couldn't stop talking about the guns. She's got a giant gun in her hand. They don't even bring it up. Well, I don't, it, it's, because, it, okay, well, let, let them play first before I. Okay. Yeah, okay. What What's wrong? What's wrong with this I want to get into that conversation. But the conversation that I do find fascinating is like, Blair, like beyond money, what is in this for you? Because oh, God forbid she believes it. Well, it's it's being a pick me girl, pure and simple. Oh, no, like, it can't be that. It can't be a belief. There's any number of, of cis women that do an equivalent thing, right? And there's, again, incentives to do this. If, you, if you're willing to sacrifice a certain level of self-respect if you're willing to make yourself a little bit smaller and put up with because remember if you're trans but you have a lot of conservative opinions and the other side fucking hates your guts so you hang out with conservatives you're making yourself smaller you're getting rid of a part of yourself even if it's things that you earnestly believe because that's just beyond the pale it couldn't be that blair just dare we say disagrees with you right. no 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 she might be someone who shares an identity element with you who doesn't think like you do. It's like those pesky Republicans who are black. Oh, aren't well, they the worst? <laughs> and it's it's kind of weird, too, because, you know, Contra's talking about like, well, you know, Blair doesn't have self-respect here. And it's like, well, wait a minute. If you have a bunch of conservatives who in normal situations would say, ew, trans people are all icky and gross and they're disgusting... And how, now you have Blair here who's basically creating an argument Challenging where a bunch of people that. are like, well, I mean, I know I'm straight, but I'm not that straight, right? Or they're saying, is it gay? Like, like isn't that actually helping the cause? How's yeah, this is how you cause? start the conversation. There is a yeah. person, it's biologically a male, yet how come my pee-pee hard? We need to be talking <laughs> yeah. about this, guys. Right. This is yeah. unprecedented. Right. So it seems like it should be helping. Contra should Absolutely, be it should be yeah. helping. They should be thanking her. Yes. But no. <laughs> More but no. humiliation. Um, there's also a kind of reward that comes with it. I think that, you know, just to, to talk about, you know, women as an analogous case, I think that what is a large percentage of, of women go through some stage in their life of enthusiastically endorsing the male point of view because it's easy right we're all kind of the male raised point in, of view you know, you know you, that you go to school and you read a bunch of books what is that you mean? know how those males have that one point of view yes yeah i agree rags i'm so offended by that all the time <laughs> it's like what the hell imagine if we started talking about the women's point of view you know how <laughs> women are <gasps> All the same. Yeah, women. Yeah. Those yeah. emotional, bad at math women. Can't drive <laughs> women, right? That women True. point of view. True. Look, I just hate the so way that sexist. all men think of women. Yeah, but... That's uh, all I'm saying. But ContraPoints is allowed to get away with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ridiculous. Endorsing the male point of view because... It's easy, right? We're all kind of raised in, you know, you, you go to school and you read a bunch of books by men that show the male perspective Ugh. and men have yes. generally Carl more Marx power than women. And, yeah, Arthur C. Clarke, basically the same perspective. 
Well, they're all male, so. I mean, I've never read a book by a woman before. That's true. They, they actually write books? Come on, guys. And the left finally found a book about written by a woman that they can quote endlessly, and it turns out it's, well, not, not the, the right kind of woman. I'm, I'm kidding. I've read lots of books by women, so. Ew. I'm I don't always think I amazed have, that they're good. Coincidental. Women, and uh, there's a you know huge historical precedent for that. So I think, and and you know, men praise you, and men like it when you validate their way of seeing, and you don't challenge them, and you don't make demands, and you don't stand up for yourself, and you don't be difficult, right? So much of this has to do with whether men. it's difficult, right? It is difficult for white people. Yeah, me. White men, hate, men hate difficult women. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. Now, what's she going to say about white people? Oh, those pesky oh, no. whites oh, no. always generalizing. Are we, the, are we on the white people train now? This, yeah, I hate I had how white no idea. people always generalize. It really bugs me. I had no idea this got this painful. Of course. This is all. This is already horrible. Time for the pesky whites, Adam. <laughs> Please make it stop. Sitch. The pesky whites. Okay, listen. They don't want any of these uppity uh, women and non-whites. Okay. <laughs> That'd be that, a good, uh, so, that, good so, rename, that, rebrand. So. The pesky what? white podcast. Oh yeah, that yeah. is a good name. I like it. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. old the old P dubs. Yeah. Well, that sounds oh that sounds a little like a pedo. So I don't know about that. That we'll part. we'll rebrand at two ninety nine, so we don't have to do a three hundredth episode. There Ooh. you go. <laughs> so perfect. I think, and and you know, men praise you, and men like it when you validate their way of seeing, and you don't challenge them, and you don't make demands, and you don't stand up for yourself, and you don't be difficult, right? So much of this has to do with I like whether that, it's though. difficult. So I guess right? I'm a bad it man. It is difficult for white people to hear that racism <laughs> is real white and people. an ongoing problem and something that they might have to deal with and something that they might themselves be participating in. Yeah, it's difficult. Whites. Well, it's, it is difficult when you those whites. don't actually give us any evidence for this claim. Well, it's sad because there was a time period where Contra was pretty moderate. Less it seems like, yeah, and now, <laughs> and it seems like now that's gone completely out the window, and we've kind of adopted this like very woke white people just can't accept their racism like nonsense attitude. Right. Yeah. It's sad. It is. Sad. But you know what? I'll do her the service by not accusing her of being a grifter. Well, you should. But yeah, <laughs> I'm not going that far, Rags. You're, it sounds like you're on your own on this one. <laughs> I mean, at some level, you got to wonder, right? If you move from someone who tries to be somewhat intellectually honest to someone who just embraces whatever your audience wants, you got to kind of wonder, right? I mean, just a little bit, Sitch? I don't think it's a grift. I think it's just the radicalization. That's what I'm saying, but... I won't say it's a grift. I'm going to do her a service she would not give to other people. Mm -hmm. Look, I don't yeah. care if she thinks we're grifting. I have okay. like, yeah, I'm her fine. opinion is like worthless to me. I don't fucking care. Yeah. <laughs> There's not someone who I take seriously in any way. This is yeah, a I, you. I'm comfortable in my own authenticity. Okay. I'm not worried, yeah. too worried about okay. it here. I'm just, I don't saying. actually require the validation of internet weirdos. Yes. Okay, bigot. Well, uh, I just I think our picture of reality is much clearer, and I do think yeah. Contrapoints at one point shared that perspective. Yes, and didn't think you know all all gay conservatives are just grifting. I that position does seem tailor made for an audience that wants to hear it. Yeah, it's not great. It's not great for men to hear that misogyny exists and that some of their attitudes towards women are actually really toxic what and, a woman and, hate and to hear. Say it, damaging it. and bigoted. It's it's difficult for straight people or cis people to hear. to hear that they have, you know, homo that their point of view is homophobic. So if you can kind of flatter these kind of basic prejudices, people find that comforting, I think. Right. So, you know, if, if you can look, if you agree with somebody, 
because you think that they're right, you're flattering their prejudices. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to flatter someone's prejudices. Every okay. day, you want to flatter at least one prejudice. How dishonest is that? How dishonest is that? Do you think Contra really thinks that's all that's going on here? Yes. At one point, Contra points understood that there were ideological differences between the left and the right. I mean... That that time there has were, passed. There, there were videos about it, though. Are, do you, yeah. are you saying that ContraPoints now just has changed? You know, like Lord of the Rings, where like Gladio's like, the world has changed. Right. <laughs> That's where we are. So the world changed. ContraPoints didn't change. Contra, no, ContraPoints has changed. ContraPoints has just become in this... ContraPoints has been surrounded by basically uh, leftists for so long that have been attacking her for so long. It's funny. I feel like a lot of this is projection. I feel like a lot of this is that she basically gave up her opinion to the crazy left people that wouldn't leave her alone. Right. She's given in to the mob. The mob said, no, this is what we believe. Yeah. That's, that's how she, she's in. Captain Picard. She's saying, Oh no, there's three lights. Yeah. Whatever you say, three, two light. How many lights you want? Five lights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah she's saying that there's five lights. And uh, clearly there isn't. So. Hey, we've been right. looking for one of you three lighters on our cool Romulan podcast. <laughs> First of all, Cardassian. Cardassian, okay. sorry. Okay. Whatever else. Kind of... <laughs> is it four? Is it actually four lights and they're trying to get them to say five? Yes. Okay, I'll remember next three? time. I forget. I, I forget. Five. I know. I know. Somebody there has are to four, know this. There are four lights is is what how many lights there actually are. Right. Yeah. And they want them to say how many? They keep telling him the wrong number, though. Yeah, I keep telling him the wrong number. I don't remember if it was three or five. Contra has given in I think to the Cardassians. Five. It's the Cardassians that are doing this four light thing. It's the Cardassians. Right. It's the Kim Cardassians who it's are doing right. it. Classic. They captured Kim Patrick Kardashian. Stewart and they brought him to their sex dungeon. Contra points. And they went. I mean, he, they're he like, we heard that naked. you can count to five. We he need you to help us naked, learn how to so, count to five. Yeah, that's essentially what's going on. ContraPoints has given in to the Kim Kardashians of the world. It's five lights. Yeah, okay. Hey, look, it's Dev. Hey, Dev. Hi, Dev. Hi, Dev. What's up, Dev? I watched Dev talk to a 19-year-old socialist the other day. It was entertaining. Oh, really? Yeah, on the Wix, uh, Wix TV's channel. Oh, had, that's uh, right. Yeah. The debate about that was... Was it free speech debate, right? Yeah, uh, sometimes it veered into that topic, yeah. Who debated what on Wix TV? Dev, Dev debated. Dev some had a chat timing. with a, a a gentleman who a young gentleman who learned, I think, a lot about the world. Sweet. <laughs> I think I saw that. Dev just talked to Wix, right? It wasn't a panel or anything. No, it was just Dev debating this one person. Oh. Okay, cool. Maybe I haven't seen it. No. J Mac for twenty dollars, our surrogate father. Thanks so much. I think J Mac gave us fifty gifted memberships. Thanks. So Yo, J Mac, what a J-Mac. what a hero. Oh, and by oh, while it's on my mind, sorry, yes. I accidentally uh, timed out someone. Um, it was an accident. Yes, you it did. Live in live in computer, Dev's wall. Yeah. The, yeah, you did. Lives in Dev's walls specifically is the name of the the gentleman who gave a five dollar super chat. I'm sorry. I was I clicked on the message up top and then it put it in the chat. And I was like, oh, okay, I want this to go away now. And so I dragged the mouse down. Like I clicked on the, the chat and then I dragged the mouse down to click on the normal chat to make it go away. But it like lagged and then it showed the timeout option like right as I was clicking away from it and it timed you out. So accidental ban. Uh, there you go. A uh, likely I've story. Done, yeah, I've done I feel my like due we diligence. Have, I feel uh, like we have Jamal Bowman here on the live stream. Yeah. Talking about, well, this seems like a likely story <laughs> yeah. here. Mm. I don't I don't know who this Jamal Bone man is, but you I click I am you timed him out trying to he, open um, a door, huh? That's exactly <laughs> You know how they're doing like the government shutdown stuff on Saturday? Do you follow politics at all? I know we talked um, about it, but I don't know if you I don't care. really follow politics that much. A little bit. I don't know. Jamal don't Bo- Bowman is a congressman who pulled a fire alarm to open a, a an exit and no one believes well, it. Well, no. The question is, he says he pulled the fire alarm to open this door. He didn't realize it was fire alarm. And they're saying he pulled the fire alarm to delay a vote in Congress. Right. There's two conflicting well, narratives going on That's right now. a dumb yeah. thing yeah. to do because they'll just come back and do the vote later. It's not Says like, well, the we guy can't, who we just timed out. He, he, supposedly, <laughs> he wanted to just 
make it slow down the vote so that they had time to read the bill or something. That's the, the claim. Oh, okay. Yeah. What a a noble hero. Yeah, hold exactly. on, hold yeah, on. Okay. There, who's saying what's that narrative? That, that was the that would be the explanation of why he wanted to slow the vote down. Did, but did he say he wanted to slow the vote down? No, I no, heard no, he was no, trying no. to He's get to the He's saying it's an accident. He's sticking yeah. by it. It is an accident, which seems he, unlikely to me. I don't. Wait, know he says accident. it's an accident. Yeah, he said he was trying how to open a door. How do you accidentally pull a fire? How that's do you accidentally shit. time Listen, out? Those you, know those, you know when you see like the the door that's got like the handicap thing. It's got the button on the side. He thought it was. Uh, he thought it was a handicap. <laughs> yeah, that's a lie, and I don't believe him for one goddamn <laughs> second because those big ass buttons have the handicap man on them and the fire alarms they're red and white mm -hmm. and they're clearly marked don't fucking pull unless there's a fire retard yeah but there's but a was, there's a sign it. there's a sign on the door that says if the fire alarm is pulled the door will open in 30 seconds this is this is a sign this is a sign that our schools have failed <laughs> hello hello oh, hi, oh wow hey what's up dev oh, hi i was i was summoned by a few people apparently so nice. uh, are so you, firstly are you firstly you, you, you guys need to fucking understand it's not it's the cardassian union and it was gul madrid and it was five lights well first of all the guy's fucking name jesus christ how <laughs> many how many lights did they want him to say four they want him to say five, five. there were four they lights and they wanted him to say five yeah and they wanted him to say yeah there were yeah, four oh, lights they wanted him to say five lights. yes okay is it correct wait so the cardassian union that's not the name of it. what are you talking about yeah, well, the government is called the Cardassian Union. Okay, I've never heard and the them species say are that. the Cardassians. Well, I know that. I've never heard them say the Cardassian Union in Star Trek. Yeah, well, I mean, they're they're like a, they're like a fascist state. Yeah, that, Dev, they Dev are, how long are you going to stick around? Just so I know, like sometimes you oh. drop in just for like thirty seconds. 30 yeah, seconds. I'll, I'll I'll be here for just a couple minutes this time because I okay. I heard that from from a few people that Sitch was talking shit. Was, was it? Was it was it Sitch or Adam? Which one of you two was it? No, 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 no. Okay. So okay. Adam was saying, so Rags was gonna come on. So Adam was like, Wow, I wish we had had a bisexual person here, friend of the show, to come on and talk to us. So everyone in the chat was speculating that it must either be Rags or you. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. We have a large pool of uh <laughs> no, we do well our yeah. audience does have a lot of LGBT And no, oh, so so somebody friendly. asked I don't friends of the why. Guys. Yeah. I said, is I said, is Dev even bi? I don't know if Dev's bi. Um, yes. And then, well, okay, I guess you've answered the question. And then Adam <laughs> said, um, has Dev ever given a blowjob? Because that would be the answer to the question. No. Is that the if he gave a blowjob and that's how he discovered he hated it, then he wouldn't well, that's be bisexual. True. He'd that's just be true. a brave straight Oh, that's man. a great point. Yeah. That's a good point. That's yeah. a great so, point. Uh, someone in the chat. Not uh, me, though. I love fucks. him. Zero fucks says, what about the one drop rule? Okay, so I was on the arch one drop of cum? last night. <laughs> <One drop. laughs> I know, what is the one drop rule? If you swallow okay. one drop of that cum, you are gay. <laughs> so I was on the arch cast last night, and um, it was Arch and V and me were like the three hosts of that of that show, right? And their audiences are significantly more right wing than mine is. Like they're more right wing than me, but their audiences are, are even more right wing than them. Right. And they have a very strange view of bisexuality and that they don't think it exists. Oh, and they so think they're retarded. They think it's just the one drop rule of sexuality where like a guy could have sex with hundreds or thousands of women. But mm -hmm. if he has sex with one man, he's gay. Well, that's okay. that's dumb, though, because you can like be, both. being because being gay overrides everything else. Because well, no, I think you can be being gay. gay is like an action. And if you Look, perform you the can... action, you are the thing. Well, you can be gay and never have sex with a guy, though. You could just want to have yeah. sex with a guy. Yeah. Sure, but I think they're all like virtue ethicists over there. So what you do is what actually You're is. being very kind by saying that this is virtue <laughs> ethicism. <laughs> yeah. Not profound stupid. mental retardation. It is. <laughs> it, it is. It is pretty retarded. We're not actually, retarded. Yes. We're virtue um, ethicists. Well, yeah. How about this? How about this? Wait, um, how many people are by and they just have sex with just one sex? Is that like a really common thing? Um, it's probably common enough that like you have bi people who only end up getting into straight relationships just because there's not that many gay people. That's probably pretty common. Okay. At least it surely was before. You can't, surely you, you can't know, force yourself into liking dick, right? I would I guess maybe assume? if you're a top and you just start, you can be aloof. Maybe you can be an aloof top, and you can pretend that it's a woman's butt. <laughs> I guess I I, I yeah. would guess yeah. Okay. You you could be like like a Greek straight. 
where as long as you're just topping guys and not bottoming for them, then you're still straight. I'm still straight, guys. I, I just call that, really like boys' bottoms. I call that the the cope the straight cope. Straight, straight that's, yeah, cope. that's cope sexual is what that is. Cope yeah. sexual. That's cope sexual. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of cope. But uh, you know, I'm gonna try to find an article for you guys to look at because somebody wrote oh, joy. an article of explaining exactly why how if you have gay sex one time, you're fully gay and you can never go back. Interesting. The um, one the boys but is so good you can't go back. If you want to read once this. you go crack, you never go back. Once you go crack. So have you seen this video at all, Doug? Uh no, actually. I haven't even pulled up the um oh. watch together yet. That's fine. You're probably gonna leave anyway. But um this is I will video. in a minute or so, but well wow. no, I I was summoned over here. Hold on, let me just check out the message. People are sending me messages about Who about you? this stream. Peer pressure. I didn't summon Let's you. see. Here we go. Uh Adam and Sitch want to talk to you, according to some fan of theirs named Gordo, over the once gay, always gay thing. They're discussing it right now if, if it's gay to be attracted to Blair White. Is it gay to be attracted to Blair White, fellas? No. Oh, no. If you're attracted to Blair White, you, you know, that doesn't mean you're gay. Yeah, I don't think but so. But there's still a dick there, though. Like, she doesn't have the bottom surgery. So. Well, that's fine. That's fine. So if you stick your dick in a glory hole and you think that it's a woman on the other side, but it turns out that it's actually a guy and you don't discover until after you have produced your ejaculate, shall we say, to keep it clean for YouTube. <laughs> Thank then, you. That's then much you, cleaner. And then, you, and then you discover, <laughs> much to your horror, that it was actually a male. That doesn't mean that you're gay now, right? It's what you, it's your perception of what you are attracted to, yes. not the technical truth. Right. I, I agree with you. I don't think people would necessarily accept that as being a comparable analogy with Blair here, look, but I understand I was, what you're, I understand what you're getting at. If you like big Bara boys, big daddies, big hunky daddies, you're gayer than someone who only fucks very feminine twinks, but you're both gay. But one yeah, is so there's, still, the other. there's still some gay in there, right? There's, right. oh yeah, there's, oh yeah, it's gay all, it's all, it's gay all yeah. around. So like, so like but the, it's on a the, spectrum, the most, as most people who are gay are on the, the most feminine possible male fully transitioned the whole nine yards. Mm -hmm. Looks perfect. Is that still at least a little bit gay? Um, potentially, but not necessarily. I would say okay. not at all. If they, if they like, you said they look perfect, like okay. indistinguishable, well, indistinguishable from well, a woman. Yeah. They, they still have the dick though. When, when she, when she, oh, when she take off oh, clothes, oh, 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 yeah, the dick is still well, that. That definitely changes things. Like if if it's not a game changer for you, you can still be mostly, um, straight. But yeah, there, there's that. You know, there is that element of you did cross the line. It might it might have been just a foot or just a little toenail over the edge, <laughs> but the edge was breached. So to speak. Mm -hmm. So the edge speak. was breached. Well, I know so, yeah, they're, they've they're done like, they've done yeah. research on this and they say that gay men are not attracted to women, trans women with penises at, like at all. And it yeah. was specifically bisexual men or men that identified as straight that would never have sex with gay men were the only ones that'd be attracted mm -hmm. to this. So that's pretty interesting, but there you go. Okay, so I, I found the uh, the article. Yeah. But I want to show you, but you forget about the article though. The article is full of fucking autism, but I would like you to pull this graph up because it's fucking hilarious. Look at this autistic shit. I put it in the Discord. Uh, let's see. Intuitively straight, intuitively. <laughs> Pull it up. <laughs> you gotta show. The, you gotta show the people what this shit is. Okay. I didn't Let's even see. understand how to read this graph. I don't even okay, know what am I so, looking at here. Okay, so basically, uh, the bottom axis is degeneracy. So yeah. from zero to ten, like zero is celibate, ten is pure degenerate. All right? right, and then the axis going up and down. That is the generative process, which is how reproductive it is. So you have, you know, zero is again is still celibate, and then 10 is pure generate rather than pure degenerate. What is even the right? point? This chart is retarded. I don't even know what like this is so, so stupid. So, so what's going on here yeah. is that like the more the more sex you have, the more degenerate and generate you become because you can also have kids by having sex. Right. But because gay sex never actually results in having kids. Um, it is always just degenerate, and it's never it never has a generative component. 
So okay. th- this this is this is the logic used for why like one, like once like bi doesn't exist and once gay always gay. I mean, once you accept these completely arbitrary and pointless criteria, yeah. Do, do people understand? That when people say degenerate. They don't usually mean literally like degenerate versus generative. It's not usually what they mean. <laughs> I mean, I, I think actually if you were to get someone on the right who's like smart enough to actually dig into it, you mm-hmm. know, to here, to, to grab mold bug or someone, someone who's like at least kind of intelligent on the right and have them right. actually explain their positions, you'll understand that they actually do mean when they say degeneracy, they mean it in the opposite of like generacy. They do mean it that way. Yeah, but they, like, they mean it in terms of like, like, like it's degenerating society in some way that they don't like. Not necessarily that it's not an action that creates children well sure sure but like to 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 generate something is to like create something new and then to to degenerate is to kill instead of un or a generate or just not to break degenerate is to break something down yes yeah so you you can have like generative actions that build society up and then you have degenerative actions that tear society down exactly right and that's kind of how they view it and like having kids is one of those generative actions i mean Depends on the kid, right? <laughs> I mean, if, if you if you have if you're if what if you generated uh, a gay person? Yeah, or I'm saying like if you if your offspring is Stalin or Marx, I mean, you're not really just generating. <laughs> like he society, killed a lot right? of straight people. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, about that. I mean, I just, listen. I'm trying to explain it. I'm not saying that I believe in it. Well, stop it, you bisexual. Listen, I, listen I, I need to straddle the fence post and all possible things. I would just sit on it? Yep. Of course, nice. you need to straddle it. You That's a generate. bad place to get a splinter, though. <laughs> terrible. Though. How do you get that out? That splinter's going down with the ship. Oof. Pretty much, yeah. Big oof. Okay. Well, so, no, yeah, basically, people were saying... We'll talk about? The way that everyone was sending me, there's maybe three or four people sending me DMs, and I was like, "Oh my god, is this like like a continuation of people just lie?" Yesterday's, I, this, this is annoying. yesterday's one lie. drop rule conversation yeah, on the Archcast. We didn't even bring up the one up? drop rule at all. Oh, I mean, okay, I'm not, I'm not even aware of any of this stuff. People just lie to you. No, so you're like, lying that there are three or four we, people in his DMs. No, 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 no. I'm, the people are, are telling him are just exaggerate. Like we're just watching this video. It's about contrapoints talking to someone about why LGBT conservatives exist at all. Okay. And they're kind of obviously looking at it from a very in the left wing progressive echo chamber lens. And so what's yeah, your no, argument? No, look, Sitch, I told you earlier in DMs that nobody wanted to hear us talk about sex. Yeah. I think the fact that we've lost about 200 viewers is a testament to the fact that that is <laughs> no, 100% those were just, true. They were just straight. Well, no, to be fair, it's 10 <laughs> o'clock at night. I mean, we just lose. You know, we true. reach a point it is and a school we lose. Night. We lose viewers after a certain time period. <laughs> well, okay, so, I think that's probably the issue. Oh no, um, I think this conversation. Everyone, wa- everyone likes to hear us talk about. Degeneracy. Everyone loves sex cells. <laughs> Haven't you heard? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, well especially gay. Sex. Like, I know that despite you know the obvious political differences, despite... like, w- w- there is a fair amount of um, audience overlap between like Sargon and Arch and me and you. You guys, mm-hmm. you know, so I figured a bunch of them were here continuing yesterday because the, the conversation yesterday was kind of a shit show and it went on for way too fucking long. But with that guy, anyway. this this that is guy. The, the quote one drop rule about if you do anything gay, you become gay. The one cock rule. Yeah. Or it's like yeah, bisexuality how, how does that... doesn't exist. And you're just if, if you have gay sex, then you are just gay and that's it. Yeah, but what, how does that explain? But that's stupid because it's obviously yeah, because people, it's stupid. It's stupid <laughs> because there's obviously people that are just are gay. They only want to have sex with the same sex, and there's people that want to have sex with both sexes. So how is that? How is that not a distinctive category? Because they're they're retards. Oh, okay. I mean, that, that's just what it sure. is. That's what it is. So, so yeah, what what is what is uh, contrapoints' argument here regarding the the LGBT conservatives? Um, either a, they're just doing it because they're just trying to make money and they're trying to be like the niche LGBT conservative or B, they're just trying to plead with conservatives to stop uh, attacking gay people because look, they're normal too. Hmm. I mean, there might be some truth to, to, to both of those positions, but I don't think it's the mainstream gay conservative position. I don't think, I think there's just... any truth to the first position uh, at all. I think there's, think there's any grifters out there, really? I don't think there's anyone who's gay who's like, listen, I'm gay. 
I want to make a bunch of money. I'm going to be a gay conservative. Like that just doesn't make sense. That doesn't compute to me. I don't know. Really? Yeah. Because honestly, I think, I think Dave Rubin fits the bill. No shot. No way. Yeah, man. No, no. Yeah, no, man. No. I remember. Hold on. I remember no, no. Blair White. Blair White went on his show and then a little bit afterwards. Guys, guys, she- guys, guys, guys. What? That was from when he- don't you remember when Blair White was on the show with Candace Owen? Guys, 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 guys. Don't That's what? Uh, Dave what? Rubin. Yeah. Guys, Rubin. guys, 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 guys. That was Continue. Candace Owens Continue and Blair what White. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was like uh, our did- third show, Sitch. Do you I know, know that? I did. Yeah. Guys, 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 guys. You Damn. guys weren't listening to us on the third show. Look, I, we got to kick these guys. I these know. aren't real fans. They're not. <laughs> Listen, I knew of both of you back when you did your third show. I just didn't know that you were doing a podcast like episode 50. There you go. Anyway, what were you saying? Right. So Dave Rubin. Dave, Dave Rubin, Blair White, they did a, they did a show like she was, was a guest appearance on his show. And then shortly afterwards, Blair White comes out with this cryptic message where she's clearly not throwing Dave Rubin under the bus, but you can kind of tell it's about Dave Rubin. Mm-hmm. And she says, yeah, I'm meeting people who in the in the right wing, you know, media ecosystem right now. And they're just saying shit like, yeah, I don't actually believe any of this stuff. Right. And like, you don't either. Right. It's like, oh, it, it's it's it, 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 like her her description of her um her time talking to some of these people was almost like Lauren Southern's in a sense where they basically was like a bunch of backstabbers and a bunch of people who didn't really believe any of the principles. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I, I, there, there's, there's a super cut of Dave Rubin's appearances on Joe Rogan and why Joe Rogan stopped having him on because Joe Rogan basically outed him as not actually believing any of this stuff. So I do think like Dave Rubin, I think is actually, he's actually the conservative grifter. He's actually the one who doesn't really believe in in any of these right wing principles. He simply makes money off of them. I don't agree. I don't agree. Okay. Um, right, I think what's going on with Dave Rubin, I think it's a different meme. The whole like people are mean to me, so now I'm going to be the other side. I okay. think that's more likely with Dave Rubin. Are you talking no. about the Rageaholics tweet? I don't recall. It's been it's been a, a few a few months since I've looked into this at least. Oh, okay. I, so he tweeted out recently that Dave Rubin was a big fraud. Who's a who is oh. Rage Rageaholic guy? Rage, that, that's Razor a Razor Fist. Fist. Razor yeah. Fist. Yeah. Razor Fist. Yeah. Razor yeah. Fist tweeted out that Blair White told Dave Rubin, or Dave Rubin told Blair White when when she was on the show that he didn't buy into any of the conservative stuff. He was just basically doing it for a job. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, Blair, Blair said that independently. I didn't know that Razor Fist tweeted about it too. Blair evidently told Razor Fist and Razor Fist oh. tweeted this out recently. I mean, I saw it just like a few days ago. Yeah, I, I, I heard thought, this. Oh, at least that's a year. interesting. I heard this like at least a year ago. This was kind yeah. of public on yeah. the surface. So we, this was when did Dave Rubin split off from the Young Turks? I don't I know. Mean, this goes this was years ago. This goes with everything Jenk and Anna have said about Dave Rubin. He left in 2015. In 2015, says, he's like, I'm going to go be the gay conservative because that's how I'm going to make money. Like, I just, that doesn't make any fucking sense to me. They, Young Turk said that he asked for like $100,000 and they kind of laughed at him. They said, like, no one at the company makes $100,000 a year. Right. And he basically left the company, but he didn't, he wasn't really, he didn't really care about progressive politics. It was more about money for him. That's their mm. narrative. So, well, that's a little bit. Well, that's a little bit different. That's just someone. But why would he decide he's going to go be conservative in 2015? Well, I, I, I think it's because he's always been kind of a libertarian, and libertarians might have had a place within the Democrats, let's say, ten years ago, and they kind of don't now. So maybe sure, just that's a, very as the realignment happened, he no, kind of look, found himself more on the right. Maybe something look, like it's that. It's so simple. He's on the Young Turks. Young Turks always talk about Fox News. They're basically saying, look, Fox News always gets these people, the the gay conservative, the, you know, the crazy crystal lady to be the progressive. And Dave Rubin is thinking in his mind, he's like, well, that might be a good gig for me. <laughs> he's like, how do I get that gig? What if I could be the gay crystal lady of the right? Yes, exactly. He's like, <laughs> wait, me. I could do that. that I could have yeah. my own show. I'll tap that market. Uh, and that's skeptical. basically what he did. Allegedly. I'm very well, skeptical. Well, th- th- that was the first possible reason. What was the second one? I forget what the second one was in that list. Oh, it was uh, 
protection to try to be like, please don't attack us conservatives. We're normal too. And I think there's, I think that is true ish in terms of, I think there are people that have already have conservative, conservative moral foundations who then try to kind of justify it post hoc by trying to create this, like, look, we're just normal too, because they are just normal. <laughs> and they're tr- and they do think that like the non quote normal uh, queer people are giving them a bad name, which they are. Do you think it's more the religious element or the conservative element? I think it's a conservative element. I, I would. Mm. I feel like it's more of a religious element, right? The gay <laughs> thing. Oh, right? anti theist uh, rags just logged onto the street. No, no. I, I I think that it's it's. I think it's easier to like see yourself as a gay conservative than a gay religious person. Rags, Maybe. I want you to know that we love anti-theist Rags. We do. He's a great oh, addition. Oh, no, he's, he's a, I don't want you to think on. I'm, I'm just not like he's really I'm that edgy. He's always I, I turned just, on. It makes no. It makes is our, that is that a contentious thing? I don't feel like that. Like that's a it is. Thing it to is. Say. Look, we have a we have a lot of Christians in our audience because I usually oh, <laughs> see They're right allowed. there. Look at that. It's fine. You're, no, it's fine. I, I don't. I don't give a shit. Um, it's just, you got, I, I just look, feel you like it's admit that easier it's to hold the identity though. of a gay conservative than a gay Christian, right? You're. you're what, I don't understand. What's, what's no, the I'm not kidding. Part? I'm confused. I don't. No, not disrespectful. No, I'm, what Adam was saying was I don't understand. What is disrespectful? I'm confused. I didn't say me. What I said. You oh, said, look, no, no. You said he, he said something disrespectful. Well, yeah, well, I, we said we have a bunch of conservatives in our audience, and he said, I'm sorry. No, oh, I like, said that's that's fine. Something. No, no, I said that's fine. I didn't say I'm sorry. I literally, I, well, you should you be literally sorry. You literally <laughs> misheard me. <laughs> I said that's fine. I didn't say I'm sorry. Where oh, does okay. this, this magic look, rewriting, maybe, this look, KGB uh, rewriting of history? I may, have mis- I may have misunderstood you, but it sounded you, like you when I said we have a bunch of Christians in our audience, it sounded like you said, no, oh, I'm no, sorry to hear that. Like no, Christians are not totally welcome. Totally fine. It's totally okay. fine. It's totally coolio. Look, it's we all... like we like to argue on the show, and the anti-theists are fun to argue with, so we like it when anti-theists come on the show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it sounds so, skeptical, but anyway, look. Well, ever since we started stop talking about sex, our view numbers have just skyrocketed. Okay, let's talk about sex again. Let's get back to it. <laughs> let's talk about sex. <laughs> what so, about Sitch, sex do you want to talk about, Sitch? I think there's actually a different. It's like a related but different effect that's happening. I want to know how right. many dicks Dev is. Su- <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my do you? God. No, I don't. No, Sitch, <laughs> why would you do that? Oh, Fear look at not that. the man who has sucked a thousand dicks. <laughs> Fear the man who has sucked the same dick a thousand now times. We're, now we're you know plunging. There we go. You know that Nobody scene from Clerks? Nobody wants to hear this. You know that scene from Clerks? I want to mm-hmm. see. I want that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Okay. okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think actually as the culture generally shifts more leftward over time, I think like conservatism is also kind of shifting a little bit more leftward too. Mm-hmm. And I think there's just now like a, a space for gay acceptance on the right. And there, there's going to be some very far right people who are not happy about that, but they're they're not exactly politically relevant anymore, you know. So, I think I, I think they're actually it's not really a contradiction to have like a gay conservative. It's just that the you know, the politics are changing. Yeah, but if you're in the progressive bubble, you don't understand that it looks like a contradiction. Yeah, so. the progressives would never say that they're politically irrelevant. The progressives believe that the homophobes are the what's keeping the Republican Party alive. Right. <laughs> The the actuality is like the the capitalists they're fine with selling you and making money off of you with all that rainbow f- covered merch you know like they're they're completely no, okay no, no, with no, that no, no. and they they're definitely yeah, yeah and they're definitely on the right those guys are definitely on the right so this this idea that the right is inherently homophobic I just I just don't buy it. Uh, Mark Twain's Revenge for five dollars says Sitch and Adam did you hear that I officially got Dev to commit to the centrist creed? So did I? Nice, Thanks. sweet. Good job. Well, I, I might have done it for like a super chat. Wow. Does that still count? <laughs> well, are you, what? I count. Are you saying that it wasn't authentic? Is that what you're trying to back out now? You made a commitment, Dave. No, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've been a centrist since before you guys started this show, I think. So don't worry. I'm in. Wow. I'm in. We invented the label. What are you talking about? Okay. You invented centrism? Yes. It didn't exist. No, enlightened centrism. Me. Oh, oh, enlightened, enlightened centrism. centrism is different than just centrism. Do you know that? That is oh, I, do, I do, but I thought I thought that was like a, a pejorative used by the left to like insult. We're taking it back. Who are, are crypto rightoids? Yeah, or taking it back. It's like the that, political. It's, a, it's our N word. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. All right. This is our I mean, struggle. We, 
we can act <laughs> our struggle. <laughs> hey, Dad, how we you even wanna... call it that? Our struggle. Yeah. My struggle is what I call it. My wow. struggle. Jesus oh, God. okay. Did you guys see? I posted a reading list thread on Twitter. I don't know if you guys saw it, but it went viral in like lefty Twitter because the, the most uh, well well worn book in the stack was Mein Kampf. I did. Yeah, your book on your bookshelf. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, the, the only one this guy's read is the one, like the one that's been opened 50,000 times. And it's like, I bought it used, guys. It's likely story. From Hitler. Directly yes. From Hitler. That's what I was thinking. True. Yeah. Did you guys know, though, if, if you buy uh, Mein Kampf, the money actually goes to a Jewish charity? So you're yeah, actually supporting not... the Jews. Yeah, hmm. that's, that takes all the fun out of it, though. Does it? <laughs> that's what yeah. they tell you, Dev. <laughs> oh, shit. You actually believe that, you fool. I guess last thing to mention. Um, I noticed that you guys talked about my um my debate slightly a little bit for a minute or two for like 30 seconds. How was your debate? It was fucking ridiculous. Who did you debate? I, there's a, a small YouTuber named Carl Max. Okay. And he's he was like a 19-year-old socialist. <clears throat> he's like and a he, uh, little person or something? Uh, no, he wasn't a little person. He, he was like a twink. Oh, okay. He was just Why like some a little person. Not all little said persons he was small. are twinks, though. He's like a small uh, YouTube channel. A small, a small YouTube channel. Yeah, <laughs> like literally a small YouTube channel. And um, like, like Wick has been trying a to get me to do more YouTube debates. channel means he's a midget. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, w Wick has been trying to uh, to get me to do more, like to try out debating. You know, getting getting into Twitch poll, dip my fingers and get my toes you in. You should. You'd be good. You at did it. really. You did really good, by the way. Did he? Oh, thanks. Yeah, well, he did. You. He came I across as he did reasonable, terrible, but. It, oh, oh okay. did you word well, on the street yeah uh, no i'm, I'm I, kidding i didn't hear oh, i didn't yeah. i didn't even know this took place so i i've always kind of seen my like like debating is probably my weak suit because i'm more of like a reading and writing kind of guy and not like an on the fly mm -hmm. I, i've definitely like i've had arguments with sargon over the years where i've just been like walloped you know and it's 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 been less on we, facts and more on <laughs> rhetoric oh I agree with that. We've been walled <laughs> by Sargon's rhetoric more than once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go, Sargon. Debate tactics. Look at that. <laughs> no, no, Sar Sar Sargon's a good boy. Um, is he though? Yes. Okay. But you, hold on. Are you guys going to anti Sargon now? No. Is, is it time for the Sargon <laughs> backstab? I'm literally just <laughs> fucking with you. I just listened back to our debate with Carl on the liberalism stuff, and I mean, it's it holds up. It's What's up? Oh, damn. multiple ones about yeah. liberalism. I feel like every day we have a, every time Carl comes on, we had a debate about liberalism. But no, he's out that. for liberalism. He hates liberalism's know, guts. He wants terrible. to drown so, it in the bathtub. I know. He he did that recent video promoting the Lotus Eaters. Like, what have I been doing recently? And he made like a three minute video mm -hmm. where he said that he still likes liberal values, but there are some foundational principles that gotta go. And it's like, you know, maybe maybe that might be the case. You know, maybe there are no, some things that are actually don't wrong, give in. even though that's why you don't have to give ban gay marriage, Dev. Don't you know? I'm not. I want to get ban gay marriage, but like. There's, there's, a few, there's, there's a few things in the philosophical side of Name liberalism one. that are that are a bit eh. well no. like 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 the idea Free of fungibility speech? no no fungibility is, is a bad liberal idea like nfts i agree what is fungibility well, fungibility it, 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 <laughs> it means like replaceability you know it's like the idea that everyone can it, there's, there's the idea of like, like a universal man that can be extracted out and then put in any situation and just like completely adapt. It's like that doesn't, doesn't really. That's work, not you know? liberalism, man. That, that is definitely a part of liberalism. liberalism. Listen, Bullshit. the main reason, no, no, the, the moral impetus behind something like immigration. Make me bring up my notes. It, that's not is liberalism, the yeah. is the idea that has nothing that you can to do bring, with liberalism. Hold, hear me out. Hear me out. It's the idea that you can bring people in and they'll simply just become like you with no pushback. You know, because our culture is just that much better. It's like, well, no, they're going to hold on to some of their own culture and some of that culture might be bad it might even be anti-liberal so it, it seems like liberalism does not have like very solid uh defense mechanisms against subversion right now so that's that like an anti-immigration straw man Amendment. of liberalism i i think i think what you're talking about that's an idea that's like, that's like a that's like a left-wing idea that's not a, like an idea that's inherent to the philosophy of liberalism maybe so but we do we have uh, gotten here at this point so okay but that's a different question Right. Okay. Like why yeah, are we listen. here, and how do we not be here? All right. Should, 
Do, do you want to debate it, Sitch? I, I thought you had to go. <laughs> <Let's> <laughs> like, go. I'll fight you anytime. No, you're no, like, no, you're no, like, no, oh, yeah. yeah okay. I, can't, I can't be here that long. Well, no, I'm the next reading project for me is um the book, The True and Only Heaven by Christopher Latch. And book he was like, he, he was a conservative liberalism. Well, hold on. He, he was a conservative who started, he, he started actually as a Marxist, then he became a liberal, then he became a conservative. And his view ultimately was that the liberal belief in unending progress ends up undermining liberalism itself because it like it like dismantles everything in the pursuit of progress. I don't even think like unending progress doesn't have anything to do with liberalism either. Yeah, all this stuff has nothing. This was my critique of Carl. It doesn't have anything to do with fucking. This was my critique. Hold on. Critique I'm talking about too, liberal cause... philosophy, not liberal government. I'm talking about liberal philosophy too. There's yeah. de- there's definitely this 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 idea of uh, of progress as being innately good in liberalism for sure. No, 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 no. Wait, is there between saying progress is innately good versus unending progress? Look, I had well, this problem in our debate. Eventually. Look, I had this problem with our debate with Carl too, because Carl is like, look, Locke came up with this. Therefore, it is liberalism. I'm like, Locke wiped his ass, too. That doesn't mean wiping your ass is part of liberalism. <laughs> yeah, yes, it is. No, well, let's be clear. So, yes, it is. You yes, should, it if is. you're a liberal, you need to fucking wipe your ass. All right? Look, I, think you, Locke, I yes. think you should wipe your ass. Let me be clear here. But I don't know why you would associate that with liberalism. Because it's a, that is a... Let's make it a part of liberalism right fucking now. All right. Uh, yeah, wash your ass. Wash your ass. This is a core tenet of liberalism. If you don't wash your this, ass, look, then the you point, ain't the point the this point is how we can finally fix India, guys. The point stands just because oh Locke, the someone who you classify as a liberal and, and was a liberal philosopher, did it doesn't mean it's part of liberalism. Liberalism is a set of values and ideas and institutions. But just you can't just come in and say, Oh, some liberal that I pulled, plucked out of history, thought this thing, and therefore I'm pinning it on liberalism. See, Adam, I actually agree with you, and that's probably the best argument against this point of view. It's the idea that even though a liberal writer might have might have written this at some point in time, there have been future liberal writers who have critiqued that. And also, liberalism is not just a set of political theories. It's also a practical political reality True. that we, that we yes. are living in. And yes. when the theory doesn't line up with the reality, you have to take a look at that and be like, well, OK, what what like like how should we define liberalism now? Because we've tried certain tenets of it that haven't necessarily worked out that great. And so yeah. that, I think that's why we have like neoliberalism. Right? Well, it's this like, is okay, what well, I kept some things. This is yeah. what I kept trying to do with Carl. I kept saying, look, I, I came up w- in our debate. I came up with six proposals, I think, that basically encompass all the ideas that are liberalism. I've added some to that sense because, uh, you know, obviously we're constantly talking about this and other people say things like, well, isn't the consent of the governed, you know, kind of part of liberalism? And I think, yeah, it probably is part of liberalism. Maybe we should put that in there. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I mean, I, I, I pretty much like, I think this is actually the, the proper pushback on, let's say, Sargon's ideas right. when he says, well, you know, but, but this, you, this is what liberalism said... originally meant. And it's like, well, it doesn't necessarily matter. Look, what the thing... Meant. And this is my critique of what Carl is doing, too, because he keeps trying yeah. to put these things in that bunch of things that don't belong. Like you just said, this idea that human beings are inter- culturally interchangeable. No one's ever tried to put that in the bag. Like, I think liberalism, liberalism wants to have a, a certain amount of tolerance for different beliefs. But I don't think they a liberal believes that that tolerance is um, infinite. <laughs> Like, well, I, I guess the question then is, how come it, it has been the case that historically, uh, historically, each generation of liberals ends up being more tolerant and more permissive than the previous generation, even sometimes to its own detriment? I, look, I'm not sure that that's the case. It seems like there is some kind of ebb and flow between individualism and, and less individualism in society. Well, sure, but like here, let me put it this way: liberals, let's say, twenty years ago, were talking very frank and very openly about how you can't just have unfettered illegal immigration and how people need to be sent back. You talk to a random liberal nowadays; they'll tell you that that uh, you know asking the illegals to be sent back is now racist. What happened in those twenty years? Yeah, but that has nothing to do with with liberalism. Right, all those yeah. No, no, no. Okay, okay, that's, okay. That's okay. very it simple. Has... I have the I have the very simple answer to that is because okay, all of a sudden. People started looking at demographics in terms of voting, and they're saying, hey, all these white people are voting for Republicans. 
not only is non white people are voting for Democrats, it's therefore just better for me as a Democrat to be in favor of more immigration so I win more elections. And then they sell that and they say, the hey, it's racist to be against theory. immigration. And then a bunch of people say, oh, my God, it's racist to be against immigration. They just eat it up. No, 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 no. Because they're yeah, told this by the they thought. Can't, they, right. they can't just come out and say, listen, we're going to win more elections if we let all these immigrants. I mean, they know. <laughs> they know. It's not. It's like a, It's like a, the most open secret of all this time. This is racist. Right. Since so, you're racist. No, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. The, right. the thing is, though, is That's that like happening. if even though like you can you can describe the mechanism accurately but yeah. nonetheless if you talk to let's say a liberal who's like 10 years younger than us right now he yeah. is more likely to say the statement sending back the illegals is racist you're doing you're doing the thing again you're doing the thing what's, you're what's saying thing? because a liberal believes this that means it's liberalism you can't okay. do that well how wait, wait, wait. how many liberals have to believe it before it becomes you know the current wait. iteration of liberalism why why did for I don't know, 30, no, 40, the 50 How many liberal, years. How many liberals wait, 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 wipe their wait, 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 wait. 100%, <laughs> because if they don't, they're wait. not a liberal. Still wait. doesn't make it part For of it. Go ahead, For 40 to Sitch. 50 years, okay, to be conservative meant, oh my God, we need free market solutions to everything. We need to be pro-warmongers. We need to let the corporations do whatever they want. We need to unlock the power of business. And now mm -hmm. that gets you labeled a fake Republican. You're a rhino if you believe all that shit. So explain how does this all work if there's just this one unidirectional thing for for politics? Well, I don't think it's unidirectional. I do think that just these labels. Well, no, but that was the question time. you asked. You said why is why is everything getting more progressive? I don't I don't necessarily know. I don't know why it's getting more progressive, but it does seem to be. Yeah, like I don't, I don't know, man. No, but I, <laughs> I can't answer that question. Okay. Well, I, 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 well, yeah. I, I am observing it as getting more progressive over, let's say, the past hundred years. But I think I don't humans in general why. get more. So progress, like the left is, as I've always characterized it, and, and is just about change, essentially, at the end of the day. And as our society changes more because our environment changes more and more, things are going to go more and more in the direction of change. I just think it's a very simplistic answer to the question. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's it's change in one political direction. Like no one no one is advocating for a change back to monkey, you know? Well, what do you mean? There's a bunch of people that are advocating for that exactly. Okay, no, no one mainstream. Like, you know what I mean, right? Like, is no is it is it actually that's because a main, it's not a change. That's a regression. Regression is change. No, regression no, no, no. Change. Stop. So the so the left is basically views that all of our existing problems exist because of our current systems and hierarchies, and so we need to change and try something new or different or outside of the current paradigm to mm. succeed. And the right has the opposite view. They view all of our problems come from changing away from current traditions and systems and hierarchies that brought us something good. And so, well, yeah, but I mean, right. Previous but so when paradigms you look at, are still changes though. But okay. You're, you're getting too bogged down in like word thinking and not the concept that I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. The right looks at it like our, like current, like traditions and traditional systems are the answer and anything that degrades away from them or deviates away from the traditional wisdom of the ancestors is bad. Okay. And that's what creates all of our problems. And the left has the opposite approach. They say, hey, all of our problems come come from living living to the wisdom of our ancestors or listening to the wisdom of our ancestors. And so we need to change and do something that's outside of that wisdom, outside of that tradi traditional way of thinking. Yes. Right. So so, okay. so the left is is moving more and more away from the traditional origins. Yes. That's the thing. That that is the unidirectional belief of progress right that, but, that's right. That, that's the unending progress as, right you, as, as every generation moves further and further away from that traditional wisdom that is what the unlimited progress is yeah, that, that, okay but that will two, happen unlimitedly there's two issues here the first thing is survivor's bias okay and that's okay. that people ignore people who all the ass survive exactly people ignore <laughs> all the traditional aspects of our society that don't change because they become invisible to them like a good one until very recently, or even still recently, is still the adherence to the idea that like you want to have a two-parent household, right? Traditional wisdom, right? Getting married is gonna is going to make you happy, right? There's a lot of traditional wisdom and ideas that have just existed for so long that we become invisible to them, to us. And it's only when they become challenged that you're like, oh my God, we're challenging this traditional wisdom, right? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is. The whole point, I believe, from an evolutionary perspective, of there even being like people having this desire to change is because as the environment, like if you're living in a, in a valley 
where the environment is stable and you have a good source of food and there's no problem, you can live in a conservative mindset where you don't change anything as long as you're successful and your people will prosper for thousands and thousands of years. And it's only when some environmental shift occurs, the environment changes, that suddenly the conservative wisdom leads you to die because you needed to change and adapt to the situation and you didn't. And we're living in this time period, especially right now, but we've been living it for a thousand years where technology is changing, changing, changing rapidly, which means our environment keeps changing, changing, changing rapidly. So obviously, as long as things are changing, it's going to lead more into the left-wing mindset of, well, we need to change to fit our our philosophy to whatever the environment is changing around us. And that all makes sense, yeah. Um, I think your first point was just kind of restating what I was thinking in different words. Wow. Because what you what you were describing sounds a lot like the the unlimited progress. Because even then, well, no. like, th- when you say unlimited sounds like progress, you're putting like a negative spin on on just survivor's bias, which is just reality. Kind of and kind of not. I got to think about it a bit more. I, I haven't thought of it in terms of survivor's bias yet. It's just been like there's there's this feeling on the right. And it's it's not unfounded that with all of the change, we've lost some important things and that course. people are start people are starting to feel it now. Yeah, like I a lot of like nihilism and, and things right. like that. And so there's lots of there's lots of right wing, let's say right wing thinkers, right wing books, right wing right wing writers who are trying to figure out what has been lost and how to get it back. Right. And they're doing it outside of a progressive framework, which I think is we, valuable. Here's the problem. Since th- those are people that just, I would argue, probably naturally have right wing moral intuitions. And so their intuition tells them the past has the answer. They don't know that. They just intuitively believe the past has the answer. And so then they're kind of post hoc justifying it to like try to confirm their bias. Well, because, and they're disgruntled by their present circumstances. Yeah, of course. Because if you look back, like, fuck, you go read any fucking person from any back in the day, they're all complaining about the same fucking thing that everyone's complaining about now. Oh, the kids today, the they don't have any respect today. for tradition. <laughs> They're all just, you know, we need to go back to like fucking the ancient Greeks are like the kids today. We need to go back to the ancient fucking traditions. All these kids with their newfangled ideas, making everything terrible. And people saying, oh, be Greek straight guys. Yeah, exactly. Ooh. Or like, oh, you know, I feel like, you know, it's fucking you could dig up a million things from Rome or Greece or fucking Egyptians talking about like, what is the reason of life? I feel all this existential dread in my life, blah, 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 blah. Like people always had these thoughts forever. The only time people didn't have these thoughts was when they were working so hard to survive that they didn't have time to think of these things. As as soon as people get luxury time, they start to think of like the deep, just scary questions about like the nature and reality of life. That's all. And people just have a lot more luxury time nowadays. Things were so much better when I had to work all the time and couldn't think about this stuff. Yeah. Like that's the thing. It's like, yeah, you you don't want to have to think about like the existential dread questions. Then get, then go fucking, you know, be in a military zone 24 seven or, or go something back, like go back go, to the farm. Or, yeah. Go live on a farm where you're spending literally sun up to sun down, just working yourself to the bone. Then you're not going to necessarily think about those things. Maybe like, it's just, I, that's mean, the I, I agree with you, here. but like there there's, I mean, the, the conservatives have, have been ringing the alarm bell on the opposite problem, right? You know, you know, the, the coom machine problem where you're right. just you're in, engaging in constant pleasure all day. That's completely meaningless, which is true. It's, that's a, and that there's nothing wrong. That is true. That is a completely true critique. Yeah. Yeah, and like I know, I know, Adam, you just said something like, "Um, I you just said it, and I already fucking forgot it." My God, and maybe I need to go to bed. That's okay. <laughs> go to bed. You, you know, it, it was it was something like it was something like, um, oh man, it wasn't it better when I had to fucking work all day, and it was like, and there's obvious like there's some truth to that, but also if you have like no meaningful work to do, it's just as bad. You know, people yeah. people definitely fall into depression when they, when they feel like they're right. just useless. Well, that's another thing too, because I'm sure. You know, humans obviously evolved to work for food production specifically. So I would imagine that even if you were like a farmer back in the day, that that might bring, you know, watching something grow probably hit you psychologically much different than working in a factory. This is why gardening is so damn enjoyable, even though like, yeah, it seems ridiculous. But you go out in the yard and you've like plant some things and you watch them. It's like exciting. Sure. No, it is actually. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah, creating, man. you're you're putting something out. P- people, humans are wired to, like you you know like the little baby who like they'll they'll build up the little blocks and they'll knock it down and they'll laugh like hysterically. Yep. 
Yeah. It's because they're enacting physical change in their environment in some dramatic way. And humans are wired to enjoy that. And when you talk about planting, that's essentially what you're doing. Yeah. You're creating this change in your physical environment that's very visible. How many trees have you grown from seeds, Sitch? Zero. God, you got to do it. It's so yeah. gratifying. <laughs> Zero. Trees Rox, that's not true. We've done a bunch of planting things for Boy Scouts, but I never followed up. Yeah. Look, go back yeah, and I, visit I one of those too. trees and just marvel. You're like, oh my God, I planted this when I was a child. Look at well, it not now. A, if, he, if he didn't plant it as a child, though, it's, I mean. It doesn't count. <laughs> that. That ship is I, I did the same thing, Sitch. You have like a little, you have like, it's got like a little planter gun that's like a tree loaded in it and you like fired into the ground. Remember those? No, yeah. I have no clue. What I know you're what you're talking, talking about. about. Those are bad. Oh, really? You had a, okay, so, you had a planter gun and boys gun? Yeah, it was like, this, it was like this metal chamber. Yeah. And you would like, there'd be like, like a tray full of like little saplings. Yeah. And you'd like, you'd load it into the thing and then you'd like stick it into the ground and go poof. It that like sounds awesome. We never used. Yeah, we never had one didn't of those. Use those. No, we oh. had an old-fashioned dig a hole. <laughs> <laughs> you had to use like a <laughs> weak. You, you, yeah. Hold on. You had to use like a just like a shovel and. Yes. Boring. Yes. Hold on. Let me see if I can show it to you. That sounds awesome. No. I found it. Hold okay. on. I'll give you a picture of it real quick. Look at this. Get out of the way, Dave Rubin. Okay. Are we gonna finish this video, Sitch? We'll Just finish look, it. Look at this thing. Look at oh, this thing. Oh, that thing. I know. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, we we have had that thing. Oh, I don't okay. think of that is so, like a tree gun. I think that's like the little like the tree pole. Okay. It's definitely a tree. Okay, maybe there's like another version of it. Like what the fuck? Okay, anyway, no. Basically yeah. inside inside the cylinder, yes, you put like a little right. sapling with with like yeah, a yeah, like, yeah, like a plug yeah. of dirt. Right, and right. You right. stick it in the ground and then it goes. Doop. I was envisioning like some giant that was like putting like half grown trees into the ground. I was like, what are you? Like, oh, <laughs> like 20 foot trees? <laughs> yeah. I was like, what? I was like, what are you talking about? No, yeah, no, 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 I'm not okay, talking about yeah. that. Is that... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, sorry for derailing so much. No, but problem. it's always nice talking to you guys. Always nice yeah, talking to you. Thanks. Take care, man. Have a good day. Have a good uh, night. Adam. Have a good Adam. sleep. Yeah. Adam. What we up? We got to do mold bug, right? Mold bug three. Oh my God! How do I kick this guy? The kick. chat's been asking for it. Kick. The chat's been asking for it. By chat, you mean you? I mean, we might do another mole bug, but look, I think last time I lost my temper though, and I'm kind of getting a bad reputation for being too angry. So, <laughs> should we All should right. we say publicly who said no, that? No, we shouldn't. No, we should tell Wait, Dev in private though, right? Yes, totally. Yeah, yeah. We'll type it to me. We'll tell you later. So, someone, someone you not expect was uh, <laughs> it's very unexpected. Was uh yeah okay. Anyway, I'll I'll tell you on DMs. Okay, but yeah, thanks. Well, look, we'll consider it. But I look <laughs> my my problem with the mole bug streams is that mm -hmm. all we're doing is we're going into such fine grain detail that we're not really attacking any of his wider ideas. So if we do it, I just I want you to lay out his broad okay. argument and for us to attack his broad argument because like nitpicking at these little things that he's gotten wrong. Well, he could get those little things wrong and the broad argument still be true. So I don't right, feel right. like we're really dismantling okay. it in any real sense. So, so rather than do like go like chapter by chapter, like last time, we're just going to talk about the ideas. You want to do it like that? Yes. Want, want me to like write up an essay? We can like discuss it. Yes, yes, and and the best counter arguments against those, obviously. So I'm into doing that, and I'll commit right here to doing that if if that's the what we're gonna do. Wow. Okay. Should we get somebody who actually wants to defend Moldbug because none of us no. like him? No. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to have like the real the real debate over the ideas? No. No, not really. Okay. All right. <laughs> not really. Okay, hold on. Sitch, you typing the name? I, I saw you typing for a minute. Oh, I wasn't gonna tell, send it to you until after you left. Yeah, I don't know. See I, you I, later, I man. It. Hold on, I, I want to say, I want to say, I just want to react to it on stream. Okay. Yeah. Why well, yeah, you? She listened to what? Never mind. Get out of here. I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I'll see you guys later. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay. Jesus. Dev derailing every. I didn't think it'd be derail. God, yeah. it's so unlike him. I know. Yeah. What yeah. are you gonna do? Anyway, can 
be a, a woman, whether you, whether you're, whether you're trans or cis, and you're kind of, you're pandering to the to male gaze and to, to, you look the way that men want you to look and yeah, look ugly you and are, and shit. you're not <laughs> challenging any of the things that they're saying about you, whether they're. No woman has ever wanted to look hot. True. They only, only they want, want to look, look like th- ugly, ugly, hideous goblins who live in the swamp. The only, the only desire is to look how men want them to look. <laughs> That's so ridiculous. Well, at least men don't find me attractive. <laughs> whether it's objectifying or degrading or in the case of a trans woman, whether they're, you know, doing this. Women looking hot. So degrading. <laughs> yeah. Every, every time I see an ugly ass woman, I, I just respect her so much. The level of ridiculousness of everything coming out of ContraPoint's mouth is insane thing that that straight men do to trans women where they kind of are simultaneously expressing sexual attraction to you while also kind of invalidating that they're, 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 they're saying i mean it's, it's this like set of contradictory things that they say to you right one you'll never be a woman you're a man two but you're hot three how is that it's, it's gay to be attracted to trans women but i'm not gay but i am attracted not, to you it, and like, mm. you know it, it doesn't make sense of course it doesn't make sense they they joke about it because they're uncomfortable that, right they make those out. jokes about uh you know trans women trapping them or whatever because they, they sort of conceptually don't know how to deal with the nuances of gender and sexuality and that's what trans people do is they sort of force people to confront those nuances trans people They're blameless. blur the lines of the most fundamental human distinction hmm. and that's something that people find threatening to their own identity so if you can find a way to be a trans that's person that is true. minimally threatening mm. then you'll be given more accommodation so there's a kind of short-term self-interest i think that comes with debasing yourself in this way yeah i i read the replies i was reading them last night and i'm not going to read them here but i was reading the replies to her to that thirst trap and i was like god you know i feel badly for her in some moments and then i see what she says about other queer people and then my sympathy runs dry pretty quickly yeah but it i mean it's gosh just debasing yourself your identity debasing you know, yourself Jeez. i know i know having their opinion is debasing yourself look i just looking I don't know how looking you... attractive for men is debasing yourself well and i mean she's a competent content creator people like her content people watch her videos she has a big channel just uh, the idea that she's basically just People are only into her because she looks a certain way. That's so degrading. That's so degrading. Why don't like, people accept us? Anyway, be ugly and everyone's shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Look, and uh, look, Blair White is smart. Blair White is a smart person, makes intelligent content. <laughs> Just like uh, all people care about is her tits. <laughs> Yep. So, so bad. This is, look, in a different context, this is what you would call toxic masculinity. Actually, it would be closer to toxic femininity because a lot of women degrade other women, put other women down because they're uh, jealous of how hot they look. That's how you know they're really, trans women are really women. <laughs> yeah. When they give their shitty opinions, is it toxic masculinity or toxic femininity? Yeah. I know people say this and I know it's like probably cheesy, but when I see queer Republicans, the queer conservatives, whatever, pandering to these swaths of, you know, white cishet men or the Republican Party or the RNC or Fox News, and they're just like chipping away at everything that makes them special as queer people just for like a fraction of attention. (laughs) or congratulations or pats on the back or validation from these people who will never really see them as like fully human jesus christ to me but it is complicated like you said because i think to just write this off as like oh well they hate themselves and they'll do anything for attention it's it's weird because that's what you did like in the sentence before this yeah and like this idea of like 
fully human. Like you, if you don't, if you don't accept every part of someone, then you're you're literally not seeing them as human. All right, like that 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 gets carte blanche for me to consider communists not human. Right, right, right. Like you made if, the like, rules, not me. Like people can, there can be disagreements about lifestyles, behaviors, or whatever, without it being like, oh, you don't see me as a human. Even yeah. when I even when I disagree with you know their with people that are anti-gay or whatever. I mean, I, I don't think it's like an anti-human thing that's going on there. You don't instantly see them as not human. I don't even. Th I don't even think the people that are anti-gay are seeing them as not human. Of course not. Look, yeah. a lot of them have that. Don't hate the sin or hate the sin. Like you'll tell them, look, you're anti-gay, you're homophobic, and they'll say, no, I love gay people. I just don't like the behavior. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I don't know if any of that's. Look, true. I don't buy it either, but at least they're. <laughs> yeah. Look, that's an argument that they'll make. Sure, sure. But... Look, I'm sure some people do are making that argument sincerely, and some people aren't making the argument sincerely. But right, it's it's more complicated than just nobody is. Everyone is lying. Everyone is just subterfuge so that they can be homophobic and hate on yes. gay people. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Let's go. It's like, I mean, like you said, there's more, it's more psychologically complicated. There is something to be said about that validation. And also in the case of Blair White. Look, it, it's complicated because here I am on my podcast with it's ContraPoints trying to get as much attention as I possibly can because you're a big time YouTuber and celebrity. So, I mean, you could actually say, I'm just being a big pick me, but that would be degrading for me. So let's not say that. <laughs> let's just say that about right. someone I don't like. Well, it, I mean, and again, I just, I don't understand how Blair's existence doesn't serve the, the cause. Of course the cause it does. Of increasing acceptance. More, more so Blair because of what we have talked about before. Yeah. Just if, if Blair is perceived as being a conservative and being on team conservative, Conservatives are more likely to take what she has to say seriously. I would think so, yeah. Yeah, so that's a huge win for the for trans acceptance in the conservative circles. I just I think what they're having trouble with is conservative acceptance of trans people is just such a like a cognitive the, dissonance type. They're the thing wrong for them. trans people. What's happening is we don't want the conservatives to like trans people. We want conservatives to like trans people who have the correct political alignment. <laughs> because that's if they, true. Yes. If they accept yeah. Blair White, which they do, and things like that, if they accept Blair White, then they're oh, just that's accepting a great point. conservative. We don't want we don't want that trans person to be accepted because it doesn't further our political side, even though it furthers our identity's acceptance. It's not really about the acceptance of the identity. It's the same thing with the black conservatives. It's the same thing with the black Republicans. Yeah. Yeah. That's a I think great that's, point. I think that's a huge part of it. Yeah. Money. Yeah. The, I mean, once you commit to this as a career path, then it's sort of, it sort of becomes less interesting to me to analyze it in terms of like, what is this person getting out of this? And it becomes, just okay, with well, the ideas this is this person's, in good faith. This person, I know all this applies to all this applies both to them, it applies to us, it applies to everyone. So, the idea that people are are being insincere, I mean, I, I think it's more likely people that get into that situation don't have deeply held political beliefs. Because if you have deeply held political beliefs like what they're hypothesizing here that blair is just a secret progressive with these deeply held beliefs that she's going against her deeply held beliefs for money to grift like that is a that's a kind of hell like can you imagine selling out your beliefs every day for money that's oh man sounds awful yeah yeah if you but if you don't have any deeply held beliefs you're like well you know i don't really care either way that i could see happening this idea that they have though just seems like the most remote possibility ever right but how would it make any sense if it's like you know the beliefs we're talking about here are things that you know from their perspective are supposed to be you know their own protection and their own validity 
as trans people or or gay people. Right. So. Well, the, the, look, the Blair's position is much better. It's much healthier because Blair is basically saying, look, I don't need conservatives to validate my identity. Right, right. Which is, I mean, that's the strong position that we want everyone to have about their identity. It's basically the dignity culture. It's like my identity is, is for me. I don't need society to come in and validate who I am to feel comfortable in my own skin. This... This new victimhood culture is much closer to the honor culture where like you can really only feel good about yourself if other people are like down with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is doing, you know, I mean, there's always been people from marginalized groups who engage in, you know, a debasing form of entertainment. Yeah, the Uncle Tom's, Because yeah. it's financially remunerative. <laughs> Just say and, it. Oh my God, he's so harsh, Rags, but you're exactly well, right. Yeah, Contra's acting like Blair White's like a black person who's putting on like a mammy show or something. The Uncle, the <laughs> uncle saying, Tom yeah. of trans people. Yeah, don't, exactly. Right. Yeah, don't they, they are ex-identity. Don't they know what team they should be on? Right. So wrong. So yeah. wrong. Poor Blair White. And it, yep, it comes at, I'm sure, a certain cost in terms of your own self-worth and self-respect. But, you know, everyone's got to pay rent. Ever. <laughs> oh. Just basically calls her a whore. Ooh. Come uh, on. How's it not? How's it not? She's wow. doing this to pay the rent. Speaking of paying rent. Moondoggy for $20 <laughs> says, It's funny because at time went on, Blair became more individually minded while still being center right. She knew the picture was going to piss everyone off, especially the right that don't like trans people in general. Yeah, I mean, that's what's kind of, they, they like, they only look at it through a single lens of, of, um, of like, oh, they're afraid that, that they're going to lose. I think they're afraid that they're going to lose the ability to say that the right is like, homophobic or transphobic i think it is what you're saying rags but a lot of it is just all about i want to win political office for x people because they're kind of only looking at it from the perspective of like blair is just doing their bidding as opposed to well how do you know blair isn't pulling people from from the right to be more pro trans you know to be to be against you know the lauren whiskeys of the world because if you only let the crazies exist and be vocal in the movement the crazies will dominate the movement you want your blairs you want your gatekeepers you want those gatekeepers you want those people out there in the world kind of tempering the movement so, this well, is a fundamental wrong belief that progressives have they think if somebody moves away from being anti-gay to being pro-gay or, or gay accepting that they become progressive. But that's not true. You can be conservative and be gay accepting. But they right. don't think that that's a possibility. I feel that if they had to answer the question, if, they, if, the, if the wizard, the, the, if the, the famous wizard, if the wizard took them yeah. away yeah. and said, I'm going to ask you a question and you must answer truthfully. And I'll know if you're lying, you have to answer truthfully or else right. uh, you'll never escape. All right. Would you be okay? The contra points lady here. Would you be okay with having trans people be fully and completely and totally accepted into society, but they are vastly, overwhelmingly, firmly conservative leaning? <laughs> That's would a great you, question. <laughs> would you be okay with that? <laughs> no. Of now course, tell me not. the truth or you'll be stuck right. here in my tower forever because I'm the wizard and I know if you're lying. What would ContraPoint's answer be? It'd be hell no. It would be fuck no. <laughs> Interesting. Better, yeah, that's a good question. Better so, not what do you think? than dead or something. No. Better I, dead than some, whatever. Are we all better in agreement that red. it would be hell no? <laughs> I, don't, I think it would be hell no. Yeah, I don't think that she would be very keen on that. So the option is there'd be complete societal acceptance of all trans people. There'd be no trans bigotry whatsoever, but they'd all be or mostly be conservative. Right? Yes. Be the the trade-off, yeah. the quote trade-off. Yes. Yeah. 
That's like know, hell on earth for contrapoint. That's a very interesting. I don't. I feel like you could ask a lot of left wing trans people that question, and I don't think they would. Well, I've, they wouldn't want to answer the question. That's ridiculous. Because <laughs> you ask me, like people say, "Oh, you're white supremacist," you blah blah blah. It's like I, if everyone around me was black and brown and green and blue and all the other fucking colors, right? If there was just no white people, but everyone had like good liberal values and was kind and everything, I'm like, man, I'm fucking all for it, man. That's, that'd be right. great. That'd be that'd be a really amazing society that we have. Yep. Well, this brings in the cognitive dissonance because they they don't believe you can be pro gay and conservative. So that's why, which is just so it's it's so bizarre to me because it's actually a really really easy hypothetical. Imagine a conservative, but they're okay with you being gay, and yes. that's it. There's no contradiction. <laughs> that's literally it. It doesn't go against the will of some deity. It doesn't create some cognitive dissonance between two principles, be they moral or otherwise. I. It's really simple. You could be a gay person who is like, yep, a two parent household is the way to go. Family units. Uh, and maybe they could have a certain religions that they have a preference for. Uh, all that stuff doesn't have any necessary contradictions in it. They could say, yeah, absolutely. Gay people should be able to adopt because it's better than them being orphans and not having parents at all. Because, you know, family units and that sort of thing. It, yep. None of that is contradictory. It's, it's super not. simple. Yeah, if get all conservatism is is a a predisposition towards tradition, and if the tradition is gay acceptance, then then it's conservative. True. <laughs> Everyone does have to pay rent, even even Blair White. Um, I was listening to a podcast a while ago, and there was a black woman who was talking about Dude. Candace Owens. I was wondering when Candace Owens was going to come up. <laughs> yeah, Candace Owens does come up. And because it's, it's, there are parallels here with her being like the face of black woman conservatives. And this woman on this podcast, who I believe her name was Africa Brooke, she had a really interesting point of view, which was not, she, she didn't agree with Candace Owens' politics. And she made this point, which I did find compelling, which is that, you know, you know, for white cisgender heterosexual men, there is not a political position that they could take where anyone would ever accuse them of being politically at odds with who they are as, you know, in their identity. And it is something that is afforded to like specifically that group of people that women don't get and then as you get into the intersections that people of color don't get that queer people don't get and so that was like one of the most compelling arguments that i've ever heard to be like all right i just because this is one of the most compelling arguments this person's ever heard i want to roll it back just a little bit <laughs> so that i can catch that again because this is the most compelling argument she's ever heard he's ever heard whichever one accuse yeah, okay. them of being politically at odds with who they are as you know in their identity you missed it Dang, I'm not a political position at this point, which I did find compelling, which is that, you know, you know, for white cisgender heterosexual men, there is not a political position that they could take where anyone would ever accuse them of being politically at odds with who they are as, you know, in their identity. And it but consider, why do you think that's true? Why do you think that a black person can take a political position that you believe to be at odds with their identity. Why do you think that's the case? Because I think a black person can think any kinds of different way. Now, if a black person joined the KKK, yeah, sure, that would be that. I yeah, that one's a that would be weird a little one. odd. That would, be, <laughs> that would be like yeah, that checks a box. Sure, yeah. But that aside, <laughs> it's I I don't think that a uh, I, I think the vast majority of political opinions that you can have are completely removed from what race you are or what sexuality you are. We were just talking about being a gay conservative, right? You can be a gay liberal, gay socialist, gay fascist, whatever. There's no necessary, you know, contradiction there unless mm -hmm. it's like a very specific gay sort of thing. Yeah, you can be gay fascist. Why not? I don't know. Well, I mean, yeah, you could have a fascist government that doesn't give a shit if you're gay as long as you uphold the moral values of their nation. And, you know, mm. you, the, the, the great leader could be a, you know, flaming homosexual or something like that. And they could have pink banners instead of red ones. You know, the whole deal. You could be a fascist and gay. I don't think there's been much of that in history we can point to. But I mean, it's theoretically, yeah, it's, you could be that. You could be your own special little fascist party of, 
you know, a very diverse fascist group. You could have a fascist uh, government that doesn't care what race you are, so long as you hold fast to the, uh, I guess, national identity that you're trying to espouse at the expense of other nations and, uh, you know, peoples and ideologies. I feel if, like wokeness is at w odds with my identity as a straight white male. Well, so there is a political ideology that's against me. There's a very he's, important question. He's wrong. Which is that if if the gay people were all fascist, does that mean that Antifa would be gay bashing? Ooh, bash oh, the yeah. fascists. That's true. If they're gay, fa would they? If there was legit, it makes you wonder if that party was real and had some presence. It was a legit fascist party with a fascist leader that upheld upheld a certain kind of like national identity or anything, something like that. But it was legitimately like we do not give a shit what your sexual orientation is. Literally doesn't matter. Just put on the jacket and they would be you gay know, bashing. Sitch. That would be interesting. I wonder what the reaction would be to that. It'd be very. Well, I guess They'd we'll be, ask Nick Fuentes before. They would be reactionary <laughs> gay bashers. But to answer your question, yeah, well, so I kind of agree with what the person's saying. I kind of disagree because, like, yeah, there's not, like, a mainstream position, at least currently so far. Like, sure, white nationalists will call you a race traitor if you vote Democrat or something. Um, but, like, mainstream, it's not seen as, like, a white person is betraying their whiteness by voting one way or the other. Um, where there is... But it's weird because, I mean, I guess this is a critique of the left that they're loving, which is nice, which is like, yes, if you're black or Latino or whatever and you vote for Republican, it's like you're a traitor, you're a race traitor. Where I do think I agree with you, Adam, that like wokeness, at least intersectional wokeness is kind of built around being anti-white straight male. So Yeah. It is kind of being like a, like a, a traitor. Look, there's it plenty of white straight male woke people though that I'm sure of don't course see it that way. Them, yeah. yeah. Right. Which is fine. Yeah, but well, if a lot of them I don't think understand what exactly they're supporting. No, they think they're supporting civil rights. Right. They're like, but why do I keep seeing on Twitter uh, white people suck? <laughs> they're yeah. not talking about me, right? Right. Well, it's funny because, you know, they it's, a lot of this it does feel kind of projection y. Because they're saying like, oh, you know, there's all these gay people and queer people who are coming out as conservatives. They're like, oh, we're one of the good ones. Don't attack me. He even used right. like the witch trial example. And I literally feel like that's what wokeness is. It's the kind of witch trial of like, I'm one of the good whites. I'm an ally. I'm not racist. And so yeah. they throw someone else under the bus. Yeah, I was at the woke meeting this week and they talked about the demographic shift and everyone cheered that white people weren't going to be around anymore. That's yeah, kind of exactly. weird. <laughs> yeah, I had exactly. to make sure there wasn't a skull on my hat. That was strange. <laughs> that was kind of weird yeah. when everyone was cheering about that. Oh. So how, look, how is this different than the gay person in the in the conservative crowd? And they're like, I mean, it seems kind of similar. It seems kind of suspect, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's not good. Okay. If, if woke people can handle it, I'm sure they can. Look, this is the thing. I don't know if black conservatives are going to the conservative meeting and they're saying as obnoxious things as like, we need to bring back slavery. <laughs> like, can you imagine that? But they Turns literally out when we put on the hoods. We all look the same. <laughs> hey, there you go. But look, if if you're a black conservative and they're talking about bringing back slavery at the meeting, get out of there. Yeah, <laughs> like, then, get out of there they immediately. Have, they have gone a bit funny. Yeah, cross the cro line. They have crossed yeah. the line. But at the same time, I do think that you're you've got white people going to the woke meeting and they're talking about the demographic switch when white people are finally going to lose yeah. power, and everyone's cheering. And but the white person isn't getting out of there. They're not Sunny. seeing the same. They're not so, seeing it as the same. Plenty of white people self-flagellating. Yeah. Really? Sorry for being yeah. white. Uh <laughs> I was know. the TJ Kirk thing. That's exactly what they're yeah. doing. They're cheering along with it. They're like, that's right. I do <laughs> deserve nothing, and I must give reparations, and I am guilty for the sins of my ancestors, even though we didn't move to America until Oh like, man. This is getting too real here. What was oh, the what was the TJ Kirk thing? Remember, I'm sorry I'm white, I'm sorry I'm male. Remember, he had his shirt off and he was hitting himself. It was like a joke back before he turned into this crazy. Back, back before he actually guy. meant it. 
Back oh, before when he like gotcha. when he was like pro free speech and stuff like that, you know, right. the old days, the before back, times, the good the old long, days, long yeah. ago. Right. Back when it was a joke, now it's not a joke. If he did that today, you'd be like, oh, he means it. <laughs> yeah, he is. Yeah, it wouldn't be a prop. Terrible. That's sad. I've tried to get TJ back on the show, but he seems to. That's be the most exposure to... he's gotten in a long time. He doesn't seem to want to come back on. So, uh oh, uh -oh spaghettio. We like to make look. It's interest. It's more interesting talking to people you disagree with than just being a big old hug box. So, yeah. Evidently, get out of here, TJ. Rags. Evidently, TJ doesn't think that though. Look, at least Rags disagrees with us on the on the atheist stuff. So, I mean, look, what atheist even, stuff? Even he is willing to come. I'm not on atheist, and, Adam. What are you talking about? <laughs> I thought you were atheist. No. <laughs> what, god, what fucking god do you believe in? Oh my God! He believes in the one true God, right? How, how dare you? How dare you? Yeah, how dare you? I'm so, I I am so confused. I had no idea. God. Which one is that? The one true God. Oh. See, look, uh, we don't have a we don't run a hug box here, Rags. That's fine. Yeah. No, it's fine. No, I like uh, I blood for the blood God, the one true God. There you go. <laughs> that is true. The one true God. Yeah, the one true God. Yeah, Slanesh. Yes. Rags is still very upset. I Rags still remembers the day when he found Not out me. that God God wasn't real. He's like, they lied oh, to me. No, do you know how they fucking, lied to me? The day I realized it was all a bunch of horseshit, it was like, oh my god, it's like a huge weight was lifted from my shoulders. No. I was like, oh god, I'm not in I'm not in cosmic North Korea anymore. Oh my goodness, I'm so <laughs> happy. No, no, no. You went the route. You were like, oh my god. Because all those people aren't burning in hell forever. Oh my, my goodness. I'm so glad. I'm so well, happy. That, look, I'm glad you could look at the bright side. Yeah. <laughs> that's actually Yeah, because that's the only side. How burning in hell is a nice bright How side. How burning in hell is yeah. a little silver lining. Yeah. But Rags, let me let me tell you the bad side of that. Oh, what is the bad side? The people that really deserve to burn in hell for all eternity. Hitler, Stalin. Mao. We've, well, we've been over Charles this. Charles Manson. We've been over this. I don't think Hitler deserves to burn in hell. Wow. Clip look. it. It's yeah. true. It's true. I don't, don't think he does. Don't be in look, rags. I I talked about disagreement, but don't be insane. Okay. Don't be insane. <laughs> like, what is this go, madness? Don't go too far, okay? That's so weird. How can yeah, you don't look? be weird? I don't think it's actually that strange. It's I think, totally strange. What are you talking you know, about? I don't you can't, think that... you can't kill. Look, you can't try to commit genocide and like not deserve hellfire and damnation for all eternity. That's the reason why we well, invented hell. It's that it's that bit at the end that it's that for all eternity clause there at the end. Look, that, this is that's this where is I got to draw the line. For all eternity, I can't go with now. With punishment, man, I'm all for it. Justice, you bet. Retribution, to some degree, depending on your definition, you bet. But for eternity, no, nah, I can't. I can't this go is, with the look, eternity part. This, this is what this is what we commonly call the anti-theist brain rot, right? Oh here. my goodness! Because look, <laughs> oh my goodness! I, look, ten, tw twice eternity, ten times eternity. Oh, that's it, even more eternity. Eternity, just, it's eternity them up. times oh, it's like eternity. A, it's like a slot machine. You're getting the, the multi-genocide <laughs> bonus. How are there so many eternities out there? So Look, many eternities. I'm telling you, and the, and and Hitler deserves all of them. Oh my goodness gracious. Which which Jew got him the eternity part? Because surely one murder all if, if you murder one person, right, do you deserve hell for eternity? Right. For one person, one life? No. No. Okay. So how many this is the Jewish question. How many Jews does it take? <laughs> How many <laughs> Jews do you have to kill until you to get, get eternity eternal punishment? Which one tips the scales? Is it the fifth, the tenth, the twentieth, the one hundredth? Do, do you think there's just like a like God just has like a checkbox? Like there's like a categories. Like once you get past the million, like you if you killed nine hundred and nine like nine hundred thousand nine hundred ninety nine uh, hundred thousand Jews, you'd be okay. But once you get to a million, like oh, that's I eternity. mean that's that's a Look, Jew I'm too comfortable. Far. I'm yeah. comfortable with just one. It's depending upon how it's done. Like if it's completely hideously done, like you torture the person for days or hours or what whatever. What if they deserve it? 
Well, look, obviously, if they deserve <laughs> it, that's a, with a real question. Look, that's, a, that's, so that's a different situation, obviously. Sometimes look, people the whole con torture. Okay. Look, the con whole concept of hell was invented because people literally do I deserve agree. It torture. Was invented. I'm glad we're on the same page. It was invented, the concept of hell. Well, I agree with you. But look, I, I, I don't I, think Sitch believes in hell. He I, believes I don't in believe the one hell. true God, but he doesn't believe Slanesh, in hell. Yes. Um, Which, now, what's, I will... Sitch, what is the point of even believing in God if you don't believe in hell? Hell is the better oh my goodness. Wow. hell is the better product <laughs> oh man so That's here's the thing I, I i asked myself recently is there a potential god that i would be like fine with and pr would prefer exists and i i think there might be there might be a deity that i'm okay with existing or, or would want to exist but i'd have to i'd really have to make sure but a disqualifier um, would be something like hell, which is an, an, an eternal punishment in the oh, afterlife. Weak, now, now I'm, I'm okay with, um, at least I think I'm okay with, I just have to think about it, some kind of a punishment in the afterlife, potentially, but it depends on the nature of what that punishment is right. and whether it's not, it's uh, it, it's um, like, uh, what is it, proportional to the things that you've done. But I, right. but honestly, even then, I don't think I really feel like, because uh, that. <laughs> Yeah, because I, I feel Look, like depending it has a upon lot of my mood, you park like, in front of my driveway, and I'm tossing you in there. So, <laughs> oh my goodness gracious! <laughs> like, who cares about proportionality? Oh my god! Some people deserve it, Rags. You got to admit it. Some people deserve a lot of stuff. That is true. Anyway, should we get Absolutely. back to the video, or we should get back? Sitch, to the we got to talk about this hell thing, but we'll do oh it another time. I, I like how you're like. What's the point of believing God without hell? And Rag's like, I would only <laughs> believe like, that's God the without... disqualifier yeah, for me. It can't thing. be a hell. Yes. <laughs> God, terrible. No, it's great. Thing that is afforded to like this video is hell. Let's just be this clear video here. Is hell. Well, Specifically, listen, like, that all of our videos, that... it brings good conversation. Oh, of course. Women don't get, and then as you get into the intersections that people of color don't get, that queer people don't get, and so. That was like one of the most compelling arguments that I've ever heard to be like, yes, queer people should be allowed to be conservative well, that's nice, and so still that's... be queer. And I'm not going to like strip them of that, yeah. but also I'm still going to unfortunately think less of them. Well, I think that you can't understand, you can't even understand what they're doing without reference to their queerness, right? Like the the fa the fact that they're saying these things and the reason that they're saying these things is inextricably tied up with their their queerness, right? So no, it doesn't mean like oh you're not gay if you're Republican. It's like I think the, the one of the, like maybe the underlying issue here is that they cannot separate the their queerness from like the rest of themselves. They don't yeah. think that it's True. they don't think that it's a part of you. Like it's a segment of who you are. They think it is like a color that paints the entirety of what your character is. There's nothing you could do that is more or less your queerness. It is all a part of you. Um, it, it's it's bizarre that they do this with politics too, because they would never do this with something like vocation. They would never say, "Look, because oh, you're queer, better, you can't be example. a doctor, or you can't be a veterinarian, because you're queer." Like it's well, a better so example weird. is just like, "Do you like cheesecake?" Well, that, that's a preference, like sexuality. I can't really choose that, right? I can't choose whether or not I like cheesecake, which is pie, sure, right? But like in much the same way, my sexuality, I didn't choose it. I wouldn't like, I wouldn't be like, man, I, I need to expand my horizons, among other things. And so I, I like dudes now. Oh boy, I sure do love fucking dudes. This is great. I never is. That's not how it works, right? In the same way, I didn't choose whether or not I like cheesecake, but we don't treat those two things with the same gravitas, of course. Right. Um, even though, in a sense, they are si very, very similar in concept. A lot of things I do, most things, the vast, vast majority of things I do have nothing to do with my sexuality. Same with everything else. I right. mean, that's loser talk. Loser. <laughs> if you're not thinking with yo dick all the time, get your shit together. True. It just means that you're a sort of self annihilating gay person. Yeah, that's too cunty of a description, honestly. These people don't deserve that. Self annihilating gay person is <laughs> kind of something that I would like to be. <laughs> well, there's 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 different there's many methods of self annihilation. <laughs>
Um, so I, I want to talk about Ron DeSantis and specifically an ad that he put out recently. Oh, God. And some reactions to it. I know. Okay. So we're not going to play the ad. But basically, okay. Ron DeSantis, who anyone who's listening to this from outside of the United States, Ron DeSantis is bad. Yeah. And he is also running for president. And he's also not going to win, but that's none of our business right now. Ron DeSantis, his campaign, like one of the pillars of his campaign is transphobia in a way that is so extreme and, and homophobia in a way that's so extreme that like it is even alienating most conservatives at this point, I think, which is part of the reason I don't think he's going to get I don't think it's that it's I don't think it's that those things are alienating conservatives so much as Trump exists uh, and he's just he's the black hole upon which all of the votes and attention is kind of sucked towards. Um, right. He's kind of the center of attention for all that stuff in a world that didn't have, you know, Trump in this for whatever reason. Uh, I could think, of course, he'd be doing a lot better. But well, I don't... yeah, I mean, I don't I agree completely. But even if we were just to adopt or accept that idea that DeSantis is so anti-gay, anti-trans, it's off-putting conservatives. Doesn't that kind of completely destroy the leftist argument? Doesn't that show that liberal acceptance and assimilative yeah. tolerance is actually oh, that Republican accept Yeah, Republican acceptance of gays actually is decently high. He's just too, he's, a, he's extreme because he isn't that way. That's yeah. an interesting message to send. Right. What is she talking, what is she referring about? He... With uh, DeSantis in his homo it's I'm sorry. I'm legitimately sorry. <laughs> consider it this to whoever this person is. Consider Ma it a compliment. Her name is Matt. Her name. <sighs> <laughs> you know what? I'm glad that we live in a country where everyone could do their thing and flourish. That's one. That's wonderful. What a beautiful nation. Yeah. Consider it a compliment, Matt Bernstein, or is it it's, Bernstein? I don't know. But it's funny know. that we're we're so accustomed to seeing um trans women on the internet doing politics that when you yeah, see like, like seems to be the vast majority of them seem to be men to women yes that are doing politics um but it's so it's interesting that when you just literally see an effeminate gay guy you're like oh it's obviously it's a trans woman <laughs> it's like no it's just an effeminate gay guy <laughs> so funny <laughs> funny and true yes ahead of trump at all because he's just leaning too into this like chronically online anti-gay shit, which doesn't actually resonate, I think, with the majority of even Republicans. Hmm. But he, you know, lending itself to that image, he just put out a campaign video where he essentially just brags about how homophobic and transphobic he is. Sure, that's and what he it is. positions himself as opposite to Trump, who this ad claims is gay friendly and trans friendly and he's like you know i would never see a trans woman maybe because i i don't keep up with politics nearly as much these days how is is trump a gay and trans friendly candidate really or because I, I don't trust the left anymore when they say shit like this they asked trump if a man could become a woman and he said well, I didn't see the clip, Sitch. What does he say? He's he they okay. So the the commercial timeout is they ask. There's a different person. Someone asked DeSantis, "Can a man be a woman?" And he's like, "No, never." And they ask. Uh, I think it was Megyn Kelly asked Trump this, and he's like, um, uh, ooh, "Maybe." <laughs> like I, I forget. I think he ended on a maybe, if I recall correctly. And so DeSantis is like, "Ah, Trump believes men can be women," you know. But not me, Ron DeSantis. That's the commercial they're talking about. Okay, that's so, okay. Th now, so when, Trump, yeah. So do any of these do any of these candidates have like policies, that, or is it all just like it, no? It's can a man become a woman? Okay, okay. Because like because a bit one of them might get in the White House. So you have to wonder what are you going to do? Policies like are, are you going to put your name on paper for anything? Are we gonna are we gonna blow up another country? Are things gonna get exciting? Like what's gonna happen here? What, what's going on? He said, um, here's the full answer. He said, um, can a man become a woman? Um, in my opinion, you have a man, you have a woman. I, 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 I think part of it is birth. <laughs> can the man Already. give birth? No. 
Um, he's they'll like come up with some answer to that also someday. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's saying he thinks that the future men will be able to give birth. I just heard the other day they have a way that now a man can give birth. No, I would say I'll continue my stance on that. What does that even mean? <laughs> you know oh, what? Man. That's an answer to I don't even something. Know what that means. All right. He sure did make that answer. Does the answer sound anti trans though or anti gay? Kind of doesn't to me. It's, it's, yeah, it does. It sounds like the answer an old 70 plus year old man would make when he's asked weird ass questions it about It sounds like boys you're trying girls. to look, it sounds like you're trying to pander to the trans and gay community for votes. That's what that answer sounds like to me. It, no, it sounds to me like he doesn't care. And he's kind of okay with it, but he doesn't necessarily want to annoy who he thinks are like right. far right people. So he's maybe like, he's ah, trying to pander maybe. to far right people. He's kind of like yeah. giving a non answer. Yeah. That's what it sounds okay. like to me. But and you know, you know, this must be degenerate because when I pulled up this article on the New York Post that was talking about this, they have like a little video playing that's like a different article. And it's, it's like weird but true. Man buys fourteen thousand dollar realistic bear suit, and it's like some guy like rolling around. I mean, dog suit. It's this guy rolling around in this like very like realistic, but like kind an uncanny of looking uncanny dog valley suit. dog. Suit. It's not like a it's not like a cute fur it's not suit. A furry and you look suit, at no. it and you're like, yeah. oh, that's cute and stylized. I see the appeal. It's like you're a you're an ungodly creature from spawned from hell. You are neither beast nor man. Right. Like if you if you were like 50 feet away, you'd see that and you'd be like, oh, that's just a border collie. But you see it moving. You're like, what is wrong with that dog? Yeah. Yeah. As <laughs> like, it gets closer and closer, there's that there's that part of your brain, that ape brain, that little the great ape part of your brain. Like that's destroy like, this. Kill no, this demon. It's just like, no, run, <laughs> yes, run, right. go, run, right. leave, run, right. and don't look back. And as a woman, I would never let them talk about sexuality and to little kids, you know. Trump is so gay friendly, but I'm a real fighter against this cause. And it was like, I don't know. Trump isn't exactly like a crusader for gay rights, but he put out this video. He hugged the flag. He what hugged the flag. Did you see the picture? He hugged the flag. He kissed it. He hugged it. He licked it. Okay. Yum. Tastes there are like a couple gay. responses <laughs> from gay conservatives, from prominent gay conservatives on Twitter that I would like to, uh, to, to read off to you and to get your thoughts on. So first... Caitlyn Jenner, who we could do a six-part series just about her if we wanted to, which I don't. No, I prefer not to. <laughs> Does any who cares about the political opinions of Caitlyn Jenner? It's like, she's not one of the right ones. She's she's one of those those wrong transes. I mean, even when Caitlyn was Bruce, did anyone give a fuck about Bruce Jenner's political opinion? Didn't. Didn't she run for governor though? I mean, she did. Yeah, then it so went nowhere. I right. feel like that kind of makes it relevant. No, if you're a, if you run for governor as a Republican, I think I don't care. No one cares about Kayla Jenner's book. Look, I think what you mean to say is I don't care about Kayla. No, Jenner. nobody cares about <laughs> Caitlyn Jenner. Listen, all we care about is Caitlyn Jenner ro like run over Somebody a bunch of people talk. and and got away with it. Okay, well, you, yeah, everyone cares about that, but. Someone cared enough about her political opinions to talk her into running for governor. Right. Come on. Okay, then coming through. Beep, beep. <laughs> oh, my. Caitlyn Jenner. That? Did you yeah. see that South Park? <laughs> I or did, Caitlyn yeah. Jenner's just, like, running over people. I, don't, I didn't see the South Park, but I saw the clip. Yeah. Oh, God. Very bad. Yes. Anyway. Head it up. Hit it up. What? I'm Sorry checking my email. Oh, my God. She said, hey, Governor Ron DeSantis, watching your interview right now, you're still defending your bizarre anti-gay ad. Which bathroom should I use? And it's like, Caitlin, you know which bathroom he thinks you should use. I mean, that's why she has the question. So dipshit. phobic that it's not even that they think that Caitlyn Jenner should use the men's bathroom. They just think that if you're trans, you just shouldn't exist. Like you shouldn't be, you shouldn't use any bathroom. You shouldn't be in this. You should just hold in your poop until you explode. Yes. This is, yes. This is such garbage tear take. You here. should use the bathroom of whatever the fuck you look like. Why is this a garbage take? Eh? Cause that's not, there's plenty of conservatives that, that are not 
transphobic like that. Well, okay. Is it just DeSantis or is it all conservatives? That is not even that they... Th which bathroom should I use? And it's like, Caitlin, you know which bathroom he thinks you should use. I mean, the thing is that they... Well, isn't the point of asking the question to... It's like a, said, she just it's said a rhetorical they, question, you, right? You yeah, Matt off. Bernstein discovers what a rhetorical question is. Whether at 11. Yeah. They've gotten so phobic that it's not even that they think that Caitlyn Jenner should use they the men's think. bathroom. They just right. think that if they you're trans, think. you just shouldn't exist. Like you shouldn't they be. Think you shouldn't if you're use trans, any bathroom. You, just you shouldn't, shouldn't be exist. in society. And the who's the they in that? Well, I don't. Question? I don't know. Who, I don't know who's the they. Conservatives are the they in that question. Well, there's some it's so obvious. I don't think. I don't yeah. think Contra's saying all conservatives. Then she shouldn't say they. Okay. Why isn't she saying? Look, if she what says even, they talking about black crime, I'm going to say look. What the hell are you doing? Right. The bathroom thing is just a kind of easier way for them to say that. Um, I feel like what we're watching is the collapse of euphemism, right? Where bigotry in politics has traditionally relied on a kind of ambiguity um, that I guess is usually called dog whistling, where the right-wing politician will say something that they know that bigots will hear as in support of them, but that sort of centrists and moderates will think is maybe something softer than it is. So instead of saying, you know, we hate gay people, you say, well, we want to, you know, protect the innocence of children from indoctrination in school. Because you can't want to do that. That's never yeah. something you would just want to do. Who would want to protect the indoctrination of children? Who would, who would want to do that? Obviously, they have ulterior motives. Right? This is so insidious. Look, this, this is the kind of perspective that means you can't even talk about this, the situation. Like, the situation is very clearly... There are children that are possibly being di probably being diagnosed, misdiagnosed with gender dysphoria and embarking on a transition path in life that is not they would be better suited to avoid. That's what's going on. And to say that you can't even have that conversation without contrapoints coming out and accusing you of being a transphobic bigot is disgusting. Completely yeah. straw manning that situation for your political advantage. I mean, you you've got the lives of these children on your hands. I would say literally, you have. Well, you know, they're probably not going to die, but you have their infertility on their hands if they end up being detransitioners. It's just garbage. That's what the garbage here take is. That you disagree? I agree completely with what yeah. you said. Yeah. Well, she's also. I mean, Contra's using the term dog whistle incorrectly in a way that a lot of people on the left use it incorrectly which is a dog whistle is just supposed to be you say something that sounds innocuous unless you're initiated in like knowing whatever they're talking about right right so like it's kind of like when something like when leftists talk about like well we need to raise your critical consciousness you're like well I, you know that's like oh critical thinking that's good right and then you don't know what critical <laughs> exactly means, right? right um but what what Contra is describing here is something far different and something far more, I hate to use the word, but pernicious, which is that someone will take like a moderate position. So let's just use like, or something that could be a moderate position. Like, for example, someone says, I don't think that trans women should be playing in cis women sports Great because example. I think it confers them some kind of, you know, advantage. Uh, that's not fair. Right. And so... The person that's now there could be two people. There could be uh, John who says like, oh, you know, I don't. Yeah, I agree. I don't think trans women should be able to play in cis women's sports. It's not fair. But John still believes that, you know, trans women exist and should be allowed to transition and blah, 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 blah. And then there's Bob, right? Evil Bob over here who he's only saying trans women shouldn't play in sports because he thinks all the transes should be wiped off the face of the earth. Right. Right. Yep. And so. Right. And so like, yeah, maybe the person that's saying this position, maybe they are a secret Bob. Okay. Maybe they have the secret evil position or whatever, or maybe they're John and they, they actually just actually 
believe in this one narrow thing that they're actually talking about. They don't believe in this broad, secret, subversive campaign that you're bringing forward here. And so many times on the left, they just do this maneuver where you're not allowed to criticize any aspect of anything being presented, because if you do, you're sending out the secret dog whistles, the right. subversive evil Bob dog whistles. And the problem is not only is it A, probably not true most of the time, but B, this is what turns all the not crazy people against you because they go, well, yeah, I'm wait a John. A minute. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, they go. I'm with John. What you're saying is crazy. I don't think children should be, you know, shown that book about giving kids blowjobs in school. I think that's insane. And the thing that's bizarre about it is that people like a lot of people, especially on the Internet, like the Internet leftists, they don't just say like, you know, Emma Viglin on Tim's show, just say like, yes, this book is gross and should not be taught in schools. Like, right. let's just agree. Like, that's it. You just move, say it's gross, say it's bad, and then move on with your life instead of doing this like defense nonsense about it. Yeah. So what I was saying about being being able to call out the unsavory elements of your side. Yes. Instead of 100%. feeling like you have to defend it. Yes. Um, you know, you you say that oh, you you think that kindergartners should learn about gay sex, and 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 a lot of you know centrists will hear that and they'll be like oh, no, I don't think that kindergartners should learn about gay sex because the centrists are missing that that's not really what he's talking about. This is like a front for so, homophobia. But no, she didn't say they shouldn't. And I wonder <laughs> if you pressed her if she would say that. I want right. you to say that kindergartners should not be taught about sex in any form be it oral anal nasal or otherwise <laughs> right right i want you to say that right. don't say that the distraction homophobia blah 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 because i i am inclined to be attracted to my own gender and you shouldn't fucking be talking about that shit to kids and if someone says that's homophobic then you're fucking weird and you need to get a grip there's nothing yeah. to do with that well and why like why isn't the the move from Contra to just say like yeah, it, so say say you do know that this person is just dog whistling you, you know you just somehow know you have the magic wisdom to know that they're dog whistling, but the way to address it is to say I agree that should not be taught to children. Yes, you upset such a may potentially hopefully hopefully a very tiny percentage of your side by saying that. But it is it looks very good to everybody else on planet yes. Earth. Yeah, of course. It's a tactical, it's a tactical freebie, essentially. Yep. One hopes. One hopes. But you know, so so Trump has, has done that. Um although Trump, I think, is is more of a sincere racist and more of a passionate racist than he is a homophobe. I honestly think that Trump in his heart of hearts doesn't really care one way or another about gay people. And I think that's what DeSantis is trying to explain. Trump is a passionate racist. <laughs> but he's fine with the gays. But he doesn't care <laughs> about gays, which is, yeah. I guess, you know, I, I guess that, you know, it's coherent. I don't know. Better than nothing, I guess. Yeah. Passionate, like, well, we're, yeah. passionate racist. Passionate huh? racist. Well, you know what? If there's something you feel strongly about, do it with passion. Look, I think there's more evidence that Biden is passionate about sniffing little children than there is <laughs> that Trump is a passionate I'm saying racist. But it was Biden who says, "If you don't vote for me, you ain't black," which right. I right. think is pretty racist. But <laughs> well, that's a good point. I, I'm too. just saying it, that's what I that's what I recall. But you know, mm -hmm. maybe who knows? Who knows? Maybe I, he's an he's an old eighty year old man. He's probably a little bit. You know, come on, he's a little bit. Come on, come on, he's a little bit. You know, even Joe Biden's like, oh man, where'd Andrew Biden oh, go? Oh, what the fuck, guys? I don't think this is a nice lady. Look, I don't think Trump. I don't think it stopped Trump from working with black people or hiring black people in his organization or anything like that. So I don't, I don't know. know. Like, in what ways <laughs> did Trump's uh, passionate racism manifest? Because yeah. I don't. Like I again, I don't know. I'm I don't follow politics too closely. Look how passionate can he be if he's like hiring black people all the time? I mean, like I was like, uh, I feel like a passionate racist would be like obvious, and there wouldn't be any contention as to whether or not you're racist. If you're passionately racist, 
and nobody can tell or if it's in contention. Yeah, exactly. How passionate like are you? That passionate. We can agree. Hitler was a passionate racist. <laughs> you know, that man had conviction and passion for his racism. Arguably a bit too much. But arguably. Yeah. Arguably a arguably, bit too yeah. much. Okay. But with Trump, I don't know. I just feel like it wouldn't be uh Trump that not enough, you know. Not enough. Not enough. Exploit, but DeSantis's recent ads are kind of repl- it's it's not a it's not a dog whistle anymore. It's a foghorn. He's not saying, "Of course, we support gay people." Sorry, it's just what? that we don't want these children to learn about sexual. Con-. He's not saying that. He's saying that's literally oh, probably we don't like gay so. people and we don't want them in society. It was it was so interesting, right? Like this is why a lot of people are turned off, like the T and stuff and the, the LGB whatever. It's like this is it. Oh, did you see this one politician? He doesn't want you talking to kindergartners about blowjobs. He hates gay people. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you connecting the... I Now I'm thinking about it. Why did you put that thought in my head? I right. wasn't thinking about gay people at all when you mentioned the kindergartners being taught about oral sex. But now you went there and now I'm thinking about it. And it's a little <laughs> weird. That is uh, hard. Yeah. I don't yeah. know why they do that. Eddie, and the problem with Trump is he's too pro gay, right? That is the problem. True. With Trump, is he's too pro gay. I was thinking. Yeah. Like- yeah, yeah, famous, famously, all he ever does is, is you know, he, he's just constantly passing legislation that helps the homosexuals. That was his, Harvey you know, his entire presidency, right? <laughs> So this tweet is uh, also in response to the DeSantis homophobic video. It's from David Leatherwood, who is another one of these kind of (laughs) Republican gay influencers. He wrote, I spent the last seven years of my life working with Trump to make the GOP a more welcoming place for gays, while also being anti-groomer, anti-woke and pro-religious liberty. I've even worked with DeSantis on this agenda. This ad is a slap in the face and makes any LGBT person supporting DeSantis look like an absolute idiot. (laughs) Yeah, isn't that tweet completely destroy the narrative they've been kind of cultivating this entire They'll probably call this person a grifter slash pick me slash whatever thing because you can't just hold positions earnestly that are in opposition to theirs, right? There has to be some tactical, you know, shenanigan. Well, because you look at, I mean, this tweet is shows that they were sincere in what they were talking about and their beliefs and they're upset by what DeSantis said so I don't I don't understand how this is not completely contradicting everything they've said up to this point right this ad is a slap in the face and makes any LGBT person supporting DeSantis look like an absolute idiot (sighs) Yeah, this one's my absolute favorite. You're making pro DeSantis gay people look like absolute idiots. Girl, I don't think that that's the ad. I don't think the ad is was making you look like an idiot. Like, <laughs> it's very funny to me. But I also think that like that's the tweet does a great example of showing like the difference between the euphemism and the reality. So the what are the euphemisms? It's anti groomer. It's pro religious liberty. It's anti woke. Anti woke. Oh, woke is their like catch all <laughs> euphemism. It means everything. Um, and so, I mean, it sounds like this person, I mean, he, he's like latched on to the euphemisms as, again, the way to sort of separate himself from the accusation. He wants to believe in the the dog whistles he wants to take them at face value because that means that he can that he, well i'm not the target it's not about me it's about the groomers right he hello like groomer means gay like when these people say it right i don't think so i mean it seems I like he's don't think so okay. i i just don't see that i i don't i don't know i maybe i'm just not aware of it but i've just never really seen that be a thing it feels like that like this never popped up until the kid stuff started yeah well it's like it's annoying so now the argument is okay this person they believe the dog whistles are real where it's like well okay you understand that there are some people that they actually believe the position (gasps) they're they're pro gay people they're pro trans people being able to exist 
but they're against, you know, uh, or they think, you know, maybe we shouldn't be teaching kids about trans issues because maybe it's going to create too many false positives or maybe trans women shouldn't be in cis women sports or whatever. And still people can hold that position and not hate gay people and not hate trans people. You can't just say, oh, well, the, 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 the people that do hold those positions are all just the fools that are being taken advantage of by all the other majority of people who are all just using these secret dog whistles. Because if the majority of people felt that way, they wouldn't have to use the dog whistles. That's kind of the whole point of using the dog whistles. <laughs> so, yeah, so, there's true. That. so like you have to remain on the DL about the whole situation. It's like, it's like it goes to the, the passionate racism. It's like if he's really passionate racist, then how come we're having this disagreement or discussion about whether or not he's really a racist? <laughs> right, right. Why does he feel like he has to couch his racism in the indistinguishability from non-racism? Yeah, if it's so prevalent. Yeah, exactly. He's not even now realizing that, but he, he thinks that this is some new thing. Oh, suddenly, like shockingly, Tomorrow there's this turn of events where DeSantis is no longer just attacking the groomers, but attacking all gay people. And it's like anyone who's paying attention knows that it was about all gay people the entire time, right? I mean, yeah, you that say that, really but well I don't said. know. I'm that. kind of yeah. floored. Because um, I don't, I don't feel like you're talking about me. You know, I don't feel like when someone says "don't diddle kids." that it's like an attack on me, but I don't know, man. Yeah. You understand the context of groomer though. Uh, the, the groomer thing is a little bit more tricky because at first I don't think it was, you know, first I, I think I heard James Lindsay kind of pushing it first. And at first it, it wasn't like this, all gays are groomers kind of mentality, but I, but it, over time, I do think a lot of people were using it to just mean that. Were they? Exactly. Okay. But yeah. doesn't mean everyone, but I mean, well, obviously like the gays against groomers, people are trying to, you know, quote, take it back. Okay. Well, and right. they are gay and they use the term groomer. Right. Um, They're not ironically from that yeah. perspective. Right. So I, but I think, I think the groomer label has been too sullied <laughs> at this point. <laughs> I don't think you can, um, I don't think you can take it back. I think it's gone. More so than Nazi? Uh no. But I don't who's trying to who's trying to repair the, the Nazi term? What do you mean by sullied? Like I don't think you I don't think people should be using the term groomer because it's been too associated as like anyone that's pushing anything gay or trans or whatever is like a groomer. Right. Or I'm sorry, that's just existing as gay or trans. Right, even though they're not a groomer. Right. Like you, just because you're gay doesn't mean you're a groomer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. I don't even think like, oh my God, if you're in your sex ed class in sixth grade and they say like, listen, some people are gay. I think that's totally fine. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think there's anything some wrong with Some people are gay. You know, yeah. They just want to, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's fine. There's nothing wrong. Some of your bros want to fuck some of your other bros. I mean, that's just how it is. Like, yeah. Well, <laughs> now you you're go. dipping into the groomer territory. They just want to suck like... their big, juicy, plump, delicious Now cups. you're getting into And the... that's just a little, that's just something they want to do, which is fine, by the way. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh -huh. That's just something that Rags they want to do. Groomer confirmed here. <laughs> I'm just, there's nothing wrong with it. They just want to take a big dick up their asses and <laughs> shoot ropes all over their homies faces it's just <laughs> that's just something they want to do and i'm not saying i approve of it or disapprove of it i'm just describing reality as a because yes. this is i'm just describing you know, this, reality just and describing very reality <laughs> look kids if your teacher says anything like that to you 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 immediately go to the principal <laughs> <laughs> terrible <laughs> and then the the third response is from our friends the log cabin republicans are they still kicking around they are still kicking around <laughs> and for anyone who doesn't know what the log cabin republicans are they are a group i was doing some log cabin republican history which is truly like pulling teeth yesterday but they are a group of Republicans who who are gay. They're gay Republicans. That's their whole thing. They, they, the group formed in 1977 
um, in response to the Briggs Initiative, which was a bill in California where Republicans were trying to uh, make it illegal for gay people to teach in public schools. And so the log cabin Republicans were like a bunch of gay conservatives who formed around making the, the Briggs Initiative not pass. And they were successful. And that was one of the last times they've been successful. They have made basically this, you know, over the last five decades, they've just latched on to every, you know, Republican candidate, endorsed this person, endorsed that person, and, you know, made all of these pleas to prominent Republicans, like, we're supporting you. And then every single time the Republican in question is like, mm, I don't really need your support. It's it's okay, thanks, though. Um, they made, oh, I forget the politician, but um, I think in the 1996 um, presidential election, the was the was the Republican candidate Dole? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah they ninety six. Yeah, where he, the Republican who ended up losing to Bill Clinton, but the log cabin Republicans. I don't know if you know this. They sent him a one thousand dollar donation as you know an endorsement, <laughs> and Bob Dole returned it, saying that he one hundred. <laughs> He literally returned the money and he said, I 100% disagree with everything that is on your agenda. Yeah. And the Repu the log cabin Republicans have also um, been barred from having a table uh, at the Texas GOP convention for the last 20 years. So there, it's it a really shows how much case. Republicans hate. Yeah, there's gays. an amazing dedication to insi to believe. So why well, don't I don't know about the. The Republican thing, but the I thing don't, with I don't trust the um, framing of it. I just I, I just can't trust these people anymore. Whenever they talk about right. anything, really, so maybe it's but, true, maybe it's not. I don't know. But the thing with Bob Dole is like, okay, is it? So it's the years twenty twenty three. So in nineteen ninety five, something that happened is that really indicative of like what's happening in politics now? Something that happened in nineteen ninety five. Uh, no, yeah, over 20 Probably years not. ago, almost Probably. 30 years ago. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Like 30 years before Obama was against gay marriage. Then you, 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 here's how here's how to conceptualize your brain bursting. OK, so 1995 was like what? That's almost 30 years ago, right? Or is it almost 20 years ago? I can't. I mean, that. thereabouts. Yeah. Um, It's almost it's just 30 years ago. So it's like 30 years pr before 1995, 1965. That's when you're passing civil civil rights legislation. So does it make sense in 1995 to be like, listen, we're still living in 1965 before the civil rights legislation is being passed or while it's being passed? Like, it's just, that's not the way that we should be conceptualizing things at all. Well, the GOP was trying to get, I mean, they were campaigning on a constitutional amendment against gay marriage or making marriage between a man and a woman. Obama was against gay marriage when he was elected president in 2008. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, the political environment was much different. The story is actually more interesting than the person went on. Of says, course. Um, <laughs> oh, oh. Let's see. It's scrambling to, so the, this is from the New York Times from 1995. Dole in a new bow to, to right returns gay groups money. Scrambling to enhance relative relations with conservatives, Senator Bob Dole's presidential campaign said today that it was returning $1,000 from a gay Republican group. The campaign said it had accepted the June donation by mistake <laughs> and would never have taken money from an organization that supported causes Mr. Dole opposed, like allowing homosexuals in the military. But correspondence made public today by the president of the group, the Log Cabin Republicans, showed that Mr. Dole's national finance chairman had sought the group's help in raising money as recently as May. Yeah. The return donation is the latest sign that Mr. Dole is intensifying his year-long drive to court conservative Republican groups in the aftermath of his humbling tie with Senator Phil Graham of Texas in an Iowa straw poll last weekend. Uh, campaigning in New Hampshire today, Mr. Dole in interview said on ABC News, I don't agree with their agenda. I assume that's why it was returned. However, let's see, uh, blah, blah, blah. Mr. Richard L. Taffel, the president of Law Cabin Republicans, said he had dealings with several senior Dole campaign officials who had sought donations from his organization. 
He also said he prominently wore a log cabin lapel pen button as he discussed AIDS budget allocation with Mr. Dole at one of the center's fundraising events. Mr. Taffel made available a letter he received from uh, presidential candidate Dole's finance director saying, quote, per our discussion, I'm attaching a list of upcoming Dole for president fundraising events. Senator Dole and I would appreciate any assistance you could give us in turning out your members at each event. I am looking forward to working with you. That's interesting. So it looks like they 100% were courting the log cabin Republicans and then some uh, religious right wing groups found out and they got very mad about it. So, so then they kind of backtracked. Yeah, they're like, oh, it was an accident. That's funny. A thousand dollars. Oh my goodness. That might, that would break the campaign, right? If you hated gays, you think you'd want to make them poorer, right? There you go. Oh. It's all you see. It's all how you look at it. It's all yeah. if if I had a Nazi who gave me a one thousand dollar super chat, he's like, Rex, did you accept that one thousand dollar super chat for the Nazi? He's like, Yeah, I want to make Nazis poorer. Of course I did. <laughs> there you go. But you've been tainted. That one thousand dollars is going to make you turn to a Nazi. One thousand Deutschmarks. There you go. Change everything. Anyway. Believing that Republicans will accept you if you just do enough things. I mean, it reminds me of, I feel like my favorite gay Republican to hate on is this guy called Dave Rubin, who used to have a you know political debate show on YouTube. Tell, tell us about him. Well, he used to be with the Young Turks, a kind of left-leaning YouTube political show. Kind of left-leaning. And then in 2016, kind of I think it was, he split from them. Well, not anymore, right? So they have Isn't that crazy? The Young Turks now. are kind of left-leaning. They're not left-leaning. Kind oh, of left-leaning. They be, you don't. They become conservatives now. I thought you knew. Yeah, they're they're conservatives. They're basically yeah. They're they're getting tailored for the trench coats as we speak. They're flipping. Yeah, you haven't heard this narrative. Oh, no, yeah, with Anna Kasparian. Yeah, yeah she's evil. Yeah. She's a persona non grata now. Yes, not allowed. To do right wing, we're talking 2016. So at the time, the big issue was anti SJWs, anti social justice warrior content, um, a lot of complaining about campus activism going too far and free speech on campus. Wait, so he was he was liberal to begin with? He was on the Young Turk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he started out as liberal, and then he decided that in 2015, like, the left went too far because they were protesting, like, Milo Yiannopoulos or something. And <laughs> so, I mean, what's, what's, what's funny is that, like, this is the Obama administration. So I do definitely wonder if he would have gone this way if he if he knew that seven years later it was going to be DeSantis and not Milo Yiannopoulos, who was going to be the, um, the person you know, that he's fighting for, the, the person that he's fighting for. But he's really dedicated to the cause. There's this amazing clip of him on stage at some conservative event. <laughs> where he talks about how, you know, he's moved from Florida to California to get away from those lids. And, you know, sometimes his, his neighbors look at him and his husband skeptically, but he always pulls out his wallet and shows them that he has a picture of him standing next to DeSantis. And that's my governor. And it's like, my guy, Ronald DeSantis is never going to be your daddy. Like, he's never going to say that he's proud of you. He's never going like, to... I mean, he might be. I'm I don't know. Kidding. The delusion is, is just DeSantis incredible. Gay? Hating is... Didn't Dave Rubin also have a conversation on Ben Shapiro's show at one point? It was actually it was actually on his show. Ben Shapiro oh, came, show. He invited Ben Shapiro on his show, yeah. Where, they, where he was like, Ben, we're friends. Would you come to my wedding? Did you come to my gay ass and wedding? Ben was like, no. Will you bake Ruben a wedding cake? The answer is no. And the okay. reason I won't is because as a religious Jew, I, yeah. I do not participate in activities that I believe are sinful. But again, we live in a free country and Dave knows this. He doesn't have to care what I think yeah. about sin. Does Dave have a husband? Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, okay. And yeah. are we friends? Yeah. And are we going to go out to dinner sometime in the near future? Yeah, I mean, yeah, but but there's a difference between me just being friends with Dave and me actively participating in an event that I feel is religiously sinful. And while that's awkward, yeah. we're still friends in spite of it, which is why we're friends. If well, we couldn't be I, friends in spite of it, then right. it would be a bad thing. Well, look, when I when I did.
How, how do you feel about that? How does everyone feel about that? Me? Answer. I yeah. have no feelings. I think that's, it's just, it's really weird to me. Um, like, I, the ability to, if you have, if you're in that position, right? If you don't approve morally of gay marriage, if you think that Mr. Jesus says, no, that's a big bad, and you can't do that, one woman and one man would be weird because he's Jewish, but yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Jesus was a Jew, so it all checks out there you go. Isn't, logically. Yeah, isn't so, uh, Dave Rubin Jewish too, though? Is he? I believe he is. Yeah, uh, he's okay. probably grifting, but probably. I think that when it comes <laughs> to the I don't know, should is there an element of you that wants to compartmentalize what that marriage kind of is? Because if you go to the marriage and you like help it succeed, surely it's better that it is a successful and happy gay marriage instead of a miserable gay marriage that ends in divorce. Right. Is that more morally better? Right. Isn't it? Wait, is it morally better that what? Is it more, if you are, if you are maybe some of you more theologically inclined, uh, uh, people in chat can help me out. Is it, mm -hmm. if you don't think that, uh, the gays should be married, but the oh, oh boy, but they're gonna, and they're going to get right. married. They're going to the marriage place and they're going to do it. Is it better that that marriage is long and earnest and uh, a good, happy marriage? Or is it better that they get divorced as soon as possible and their uh, love falls away? Right, right. Because that's yeah, a good question. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. Is so. it? Is it wrong for him if Dave Rubin has a Jewish wedding? Is it wrong for Ben Shapiro as a Jew not to go to the Jewish wedding? Because I would go to a Jewish wedding. I don't. I don't give a shit. I hope you have a wonderful, happy Jewish wedding. Um, Look, I, I here's I the don't move. Have a, yeah, here's the move I thought I considered, but then I, uh, Dave Rubin is Jewish, so I don't know if this move works. You could say, "Listen, um, Ben." I know you're going to circumcise your kids. Now, I think that's genital mutilation. <laughs> because it is. <laughs> now, I think what you're doing is horrific. But, you know, we can still be friends. Even though you're going to mutilate your children's penis. Even, even though you are literally <laughs> going to mutilate you're gonna, your kids. You're going to cut off your children's body parts. Wow, those body parts. yeah. And, yeah. And, but, like, isn't... Surely... Look, you what think I'm living in sin, but you're mutilating your kids. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not lopping off body parts over here. Uh, w what if the question was may maybe the better question would be, um, would you? Dave Rubin asks of Mr. Shapiro, um, do you do you want? Do you hope that my marriage succeeds? Like that's the question you ask, right? Because this one I'm like so-so on. It's like weird, but I don't know how I feel about it. It's a weird issue. It's a strange one I haven't really thought about. But if Dave Rubin asked the question that I had asked to Mr. Shapiro and uh, Benjamin, sweet, sweet Benjamin said, I hope that your marriage fails as quickly <laughs> as possible and that you get right. a divorce so that you can get your life on track and find yeah. God. Then I'd be like, oh, okay, you suck. You know, I, I don't think, think that's you, that's really say bad. That. Look, I he's just not. like, I'm not going to your wedding. Okay, don't. No, nobody wants to go to your wedding anyway. So, and well, he's got a good excuse. No, Anybody's wedding. Dave Rubin. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, it's probably true. I don't know who's like, oh yeah, I'm excited to go to Dave Rubin's gay wedding. Yeah, you you have a very good talent, Rags, of like, like framing a question in an unusual but highly probing way. Thank you. That's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. They, well, listen, you're very good at probing. Yeah. Oh my god, thanks. I'm, I'm glad that I can ask all the probing, tough, difficult. No, but because it's like because instead of a asking real a question, sphincter stretcher, yeah. Because most people ask the question the way that it was asked Ben, which is like, "Well, would you bake the gay cake or would you go to the wedding?" And then Ben answers like, "Well, I'm not going to participate in this thing that I think is inherently sinful." And it's like, okay, but. Here's a completely different question. Do you hope that the marriage succeeds or do you want to fail? Because that that's kind of the kicker. It's like that is a good question. Because yeah. it's like asking something that's in the ballpark, but it's actually asking something far different. Yeah. And to me, it's like that's a good way of, of really questioning, like, well, are you a bad person? Because because if he's saying, like, no, I want the marriage to fail, it's like, well, why are we friends? <laughs> like, how can we interact with each other? Like, that's super messed up.
because it's if someone asked us a similar question, but if it was like like polygamy, you know, right. if a man had like four wives, do you want those wives to divorce him as soon as possible or and, and, and have a miserable time? Or do you want those four wives to even though they're in a polygamous marriage, feel like they're fulfilled and happy and it, it, it's a great time and everyone's just just fucking all constantly. Right. Is that is that what you'd prefer instead? And it's like, I don't know, it's kind of it's kind of complex, but I, I I guess I would prefer prefer the latter, I suppose. But it's mm -hmm. a difficult question. It's not one I've really thought of. I'd have well, to think yeah. about it. Well, even though I just praised your question, creating ability, I'm gonna have to criticize that. Comparison. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Oh, my goodness. You just ruined all the goodwill because with a polygamy one, I 100 percent want that guy with four wives, I want his marriage, his four marriages to be the worst, most awful experience of his entire life. Okay. I don't yeah, want him fair. to be happy with four women. That makes me jealous. Fuck that guy. Uh, he doesn't it's get fair. to have a happy relationship with As four women. As if you could be happy with four women exactly. anyway. This is it all just like hypothetical. Yeah. Yes. Miser that guy needs to be miserable. Yeah. We okay. call that a problem that'll sort itself right out. That guy better be fucking miserable because if he's not, I'm going to come to his house and kill him myself. <laughs> Awful. So unless unless Ben Shapiro's just je maybe Ben Shapiro's really jealous. How do they do the sleeping really arrangements in a polygamous marriage? If you have a man and he's got three wives, do they sleep in the same bed or is it in like a rotation? And he fucks the one he fucks the one person and he's got one woman on deck and they just go through the the lineup. Right. Well, I know in um <laughs> yeah, what's what was... a B suite? Yeah, and B suite. Well, B suite is ridiculous. Do you know? Have you watched B suite? You know what that is? No, right? B suite. It was, no, yeah, it was the name of the, it's a documentary on Netflix. It was about this. Um, I forget what they were called. They were about like Mormons. a more, yeah, but they were like a more radical form of Mormons. There's some acronym that escapes right. me a minute. And so, like, they were basically Warren you know, they, Jebs is the guy. Yeah, they basically had like bought an entire town and were thus including like the police, and they were all on like the police were all part of this like weird ultra Mormon like break off cult that were practicing uh -huh. um like super polygamy oh so that God. the people at the top would have like literally i don't know like 50 to 80 different wives the people at the bottom would have like four to five three to five wives or something Oof, yeah that's where thank I you uh, daily dose it was the flds yeah um flds yeah you know, the more i wonder what that acronym is uh what it stands for maybe it's like fundamental latter day Saints no maybe it's... what about freaky freaky <laughs> uh freaky latter-day saints but it was but anyway it's, um, it's fundamentalist latter-day saints that's what i literally said and yeah. you said no <laughs> okay but anyway oh, okay. um but yeah so i know with them like and it was so gross because they kind of talk about the guy who was in charge of it who's like this old fucking dying incontinent man oh, and you're I like how is this guy worst. He, first of all you're like this guy can't I, there's no way this guy can even get it up okay he looks like he's like dying that's got his legs up. Yeah, yeah his legs. He's old. And yet, and yet, but they were talking about they would do this gross thing because the women are like giving the testimony. And they were saying it was what you were talking about. It was like the lineup with the rotation. Where it's like, well, who's gonna sleep with the grandpa tonight? He's got to take one for the team, so to speak. But yeah, who's gonna sleep with the grandpa tonight? I was like, oh, grandpa's so feeling freaky tonight. It's so gross. That's what horrible. the F stands for. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what it is. Freaky Latter right. day Saints. Yeah. yeah. Awful. So I do think part of I think Ben's phrasing here is like pretty triggering. It's even triggering to me to send. Like I would have a difficulty being friends with someone who's like, well, listen, I think you're I think you being married is a sinful act. It's, it's like, kind oh, of a like, oh. you can say you don't support it or don't agree with it, but don't tell don't say it's sinful. Like yeah, it's kind of a weird social awkward thing that you have to do, especially if you're like an atheist or something and you live around a bunch of like Christians or Muslims or whatever who are not cool with that, you know, disbelief right. and you know, you have to kind of accept and live with this super awkward fucked up notion that a lot of people think you're going to burn in hell for eternity because you right. don't believe in God. And then they're going to go to heaven and they're going to be blissful and happy knowing that you're suffering. And they worship the guy who thinks that this is okay. And therefore they agree with it. It's super yeah. fucking awkward when yeah. you like get down to it. And there's a part of you that's like, I don't know, maybe if they're really pressed on it, they don't really believe that in their heart right. of hearts, but they go along with it. 
So no, that's a great uh, point. It's, yeah. it's a it's a thing. You gotta just live with it, I suppose, and hope that they get better. Yeah. <laughs> and you would hope that I mean you would hope that if Dave Rubin and Ben Shapiro are like friends and they like interact with each other a lot, I mean that has an effect. You know, you have the what's it, David Dole? What's that guy's name, right? The guy sure. who like befriend the KKK people. Yeah, no. I know who you're talking about. I know who you're talking about. I forget David his name. Dole. It was uh Dave, David Dole is not the guy. That's the that's the banana national. guy. Oh, you're um, right. That's David <laughs> yeah, David, David Duke. Dole. No, David no, Duke's David the Duke KKK. It's the opposite of the right. David Duke. Oh, Duke David. Yeah. <laughs> what, an, what, what, an, what an unfortunate name for a for a racial I'm sure in the chat. Yeah, yeah someone will do come it. Up in a sec. Daryl Davis. Up, I knew it was, I knew it was Davis. a D and a D. I knew it was a big old double D, D over there. Yeah, big double Daryl Davis, thank you. Darryl but yeah, Davis. I mean, that's got to have Double barrel Daryl. That's got to have an effect of like, you know, Ben Shapiro's friends with Ben Shapiro. I mean, Ben Shapiro's friends with David Rubin. <laughs> yes, and they yes. have like a good, they have like a good friendship. And he's like, oh, you're gay and you're gay married. And, you know, you you see that he's happy and you see that he's having a good relationship. I mean, it's got to have an effect on your psyche. Like, oh, you know, maybe <laughs> there's something that every time it. he's like, yeah, you're married. You're, I don't think they're husband. that good of friends. I mean, I think I'm just saying theoretically, they're just acquaintances in the I know. Same I'm business. just saying I'm just saying theoretically. OK, right. Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, I agree. Like people like, you know, I hope like Ben Shapiro, I, I'd much rather him have Dave Rubin. What if he goes you know, out to dinner be, with Dave Rubin and him and his husband just start making out right there? In there front you of, go. Like, yeah, and they just ejaculate all over the spaghetti. <laughs> like, yeah, fuck you, yeah. Or so and then they start having sex Rags, at the table. You always then, take it too far. And another you marriage is destroyed. You didn't, you didn't. You wanted us to get divorced, but actually, we're doing really well. Yeah. Because this it comes back to what I said about how if you only let in like the crazy if you no one silences the crazy people in your movement and that's all who gets brought up like that controls the movement because if Ben like imagine if Ben Shapiro is just going to dinner every night with Michael Knowles and Matt Walsh and they're mm -hmm. just feeding him their insanity right their, their extreme insanity you know crazy far right positions Ben Walsh and, or Ben Shapiro's doing that no I'm saying imagine Matt Walsh and Michael Knowles are feeding Ben Shapiro right no that, their, I think that's actually positions. happening though I think that that's, could be happening but I'm saying yeah. like like so wouldn't we all we'd much rather prefer like the Dave Rubens instead feeding their opinions to Ben Shapiro. Yeah, like, as long as like, they're not like making out in front of him and stuff. Sure. But I'm just saying like interacting with him, kind of being like, you know, oh, Neutrally. you know, I'm friends with Dave Rubin, so it's a little weird where every time I talk to Michael Knowles, he talks about wanting to get rid of the gays. And I'm like, but I like Ben, I like Dave Rubin. He's my friend, you know. Right. You kind of want that. Uh, yeah. Nate the Farmer for $20 says, is Shapiro and Ruben being friends like when a sober person and a drinker are friends, or is that different? Both cases are possible, but it seems like it'd be a big strain on the relationship. Hi, Rags. Hi. I think I don't think there's anything against necessarily like uh, like, like if it was an alcoholic and a teetotaler, that would be one thing. But if it was just someone who doesn't drink and someone who does, then I don't think that's any issue whatsoever. Because I have friends and one of a couple, they're a couple and one of them drinks and one just doesn't like alcohol. It's, it's just a taste thing. Don't drink. Um, it's your opinion towards the other person's uh, proclivities or interests, not your personal interest towards it yourself. If you thought drinking was an immoral, sinful thing, that's where the issue would arise. Right. Uh, WTF1A1A for $20 says, I want to know. God. Well, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. I want to know if Rags has any bad dragon items in real life. And if not, yeah. why does he only have it in his videos? Seems like a bad dog not have them in real life. Praise be Foamy, the true god. Yeah, I got some. Uh, they're pretty great. Would highly recommend. There you so go. You want to start small. Dear God, start small. Take your time. It is not a race. Dear God. <laughs> but, man... Once, oh Jesus Christ! You guys have no idea. If you guys have never, oh my man, oh my word, boy, gallons of ejaculate. That's all I'll say. <laughs> Start small, everybody. Gallons. It's incredible. Okay. Listen, we're LGBT friends. <laughs> we're the LB LBGTQ friendly stream. The question they show? paid you money. They paid good and money I to ask that question. They did. They did twenty dollars. Yeah, and Adam yeah. and Sitch, Sitch and Adam. Yeah, they will not. 
enlightened centrists. They are no cucks. No, no. sir. They are no. not cucks. Why did you earlier in the stream, Adam? You brought up what did I do? The, the background of the tree, and you like zoomed in on it. What was the what was the reason for that? Chat was wondering if the tree was real or not. Oh, I was wondering the same thing. Yeah, I was did trying to figure it out. Was it real or fake? <laughs> I was like, yeah. hmm. Let's say wait. And, and I truly mean this. Like, if you think what I'm doing is sinful, like I. It, I don't, it sounds glib, but I don't care. I, right, I and then this is my view is you don't have to care, you, right? right? It's a free country. Like. Right, like that's the thing. And it's like, look, look, there is, of course, someone's going to go, well, wait a minute. If you really think his marriage is sinful or something, of course, there'll, there may be a place that in the nature of our friendship, maybe that we can't quite get to, that I would be able to get to with someone that didn't think For that. sure. Why is it that we're able to do this? And most people can't do this. Because, that's what I'm curious about. Because you're both and we can no, one have our own cucks. lives. I mean, that's right. that's really. And yeah, I was gonna say because Ben like, Shapiro is no cuck. Because Dave, you're like cucking to me right now. <laughs> I think he, yeah, I I have very progressive views on cucking this, but I I don't know, man. This one's been a bridge too far. I feel. <laughs> well, I mean, I I would just say, you know, maybe we can look. Maybe it's cool that we can be civil, but maybe we can't really be friends, like in the, we can, in the yeah. strictest sense of what a friendship is. I think that's probably where I would go with it. That seems pretty reasonable. The element of we can hang out with one another, we could be co hosts, we can be chums. Yeah. But, you know, I I'm like my kid will go to your kid's birthday. Judging me all the time. <laughs> yeah. But we can't be friends. You yeah. know, that's a bit. It's just a bit. So you draw much. a line at chums, right? Yeah. Okay. That's really your buddy guy, but I'll be your chum. There is a certain aspect of friendship where there has to be. I mean, you can't get. Well, I guess people do judge one another as friends, but this is just kind of a weird. Well, how can you be friends with someone that you think is fundamentally well? No, look, every every example that I think of, I'm like, well, I'm friends with people I think are. Totally immoral. Like, what am I talking about? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a matter of intensity because Ben Shapiro knows that all of his male employees and friends masturbate, right? And like, that's just, I'm sure that he just accepts that and probably tries not to think about it too much. You know, right. but it's not a big deal. It's probably not a big deal. Yeah. As long course. as it's not in front of them on the spaghetti, he's kind of okay with it. You right. know, it's, it's privacy of that stuff. I think that he really does... In a lot of ways, he is. I, I do think for all of Ben Shapiro's issues, he is holding firm on the whole privacy of your own home. It's not hurting holding anyone. Firm, Religious huh? freedom. You have a freedom to jerk your own chicken, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, if it's something serious like the person that you love and are married with, that's where it starts to get like, ooh, that's, that's when he's not holding us firm. Yeah, and he's like, no, right? I, is he anti-masturbation? I assume so. If he's really, I mean, if he's religious, I assume he's anti-masturbation. Kind of I don't think Ben Shapiro has ever grabbed his penis for any purpose other than is there cleanliness. A, is there like a prohibition against that in Judaism? Such you were, I think so, right? That's where the prohibition comes I from. The, I thought all the Abrahamic religions were like, no, it's, do it's not Christianity, flog the right? dolphin. No, it's do not spill thy seed upon the ground. Is that yeah. Old Testament or New lay on Testament? your back and try well, to get it in your mouth? There you go. I'm pretty oh sure it's Old God. Testament. I think so. as I would, as far as I know, it's sinful in all the Abrahamic religions. So, hmm. Old Testament masturbation. Wonder what kind of search result that's going to come up with. There weren't there weren't any weird <laughs> sex stuff. Don't. There wasn't any weird sex stuff going on in the Old Testament. Yeah. So you should be a okay. Read this super chat from from J Mac. J Mac, our surrogate Godfather for fifty dollars. Thanks so much. Says I'm super against abortion, but my my best friend, who was my best man, is not. I think we can bypass certain moral values, especially if we understand the perspective. I hope I can change his mind, and I'm sure he hopes he can change mine. Yeah, I mean, though I do think this is a little bit different between like, you know, you don't like or you are against abortion. He's in favor of abortion. It's a little bit different than like being gay married, where like what you're like you're doing the action like. Like the difference, like if you were super, here's, here's, maybe here's a comparison. Like, could you be friends with someone who was an abortion doctor that who performed an abortion every day 
if you're super against abortion. Well, let me let me give you an example that actually came to mind. Uh, right. My parents are architects. They do all kinds of buildings, uh, both residential and you know business related. So my parents and they have a side business doing abortion. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> you you yank him, I'll yank him, or something. Like, I don't know. But <laughs> now I, I asked my I asked my father once. I was like, okay, you guys don't approve of the devil's lettuce, right? Because they don't, they don't like the weed and stuff. You know, that's you know, fair enough. You know, uh, they don't Terrible. like weed. Yeah, well, uh, they don't like weed, but it's not that big of a deal to them. So they will design like dispensaries. They'll they'll do that. They've designed a number of oh, dispensaries. Oh, you know? okay. I see where but, you're going. Yeah, but I uh, then I asked him. I was like, so I assume you would not take a job being the architect of an abortion clinic. He's like, yes, I will not do a job that is an abortion clinic. It's something they feel very strongly about for pretty clear reasons. Abortion's a really big deal, mm-hmm. especially, you know, morally wise. Um, so, you know, one of them, we don't like it, but it's no big deal. The other one is a very grave matter and we won't help it out. And I think that's how a lot of people probably do and should treat these kinds of things. It's on a very big sort of sliding scale. Hmm. Yes. Uh WT1A1A one, one for two dollars says rags. What would you recommend? Um, regarding I'll, I'll answer rag. that question in a bit. I want to get the names right, but okay. carry on. Yeah, you get the names right. Well, absolutely. What's recommend for what? For oh, bad why? dragon. Yeah. For what? For bad dragon. Bad dragon making fantasies but, real. Yeah. Don't yeah. worry about it, Adam. They have a meat canyon one now. Is this like a butt thing? <laughs> no, not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. They have they have fuckables and insertables. So you, guys, you can get you one. Guys. You can get one that you could put your penis in, and a penis you can put Look, in. Look, this might be a good time to check in with the poll here. The poll the is poll? up to nine hundred and seventy six votes. It's does anyone want to hear Sitch and Adam? talk about sex on okay. their show well start off by 20... doing the most popular and then work down to the least popular so. well the most popular is 53 percent. i don't give a fuck Ooh, don't care interesting. one way or the other look at that okay. look at that yeah okay. so that's that's the winner the clear winner that's fair the right. second place is yes it's interesting with 24 percent, which i am surprised okay. by third right. place is 23 percent. hell no it's weird <laughs> so I guess the the hell no it's weird is in the minor. I I expected it to be closer to fifty percent on the hell no it's weird, but I guess interesting, look, interesting. People people they're they want us to. <laughs> I guess I they guess like some people are all Adam about it. Cringe. You know, some people are just they're just all about it. You know, yeah, they, they want to get their perspectives. No, not a, the other podcasts. They won't do it. They won't do it. They're cowards. They are cowards. Look, all these other podcasts do is talk about sex. Have you not seen the whatever podcast? Like, it's all about sex. It is all about sex. That's literally all they talk about. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think uh, the fact, yeah, other podcasts do it quite a bit. So I'm fascinated that people would be, well, I guess actually most people don't care. They're here for politics. So yeah. Um, but, anyway. but I guess to answer the question, I won't give anyone specifics, but get one that's very that's tapered. Don't get one that has mm-hmm. a blunt or a flat head. You want one that's like like a point, so it's easier right. to you know get in there. And dear God, please start small and soft, um, <laughs> as we all do. But you need to start small and soft. It, it's it like, seriously don't hurt yourself. It, if if it hurts, stop. Lots mm-hmm. and lots of lubricant and start small, please. Mm-hmm. We have to be we have to be responsible. You don't want to hurt yourself. So yeah, there you go. There you go. That's there you go. Good, there you go. Good message for the children. That's right. Yourself. That's right. And eat your fiber. You don't go with the there flail. The flail. <laughs> don't go with I don't the flail. I don't, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay. That's the bad dragon that Adam used. No. And I think part of friendship, by the way, is that. Like, Well, I think that Dave, on some level, is in a state of genuine... I mean, part of the, this is part of the reason why I find him a compelling and fascinating figure, is that with him, often the delusion seems to be genuine. Like, he... Like, like he's just very stupid. 
<laughs> yeah, I think he's I think he's just kind of a himbo. And like, I don't know, that, that makes it more endearing than than a more like sinister manipulator. But he seems to think that he can negotiate with Ben Shapiro this kind of like, you know, we have our differences, but like we can still be friends. And that means like you'd go to to, to my anniversary with, with my, me and my husband, right? And Ben's like, well, no, of course not. You live in sin. And <laughs> Dave's oh my God. just like, okay. okay, wait a minute. First of all, it was, they were talking about baking a cake for yeah. his wedding. Well, he, not... he said both though. Like, well, oh, no, of course not you. Go. What is your stance on the bake the baking the cake thing? Where do you guys where'd you guys fall? Look, I don't that? like to bake, so hell no. No what cakes. Are you talking about? Understandable. You're a, Understandable. A huge baker. He likes to wake and bake all the time to listen to him. Oh, no. okay. I'm um, not a big fan of cooking. No, I my position, I mean I, my position is basically the position the court ruled, which was that um if you walk into McDonald's and you order the Big Mac. They have to give it to you, regardless of your. Can I get the gay, gay Big Mac? Yeah, they have to give it to you. It's just a, it's just the object that everyone orders. So it's like you know, it's not special, not create. It's not a creative endeavor. Um, but to ask someone to make like from scratch a cake that has some artistic or creative endeavor attached to it, or the same thing with like a website, I do think you can't force people to use their creative will against their own desires. Yeah, I, so, I think that's kind of that's kind of where I am. I see yeah, it as they said if, that if they went to the shop that they have to sell them anything that exists, but they can't order a custom cake. And I think the shop said that they could they would do that, right? I they believe would, they did. Yes, is I which is where I, I fall on a pr pretty much your position. If you're selling things to the general public, you can't exclude those general items from you know selling to them because of their you know sexuality. Right. But as far as commission work and specific work for something. You don't have to like specifically make special stuff for, you know, them, uh, which right. I think is which is I'm OK with, uh, even though as right, this put your money where your mouth is, even though m on more than a few occasions, there have been people who will not do work for me because uh, I'm a I'm a bad man. I'm a bad dog. So they won't do work for me. So, hey, you know what happens? But, you know, that's the world. You got to. Yeah, you got to you got to go with it. Gotta what kind of work are you trying to get out of them? artwork i was trying oh, to get okay. some fucking furry porn and they're like nah -uh, you're a oh you're a bad guy you're a piece of shit and your character is mid so i don't even go i'm don't even wow go yeah i know right mid, that's uh, yeah have you they, bought you're... furry porn no not oh. me nope not a single okay. time i don't even know what that is well, what I've is seen, this furry I've porn seen... <laughs> I've seen weird pictures on the internet and stuff. I always, I try. Yeah, to... they're out there. There's some crazy people out there. No, I think some though. people commission this stuff for artists to draw for. <laughs> yeah, I guess they do. There's for so, big money. Yeah. Oh yeah, I've got. Oh yes, they do. People pay the big bucks. And you've, for... have you have you ever commissioned someone to do one of these commissions? Fuck yeah. Okay. Yeah. What what kind of what does it cost? I'm curious. <laughs> It depends. Uh, it can be anything from. It depends on how good you get and how the artist uh, is much as willing to charge. Essentially, if it's really good art, and if it's a lot of people, or if it's a certain background or a certain style that takes a lot more work, it could be a lot. I mean, depending on how good you want to get. I mean, it could be hundreds per character if you go into the upper tiers, uh, right. or it could be real a way you know a lot lower. You know, you could pay, you know, 70 bucks a character and they might throw a background in for 30 or maybe if you have another character in there, it's like 50% of another, you know, character cost. It, it depends on the artist. What if what I wanted want like an elf girl with giant dicks on yes, her ears? Yes, 100 fucking percent you can How have How much that. would that cost? It depends. Like I said, it, it depends on who you go to. Mm -hmm. It depends on the style. Do you just want to sketch or do you want something that's like clean lines, black and white and grayscale? Do you want it colored? And do you I'm want a background? I'm just curious what it would cost. Like I'm. It depends on who you go to. It could be anything. It's a huge range. It's like right. food. You know, you could buy well, the give cheap me the stuff. range. Is it I'm, like 50 I, I bucks you. to a thousand dollars? Some yeah, like, you could get one for 50. Out? If you want to buy what's something from an totally artist? unrealistic, something like you, you would say, look, I want the furry, like my limit, naked, naked rags picture. But look, I, that's this way is too much money. Yeah. They um, throw, they throw a number out. They're like $10,000 and you're like, oh no, 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 no. I, I'll I'd pay more... twice the price. <laughs> 
I've spent a decent amount of uh, money on art for the channel, like the stuff that's mm. on like Dog Bites and, and the Rags channel now. Like that was pretty pricey, but it's for the channel. It's for work. It looks really mm. good. And I went to a really good artist. But if it's just for for poops and giggles, for funsies and sexy mm. times, then there's no fucking way I'm paying that kind of money. Right. It's just just kind of for. So what you know, is the fun what's, and, you know. what's a cutoff? A thousand I, bucks? Oh, no. Bucks? Yeah. It, I'm not paying 500 for something like that. No. OK. I mean. If I consider it two hundred, really good, three hundred, maybe. I just, look, I don't want to get ripped off. I'm thinking of getting a. Well, here's the thing: a picture so first. So well, you you can't ask no, me I'm, that. I look, I'm, because Sitch is really into elf ears. I'm thinking no, of getting him something special. You know, even though elves are, scum, I just I don't want to get taken advantage yeah. of. Uh, yeah, leaf lovers are uh, disgusting, but sometimes fine. It's just porn. It, but again, it really does depend on you. Go to an artist if you like their style. If you like the the way that the lines look and the proportions, the way they do their colors, a certain texture to it, maybe you really like the backgrounds, you find an artist uh -huh. and then you're like, well, they charge X for this. Do I think that this art is worth okay? X? So the so that's the, purely on you. So the artist usually just sets the price. Yeah, they have like price okay. sheets and stuff that they okay. use. But it's because so it's you, art. So you it's, shop around and you, you're like, oh, I like this artist's style and this yeah um, yeah uh there's some i like that the I'll, way that I'll they do to. veins so i'm really I'm oh i don't know get... it's, here's the, i don't like I'm veins gonna... i don't like the big veins i'm not a i don't oh, i don't care for the big veins and i'm not about that oh, it okay. looks really weird sometimes some people have the big old i don't i don't like it but it, it's super subjective it's what you think that the art is worth <laughs> to you there you go no veins and uh, i'm, Af I'm not, afro I'm a no afro fry cook says bonk for five dollars says bonk too that's much the, horny. Yeah, yeah horny Adam, bonk. what's up with this? I thought yeah, that you didn't I mean, want to talk about it. Coming from you, you really Adam, about. I'm I'm a little bit surprised. I'm not disappointed or anything. Look, I'm, I'm totally fine I'm with try, it. I'm trying to I'm look. Scared. I my fr look. I actually have a friend that's a degenerate, and I'm trying. Look in in this. You patronize him. In the, yeah, that's a good thing to do. In the Ben Shapiro style of I I do not approve of this elf and ear lifestyle. I'm trying to to sw swing him away from the dark side. Well, and, you know, if I, thing, if I had an illustration that really could uh, could hit home for him, maybe well, he here's, would here's the problem, lose Adam. his elf and ear ways. The problem, Adam, is that porn, even furry porn, that's where the money is. People mm -hmm. will pay a lot of money to satiate and build up a gallery of art of their fetishes or their character doing the things that they want this is people fascinating pay, people pay big money for that shit i don't pay that much money for it uh, so but look, that's just how, me but some people pay huge bucks i i've got friends how and does their this play job out? Is, it is like drawing a, furry porn that's look, their job how, tell me how is it do they collect jpegs does this is this artwork ever no, framed P, and hung have, on the wall or png files you can get jpegs fuck that shit um what well, do they do JP with it? A file, a JPEG, and a PNG. I'm not really there. That's not very different. But you're saying yes, it is, and you know it. They collect PNGs. They they do. I I yeah. I guess you collect them. I mean, it's it's like a it's it's images that you have commissioned that you will keep, right? right. And they are of your. I guess if you have a character, it's like your intellectual property in in, in a way. Like uh, like if, like my dog, right? I that's my intellectual property. I would not be okay with somebody drawing that character and then like selling it without my permission. Mm -hmm. I would stop them. I'd say no, that character is mine. Um, that's Sammy but, G for two dollars says. So I'm hearing you want more elf art out. <laughs> but look, if, yes. if, if you're look, trying, we're trying to, to get look, if you're trying I to want something your disgusting friend, that I can give to Sitch and say, look, you're a degenerate. <laughs> <laughs> what you need to do is you need to go to e621.net and you need to put in a tag of some nasty ass shit and find an artist who draws it and then commission <laughs> them on, to do what, it. What is this? What is this website? I like how we're playing dumb. That's very cute. But it's e621.net. It's a furry porn website and they have an extensive encyclopedic <laughs> tagging why, system why what's e621 why is it e621? i told you it's a very porn website and don't pretend that you don't already know what that is because everyone I, does they try to get me to google stuff on the show all the time and i e621 look. is a furry pornography site but why do they call it e621 i actually have no fucking clue it's just that's just <laughs> what it is it's called e621 okay and it's an amazing site you could look up uh, anything on there you could search by tags whether it's you know the pregnant or 
female or anything, right? Okay. Me female, male, straight, gay, anal, ambiguous, penetrate, right. anything, tentacles, whatever you're into, man. It's all there. Okay. It's all What if there. I give what if I what if I do this plan and I give Sitch the picture and he's even more into elves than ever? Well, hey, then he is going to become a patron of the arts, and that's that's <laughs> that's the way that it goes. Ask, you know, he's going to ask for the artist. He's going to be like, "Ooh, can we get a second? Who angle is this off artist? This? Yeah, who is this artist? There you go. Uh, and you know, we can get a, we can get a follow up. We <laughs> Damn can maybe it. have these be recurring characters. Give them Damn names. It. They like to get freaky. I want uh, Rags to understand what you're even talking about. No, Adam, he I doesn't. Know what you're talking he about. doesn't need to. He thinks he elf ears are say. like. Like really attractive gross. oh no, gross. he thinks they're gross and he thinks they look like penis ears really yes. yeah i'm not like a like a particular fan of elves but i'm not I, either it's fine but it's fine to me i, I guess i guess like, it's fine they're I'm like not, human listen, adjacent really i'm not one of these people like oh my god let me look up elves for porn but it's not like <laughs> you see some like hot elf chick i'm not like oh i'm turned off by her penis ears like that's never the thought never yeah, entered my yeah, mind in my the entire life point. if you yeah, see a super hot elf and you're like, man, I want to have sex with that. Oh, yeah, I'll show her the light of a Levitar. And then you see the ears are all pointy and everything. That that's never gonna that's never gonna dissuade me. What At is that for point, Adam? We're apparently. going in. Yeah, that's interesting. You guys are both gross. That that's very possibly true. But pointy oh, ears is nowhere is close right. to the <laughs> breaking point. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But Trick. that's interesting, right? That's that's where you draw a line. You draw a line at pointy ears. I think Which this is, conversation has proven has reached its terminus. We'll know that we shouldn't talk about sex now. The hell no, it's weird is pulling ahead. They're almost in the second position. Oh go. my god. Oh my goodness. No, the poll was over. No, no, no. The poll was over. No, it's still going. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? It ain't overtaking the people who don't give a fuck. So they can click and type. We'll see. Maybe you that's true. Miss you brought this up. You brought this up. Miss Sparkles for four months, thank you, says, you're pushing it, and I'm about to send you the glitter bomb. Stop this nasty. Please, Adam, go to the corner. You're grounded. Think about your actions. Oh, my goodness. There you go, Adam. You're going to get the glitter bomb. I'm sorry. I hate you, Adam. Sit, you're in trouble. Look at this. What did I do? I, you're the one. You're like, we need to not talk about sex. Then you're like, you're like, let's talk about sex exclusively for like five minutes. Right. Well, I was trying to get the points to go up on the hell no yeah i know what ball. you're doing i know what you're doing i think it worked okay. look we're almost guys we're almost in second place you live in sin and <laughs> dave is just like oh uh, okay well but at least we can have this conversation and isn't it great that we can have this conversation and ben is like yeah, whatever. I don't like you <laughs> well, and, and dave's like we're such good friends <laughs> And then, right, and they have this conversation that ultimately amounts to Ben being like, I will never see your love yeah. as real love. It will never, it will never be, think you're going to hell. And then Dave Rubin kind of like shrinking in his chair is like, but at least we can talk about it and have such a great podcast about <laughs> yeah. it. And it's like, Dave, stand up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like so spineless that it's like amoebic like it's amazing like i i love like watching him like like i don't know just like sway in the water like seaweed like as as ben shapiro sits there saying like your marriage is not valid you're a menace to children and dave is like yes but we can talk about this in a civil way and it, it's i mean it's like it's the virtue of a civility taken to such like a comical extreme that it's it requires like the complete absence of any kind of self-respect where you won't defend yourself, you won't defend your relationship, you won't defend your family or the, your own relationship to your children. You'll just sit there sort of quietly nodding as Ben Shapiro just completely trashes your entire personal life. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What was the, uh, what was the final judgment on these plants? I think they're real. The one on the right, the leaves look fake as hell, but it could just be the lighting. I only looked at the left one. I don't know. I figured if one was real, they were both real. Like, why would you buy? They're the either plants? both real or both fake. We're we talking about the fake plants. 
Yeah, you think they're fake? I was I was gonna bring it up. I thought this is really kind of a shitty background because it's just a curtain. I would put plants on the left and right. They were done. Um, I, I and then oh, what chair do we have? I'll just use this one. You know, I was like, okay, I something, I guess. You know, and like between two ferns, what was Wait, everybody? Joking? Everybody yeah. else is saying fake. Yeah, I think look- the right one is real and the left mm-hmm. one is fake. Okay, I have like the opposite opinion. Really, I think the right one is fake and the left one. Oh, interesting. Might yeah. doesn't the right one have like a unfurling leaf on the top there? Like it's why They're would you in, make? What do you mean? They're all kind of like bend in that direction. Right. No, I feel like the one on the top is like unfurling, like a real growing leaf. Um. Okay. You know how plants. I, I know how plants go and do, yeah. I'm aware of the concept of plants. If it wasn't real, the leaves would be more uniform. Well, it's hard to tell from the angle how uniform the leaves are. Because they actually do look kind of uniform. Because they all have that same pattern at the edges. Almost perfectly so, if you really look. Like you see, they all have that like perfect like trident formation. Yeah, that looks a like, little too neat to me. Like fish ribs. Yeah, and they all have it. Yeah, like, let's see a what you mean. Too cleanly, the stalks. Yeah, that that middle one is like really stiff and straight. Yeah, I think I'm. Yeah, it. it I think that is artificial. Yeah. 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 These are pertinent questions. <laughs> it is amazing. So. <laughs> So swinging back to the log cabin Republicans and this DeSantis video, after the video of of him bragging about how homophobic he is and he's the most homophobic presidential candidate comes out, the log cabin Republicans tweet, Ron DeSantis and his team can't tell the difference between common sense gays and the radical left gays. He sadly sees them all the same. His naive policy positions are dangerous and politically stupid. And it's like, yeah, Ron DeSantis can't tell the difference between common sense gays and (laughs) radical left gays. Yep. And also, no politician that you have ever tried to make yourself available to has seen the difference either. And they never will. And that's the thing that is so wild to me is we see this happen again and again and again and again and again. It's that like famous old tweet that's like, I never thought the leopards would eat my face. (laughs) <laughs> cries the woman who voted for the leopards eating people's faces party it's like the leopards are going to eat your face they are eating your face why are you acting surprised after you voted for the leopards eating people's faces party it seems- so he so he just sees it as basically the right is just hates gay people period and that will i guess never change at all even though earlier they said that desantis was too um homophobic for even the republicans liking so i'm kind of confused as to what the actual <laughs> stance is here but that's true yeah i don't see desantis as being a huge homophobe based on the parents protection bill well and the question was about trans stuff anyway it wasn't about like with the trump ad i think i don't know what the what is the why well, don't the lock cabin republicans were talking about so maybe there's a different ad that they're talking about yeah, I never saw the ad. Yeah, I'll have to go. I'll go look. Does the Santas come out and like lynch Any... a gay person or something in the <laughs> ad? I'm pretty sure that uh, is what happens. Yes. Yeah. I think that would be the end of his political career if he came out and lynched a gay person. Right, but yes, if I think if contrapoints was ask that hypothetical though contrapoints would say oh his poll numbers would go up 30 points mm-hmm. if that ad hit the street right because there's so much anti-gayness in the republican party i mean there is i don't want to candy coat it i think well I, I how many how many homophobes are in the on the left that are I mean, there's a, I supposedly there's a lot of homophobia in the 
a lot of black. homophobia in the black community. Yeah, exactly. Right. And there's a decent I mean, Hispanics are a lot of them, they're very religious. There too, you go. So, yeah. I mean, you know, so so if if they're voting against the Republicans because they've been convinced Republicans are racist and they're homophobic, like why are how's that how's that Big work? Think. So right. it's annoying this video that they're responding to. It's like been re removed from Twitter. <laughs> you can't can even see it. it. I'll Damn see it. if I can find it. Yeah. I heard things on the internet are forever. Doesn't seem true. Yeah, not always. Anyway, seems like what's going on is people vary and how we interpret the euphemisms. How we, when when the lepers eating people's faces parties say we're going to eat people's faces. Like there's some some of us who say oh that's bad they're you know no one's faces should be eaten we won't vote for them and then there's the people who hear that and somehow like translate it in their head into we're going to eat other people's faces but not yours um and, and i think it's like i don't know they get excited about the, the, the some of the level of face eating maybe but i also think that it has to do with this 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 is such a stupid and it's weird because contra was saying something that was far more intelligent than this earlier um because that is strange under well that's true but uh under this framework that she just laid out you could say that about anything it's like well when they said that they were going to only bash the fash I was like, yeah, eat That's those true. faces. true. But yeah. now they're calling me fascist. And I'm like, like wait a second. Why is it's this not that I, in my face now? I have no particular love for fascists. However, you think that I'm a fascist. So I don't think you should punch people you think are fascists. Very simple. What? I'm, I'm a fascist, fascist now. What? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my, oh my God. God. Oh, my God. Oh, oh my God's in the chat. Oh my hey. God. Hey, oh my God. Oh my God. I can oh my God. Oh my God. It's me. <laughs> Actually, I think, oh, I think, oh my God might be a she though. Oh so. my God. You have to say, it's, it's me. No, I like, I like Rag's impression. Oh it's my me. God. It's me. It's, it's me. Like a oh, South Park oh my God. It's me. Oh my God. Hello, everyone. Dude, the, the precious. Why? Yeah. Why? Look, what happened to the video? We're trying to get know. through. What did happen to the video? <laughs> I was looking We're trying for to get through you the video. Press, you you paused it just looking, looking for something. One, I said I was looking for something. It's a euphemism yeah, thing. Right? A lot of times, a homophobic, for example, a homophobic politician will find it expedient in a liberal society expedient. to. Who is the homophobic politician? I mean, DeSantis, I guess. Donald Trump. Oh, okay. Donald Duck. No, Look, he doesn't I, care. I, he's he's passionately racist. He doesn't care about the gays. How to keep it straight? Sorry, I forgot. May I quit? Sorry. If if parents don't want their kids to learn about homosexuality in school, is that homophobic? I mean, they can learn about it elsewhere, right? I don't. A lot of parents are. Do just they like, have to learn about it in school? If they don't want them to learn about like the existence of homosexuals or the school telling them that being homosexual is fine, I would say that's homophobic. But if they're just like, no, don't talk to my kids about sex. They're my kids. Right. I'll tell I'll tell them about that. Then I'm like, well, that's that's fair. You know, as long as we're being consistent, you know. Yeah. If they don't want kind of to a big deal, if they don't want a Christianity taught in school, are they yeah. being Christophobic? Christophobia? I, well, yeah, I, I don't know if that's a good example. Good Why? Why isn't that a good example? Explain yourself. Well, you can you can say Christians exist and gay that's people exist true. without like trying to push people down a specific pathway. Right. right. So. Yeah. I would argue like, of course, I'm not homophobic. Of course, I support the right of gay people to exist. I just think there needs to be a few like reasonable restrictions on, you know, whether gay teachers are allowed to teach teach certain things or whether, you know, whether we want children well, that's pretty being exposed to, to information though, about homosexuality. You know? Right. So that's the kind of the kind of smart. Well, like, I wonder what percentage of people are saying that and not just like quit telling my kids about sex stuff. You know, I don't care what sexuality it is. Stop talking to them about <laughs> sex stuff. That's what's so weird. It's like, well, 
Yeah, it depends what's being what are we talking about here, mm-hmm. right? Well, because first of yeah. all, I mean, there was never no one was ever saying I don't want gay teachers. There's always I don't want teachers teaching specific things, right? Which this is what's kind of annoying about this. Like, yeah, there are people out there who are just take gay people, just hate trans people. Fine, whatever. Um, sure, screw those people. Yeah. But there's yeah. also people who are like, listen, I don't, you know, I do think there's a social contagion aspect to some of this trans stuff. And I think it's dangerous and not even necessary that you're going to like try to talk about gender fluidity, you know, to children in school. Yeah. I don't think that's appropriate. Don't get any of, I don't want that gender fluid on my kid. Fucking yeah. Keep it please away. get all your, keep all your gender fluid, keep all your gender car. fluid away from my children. Right. Don't, don't, <laughs> yeah. Don't spray my kid with any of your gender fluids. Right. And it's like the idea that you can't possibly be against any aspect of this without being against the whole package is ridiculous. Which is kind of like the worldview that Contra's laying yeah. out here. It's his ultimatum worldview. It's like, yeah. oh, you got to talk about all of it. It's or... her ultimatum worldview, Adam. Right. What What did I say? You said him, bigot. I didn't say that. Okay. Part way to play it. If you think that the 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 voters are not as homophobic as you, um. But it seems like the log, the log cabin Republicans just take that at face value, and they think like, "Oh, so I'm fine, but it's just the bad case." Okay, well that's good. Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I never. I mean, yeah, but yeah, right. I'm fine. If I'm a good one, then that's good. But the bad ones, eh, they're bad ones. But yeah, you're just just you're just describing the delineation between what we consider good and bad, and how we generally have an approval of the good the disapproval of the bad because i mean everyone would say that it's like yeah I, white people are great except the bad white people you know like like everyone <laughs> those serial like, killers those yeah, school like, shooters yeah like they're bad you know like i the good blacks are good the bad blacks are bad but it's because of their goodness or badness not because of anything else you know right you got to call them black people black you, people the black yeah. did the i blacks. say the black ones yeah. you said the blacks the blacks yeah. oh okay i don't know if what i'm supposed to call i'm them. told i'm told that's very racist our african-american brothers and sisters thank you yes <laughs> much, that's much better sitch yes. always sitch always tells me that i'm not supposed to he say, say that. the blacks it's always like but i don't neighbors look, from across the sea look and people in the comments have said it too i'm just it's so weird because doesn't sound good when you say the blacks <laughs> i know just but no one can tell me logic other than just oh it doesn't feel right what well, it just sounds bad what do you mean i there's no logic to it it's just the way right. the word hits you yeah yeah i get a good it. Ra- it doesn't have a good ring to it right like surely she you believes should say, that look say black bodies that's what you're supposed to say. That does not say. have yes. a, that has an awful ring to it. I don't understand why. It has an awful good. ring to it, but that's the yeah. politically correct way to say it. I know, it and it's insane. Yeah, let's go to the market, yeah. get some black bodies, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's exactly got a really historic that. connotation there that right. I don't know if they really have thought about yeah. very much. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't make well, sense to me. After, <laughs> after a while, though, you're, you're going to have to say black bodies. I'm not saying crap. All right. <laughs> You're like, I draw the line there. You're like, I'll say black people, but I'm not going to say black bodies. I remember like really, and I think I even said this in one of my evergreen videos um, about evergreen college, mm-hmm. how in, how bizarre it was because all the people there were screaming like, we need black bodies. We need white bodies. I'm like, this is so dehumanizing. I know. Why are they like, say, like speaking this way? It's so strange. Remember the woman that ran around was like, I need some muscle over here. Ah, yeah, yes. that's right. I yeah, with the, yeah. I need some muscle. This guy's a reporter. Yes. He's you got a cell seen... phone. That's Wait. when the that's when they were at the height of their power. They're like, I am social justice warrior. Yeah, that was that was the thing that basically caused Evergreen to fucking tank. Yep. Yeah. They lost a shit ton of enrollment and things yep. like that. Yeah. That was totally done. No good. Now we're on the verge of Tim Pool's civil war. Oh, <laughs> it's any day now, the guys. Any day now. Backlashing. Any day now. <laughs> any day, yeah. It's only a matter Search. of time. Look, it, it's it's a trade off here, okay? We're gonna get yeah. UBI. But we're gonna but have a fascist president. For you have to years. have the civil war. Is that the trade off? <laughs> That's it, yeah. Okay. A little bit of fascism. <laughs> you sound like a little bit of fascism makes In the UBI go down. <laughs> a little bit of socialism, really nice. 
Look, I hope a little communism. Look, I'm not on the I'm not on the side of big fascist government, but okay. You're like whatever it takes to get UBI, <laughs> even if it's a little bit of no. Fascism. Look, I've fuck UBI seriously. If okay. I'm not down with the fascists, that's Ooh, good. I'm I, glad. Obviously, obviously, I'm just joking around here. This obviously. Look, we get late in the stream, and it's funny. I get a second win. I really do. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, absolutely. You get to a certain point, you kind of drag through it, kind of totally. the, the middle late part. But then it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm back, ready. Baby. Let's go. Yes, exactly. I'm ready to. Yeah, let's finish this video. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Contra points is insane. For <laughs> took that at face value because it because it shouldn't be taken at face value, right? You know, they're never going to stop at the radical left gaze whatever how whatever that means right when they when they take away your rights that's all of our rights i think they just look so delusional when they say this because it's i don't know i think what we're seeing with uh, the you know the kid stuff changing a lot of people's minds it's probably i mean it's probably an element of like you went to uh, some of y'all went a bit too far a bit too kind of like crazy you know that kind overreach of yeah big yeah, time i agree not like it was always going to be this way. The more power you give them, the more power they 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 gain, the more they're going to push the line, right? And Not that's you why guys, you had to fight back. Yeah, it's so Not ironic. Us. It's so ironic. All this is being driven by overreach. <laughs> that's be that's look, they made an argument, a clear argument. They said, "Look, this is a slippery slope. If there was no overreach, that slippery slope argument wouldn't work." But as soon as there's overreach, they're like, "Look, we told you. <laughs> it's terrible. Look, take some responsibility here. Back against them and not make concessions and not do this like appeasement stuff of like, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll agree with you about getting the non-binary people and about getting the radical left gaze and about getting wokeism, whatever that is, right? Once once you get rid of all of them, you're next. You have an idea, and that's right? what the log cabin Republican types don't seem to, to get. They don't seem to get that they're next once they're done helping the reactionaries you know destroy the the people more marginalized than them they're up next read the poem first they came for the wokes like <laughs> <laughs> is that how it starts <laughs> and you these people are so freaking delusional it's just i you're completely ignoring the detransitioners. Like the detransitioners are tangible damage done by the movement. You can't just sweep those that under the rug. You really can't. Okay, transfer. Well, look, you that's though that's where the backlash is going to come from. I right. I seriously, I do not think like if if gay people wanted to just get married and live normal conservative button-up lifestyles, oh man. But there'd be no issues. There'd be no issues at all. But they got to push. They got to push. They got to push. They're like, no, we need to teach people about homosexual sex in the third grade. <laughs> it's like, really? You think society's not going to function unless that happens? Mm -hmm. Like, no, we got to look. Everybody could be born in the wrong body. We got to start teaching kids early on so that they can pick which gender they want to be. Yeah. You don't think problem. that's a little insane? Um, no. Look, this, the backlash, that's, that's what's dr uh, fueling this backlash here. And I just, to, to deny it, it just makes you delusional. It makes you completely delusional. Look, the, the gays against groomers people are not denying this. They're like, hey, we're gay. We understand. <laughs> like, this right. makes us look horrible. Yeah just delusional completely delusional and if you can't even have a like a rational conversation about that you can't even say oh look there's these two things that we got away here you know obviously tr um you know if trans if if someone is going to go on to be a transgender person in adulthood and they can transition earlier that's a positive but there's not necessarily any way we can really determine whether or not that's going to be the case with all these kids Mm -hmm. You can't have a rational conversation about that if you're just going to say, oh, that's homophobia, move on. You're not even equipped to have this conversation. All you're doing is fueling the backlash. You should have spoken up. But I didn't because I was not woke and I was, was anti-groomer. Anti yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I just look, these people are imbeciles. I'm just going to say it. Okay. Imbeciles. Imbeciles. God, idiot. Look, here's your rep. Yeah, exactly. Napoleon, make yourself a goddamn quesadilla. <laughs> Good luck with that. I think when it comes to people who behave like are delusional <laughs> like this politically in the lgbtq community a lot of people online and in real life that i've seen have this conversation just basically the conversation their analysis of it starts and ends at like oh well these people just hate themselves and that's why they do this my thing with that is that like there's probably some self-hatred in there for sure but also this is so sophisticated sitch oh my this is ah uh, incredible this, sophistication some, here. I mean, there's some self hatred in so. <laughs> Look, you think people become, you think gay people become conservatives because they are self hating? Yeah, they they just hate themselves. Yeah. I mean, look, you're going to have to point me in the right direction here. <laughs> Who do you think is like the self hating? They're very openly gay, and they hate themselves. As opposed to, like, I would think if you were gay and hated yourself, you wouldn't be gay, right? Wouldn't you be, like, closeted or try to, you know, you'd be like Milo? I was, you know, Christianity cured me of my gayness or something. Look, Milo may be a good example, but I think he's just self-hating in general. Because well, that's true. He also such... could just be grifting 100%. So. Well, no, I think he's, he's, I think Milo has a tenuous relationship with something called the truth. And I think that that can weigh on you and yeah. kind of make you self-hating after a while. Like, right. oh, I'm just a dishonest piece of shit. Nobody likes me. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. But that has nothing to do with him being gay. Zero no, to do with him no, being no, gay. No. Yeah. Right. This is just ridiculous. I think most queer people have at some point dealt with self-hatred as it pertains to our identity. Some people deal with it for a really long time. And yet the bulk of us don't turn to self-hating politics. And I also just think that accusing people in this derogatory way of hating themselves doesn't really leave the conversation with any room to go on. It's like, well, you hate yourself, so fuck you. I mean, I agree with that. And like, there's... I Look, I do agree. And I've seen lots of gay people talk about this, how, you know, when they are first coming to terms with the fact that they're gay, you know, they're growing up with a bunch of heterosexual people who are going girl crazy or boy crazy and they're having a completely different experience. Right. That I can totally relate to. But that this idea, like they just, they don't understand conservative politics and they're just, they're, they're doing their best to kind of understand it within their framework but their framework doesn't adequately explain what's actually going on like i i would say that the gay people who turn to conservatism are probably more secure in their homosexuality than most people because uh, they're, they're literally yeah. going into into a situation where they're going to be there is going to be a, a higher homophobic right. contingent so you'd have to be more comfortable in it yeah, that makes sense. There's got to be more there. Yeah, I think that it's reasonable to have a level of animosity towards people who take their self-hate and then use that to hate other people and use that to bolster politics. They just hate other people. hurt you know? all of us. I also is. think that, you know, when you deal with your self-hate, say, as a gay person, by being an enthusiastic trans basher, well, at a certain point, self-hate has become other hate you mm. you're passing it on you're sort of projecting it outwards and i think that's just how bigotry works like i think that a lot of bigots you know, right, every bigot every abuser every dictator has their own issues they were deeply wounded in childhood like joseph stalin was beaten by his father every common domestic abuser has some kind of sad backstory like sure the question is like what you do with that trauma and what you because we all have some degree of trauma and i do think that some level of self-hate is probably a, a near universal part of the queer experience like who among us has not had times in our life when this was like the most 
salient emotion we were experiencing. Um, I think that it's, it's very common. I, I remembered when I was doing research for my video on cringe, like reading all these Reddit posts from people to, posting to like r slash confessions where it was like, I'm trans and I hate other trans people. Or like I'm gay and I hate other gay people. I remember this one post from someone who was, they lived in a very homophobic country and they came from a homophobic family and they described this experience of seeing a pride parade and feeling this like horror and disgust because they were scantily clad people and people kissing in public and wearing, you know, rainbows. And it was everything that like my homophobic family would say they were. And that's why my family would hate me and why I can't come out to them and what, right? Not to get all Freudian on it, but like a lot of times the wound comes from, from the, from the family and from early in life and okay, 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 okay. it's anything but our own behavior right 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 like okay i'm sure there's some people out there that are absolutely. like oh absolutely i'm yes. gay and i don't like other gay people or i'm trans i don't like other trans people and there's some latent self-hatred or what okay blah, 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 blah. Yeah, sure. i'm sure that's fine i'm also sure that usually like what that's code for in my experience when someone's like oh i don't like you know x people it's like there's a certain aesthetic involved with being gay or being trans or being a man or a woman you know the guys because we all know women are like oh i hate other women or i hate or guys or i hate other guys right there's some aesthetic quality to the social interactions between these groups some cultural element that people just don't like and that's usually what they're talking about in my experience someone's like oh i'm gay but i don't like other gay people it's like, well there's some aesthetic cultural attitude that they're just not happy with that's like a yeah, that's how i am with furries attitude. well there they're you awful. go yeah yeah there you go they're off right and so that's usually what I've found that they're talking about. I don't necessarily think it's some kind of like deep seated hatred to themselves. I think also it gets compounded with now that being gay or trans has like political uh, ideology associated to it. That if you don't subscribe to that political ideology, that could also lead you to not want to interact with those people. And it's like, I'm pretty sure Contra said the same fucking thing. I'm pretty sure like almost every person on the left has said this is that. Like internet, um, the internet LGBT community is like insane. I've heard, I'm pretty, I'm almost certain I've heard. Yeah, they're say pretty this. nuts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would agree. They're fucking insane. They're nuts. They're some of those vitriolic, um, angry, just super foul people. Yes. Like, like they'll just like, bite your head off over nothing. It's right. nuts. And I'm sure for a lot of people, and I'm sure this is also like, like kind of the tragedy for a lot of people, that there's a lot of people out there who are LGBT who maybe wherever they live, they don't actually know anyone in real life who is LGBT. They just have their experience of them being like this horrible online community or something. And so maybe when they say like, oh, I don't like other LGBT people, it's like, well, you just don't like these online horrible activist people. Yeah, we don't want the, the ones that are crazy that'll just like deperson you for having an opinion or right. being different from them in any way and who are out on like some crusade to destroy who you are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's like... There was there's so many of these like horrible woke internet communities that are so toxic. I remember there wasn't there was some girl who I think she was like Asian or something, and she drew Miles Morales like a slightly shade, like slightly not as dark shaded as like the internet wanted the hair to draw. The yeah, it's shit and, like that. Yeah. And then she was like, "Oh, we have to destroy this person with the cancel ruin this person. their life because they made a drawing I didn't like." Was it actually no? Wasn't there there was a girl? Wasn't there a girl who drew Steven Universe fan art um, who ended up like committing suicide or something? What? Because like people didn't like she redrew a character like a different shade or something. Uh, there's something about this, right? I didn't just make this up. You made it up. No. Anyway. Oh, it was it wasn't even race. It was okay. Here is the story. Steven Universe fandom is melting after bullied fan arts attempt suicide. So, they didn't, so that's good. They didn't succeed. This was in 2015. Okay, uh, we could have had one less Steven Universe fan. Well, that's true. Yeah. How do you um, know they didn't like they're not super depressed that they didn't succeed? There you go. They're basically um, a failure now. Yeah, because she drew a character. I guess she drew them skinnier than they really appeared or something. <gasps> That's fat phobic. They, they were a white character already, so yeah, they drew them skinnier. So they're like, "Oh my god, how dare you!" 
you bastard. I, I think a lot of conservative influencers probably have like a homophobic father or something. And yeah. <laughs> the desire for approval okay. from your parents is a long lasting thing that even if you no longer have a relationship with your parents is still somewhere inside of you. And if you feel like, you know, you want your, say your father's approval, like you'll kind of seek out that type of approval from other right-wing men. Mm. And I think that that is, you know, so it's, it is like self-hate in a way, but it's, it's more complicated than just self-hate because it touches this like yearning for acceptance and love that we all feel. And that I think queer people in particular, a lot of us have this basic wound of the shame of like years of, of hearing, you know, our selves disparaged, whether it's like seeing like derogatory depictions in media or is hearing homophobic talking points in your within your own family growing up um and so i guess they can literally only conceptualize conservatism as like bigotry there's no it's a other... bigotry it's being irrational there's just nothing there's literally yeah. nothing to it which which is even like when i look at even you know stuff that's like crazy stupid like flat earth socialism things of that nature there's like, no, like, no, I get it. I can see why you might think that, you know, even though I deeply disagree with it. Like, I can I can see from your perspective why you think, you know, the way that you do. And right. Why you think it's, you know, a, a good move or whatever. Um, what it like? Yeah. What if there's someone who is like, listen, I, I want less government regulations on businesses and lower taxes. Um, no, like, that can't. That yeah, like they're all like that's exist. pretty. That's pretty irrational. Honestly. Right. They have all like the kind of like right wing economic prescriptions, but then they're also gay and or trans, which is basically like Caitlyn Jenner's positions. And it's like, well, well, I mean, what are they supposed to do? Like, I don't know. Like, obviously, they still have all these conservative leanings. It's very strange that they just kind of don't even address this issue whatsoever. Like, no, 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 no. It must be that Caitlyn Jenner had like a father that hated them or something. Even though Caitlyn Jenner came out when they were like 50, so I don't even know if their father was still alive. <laughs> they would say wanting lower taxes is rational, but voting with someone who hates you, who's just bigoted, whose entire ideology is based around bigotry to right. get lower taxes, that is the irrational part. Yeah, but that's the way they would frame it. Just to acknowledge that there is like right wing positions that are not related necessarily to your sexual gender identity and that those can be motivating people pretty strongly. I mean, I agree. Like, listen, if the Republicans were out in the streets, like we got to round up the gays and queers. Is, OK, I'd be like, OK, yeah, you shouldn't be voting. For You've them got a gay point. Queered, yeah. Right. But that's not really the environment that we live in right now. <laughs> so. The leopards aren't eating the faces, despite what Contra is saying, because both sides are leopards and they just want to eat different faces. <laughs> right. And so that like yearning to be accepted and for the shame to be reduced motivates a lot of this kind of behavior, I think. And and I think there is a grain of, of something sympathetic in that. That's not just like, oh, this idiot hates themselves. Right. I mean, I remember like being one of the very few out gay people in my high school you know i've always been feminine i was in the glass closet as they say like i was never really like i came out as gay and people were like yeah i carried so much shame as you know most queer people do for whatever reason you know there's like very few queer people who have like a universal experience a, a universally just like accepting great experience like it's hard to even imagine it's hard, it's hard to even imagine. And I remember going to college. I moved to New York for college and seeing other queer people who were way more outwardly queer than I was, who, you know, other gay guys who were way more feminine, who were super into drag before I had really accepted an interest in that within myself, all this stuff. And like seeing people. Here's the disconnect. I don't know how old Matt is. Um, but I think Contra's in her mid to late 30s, or, you know, kind of age range of things. And so, like, th like she just said, it's hard to imagine someone who could grow up gay and not have shame about being gay. And it's it's hard for me to imagine why you would actually think that. 
in today's world. Right. Um, in today's world, especially when it seems you're getting to all be, the head pats. Yeah. Right. Because, like, sure, if Contra's in her 30s, you know, she grew up in the 90s, where basically the go-to insult for everyone was "you're gay." Right. right. So I understand that. You know, if that was your experience, sure, definitely. People, people around that age, 100. percent But like now, I know I've heard from people, and I've heard from from their kids, like at least where I live. You know, stories were like, oh, people are like bullying you if you don't tell them like how you identify and you don't have like some special pronoun or special identity or something. Right. And they'll get come out as gay and they're like, that's so awesome. Right. And it's like, so it's like literally the opposite of kind of my experience growing up. And so, I mean, again, I don't know. You're a straight white male. Oh, right. Like, yeah, I don't know how, (laughs) I don't know how widespread across the nation is. I would imagine it depends on pockets of where you live and where you exist that people have wildly different experiences with all this stuff. But just, it is hard for me to imagine that there are not a lot of places in this country that if you grow up, if you're young and you go to school and you're out, you know, People are going to be very happy. I mean, I I know it's I've seen these videos with these kids who transition, you know, when they do the social transition and they're like, oh, everyone in the school is like super supportive of them and their social transition. So I just, I, I'm this pop- is not true I'm anymore. finally popular now. It's right. amazing. I got to cut off my wang, but it's so but worth see, it. But that's, I think that's why Contra and other people who grew up in a very different era just have no belief whatsoever in social contagion because it's just so wildly different than their experience growing up. Right. So even though I'm pretty sure Contra's talked about in the past, you know, looking at the bizarre, creepy trans Reddit forums where there definitely seems to be pressure to get people to do some of these things. <laughs> yeah, those are real that, that shit's really creepy. Yeah. Back when they were reasonable. Back when yeah. Contra was reasonable. Back when Contra was reasonable. Sad. People who were like, quote unquote, weirder or freakier than me, it was like, oh, it like soothed a part of me that I was like, I've always wanted to be on the other end (laughs) of thinking someone was weird. That's hilarious. Because we all deal with that. Like, oh, everyone fucking thinks I'm a weird. Everyone thinks I'm a faggot. It's a dangerous thing to feel Uh-oh, good about disavow. because then Canceled. that could lead to me forming actual resentment towards these people thinking that it will stop other people from having that resentment towards me i feel like i'm in a therapy session right now well it is kind of a therapy session that we all kind of constantly need to be in <laughs> but yeah no, i know same kind of experiences like when i first came out as trans i you know there was this kind of mix of elation that okay i'm actually doing this thing but also terror because it's like, I don't know if there's gonna be a place for me in society after this. And so you look for some kind of anchor and I ended up kind of like latching myself on to this other trans woman who seemed to have her shit together. And so I thought like, look, if I stick close to you and I do what you do and I take your advice, then I'll be okay. And in some ways that helps me i'm literally copying another person but social contagion not real at all (laughs) yeah (laughs) oh yeah right right look i thought this was supposed to emerge from you naturally right from your brain right Hmm, okay Hmm, interesting but in other ways i think you know she was someone who was very much still working on this kind of self-loathing stuff and who was a little bit obsessed with passing and you know introduced these like terrible like cruel dichotomies that trans people make like there's all these like these kind of like fake dichotomies that trans people make between the true transsexuals and either the like trender uwu too cutes Sorry, this is a lot of jargon. Or the Ooh, like is jargon, yeah, pervert fetishist Huns. Like these are these are these are like categ- these are like sort of cruel categories that trans people have to distinguish. Like, oh, there's the real trans people, the good trans people, mm. and then there's like, oh, the weird fetishists, or oh, the blue haired. T- why why don't you want to make sure that there is a clear delineation between those who really do have a mental condition or dysphoria or whatever you want to call it, and those who are doing this for either attention seeking, the trendiness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you cut they, out? They usually split them up between 
gender dysphoria and or gender identity disorder now i think they call it and and uh agp autogynephilia well i don't think no 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 i, I think what contra sign about is the people that have gender dysphoria versus the people that are you know the trans trenders okay know, just attracted to some aesthetic or whatever which i mean you should draw a distinction between these two things or these three or these however many categories these things are because one of these things requires medical treatment and one of Hello? them doesn't oh, zoom died okay I'm back. yeah you're back yeah you're i'm back from the middle of what you were saying. yeah but you know i agree with you right because like one of these things requires medical treatment and one of them is an aesthetic and we do need to have a very clear categorical difference between the two things oh okay. did you did you go again no i'm here oh okay teenage people doing this just as a trend right it's like it's like Blair, Blair White versus like the thirty-seven pronouns he, they, it, zero. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's a common way of setting up the distinction. But I definitely had a couple years where I was kind of like getting dangerously invested in the idea of myself as one of the good ones mm -hmm. because it was like I needed to believe that to feel like I was going to be okay, like I was lovable. Look at that. Contra used to be correct, and now what happened? Contra used to be one of the good ones. Well, she used to be one. She actually did used to be one of the good ones, and now she's gone. She's gone <laughs> to the dark side. It's so sad. It's oh, so sad. you're so bad. Basically. And, but I also kind of noticed that the way that my thinking was getting uncomfortably cruel, and I was sort of fixated on disparaging the kind of person that I was rejecting what I, what I thought was unacceptable in myself, right? Mm -hmm. It's like your shadow self, right? The thing that the, the unbearable parts of yourself that you have to sort of project out of you and you rage against it when you see it in someone else, because you're kind of trying to kill what they represent to you. You're trying to kill uh, some part of yourself that you're trying to shove down and you're doing this like by projecting it out onto other people. Um, and I, I feel like I feel like I was able to come out of this and, and just be self-aware enough to realize that, oh, I'm like starting down a path that leads to acting like a bully, right? And well, so- y'all would never be bullies. I think that that, that video <laughs> cringe is- You know, it's funny, yeah, because like, like that's kind of the, that's what create, like that's what we all think of when we think of like woke people is to be this like horrific bully. 100% yeah. Yeah. super bullies, the, the societally bully. accepted bullies. I yes, mean, the state sanctioned bullies. It's kind of interesting. Contra had this <laughs> unique um, journey, I guess. But I don't know. I don't think this is like super indicative of anyone else's experience. So, this is the kind of my reckoning with that in a way. Mm -hmm. Like, it's me noticing, you know, that. Like pr probably a, a section of that video I wouldn't do now has to do with m me describing my intense reaction of like anger and hostility to this like trans woman behaving poorly in public and not passing or, you know, and like me sort of processing the fact that my like rage and disgust towards this trans woman had to do with my own like terror of anyone seeing me like that. Mm. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe maybe doing that in pu public, maybe doing that in a YouTube video was not the right way to do it. Maybe it should have been done in therapy, but I don't know, it's hard to find a good therapist. Sometimes it's easier to just tell YouTube. Um, so yeah, I think that this is like work. It's work, right, that, that, that we all sort of have to do to kind of learn a more compassionate way of seeing mm. and to find ways of healing your own damage that don't involve, you know, projecting it out of yourself as cruelty. Right. The same the same cruelty that you experience pushing it onto other people. Yeah, and you wouldn't want to do that. I honestly feel like mm -hmm. that is unfortunately just like extremely common. I mean it's yeah it, mm. within within the queer community and like you can go to extremes where you have people like the log cabin Republicans who are we finally get them talking about being about bullying and being cruel. And it's to people in their own community. They they have no idea about it, you know, <laughs> against all the people that they're really cruel right. and terrible towards. Because uh, it's like, yeah, they're not, they're not in the right tribe. So fuck them.
Yeah. To where like, I'm going to wield political power against my own community because that's how much I want to, you know, unload my own shame onto the people who theoretically I'm going to go down with. And that's and that's kind of why I wanted to round out the conversation here, because I don't want to I, like I, I do want I think compassion is the word I do want to empathize with the people who end up there politically to an extent because those feelings of shame and the feelings of want to wanting to scapegoat that shame onto other people in the community that they think are weirder or less acceptable or less able to fit into society than them. Like Natalie's experienced that. I've experienced that. Like, I think we've all had moments of that. And I think it's extremely human to have experienced pain and then not know what to do with it and sometimes do the wrong thing with it. But also, like we're saying, it's the slippery slope where you have to like catch yourself as you're falling into it so as to not hurt other people. Yeah, it's a situation that we're all in, right? And that is the point, I think, where we can sort of have some understanding for the log cabin Republican types is like, yep, they're processing the shame, same shame that we're all processing. But <sighs> if... Yeah, you're all just feeling shame. It's just, we all feel this way. There's one, there's one experience. We all have it. There's only the one experience. It couldn't be that they just don't feel it or they were raised differently mm. or they process that differently. Because like me, yeah. I've never felt shame at all and never a single time for like my sexuality, not once. And I'm, I live in Arkansas in the South. I've got conservative religious parents. I just don't, I just don't feel that way about it. Not at all. It's just not you know, who I am. So it's by no means a universal experience. That means you're, if you have I guess the is, strength yeah. and the self-awareness, you can choose to make the cycle of shaming and cruelty stop with you. Mm. And I think that that's a very powerful choice to make. And that's a choice we should all try to make. Yeah, totally. I mean, the last question. That I mean, listen, I, that's a good message. I stand by, you know, I appreciate that message, but it's hard to take seriously when it's like the entire, you know, apparatus and weapon of the left right now is shame and guilt. <laughs> And so it's kind of, yeah. like, you know, it's like, oh, okay. These are, yeah, these people are shit. terrible, cruel people. Yes. Yeah. It's like, all right. I mean, yeah, let's end the shame, I guess. That I kind of had for you is I have people who follow me online who are ostensibly not conservative um, because I, I just don't accrue that kind of audience, generally speaking. I wonder but, why. You know, there are these very social media savvy groups like gays against groomers and you know these other influencers some of whom we've talked about today who create this content that is very compelling um it works really well on social media and so sometimes i have people who follow me who don't really know what the cruelty is behind these groups and the psychology behind them that we've talked about today they just see, you know, oh, Gays Against Groomers posted this thing of look how crazy this non-binary person was behaving and this is really bad for our community. And they send it to me and they're, they kind of know that maybe it's not something that I would say, but they're not sure and they find it a compelling piece of content. And so I get these messages from young people, you know, high school age and younger being like, hey, I'm not really sure what to think about this. And it's like they're really vulnerable to as you so where's the part where you tell them you shouldn't behave in those ways you right. know like wh where is the advice of if you are going to especially with how much they politicize their identities you should be very quick to tell them well then you're reflective of a community or reflective of an identity so you should behave in a way that is positive you know but maybe this goes into the whole thing of then that's making yourself smaller or some shit like that. Right. It's not that way with the heterosexual community, obviously. Like, yeah, no a, one's like, oh, look at the look at the straights are up to it again. You know? Yeah, you don't. <laughs> there's not like you know the porn community does a convention or something. And everyone's like, oh, look, straight people. They're all yeah, bunch porn of porn addicts. Yeah, yeah, horny porn ass sex addicts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I just like. I don't, it's, it's a different situation with the, cause they do, 
the pride thing. Like, and if heterosexual people did have a, like a heterosexual month or whatever, and it turned into basically like a porn convention, I mean, I think that would affect people's view of all heterosexual people, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just I would it's like a different so. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I, it's look, you've got a month of the year that you're branding what your community is, right? People are looking at your branding and going, hmm, <laughs> like there's, it's not, it's not the people looking at the branding saying, look, this is a, a representation of the, the gay community, right? It's the people who are doing the branding that have control over that. Definitely. I think they should work on that. They should. I, look, I think the gays against groomers are basically, that's their message. They're saying, listen, listen. you guys are controlling our branding and we're not down with that. How right. do we get a, how do we get a hand on the branding wheel here? Yeah. Yeah. They're like, look, we're stuffy Republicans. Okay. We do it missionary. Look, <laughs> we do it gay right. missionary style. That's, that's all we right. do. Yes. There's going to be no adventure in we the We do it like they do on the discovery. No, we don't. Yeah. We're about no. love. And they and, don't. They don't. Yes. Yeah, so look, they, that's a that's a way of life. So I just, it's a weird thing, but. You and I both have being like scooped up into that thought process of like, well, they'll accept me if I, you know, throw the wrench at all of these weirder gays and all of these weirder trans people in the third. No, if it's the bad ones, then yes. If, if we change that to if you very openly say the ones who are doing really bad, disgusting, terrible things, they're bad, then they will look at you positively. And, and that's good, though. It's okay to cut ties with the, the worst parts of your own community. You don't have to drag them around like an anchor if they won't get with a program. Look, at it, if people go out like, like conservative types, even maybe even religious types, and say, listen, pornography and, and being a slut and sleeping around and all that stuff is degenerate. You shouldn't do it. They're not doing that to say, look, I'm a pick me. Look, I'm trying to throw the other hedros under the, under the bus so that you can, so that you like me more. It's just, it's so weird. It's like, no, we have a different philosophy about life. Mm -hmm. It's not about, it's just, it's weird because it is kind of making this identity out of, just sexual orientation, which I don't, it's not, a, it, it's not an identity on, in the heterosexual realm, right? I right. mean, you might look, I know that there's different people who are, who make pornography and they're kind of in the porn community where that might, I could see that maybe being an identity, but just heterosexuality is not an identity. It's people in the 37 pronouns and how do we stop that cycle of, you know, and that's a big question, but how do we stop that cycle of like transferring our own pain? How, 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 do, how do we make it end with us? Well, I think that one way is to just be very public and vocal in deconstructing the workings of it, like showing what's going on, what Gays Against Groomers are doing, how it works, why it works, why even if you aren't a cruel or bigoted person, you might still feel a strong pull towards this as most of us have at some moment and translation we have to basically lie and completely mischaracterize gays against groomers mission yeah <laughs> when it's when it really is closer to the what i'm talking about with heterosexual like christian types being against pornography mm -hmm. it's more like no we're just against this certain aspect of your behavior christians that are against pornography are traitors to the heterosexual cause adam well look they would be the <laughs> they would be the if there is racy heterosexual stuff in schools they would be the first to be at those school board meetings and saying well, no don't do that like we don't want this sex stuff in our junior highs right how is it any different if the sex stuff is gay sex it's not they're traitors to the hetero cause. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. What, what are you not understanding about what I'm saying here? Look, okay. this is completely ridiculous. They're traitors. 
to the cause of the straits. What's going on with that dude's arm? It's so weird. Does oh, it does like... look strange. Yeah, I think it's like the way that it's like the arm of the chair behind. Is it the arm uh, of the chair? Is it like? Yeah, arm? it makes it kind of look. <laughs> I mean, I'm just starting to notice this skin guy's and bones like bones on that. All right, it I'm starting to notice this arm. guy's just like a huge chubbers. A I'm at a different wrong pull right towards this, as most of us have at some moment, and, and there it is. Oh, it's just the the arm of the chair. That's it just arm? looks a little silly, yeah. No, it's the way he has his arm angled on the chair it makes it look a little strange. There's like a giant growth coming out of the side of his arm, man. No, because you're seeing like this, like the flesh of his of his arm is like pushing against the chair. I don't know, like Matt's arm is just. Okay. I mean, look, arm flesh. Okay. <laughs> Something's going on there. There you go. What's that? It's like he's got like dangly arm flesh. It's true. He's got. It's a terrible. Yeah. Listen, dangly arm flesh is a condition that affects seven percent of all adults. All right. Look in America, I think it's closer to like forty, maybe thirty or forty percent. Yeah. <laughs> if you at home have dangling arm flesh, please consult your doctor. In the and also get off and the couch, consult that pull up bar. Get yeah. yourself in the gym. Jeez. Cons consult a salad once in a while. Perhaps. My God, awful you fat fuck. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. How dare you? That's no, awesome. you're, you're, you're I right. think that that probably is the strongest way to fight it. And then the other part of it is just kind of accepting the, the difficult fact that for a lot of young queer people, this is kind of just a stage that they're going to have to go through. Like some people will just have to learn for themselves why this is not a good path to go down. Um, and, you know, you can kind of show people the way out and you can show people the flaws of that thinking, but ultimately each individual person has to kind of come to the understanding of their own and, and see why they need, what they have to decide what choice they're going to make for themselves. Look, if you're a young gay person and you're listening to this stream right now, okay, stop watching ContraPoints videos. They're rotting your brain. Pick up the audiobook of The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt <laughs> and learn. Learn how other people think, okay? ContraPoints videos are designed to make you shut your Radical. brain off. Yes. They're, they're designed to make you not think, just to copy ContraPoints. There's no thought going on in in contrapoints videos no introspection right very, no, no wisdom it you, you are being trained to become a soldier in a culture war and your cudgel is your identity true. that's all you are going to be true yes yeah you're not a person you're a tool read the righteous mind and escape the matrix never <laughs> and i'm not talking about the red pill matrix those guys are insane yeah, they right. need to read the right nuts if you're they need to the learn how to read. Movement. Then they could read the book. After they learn how to read, <laughs> then they can first learn, how to, read learn the book. to read. First, learn to read. <laughs> yes. So we can guide them, but we can't. You know, you can't do more than that. Yeah, and if you find yourself sitting on a podcast with someone who's politely telling you that they won't come to your wedding because you're burning in hell, but hey, at least we can talk about it. You know, leave that podcast chair. Leave it. Leave it immediately. <laughs> yeah. If you if you find yourself acting like Dave, I don't Ruben, know. This might be a good time to rethink your life. <laughs> <laughs> if you've made it this far in the episode, I want to thank you so much. Okay, that was it. That was the end. Wow. That's look uh, at the arm mystery's been solved too. That's right. It was a mystery. <laughs> we didn't. That was a mystery. We didn't know how that I was going to work look, out. I should have screen capped it. What I still mystery. think I was no, right. I no, I know what you mean. I was looking at the frame. I it, it was the way that the arm lined up with the arm of the chair, Perfectly, so it looked a little yeah. looked a little strange. looked a little looked a little sussers. Right? All right, we're all done now, right? Now it's super chat. Now it's yeah. I guess you guys do your super chat thing. Right. That's yeah. right. I might uh, linger for a bit, or I can oh, okay. go. Just let no, me know. No, it's your call. You can you can get out. Oh my God! Actually, it's twelve thirty. It's already right. tomorrow. It's already Monday. I should probably exunt. I should. Well, before you go, someone did send some super chat directed at you. Oh yeah, if you have super chats directed towards me, if you've been cataloging those, then I could. I'm more than happy to uh, stick around. You bet.
Uh, K Bizzle for five, ten, fifteen, Bizzle. twenty, twenty-five dollars. Thank you. Oh, nice. Um, and this is your first time super chatting. Said, oh. you guys are spewing. Oh, that's never a good sign. You guys are spewing. <laughs> uh, BS SJW logic. Well, let's just. Um, are we? Well, I don't know. But I'll, before I finish, I'm, I'm just gonna. This is a recommendation for anyone. I assume fans of the show. I mean, if you're sending us money, you want me to read super chat. I assume you're a fan. And people, a lot of people do this. Never start your super chat with like an attack or an insult. Yeah. Because you just make everyone, you, I mean, you make me defensive. You make anyone reading it defensive, listening to it defensive. I'm just saying for persuasion purposes, you should just say what your opinion is. And, and like I do this sometimes when I'm tweeting, I write out an angry tweet and I'm like, okay, let me erase the insult and just leave the opinion. And I, that would be my recommendation. Just or, like you write it out, you're all angry. And then you say, okay, let me erase the insult and just have the Sometimes the I pull back. all the insults out and like the tweet's all gone. There is no more tweet. <laughs> well, then you, maybe you should rethink. The tweet. Anyway, I'll continue. Uh, rags, lots of Christians will not be happy that people are burning in hell while they're in heaven. That's why they share the gospel Oh, this did not go in the direction I thought it was going to go. In. <laughs> That's uh, right. Look, wow. whenever you rip okay. on rags for being a, a anti-theist, right. you make me smile. So bring it on. Interesting. It's I like a win-win. Go the... We get money uh, and we get to rip on rags. Wow, Wait, is really... that the whole of the super chat? No, no, no. It's still going. I just, I didn't expect oh, this okay. to go this route. I thought it was going to go <laughs> in this completely there? There? other yeah. direction, but okay. Uh -huh. I'm giving um, Bizzle a wrench. <laughs> there you go. Um you sound like an angry anti-theist. Anti oh, what I Christian did you dirty? Sitch, you're using SJW logic. You're not basing off of if the Bible is accurate slash true, which if it is, then homosexuality is a sin. So Christians should go against the truth, as important as what sin is based off on your fifis. Nothing wrong with saying I want my friends to know God first and hopefully through, use wrong through. Giving their life to God, they will turn from their old sinful habits, which include promiscuous heterosexual sleeping around lifestyle and homosexual relationships, etc. Well, let me uh, address this and then I guess react to my end. So in terms of me using SJW logic, saying not basing off the Bible being accurate or true, I guess I would imagine that most people in the audience listening would be smart enough or rational enough to understand that whenever we're talking about religions, we're kind of operating from the assumption that no one is ever going to be able to factually prove the religion true or not in any sort of way that would be objective. Because obviously, if you could objectively know that like Christianity is true, then everyone should be Christian, right? That's kind of the difficulty here is that people don't have the ability to objectively prove their religion's true. Yeah, so, we do. I, no, I assume I, that would, I assume think that would that, go without saying. But. Well, that'll depend on the Christian that you ask. There are some Christians who say there is proof. Uh, and there are some who say right. that you can't know. The Some will say that that's why you need faith and all that. Right, worship, exactly. You know, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But it, dep but it depends on uh, who you ask. I okay. mean, after all, God did reveal himself to certain people, his favorites, I like to call them. Right. Um, so some people got that, you know, revelation from him. I mean, the angels, they knew. You know, yeah, but that's even, not proof to anyone else. I suppose, yeah, that, yeah, you know, allegedly to them. But yeah, it's, he allegedly showed up to some people. So, and some right. people feel like they have better reasons than others. But I mean, when Angel whispered to Joseph Mormon about golden plates being buried in his bed, oh, that was real. That's real. That's yeah, objectively, no, I, provably true. Yeah, that's like, that's right, not so. fake and made up at all. Sure. No, that's very. That's the, that's the truth. Yeah. So yeah. But anyway, do, do you have a response to? Uh, that, well, just read the first part again, real quick. Um. Rags, lots of Christians will not be <laughs> right. lots of Christians will not be happy that people are burning in hell while they are in heaven. That's why they share the gospel. You sound like an angry anti theist. What Christian did you dirty? Uh, I I don't believe I ever sounded angry when I was talking about this because I wasn't angry. Um, if you thought I sounded angry, that's more of a self report than you think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, however, you did sound a little angry about the hell thing though. Um, it sound angry it's more, I sounded sad and dejected because in a way that's, there's a little part of me that is that way. Right. Um, but I, I certainly am not angry about it. Um, I, as far as the, um, yeah, heaven thing goes, as far as I know in heaven, as far as I know the, the lore, right. Uh, <laughs> is that you will be it, it, incredibly enthusiastically blissful in heaven. So you will be happy. 
even knowing that people that you loved here on earth are suffering for an eternity in hell for yeah. which there is no escape from their finite crimes, which well, can ever, be as small all as my loved ones are going to be right. in heaven though. Ah, it's true. Yeah. Do, do people, I thought when the rapture comes, do people still remain in hell or I thought something, I don't know something? the rules on the rapture. Um, I wasn't part of a denomination that believes in the rapture. Okay. Or at least I don't think I was. The, I don't yeah, know. The, rapture the rapture people go thing. straight to heaven. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah other people, thought, like, what know. do you want to know? I know a lot know. about the rapture. I thought something different. Happens. I thought there are people. I think the the good people get transported to heaven, and the bad people get left here. Where I guess the world is going to turn to destruction because well, all no, the bad people look, are the ones left. You can accept. You can accept Jesus after the rapture happens, which probably is your best move since. You're going to have to die in the apocalypse, supposedly a horrible death, but you will oh, get dang. to go to heaven. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Okay. Well, who wouldn't well, accept Jesus after the rapture? Oh, yeah. yeah I, think, I feel like, like after yeah, the rapture, that's pretty like... Yeah. But as long as you knew it was the rapture, because if everyone just disappears, especially if it's the rules of Christianity, it might be indistinguishable from fucking randomness that all these people just disappeared. Right? But in the apocalypse, they're going to make it hard on you. They Who's really they? are. Right? Well, the, all the people who are left, uh, Satan or, and his so, minions. Oh, oh they get yeah. to come to Earth. Oh yeah. man, that'll that's that really that sucks. Yeah, there's going to be like a lot of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh yeah, oh yeah, the wailing and gnashing of teeth. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Bad that's stuff. Bad well, okay, stuff. Here's a question. Uh, no Christian did me wrong. I'm actually. Uh, I was really cool with uh, uh, the the priest that I you know had at my church. Yeah, I was man. chill. I was a lector. I was an altar boy. I was in the handbells, choir, the whole nine yards. Um, I didn't have any bad experiences with being touched or diddled or people saying they hated me or anything like that. I didn't have any negative experiences growing up uh, as far as Christianity goes. But it's interesting that that is your default that you go to. Because there couldn't be an intellectual or rational reason why I changed my uh, theism. It must be because I'm operating under emotion and I'm reacting against uh, particulars who were bad to me. Ooh, salty. But, uh, it was an interesting self-report of a super chat. But I'm certain that Sitch and Adam appreciate deeply the $25 you sent as your first super chat. I and do. boy, what an Look. incredible selection of a podcast that you chose to have you be first <laughs> super chat. So, hey. I think all in all, it was a very positive experience for all of us. There you go. There you uh, go. We did it. We've truth done it. Is, we did it. I look. I think you can. You can definitely prove that there's aspects of Christianity that facilitate pro-social behaviors yeah, in society. That absolutely. And you can you can prove that one hundred percent. So there is some level of truth that that Christianity is good for society. So, mm -hmm. yeah, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. A lot so, of yeah. good stuff came out of it. I'm, I'm not bitter about my upbringing. I'm very well, no, glad. You sound, yeah. you sound, look, you do sound a little bit like you're being sarcastic. Do you? No, it's uh, just, just me. That's just me. That's Rag's tone that's of voice. Just, that's, that's just, just default tone of voice. as a person. That's just my <laughs> default is to be sassy and sarcastic. Yep. Rags, if you stereotype. could press, if there was a button, that you could press and Christianity yeah. would no longer exist. Would you press that button? Do you, and, and do you think no. the world would be a better place after you press that button? Um, I don't think the world would be a better place and I wouldn't press that. I okay. have, I, I have, I have reasons for not pressing the button. Um, I would think that a movement away from religion needs to be a gradual process that people arrive to, um, in their own ways. Um, and plus, but I don't want to. Is that a necessary them. thing? What if religion no, is better for them? It what might if they're be, yeah, a like complete I, drunk and alcoholic and a shoplifter well, and a burglar? Well, and last they time find... we're sh shoplifting and burglar. Holy shit, man. They're yeah. going for their achievements. But uh, as you asked me this last Crack time, I was, uh, I was on, and uh, my answer will be the same. I, if someone uh, would otherwise do be doing. Uh, be doing bad things if they need it to stay off of you know alcohol or drugs if it really brings them a sense of fulfillment family all that sort of thing then maybe it's very possible uh that it you know it, in, in fact it is the case that religion and people's faith and their uh their theism brings them you know it, it's better that they should keep believing you know even if i don't believe it to be true you know it, probably all of the good uh, will outweigh otherwise what would be bad 
So we'll go, yeah, well, in that sense, yeah. Look, I'm going to ask you next time you come on rags, just so you can remind everyone. It's, we it's just, good. I want it's people good. to you, know. <laughs> you want to make yeah. It's good to make sure that I'm uh, I'm being you know consistent. And if I change, then I you know I better have a decent no, look, reason can, ready for it. You, you know? could probably have a different answer next time, and I wouldn't even remember. I'm just oh, I got you. I got you. well. I'm sure chat will let you know. They'll tell you. They do that, don't they? They're yeah, like last they all, time you they'll said let you this. know. Yeah. Ooh, they'll like, let right? you know. You Adam, bet. don't yeah. let him get away with that. <laughs> well, okay, so that's part of you know part of the. I have three questions before we go. One of them, I I could never watch Left Behind because I hate fiction. Oh, it's that, horrible. That has like a crazy mystical possible thing that happens, and then they're like, "Well, we're never going to actually explain it. That's just the setting for the drama of like humanity." Um, I'm, like, oh, I'm okay. I'm okay no. with that as a premise, no. not knowing what caused the thing, especially because a lot of the times the explanation would be just fucking stupid. Sometimes leaving it as a mystery is just can't stand gonna it. be better. I can't stand um, it. If, I if, can't if, stand it either. It's no. bad writing, bad yeah. filmmaking. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think so. I think uh, forcing people to go with headcanon. Oh, rags, please. Well, that's no, little... they're not forcing you to go with headcanon. Yes, they you are. To, you don't have to have headcanon. You could just say you don't know. You can yeah, literally with, just say you don't know. Well, left behind. That is... happens all the time with uh, the movies and stuff we watch. I constantly mm -hmm. say, I don't know how this happened, and I don't have enough information to work with, so I I can't make a guess. Well, I don't I don't personally like it. I mean, obviously. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. I it's hate fine. it. I think I, people yeah. who do that should burn in hell for eternity. There you go. Oh, times my goodness. eternity. That's, a, that's pretty serious. I think with oh, Left boy. Behind, it's a little bit worse, too, because it's not just like something weird happened. Why is this like like the movie After Earth? It's like there's no explanation. It's like, OK, fine, whatever. It, you know, it, <laughs> it's fine. It's just so but it's something that's so bizarre. It's like an alternate Earth flying into this Earth. It's like, OK, there's not even something to establish why that would be happening. But Left Damn. Behind it's very specifically like, well, did people get raptured? Yes or no? Like, it's a very specific question that's never answered. But my question was, if something like Left Behind did happen, where a bunch of people like fucking just vanished like that, but there were no demons or any of the other thing, would you be like, listen, I'm going to start praying to Jesus just in case, right? <laughs> or would you be like, no, um, screw that. If everyone in the world just like or, or a everyone. huge chunk of the world yeah all of the by i guess the the jesus rules the righteous people just like disappeared right um i would i don't know that would be such a bizarre thing i'm not certain how i would react to that that's a that's a really wild thing so i just don't know um i don't know how i'd react to that i'd be like listen time to take out my insurance policy baby i think if something that <laughs> incredible Get baptized and, if something like that happened, I might yeah. seriously consider like the supernatural is afoot here. Right. Because I just don't see how there could be any natural explanation for it, right. though I want to be really careful with, you know, saying that kind of thing. But that would be so, you know, grand of an event that I don't know how it, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Sitch, I'm, it's not Sitch off the table. calls me up immediately. Look at him. It happened. All these people disappeared. What's next? That's yeah. what do I and he'll do? be here. And he'll be here. So I mean, you know, well, as we all, all all of us will be, of course. I was told that the Jews are still like gonna get in. Eventually. Well, no, Ooh. I'll be here. I'll be here. I mean, I'm they, they're the atheists though. Wait, 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 no way wait, I'm getting raptured. I'm gonna all be the here. ethnic Jews or just that you have to be like Jewish Jewish. I mean, I'm Jewish Jewish. I'm like hundred percent Jewish. You're Look, like the only uh, people that get raptured are the people who have the only people who get raptured are the people who have accepted Jesus as their own personal Lord and Savior. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have technically done that. Oh, even I though I, too. even though I am an atheist now, look, when you become an atheist, you don't renounce taking Jesus yeah, but as God your personal knows. Lord and Savior. I mean, That's my God little insurance God, right? policy. I keep in look, my back I, pocket. I'm and... saying there's a 50, 50 chance I could be raptured. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> but so is, wait, so is it, Okay, well, here's the question: Is it God doesn't care whether you like believe it or not, just as long as you did the, the you said the words, had the water? See, I don't you? know. Or it's unclear. is there like a bureaucracy, and you just fall through the cracks? Because like once you get on oh, the thing, I could you get on a list somewhere, and some angels like, ah, I gotta get off this shift. Let's see, Adam friended right here. That's the guy. Yeah, rapture him up here. Look, I'm not. I'm keeping my mouth shut. I've been lucky like this before. Okay, <laughs> like, <laughs> so. Things you, like this happen. Look, I got out of a lot of yeah. classes in college because uh -huh. I got lucky kind of in the same way. So you just, just got there's raptured an entire, out of There's an entire branch of study called soteriology yeah. that is essentially the discussion and study around what you 
about the concept of salvation and what you need to do to be saved because mm-hmm. it's actually like very clear and unclear different denominate you would think they'd all be in agreement on such an in- I would not insanely that, no. important well if it was all true you'd think so right they'd make it very clear mm-hmm. but there is a lot of disagreement on what you have to do to be saved so there's a lot of old studies about it do you have to do this do that do I have to do this and that what about this what about that how do I have to get in heaven you know things of that nature mm-hmm. so it's a whole thing they can Actually, clear it up and get we're back triggering all the christians in the chat well, that's right that's right someone because i forget who was someone came on and said that jews are will still be saved and then i think i've read that jews get a second chance to accept jesus once jesus comes back and they see him nice yeah so listen i'm in i'm in a good spot okay we'll see oh, how okay. it shakes out look this is the fourth turning is here so the rapture could <laughs> this be is any... the fourth turning jesus coming back <laughs> that's the last fourth turning you're ever gonna see I, like i was right Sitch. it wasn't just the fourth turning it was the last fourth turning. <laughs> oh that'd be epic that'd be ep- look we're getting ubi in heaven <laughs> there you go there oh i mean the, like ul- UBI, the I ultimate know. universal basic income right okay uh ct uh, wanted me to read this. She said, Rag's opinion on hell is actually what made me question evangelical evangelicalism. Like I told Adam, I started to think negatively about heaven because the people I liked would be suffering. I would carry around a piece of paper with names of people I loved on it so I wouldn't forget them if the rapture happened. Jeez, can you imagine being Jeez, like that's fucking interesting. Right. To, to like go to believe in it and like to go through that length just in case, just to make sure that you don't forget people you love that got left behind. That's right. That's that's a uh, insanely interesting. You stop being you in heaven because I was told no matter what I would be happy, and that upset me, and that upset me because people I loved would be suffering, and I would be happy about it. It sounded like the worst thing I can imagine. I was thirteen at the time, so I was still very young too. And I would think about how, quote, how I could I get out of heaven to save my <laughs> friends from hell. The rapture stuff, yeah, the devil will try to force everyone to take the mark of the beast, and anyone who does is rejected from heaven, and the force will involve every manner of torture you could think of. Lucifer and the demons are unleashed upon the earth for seven years. You cannot die, from what I remember, and you have to survive all seven years until Jesus returns again. It is seven years of torture to earn a place in heaven if you're a non-believer. It's all really fucked up. Look at this. Similarly to uh, CT knowing it. Okay, so we can't die. We have to make it seven years. See, that's what I'm talking about. They bring out things like torture and cannibalism, all this stuff. You got to get with your buddies. You got to you got to form your groups and get your bunkers ready. Because seven years, that's uh, it's good. You know, you just kind of live seven years. They're like demons and stuff. I don't know what your bunker is going to do. You have to (laughs) survive, but you can't do anything wrong. You can't. Jesus can't show up, and you can be, oh yeah, I've been a cannibal for the last seven years. That's not going to. Well, if you can't die, but it's clearly, I guess the the spirit of it is that it is possible to survive the seven years morally right or else well, you know i, well, I what, assume I assuming this is okay so. assuming so? this is right so assuming i mean i've never heard this uh, specific thing that ct is laying out but i'm assuming that this is based on some sex canon which is that you humans cannot die and for seven years humans will basically be tortured by demons and they'll say listen we'll end the torture if you take the mark of satan and reject heaven and so if you cannot, if so, if you can sit through the torture for seven years and never, you know, take the mark, then then you go up to heaven. That's clear. That's clearly under duress, though. Because it so, becomes a because it becomes like, a oh, it's literally a test of your pain threshold that will determine whether or not you like get to go into heaven. Right. And I'm like, man, that well, seems listen, really unfair to me. But, you know, that, I, I just say it seems a little uh, fucking. But similar to the super chatter. Yeah, it was my like really thinking about heaven and hell, hell in particular. That really kind of it just shook me out of theism and uh, it just didn't right. really all didn't add up to me and you know all good god and you know all that stuff you know it really it really okay. resonated a lot with me and before you go if i don't ask this thoth thoth will have a seizure if i don't ask oh uh, thoth yeah yeah is he in your is he in the efat community too no i assume you're talking about the uh the egyptian god who invented writing thoth's apprentice god of knowledge his name. and magic he's a patron he's of scribes man. What's with his little his little avatars? This, so. Oh, hey, there you go. It that it might be him. Maybe this whole fucking time we're wasting on yes. talking about the rapture because Thoth is in the chat right now, right. and he right. knows the truth. Yeah, him and Anubis and Osiris and Horus, stuff, they're all up there, and boy, they're gonna weigh our hearts on that scale. Right. You don't want to get that. So he sent me a video um, that he wanted uh, us to cover with you and Mahler at some point called. Uh, 
Yeah. The, the Lion King one and a half Judaism, white pride and paranoia. Oh, I oh, by uh, by a strange coincidence, I actually uh, on the on Saturday on our yeah. EFAP. Yeah. I randomly like that movie just came to my mind. And so yes. I asked what everyone's opinions were on Lion King one and a half. And yeah. some of the people had never even heard of it. Right. So uh, I don't know. So Lion King one and a half. Uh, yeah. I, I think that video, someone had mentioned it before because it was like a hilarious joke. It's a very strange uh, of a video, video, but yes. I guess yeah. if it's real, that could be interesting, but I'm not going to get into like the Judaism stuff right. and the like, yeah, I mean, I, I listen, I watched like, 20 minutes of it and i was like it's like ramblings of a lunatic kind of stuff it, it's like it's not it's not like the fun kind of crazy oh, it's not even fully yeah. crazy it's okay. just like someone making a lot of illusions that they're kind of headcanning and you're like maybe but maybe not so i don't oh, know i didn't okay. think it was. i, I think i know covering, what you mean yeah i think i know what you mean if you're interested in it you can check it out it's by a youtuber named the sin squad the sin squad yes hmm. the sin squad interesting so you let me know and cd for another two canadian says yes rags it's all very unfair lol indeed it is indeed it is fair life is uh unfair but i guess it didn't i guess it didn't have to be you know if the big man wanted it to be so but who knows you know who knows maybe there is no big man what are you talking about that's true that's true santa what do you mean santa's real there is a santa what what are you talking about where do the presents come from if there's no santa I saw that your avatar, you changed your, you're in Halloween mode already. Yeah, it's spooky ween. That's right. Okay. I'm a, I'm a scary vampire. You should That's be, right. I thought you Discord, should, yeah. you should be Santa Claus. I, I don't think you should I already have a, be Christmas themed. I've got some with, uh, with, with pumpkins. I got some where I'm a ghost or I'm a spooky ghost. One of them like here, I got the vampire and one of them, I'm a witch. Oh boy, there's so many great Halloween costumes. I love spoopy costumes. Halloween's great. I, mm-hmm. I I'm Christmas supremacist, but Halloween is top tier holiday. It okay. is definitely up. It's super up there. I think I think my favorite holidays are you know you got the big three: Christmas, Halloween, and Thanksgiving. And then this won't apply to everybody. What about Earth Day? Earth Day? That's every day. What, what about St. Patrick's oh. Day? Oh, that's yeah, just another it. reason to drink, which is always good in my book. Cinco but I've always had Mayo. a always had a particular <laughs> fondness for the 4th of July, the fireworks and the grilling and the family getting together and just having a good time. And it, it's great. I've always, May the 4th always had a be with you. May the, oh, that's true. No, yeah. That's Star Wars up. day. Yeah. <laughs> it is made up, but that's all right. That's okay. Uh, Orca for jar says rags. What makes good rat? Hi, Adam. Ooh. Meow sitch. That yeah, is a very no. deep question, which I cannot answer here. I, there's not enough time. There's just not enough time okay. for me to explain what makes good rat. I don't even know what the it fuck that can't. means. Oh, it's a that's a that's a good EFAP meme. That's a solid EFAP meme. Okay. Dr. Dealer yeah. for two hours says hi, Rags. Hello. Uh, Fondue for 10 hours says, I went to a church that believes in the rapture. One of my biggest experiences was unintentionally stumping my pastor about it. There's no biblical support for it. Yeah, I don't think most denominations believe in the rapture but i maybe i'm mistaken but i, I don't think most of them do i think the okay. rapture is is not a not one of the more popular uh it's not amongst the more more popular lore for yeah. no way the, the, the jesus stuff the rat i did the rapture come from the evangelicals they were just like feeling it They're like this will be good people will like this yeah, I don't. I just don't quite know how that stuff starts. You know, where it comes from, because there's so much stuff that isn't like strictly <laughs> biblical. So if you're going only by you know the Bible, you know, which not everyone does, uh, not every denomination is just the Bible and nothing else. But uh, so you, sometimes you wonder how stuff like that gets started. It starts from one line. There's just like one line that's kind of ambiguous. They're like oh, <laughs> what the Bible. There's like one yeah. like vague Timothy line. four two. Yeah. Oh, and there's a yeah. rapture. Anyway. Like, yeah, you're like, wait, what? <laughs> wait, wait, what? What does this, what right. does this mean? Well, I mean, I like I couldn't believe that original sin wasn't in the Bible. I was like, what the fuck? This is like insane. So I don't know. There's a lot of this weird stuff that goes on, but that's religion. That's religion. That's religion. Yeah. That's God should so just uh, instantly and effortlessly uh, let us all know what the truth is right now and really That'd clear nice. all this up. That would be uh, really cool if he would uh... just do that. But I'm sure there's very complex and intricate reasons why he couldn't just do that and solve all the problems instantly and effortlessly. So who knows? You know, maybe uh, maybe it'll happen one day, but we'll see. It's, we'll they're, see. They're hard problems. Right. 
Okay. Well, you can check out now, Rags, if you want. I Real have thing. to leave. So. Um, yeah, I think I am. I appreciate you letting me hang on. You had two very interestingly uh, different guests today. I feel. <laughs> uh, so uh, we'll, yeah. we'll let your chat enjoy yeah. that. Um, it's always great. Yeah, it's Thanks for coming on. on, man. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed it. That was an interesting video. Good talk. Good chat. I hope you guys enjoy reading the rest of your super chats. I hope they were they are voluminous and lucrative for the both of you. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, uh, thanks very much. And I will see y'all later on. Take care, man. Take bye, care. bye. Later. Uh, oh, what the fuck? Just got some bullshit. Wow. Please. No cursing in the 10th hour, okay? I know. It's only 2 in the morning. Before we get to Super Chats, I had to bring something up. Um, Carl was rewatching Social Justice Detective. Uh-huh. I don't know if you remember. There's a scene where you are talking to yourself in the yes. car. Um, yeah. You what? What is this accent that you're doing in Social Justice Detective? I don't know if you want to bring it up, um, real quick, just to show everyone. You're doing a very strange accent, and I didn't. I never noticed this until Carl pointed it out, and I'm like, "What? What is happening here?" The not the Social Justice Detective accent. No, no, no. The it's not in the, ca in the car. I'm doing my Christopher Walken. I'm yeah, but yeah, okay. But it goes to like three different accents. It's like, it's like, are you doing like a Mexican accent, and then you're doing like it becomes a Christopher Walken accent, and then it does it like a different accent. Look, it's like it's a, a bunch of different accents. It's a little look. I made the thing like five years ago. It's a little late yeah. in the game to be. I'm just asking you what was the thought process while you were doing it. That's Look, all, I actually not... shot that scene twice. I shot yeah. that scene once and it was horrible. I was like, right. oh my God, this is terrible. Acting yeah. is hard. I have to like... It, that is true. Acting I have hard. to actually do a character or something. So I went in and I'm like, I like Christopher Walken. <laughs> Let me just watch some Christopher Walken videos. So I started watching Christopher uh -huh. Walken scenes. And I kind of was like, I can kind of do this christopher walken thing and even if i don't even if i don't hit christopher walken at least it's like a performance that's distinct from the other character that i'm playing which okay. i mean i can do social justice right. detective with my eyes closed like that's okay. the character that i did the most right okay I, okay you sign now you saying it's christopher walken it does make it does make sense now what's going on here bring it up if you want to bring okay. it i have a watch together bring it up. okay let's i just want everyone let's laugh at adam's terrible acting It'll First of all, fun. everyone should watch Social Justice Detective. It'll be fun for As far back as I can remember. Whoa, whoa, Look whoa. Let me bring the watch together up first. Look at that that, that great social justice that detective was the, voice. That was the best choice that I made. I'm like, okay, obviously I got to do Christopher Nolan's Batman. <laughs> like, yes. Well, no, that just... wasn't. No, you weren't doing the Batman voice. The Batman voice is awful. What do you, you mean? Like a good... What Look, are you talking about? Of course I'm doing... I'm doing you're doing Batman. like man. Well, what do you think all, I'm doing? You doing Batman sounds like movie theater guy uh trailer voice, of which course. is much better. Yeah, the Batman voice is awful. So Oh, you don't like uh Christian Bale's voice? voice. You, don't don't like Christian, you don't like Christian Bale's Batman uh, voice? Uh, yeah. Here, it is. Here it is. Do you guys not you, I don't have throat cancer? We're not gonna we're gonna skip straight to it, but let's just listen to the intro. Yeah, yeah. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be the hero. I'm an idealist, a guardian of justice, a champion of the downtrodden, the downtrodden and, oppressed, and oppressed, an angel, an angel of, of hope for lost souls, souls trapped, trapped on the on edge of oblivion. of oblivion. Wow, look at this. He knows all the lines. Look at that. <laughs> look, it's funny because I only know the lines from editing. Like when I was Not actually from doing it, yeah. When I actually editing. was shooting the thing, look, right. you can see in my glasses half the time you can see the script. I oh, yeah. <laughs> like look, you yeah. can right here. You see you the can laptop see, and the the camera. Look, you can see the script taped to the window. Oh, you is that what <laughs> is that what that is? Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> it's totally taped to the window. That's <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's great. Look, I didn't memorize the lines. I was like, that's look, great. I'll just tape the script up. Oh, look. God. Adam, you're wearing mirrored sunglasses. I don't yeah. give a fuck. Nice. Look, if the perform this is the one of the mistakes that I made in yeah. the first film that I made was I was like, oh, people are going to be able to catch 
everything has to be perfectly yeah, no content. Look, right. you could do a scene and literally be in a different room from cut to cut and people won't notice if they're right. in this, if right. they're into the scene. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Here's look, are scene. we is it? This is yeah. in the car? Oh, okay. What happened? To your teeth. What happened to your teeth? I was in an accident. What do you know about Trevor? Crazy shit was going on. Like loco. Ethno stuff. Well, I don't know about that. This lady got really weirded out at Trevor me. is intimidated by strong women. He hides his emotions, retreating into an online world of racially charged meme culture. I guess. You still talk to him? He really doesn't want to see her anymore. Trevor is afraid of what he might do, how he might handle her without consent. What exactly is in it for me? If I tell you where to find him, what do I get out of it? How about if I don't blow your nuts head off? Look at that. Great effect right there. <laughs> Get that. <laughs> How is that not like a picture or a meme? There's Adam pointing a gun at Adam. Okay. This was <laughs> so good. this Someone was so hard there. to do. This was so hard to do cuz I had to shoot it in two Obviously, I had to shoot it in two different scenes and like You did it great. Match them a, together. Look at that. There's no who was holding the gun? Or no, there no one's holding a gun. Yeah, you just, you did a perfect, almost perfect. Cut to, look, I think my wife might be holding the gun in the next scene. Well, you, didn't your your wife when you get hit in the face? Then yeah. wasn't your wife hitting you in the face with a gun? Yes. Well, we'll right. call well, you're not. That's my wife's hand. Look, look there's obviously. a Bruni mod ninety two. <laughs> That's my look. Oh, look at your that nails. Dainty your little nails hand. are so much better. Yeah. <laughs> look at those dainty nails. I was like. Come on, honey. I need you to point the gun at me in the car. Right, right. I hope the neighbors don't see. Okay, you sang. Head off. You sang that you were doing Christopher Walken. I understand what the voice, because I was like, "What is this voice?" That it's you're not doing? too and bad, like, right? I mean, it's not terrible. <laughs> okay, it is terrible. Never. I looked at the end of it. I'm like, "Oh, he's doing Christopher Walken," but like the first, like fifth, like the first half, and I'm like, "What is going on here?" So. Oh, here it is, right here. That shirt, by the way. You have an orange felt shirt. That is, look, that shirt. We did a, we did a yeah. video where someone was wearing that shirt, and I said, I, I have that yeah. shirt. Remember? And I said, what? Yeah, that's it. Here it is. Detective Jack Stryker. I'm a private investigator. Get out of here! Or I'm calling the cops. Where is your phone? What? Here. Let me help you find it. <laughs> Ooh, she really fucking hit you. Didn't it? She knocked my glasses off. It was great. I <laughs> it was, was like, great oh, my shot, goodness. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. Watch it. This is Adam getting hit. Fall. What? Let's watch it again. Here. Let me help you find it. Boom. <laughs> oh, look at the glasses. <laughs> Nailed them. Oh, that's so good. That is good. The, na the glasses. Oh, it's so good. That was perfect. That is the really. I have two fake guns. That's a plastic one. It looks good. She was it like, "What? Good. Aren't you going to give me the good gun?" I'm like, "That gun weighs eight pounds. I'm not going to have you. <laughs> you don't want to get hit with it. The, the Here, gun. use a plastic one that weighs like an ounce. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fair enough. We'll right, put the, the sound question. effect in afterwards. Yeah. 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 Obviously, the only other thing was. Um, oh, go you got another one here. These glasses that you're wearing here. You, you don't like those glasses? <laughs> those like your wife's sunglasses or something? No, those are my glasses. What are you talking about? You have about? these like teeny tiny little sunglasses? Yeah. Look, I have... <laughs> <laughs> this is... I All the all different right. characters, I was like, okay, I'll just do different glasses. Those are not... I don't like those sunglasses. <laughs> Look, I'm trying to do a character here. Okay. I don't it's like those glasses. Be, it's got to be memorable. Shirt. You have those fucking pink American Eagle shirts. It's so terrible. <laughs> and you have a button at the top button on top of that. I'm like, oh, it's just the word. That was a choice. It yeah. was literally a choice. Yeah, it was a choice. It was a choice. Look, I was going for David Lynch. This is strange. <laughs> this is totally strange. <laughs> okay. Since okay. when are, look, when are you going to make a social justice detective or something like this? Come That's on, right. you can do it. There's a, there's a YouTube short that I'm in out there really yeah 
No one knows. Bring that it's it me, up. Though. No, no one knows that it's me, though. How is this possible? Bring it up. Nobody knows that it's really me. Oh, that's not yeah. fair. Okay. Why don't you do okay. the face reveal? Can we watch it? Uh, No. I'll send it to you, but I don't want Don't you think someone will track it down once? No, it's, I mean, how? It'd be very difficult to just randomly figure out of the million videos on YouTube. Well, I say that, cut to, cut to me saying this. How would anyone ever find this? Cut to like a week after face reveal, someone's already found it. I bet they will, because they do just randomly. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, that was fun. Back to Super Chats. Okay. Enough of this I'm, tomfoolery. I'm going to send Andrew Clark the link, because he wanted to say something. Sure, that's fine. About the, the um, If you guys want to look it up, it's called Social Justice Detective. It's on my channel. I still, I mean, every once in a while I get comments from people who watch the show and they're like, oh my God, this is great. So. Right. No, social justice is great. So. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, look, kind of nailed, kind of nailed the culture right there at the very beginning. Cause I think, when did I do this? Like 2015, 2016? Yeah. No. Yeah, that was early. Maybe Matthew Newman took a screenshot of you pointing the gun at yourself and said, when the elephant takes control. <laughs> That's perfect. That is true. That is true. Can I spent gave, like, like a solid month doing this, and Sitch was super helpful. Look at that. Special hey thanks. Hey, you, one second. Look at that. Special right. thanks, PSA Sitch. Yes, because look, I, the intro, look, the intro I had done, and Sitch was like, really? You're not going to like... Uh, well, you gave me some very good notes. I don't remember that. I never remember. I gave you notes. I don't remember. I know. What I, was, I was trying I don't to remember, remember any of what they were. I was trying to remember the specific notes too, but I do remember them. I do remember the intro was not a tenth as good as it was until after PSA Sitch gave me the notes, and that's there when I was go. like, that's when I pulled out like the clips of Hitler and all the, and I think did the intro. I think I didn't. I. Hadn't even really written that that uh, cool voiceover intro until you had given me the notes. Okay. I was like, I got to set this up better. Did I tell You're you to right. do the Emma Watson thing? Or was that, did you have that in before? No, I had that in before. Because okay. she's in also in the in the cutaway scene. She's like, she talks to me in the, right, right. In the scene. Right. And I can't, look, uh, I think she's here. Zoe Does Life used Zoe to be a life. YouTuber. And she... Yeah. Did the voice for me and did a Perfect great job voice. too. Yeah, I would have thought it was AI voice like today's standards because they it didn't have so AI. At I the know time, back then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyway. Look, we'll just... What? Look what a badass I look like driving with my gun, my gun <laughs> holster <laughs> thing. Look at this. I got that. What a fucking badass. This song, okay? Of course. Yeah. I'm assuming it's on you. Look at this cool guy. That's Grab just me. Look, hard boiled, Los Angelino, hard day at work, solving uh -huh. the social justice case. Yeah. Just you sent, shot that guy. You just, shot yourself. Just sent that guy off. You killed <laughs> just, yourself. I didn't shoot him. I you Look, did. I shot I just shot to scare him. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, sure, sure. I didn't hit him. I just sent the guy off to get tra um non consensually transitioned for his girlfriend. Now I'm oh going God. home for a hard brew. There you go. Anyway. Hey, welcome, Andrew Clark. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you guys? Good. Good. Look, you have a little uh cat avatar. Look at that. Yeah. Bring that up, Adam. What? Uh -huh. I can Look. do that. Here, let me um uh A team support here. <laughs> there oh we go. wow, look. <laughs> That's funny. So what's so? Oh, wow! Look at that. Look, I gotta bring that up here. Let me figure oh. out how to do it. Yeah. yeah. So, are you a furry too, or is this just? Oh no, no. Um, I just uh wanted. I, I was messing around with like people looking ones, and I'm like, these are all so boring. And not mm -hmm. only that, but it's like I don't want to look at my face. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, let's go with an animal. There now, uh, this one. I do like this one, but um, like to go with my channel, which is like Fox based, 
I am planning on getting a Fox eventually. It's just that uh, that turned out to be a little bit more trouble than I was expecting. Right. Andrew Clark, like, you've been on hey, before, right? Yeah, once before. Um, and you I were, was on November. Right. And you're, look, look I, obviously I apologize if I'm not getting you right. Like, that, uh, But you, I do think I remember you came on and told a story about The Breakfast Club, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah, I do remember. No, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, the movie, The Breakfast Club. Yes. Yeah. yeah That's yeah. why that was why you had him as your avatar, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, I remember. Yes. That. Yeah. Gotcha. But then I, uh, I made a YouTube channel. I <laughs> made that video on organized chaos and um, streaming all my by myself, making videos by myself. Uh, also with uh, Kitty and Grandpa Pay and yeah, I've seen you all on of us Kitty's. over the thinkers. Yeah. 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 You guys did me dirty on the identity politics stuff, but well, look, okay, so, A-Team doesn't, hi, hi. A -team doesn't hey, hold grudges. The truth is the truth, Adam. I don't know what to tell you. you just no, 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 I you, I, no, no, Look, no. I sent you, Sitch, I sent you <laughs> a link on um, your favorite guy, Ryan Chapman, did a video on identity politics I think you should watch and react to, so yeah. you never responded. Oh, I never watched it. Well, he basically is using Fukuyama's definition Listen, the whole way through. I like Ryan, but they don't all have to be winners, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I Somehow I knew that, you know, as soon as you can get me those examples, you're going to send over. Oh, I what forgot. I was supposed to send you examples because I didn't care. Well, I found, I, like like a I found like a dozen examples contradicting right. you. But anyway, let's move on. And Andrew, you yeah. guys did me dirty on identity no, politics. Okay. But so like I said, I forgive you. Okay, no, thank you very much. But okay, it's my <laughs> my position is actually that you are correct. Oh it's yes, just that Adam or Sitch is correct in the messaging, and that was mm -hmm. I think his main contention is that the messaging of the the label has been tainted, and you can't really you know put the toothpaste back in the tube. Well, that I don't want to get go. Like, look. There I don't want to get Perfect. sidetracked on identity politics because I know you came on to talk about other stuff. So, what was the? Oh uh, well, other it, it it blends into it kind of because um, you guys were talking about like sexuality and I and, and like moral foundations and kind oh, of like I, now identity I creation. Yeah, well, and seeing so, this little cat with sunglasses talk about this is very funny. But yes, <laughs> keep going. Well, okay, so um, one thing I wanted to say is that I th really do think that I I didn't come up with it myself. I, I am adopting it from you about the ident um, how conservatives and progressives are kind of identified uh, or like their thought processes mm -hmm. on xenophilic and xenophobic. Right. Um, but I think that there's more going on there. Uh, mm -hmm. And that I think there is a tradition and innovation um, kind of dichotomy and a individual and collective. I may not be getting this exactly correct, but because I think that like I am individual and innovation, um, but like I have a lot of right wing intuitions, but I'm also very progressive in a lot of other ways. So I I don't think that um your definition is like conclusive mm -hmm. if it were right. Well, I agree with the tradition innovation aspect. Um, I don't agree. I I can't see how collectivist versus individualist maps well, neatly onto left or right the way that I think Adam does. No, that's what I mean. Because oh, okay. um, there are. Uh, traditional, like, okay, so, like, there are actually traditional, um, I would say that, what do you call it? Uh, woke people are, like, tradition, but they're, like, their tradition. They're, like, they're trying to, um, they've established it, and they're trying to make it, like, um, heterodoxical. Yeah, but um, I, I don't, I wouldn't use the word tradition, because tradition know, yeah, implies, so it, you know... Like I said, I, I'm I'm not like right. married to these terms. Um, it's right. something say I'm say like developing. dogma or something. Yeah, dogmatic. Right. Sure. Yes, that sounds right. better actually. Um, and so, and I think that also you guys are missing out on 
something a kind of fundamental. Uh, it, it relates to a super chat I sent earlier, mm-hmm. where um, Adam had said that he was like, um, straight people don't really have like a, a sexual identity, and that, um, so. I think that that is somewhat wrong. I think that's a, a very kind of vanilla way of looking at it. Um, mm-hmm. And so like, well, no, like kink, right? Right. Um, I think that you, uh, as a kinkster, um, I... Are you speaking from experience? Yeah, yeah, actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what is it? Um, that what that is kink is a um you are find you find sanctity and degradation like playing around with that moral foundation that Mm -hmm. is like exciting and not necessarily sexually exciting but exciting right that and um often it is what you will be finding sexually exciting though Mm -hmm. like you know but it also in doing so i also realized that there are um, other foundations that this applies to, right? Like playing around with the loyalty betrayal foundation is probably what like cuckolding is, and playing around with authority subversion is like master slave. Uh, care harm can relate to like BDSM, right? Right, right, mm-hmm. and so, <laughs> so the um, yeah, so. There are what, is the thesis, like, what, what is the thesis statement here, I guess? Okay. I'm a loss. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, no. So the um vanilla people mm-hmm. like they want to stay within the bounds. They find it um the ba- the like kind of like the Overton window kind of like mm-hmm. for sexuality is it's like, you know, inside is good, right? And you want to like be cohesive with with that, they are in touch with the reasons why, like um, how they were developed, whereas um, kinksters are like find themselves more progressive, right? And so they they want to play with those. They like feel them, but like playing with them is like how they interact with like uh, their sexuality or their um, mm-hmm. intimacy. Right. So, like, I think there's this dichotomy between, like, vanilla is a, like, sexual identity. It's just that you swim in it. Like, like in how in the 90s, we were all basically liberals. So you don't really see liberalism. But liberalism is really in, like, all of our stories or movies, you know, all of our pop culture. And so we don't really see it. So we yeah. say things aren't political because, one, we're not dealing with, yeah, we're not dealing with the... <laughs> interactions between different people you know managing power which is kind of like what politics as a definition is um i don't think something that you never think about though you could seriously call your identity um okay um well look if you know i mean okay no it's a it's an identity you don't necessarily interact with but it is like kind of like what rags was saying earlier about swimming you know, it's it's not really important when you're not doing it, but yeah. But if you're a you're, swimmer, if you're a professional swimmer, that's going to move up the scale in your identity. Yeah, but what like you're saying if, is if like, you're just exactly, a, yeah, exactly. like a well, occasional and, and so, swimmer, you're you're not like I'm a swimmer. That's my identity. But if you're straight, Adam, and you're just walking around the world, you're not going to think about it. But when you start to try to like hit on a chick, then all of a sudden, right, that comes into play, doesn't it? You're yeah. Identity. And if you lived in a like a, if, like a gay neighborhood, let's just say that like somehow you found out like all of your neighbors are gay, and so then they all like it. That's just normal. And then you're kind of the odd one out. You know, you start to feel that identity more clearly. In a way that um, I think, you know, kinksters very much are aware of their... Well, do, I think you know, kinkster kinkiness. could be an identity because it's something that you think about a lot and you... Well, I don't think the way that the conceptualize is something you think about. Because as you, I believe what you said early in the stream was like, there aren't straight people running around who are like basing their personality necessarily off of being straight, right? That right. Was, yeah. And I think that is true. And I think that is true because it is, quote, the default 
whatever is like the majority or like the normative thing, people aren't necessarily going to base their personality off of because that wouldn't make sense because that's how everyone is or that's how the most like the majority of people are kind of based yeah. off of, right? Sure. And I think that if we had no, and I think that if we had DS if DS relationships were the the norm, right? Then you mm-hmm. would then being not in a DS relationship, being vanilla would be, you know, I don't know what DS. It would be more is. important because to you, you would feel it more. You would make Dominant, it more of your subversive, identity. Sitch. How are you? Oh, oh submissive? submissive, dominant yeah. submissive. Yeah, Adam. <laughs> What I say, is subversive. subversive. Yeah, <laughs> it's all okay. subversive. It's okay. It's okay. That's true. It's true. Yeah, but no. But sometimes it's reinforcing it, right? Because I right. feel like the moral foundation of like a master slave relationship is kind of, especially from the slave's position, is reinforcing that sanctity. That's why I said play with and not just defiling or or subverting, mm-hmm. because sometimes it it is so it it is playing with. The foundation sure sure okay like i agree yeah and so um it's just like, like a like... repressed dom here so yeah no i'm, I, a, I, I'm I... A, definitely a switch <laughs> definitely a switch. oh yeah yeah you switch um but definitely i mean i i don't know i've always i don't know why even a very young age when i was taking psychology classes i always found fetishes just interesting psychologically to try to like well, why why does a person like have this fetish what makes that person feel that way is it psychological is it biological what's going on there and, yeah i mean i don't know if they've ever done like heights done moral foundation uh research on like on like what moral foundations uh people are triggered by that have like specific sexual fetishes or something well, okay, so fetish fetish and kink are very distinct. Um, fetish, I'm kind of using them to mean the same thing. Yeah, and it's so funny because I we we opened up with that in our dis- mean when me and Kitty were talking about it. Um, Is that's Kitta kind of like... a kinker too? <laughs> well, she <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, well, there was some discussion on that, but the answer is no, and 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 finding out the answer is no is kind of how like she found like the bounds and finally found it out like understood what i mean when i say that you know kink isn't um inherently sexual which actually relates actually to something uh, a discussion you had before possible, but okay <laughs> what? No, no, no 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 okay yeah. so okay what's her name what's her name i had her name written down that that asexual girl that you looked up before that was in the oh yeah, all sexy. I, yeah i don't know yeah. her name so yeah. she's like a kingster okay and so she I- interacts with partners in a um kink way to like to obtain intimacy but she's it's an not asexual sexual for her. kingster what yeah. does that even Those mean are, well okay so th- there actually is a and maybe some other time uh, we could watch because it's late now. But um, there's this asexual kingster. Um, she's a pet player, too, uh, called Evie Lupine. She actually has a pretty big um, channel. And she is um, <laughs> she like bigger than you guys anyway. Um, and what about guys who like ASMR? Are they in the kink community? <laughs> <laughs> OK, sometimes yes. Sometimes yes. Um, oh, OK. Sometimes it's a Interesting. Thing, <laughs> right. Sometimes it's a frizzing thing. Which right. is like when it's non-sexual. Sure. No, okay. I, wait. Anyway. Wait. So. Okay. Asexual kink. Because I. Right, because what does okay. That mean? So here. No. Because here's the Give thing with like um like a subspace, right? Um. Like uh, as in submissive. No, no. 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 Oh. Um. Submissive headspace. Right. Okay. And so um in a scene um sometimes a sub will go into. Sometimes it's kind of a trance. Different people describe it differently, but sometimes it's kind of a trance. Sometimes it's more of a runner's high. The point is that they feel kind of euphoric Mm -hmm. in the scene, right? And so they actually get like a high experience from this, a non-sexual high from performing BDSM. I've never experienced this or even heard about this in my entire life. Really? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Well, it's a different world than than you're used. This is to, a so. very different world than I'm used to. But okay. So, so and actually, there's this thing called sub drop afterwards, and aftercare is meant to mitigate that because if you don't, you, you get like these flu-like symptoms. It's like coming down from like a real high. Jesus. 
And so, um, yeah. So when you're mm -hmm. going through subspace, I mean, your neurotransmitters are going like crazy. There's a lot of science behind it. Um, you know, mm. interesting. And so, yeah. And so, like sometimes that is a goal of BDSM. So right. it, they're not looking for necessarily the sex, but they are necessarily from the outside perspective engaging in a form of eroticism, right? So. It can be like from the outside seen that way, but there are actually like contracts um, in relation to this where they will stipulate that they are not to be um, become sexual or to uh, expect a sexual response from their partner. Um, right. Well, so so I feel like okay. So I feel like there's this distinction between eroticism and sexual. I'm assuming like sexual means that there's some kind of like, you know, yeah, like, like I mean, we're not we're not talking about this very because right. there's also something that came up in our talks is that this um clinical definition of what sexuality is, where you're talking about like you know you know sex ed is kind of sexual, right? Well, and sure, like putting guess, on right. and like putting on a condom theoretically is sexual right. or something, but right. But what I would imagine is that even. So someone who's like in the subspace thing, I would imagine that whatever's happening in their brain is still tied into the sexual centers of their brain, even if they're not engaged in a specifically clearly sexual activity. Um, no, I mean, I understand that. And that's that's a very vanilla thing to say. So I, mean, <laughs> I, I, okay. I get it. Um, OK, no worries. No worries. Um, but yeah, um. Like, uh, here's a good example that kind of blew Kitty's mind is um, in kink, you can perform oral sex without it being considered sexual. That sounds stupid, but OK. Well, I know. But I mean, again, this is why it's so different. This is why it's like a different. Sense? No, but yeah, it's a different identity. Um, So it's like it's like it's like, you know, like you like encountering conservatives for the first time or, you know. So I mean, where none of none of these principles or or ideas make any sense. Um, okay, so, explain to me how how can I go down on a chick and it not be sexual? Was that well? It's it like a, it's a it's a it's a authority subversion kind of act, right? You are like <laughs> you are <laughs> okay. Um, and so like you're engaging in this action for somebody else's benefit, and like you are like you know, Zen about it. Right. It's oh, not... you're saying it's not sexual for the for the person doing it, but I'm assuming the person who's receiving it is still sexual action, right? Like, well it could be, but it could also just be the same kind of thing where it's like this person is submitting to me and therefore that is what is the attraction. That is what yeah, but... is exciting. Okay, okay. And it may it may or right. may not be sexual. So okay, so you're, okay, well, okay. Let's say let's use a better. This is example. just ridiculous. This doesn't pass yeah. the smell test. Let me, let me. <laughs> no, I understand what you're trying to say. I understand what you're saying. So it's kind of like, you know, there's these weird videos I don't understand where it's like, oh, there's a woman and she's like, lick my boots, and the guy's like, oh yeah, he's like licking the boot or whatever, or just like a woman who's just like like telling a guy that to like send her money or something right just, like, right, right. Be, like, like, like financial like, domination yeah. right and i'm like who the fuck is like jacking off to this this isn't making sense any sense to me whatsoever and but and so but here's the question i'd ask like i imagine even if there's not something explicitly sexual going on there where the woman's just like get on your hands and knees you know be my puppy you know put my foot on your head or whatever right i'm just Again, so is there actual research to show that whatever is happening in these people and both participants' brains is completely detached from like sex? Because I don't think it is. Yeah, uh, there there is some. There's not mm -hmm. a lot. That part that is sort of part of the problem because I mean you're gathering a lot of data from different people, but it's self-reported data because actually uh, researchers, even really progressive ones, are still stuck in. Um, old mindsets about kink and they like they kind of pathologize it so a lot of the uh, practice uh, particular uh, partic wow I can't say that word right now um, but yeah they don't practitioners there you oh, go okay. um, there you they go. Uh, of psychology don't study this because they kind of feel like it's a pathology right they see it as a problem between that needs to be solved and not a symptom of something going on 
that's misaligned that they need to fix instead of it being right. just like the person's natural identity. Well, I mean, to me, unless you're doing something like that's dangerous to you or damaging to you, it doesn't, you don't need to fix anything about it. Um, but I would still wager. Okay. And here, that it's actually, still like, like there's a norm. It's kind of like being gay and straight. Like you don't need to be fixed sure. if you're straight, if you're gay, but obviously it's something that's, you know, outside of the normative. So, you know, I'm assuming there's something, something changes, you know, whether it's psychological or biological. Um, I hear what you're saying. Um, part of the problem that like conf um, confuses this is mm -hmm. the difference between kink and fetish, because what you've got there is a um, like you know with the foot fetish, I right? Fetishes it, it, were for objects, and kinks were for everything else. No, um, no. so like kinks are more like well, um, it's it's one of those words that has multiple definitions kind of like how you use them because like kinks are also activities right where you may or may not you know care about them whatsoever yeah, like like a fetish is like what like a fetish when they like oh like right talk about like a, a tribal fetish it's like an object that you revere well yes something. but i mean i think that you know and you've kind of uh articulated this before with foot fetish where they think that it might be a um, brain, brain damage yeah. right? A, right a a targeting misalignment right, right. Yeah. And so there are actually a lot of fetishists in the kink community, right? Who mm -hmm. it, 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 they, it is a need and they can't achieve without it. And they have. Um, uh, How do we know it, that right? doesn't apply to kinks too? Well, no, no, no. Be uh, because kids kinks been around a lot uh, or, or well, around so long fetishes. enough. I mean, I assume no, no, no. brain damage for foot fetishes has been around for a long time. <laughs> right. But my, my point is, is that. Yeah. Um, I mean, okay, I'm not, so I'm not married to like, this is definitively the truth, right? This is just my best understanding of it at mm -hmm. this time, sure, right? Sure. I mean, maybe I'll be proven wrong, you know, eventually, but yeah, I, I think that what's going to happen is that eventually people will realize that kink is like the, the kink is a kind of like. It's a mode, right? And so, um, actually, and like, it's really problematic with um, couples that are like one one is kinky, one's vanilla. I actually was watching the, or not watching. I read on Twitter this one account of this um, wife who um, had a kinky husband, and he wanted to do cuckolding, and she had participated in other kinks, and. So she's like, sure, why not? Let's give it a shot. Um, and then yeah. when she did it, it made her it she felt a backlash on that. And she's like, No, I feel dirty. It's horrible. I I, I don't think I could feel the same way about sex ever again. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh my and god, I, I ruined like, our entire marriage. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so a brilliant idea. The therapist. Right. Smart, right. Smart person there <laughs> yeah so the the point is is that um i feel like that happened because she was vanilla that she was engaging in something that like is against her i mean even if she didn't know it was against her kind of like a moral foundation and she and when she she didn't have warning signs going into it because of maybe she is progressive right right so like, i'll so try anything once yeah uh -oh. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. and so right but that doesn't happen with kinky people. So Yeah, but I'm and, assuming that like all kinky people are not up for every kink, right? No. Don't, no. have their own things. Uh-huh. Actually, that is a problem with people who are new to the community is that they um they actually feel like they need to be, right? And they say like, "Oh, I don't have any limits." And then it's like, "Yes, you oh, do." Oh, really? Right. Yeah. yeah. So you don't mind, you know, take um do some blood play. We're gonna, oh you know, my god! <laughs> uh, hook up some, <laughs> hook up some electrodes. Run some electricity through you. Huh? Right, right. No, absolutely no. Well, okay, but I, I guess my thing is, I guess I was just going back to kind of circling back to this was just that. I mean, I don't probably anyone doing any of this stuff, and I don't think it takes away from any of any of it to be like, well, you know, why why is this what people do? 
to understand why why people are doing it or that it takes away from it to say that this is everything that's going on here is probably on some level tied to something sexual because it just intuitively seems to be tied to something sexual yeah and and that intuition makes sense coming from a vanilla person. I mean, I'm not in. I'm How not do you know I'm angel. both vanilla? I could be crazy. You don't know this. Uh, well, uh, you're just a vanilla right. ho- homophilia. But you, you, I you mean, go. you grew up. You grew up vanilla. Homophiliac. You know. Listen, I don't. I feel like I feel like as internet porn becomes more and more popular, like everyone has their uh, weird genres that everyone looks at nowadays. Yeah, but I mean the. Again, that that's kind of like a. You're, um, you're not getting electrodes to your testicles. <laughs> you're not getting blood on. Uh, I mean, it, start with some, you know, impact pay, play, and oh maybe you God. know some rope. Oh Jesus! Okay. Anyway, <laughs> what what was? Is there something specific you wanted to talk about regarding? Um, or was this it? No, this was the oh well. I mean, we we blew past it right into what I hope we would um bleed into, but um, yeah, no, I wanted to talk about um, their uh, what do you call it, the sanctity de- um degradation and uh, how um kinksters are like playing with it, mm-hmm. but um even more than that, um, I feel like there are oh actually no, I we did skip over it a little bit. I was uh, wrote some stuff down, um, not much, but um, there are you know incentives i feel like you have your in finding your political tribe with the moral foundations that you grow um that you're born with once you develop when um as you're raised in your environment and when you individuate you kind of like repel away from it a little bit uh, like and you kind of settle somewhere right but even then you might not be happy because you kind of like are inheriting this stuff and you might not be listening to where you are like or it's covered up what you're kind of born with or have developed i don't know there's this um performance because i realized that uh, especially through you guys that i'm way more progressive than i ever gave myself credit for mm-hmm. and this is just i feel like it's natural because and i can look at different signs connected to this like because i'm a very early adopter of technology like i was like i i had no uh, problems getting um the vaccine i was like um i wasn't rushing you know, that's frantic, what made you kinky getting but, the vaccine uh, changed your dna yeah no i was yeah no um i was kinky before that but yeah you, there's like a stereotype that like oh there's all these stuffy conservatives but they're all really secretly kinky or right, is it just right. like no all the kinky people are just like very progressive <laughs> well i think that that actually is uh, leads into that because I think that there is an incentive structure that um would push conservatives away. But right. I think that um I think that it it's sort of denying that um denying something. It's not always the same thing, right? But it's denying something um that like it creates the unhappiness that kind of builds up and explodes and then you have like a priest that is um cheated on their uh not a priest but like a pastor or something sure. that you know, cheats on their wife and the priest then is cheating on someone then yeah yeah, yeah. should be you know in jail at that point but <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah, yeah maybe you know. maybe right well i mean there's also i guess you could say like like maybe if we were to just say that there's some something that makes people i don't know just hypothetically makes people in get off on bdsm or something if you're like very conservative you because of your conservative cultural upbringing and environment mm-hmm. you would might be feeling psychologically like you should repress this uh desire right. as opposed to yeah. you never join a kink club and blah, blah 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 and so therefore people in those environments in those places would seem to be all super progressive but you wouldn't necessarily know if there's a bunch of conservatives out there that are just kind of under the radar kind of like didn't like denying themselves this experience so yeah 100 percent. um yeah and so they just um when you have these people who are like they they don't know who they are right because i mean right. i didn't really know who i was for a long time and once i found it i mean so many like neurotic habits just went away really? i stopped biting my nails i wasn't as nervous anymore 
uh, I was just like clouds lifted from my from my brain just to, just by realizing who I was and, and accepting that. Who 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 are you? What is that? What do you mean by that? What did you discover? Oh, that was kinky. Oh, okay. So that's interesting. So, like, what was making you anxious before? I think just not know or like repressing that because I was like that was back when I thought I was like very staunchly uh, conservative, mm -hmm. um, and it's actually that was my um, beginning point for realizing how progressive I am. Because I mean, another thing that uh, realizing how progressive I am is like my look at liberalism and how I want to deconstruct Locke and then reconstruct it into something that we can use today to talk to people about without relying on uh, the God argument. Right. And when I when I did that, I was um, I was on stream and a lot of conservatives were not happy with me. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. Yeah, that's funny. OK, so, so do you think the thing that was making you anxious and nervous was sort of the like some part of you knew that there was some part of you that was being like repressed or denied and then like you biting your nails and other things were all like the expressions of this you know that's how i your that's subconscious how I, repression or something yeah that's how i i would okay. phrase it okay. yeah right. that's how i conceptualize it anyway interesting interesting okay cool and yeah. and it was just it wasn't a what do you call it like a um it wasn't like an erotic awakening. It was a like an awakening of like relief and and calm and mm -hmm. peace. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's unfortunate because I, I do think there's a lot of legitimacy and validity to people like understanding deep parts of themselves, and it can bring uh, peace and understanding. Unfortunately, I've never had that experience, but yeah. I'm glad you have. But it's unfortunate because I feel like so much of like the wokeness is this search of like of like marriage between just self discovery and self. Like once you discover yourself, then you're like this perfect being. And I think it's kind yeah. of unfortunately tarnished the reputation of self discovery in some respects yeah. because of that. They kind of yeah. like stolen this idea, which you know, fuck them. They don't deserve to steal it. They don't deserve to own oh. it themselves. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh, um, something that um popped into my head is that uh, an idea I was thinking about in relation to the trans kind of uh, argument or discussion yeah. is um in BDSM and kink communities we have this concept of that you're not supposed to drag other people into your kink, right? So, like, sure. if you're sure. age, if you're age playing, right, and you're like five you're not supposed to be like having other people like even in your community right like at a munch um are you saying like, wait you're saying someone's pretending to be five or someone's actually yeah five? yeah like you, well they i just like, wait i said two different things you can't say yes um uh what, i said i said uh, is someone pretending to be five or someone actually is five it'll be very clear what we're talking about here Yeah. Um. So yeah. No, they age play. They pretend to be five, not okay. five year olds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's be very clear. No one is actually underage in the scenario. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, and age play is very often uh another good example of non sexual play because there's a lot of taboo related to that. Um, that's in person. fact. I, <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So anyways, the point is that um if you're you know, like age playing, then you're going to be like you can't just be at a munch and like ask somebody like, you know, for your sippy cup or something or to get you a snack or something. Oh, okay. I see where you're like right. You can't drag people in, right? And if you're like same thing, if you're like uh, a pup um like the guy in the street that was like a dog. Right, and yeah. It's like pet me, and you're like, "What? Well, get the fuck away yeah, from my child!" Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, right, gotcha. yeah, yeah. The the okay. pet players, yeah, exactly. Um, you can't. I mean, you shouldn't be wearing hood in public anyway. Um, but 
Well, you know, it's yeah. weird because like because when you when you first talk about like the age play thing being sexual, I was like, what? But now, like, I, I kind of understand what you're saying like there's some weird thing where like, well, I'm saying weird because I'm vanilla, but mm -hmm. some weird thing of like someone's like, listen, you know, I want you to treat me like a baby, yeah. and like I want you to, you know, give me a sippy cup. Like, I mean, I guess that's not. I don't know what's going on there, but I guess right. it's not necessarily sexual. If it's not, if yeah. nothing sexual is happening, they just literally yeah. want to be treated as a child. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's that's unusual and they just you know like like do coloring books i mean but i don't think that should be like, called kink because like, it's not i mean to me i think kink has to mm. be sexual just definitionally okay yeah um anyways you know um it, but... but uh uh so the point is is that you're not it's a taboo to drag people in right sure and so but yet that seems to be what trans people really want to do by demanding that you use their pronouns. Mm. Ooh, now that is a spicy take, because you're saying that they're just them being trans is part of a kink. Well, I mean, sort of. I, I'm not saying this is perfect, but it is something that occurred to me. I was like, there's something off about this, because I mean, we, we very much don't do this, and we have, we consider it like a violation of consent. You can't you're, you're taking away somebody's consent when you're telling them how to treat you. Right. Okay. Um, hmm. I guess, yeah, because, like, okay, the question would be, like, so, like, we'll use the age one as an example, because I think that's very clear. Like, someone wants to identify as, like, a five-year-old or something should you be forced to identify a grown-ass adult as a five-year-old child? Yeah. And how does that relate to the trans question at all? Does it relate? Is it is that a comparable analogy, or is it just so different that it shouldn't be compared? Yeah. That's that's where I'm stuck at. I'm, yeah. I'm That's where I'm stuck at, too. I'm like, is this apt, or is this just like a trick right. of the uh, circumstance? Well, I guess, so the argument... I think the first argument would put forward would be like, well, un until there's a bunch of people, like there's not a bunch of people running around to my knowledge who are like, listen, if you don't treat me like I'm five, I'm going to kill myself. And then they not do right. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's yeah. kind of like the whole, the difference supposedly with gender dysphoria is that their people are actually committing suicide. And so that would be like the justification for, you know, engaging in the, the identity, right. Or for society to engage in the identity. Mm hmm but be, but I mean, I think that'd be like the key difference that I could say. Yeah. Until we know what exactly causes people to, to be trans, what causes people to have whatever kink or fetish or whatever word we're going to mm -hmm. use to describe it. Well, so. right. And so we never quite got there, but I think that with kink, it's like this biological need, right? And I think mm -hmm. that uh, kink is more like a moral foundation thing. It's like they're two different, um, they come from two very different places. Um, so I feel like referring to them as kind of the same thing is just not the cousins maybe, but they're not the, the same. Okay. So you're saying you think, you think that people that have these kinks, it's triggering something specific, like a, a specific moral foundation yeah, causing the kink to, to manifest, to, to manifest or to, yeah, right. But transness has nothing to do with a moral foundation. Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah, I don't. I think you could make the argument that it is a you're you're playing with uh, um, the purity. Yeah, maybe, there, maybe. Right? You're um, changing like the form, mm -hmm. like the pure form of male or female to be the opposite. It could be. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily true. I'm yeah. just saying someone can make that. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's nothing I would want to like hang my head own. On. Yeah, a right. take I would want to own, but I'd I'd be uh, interested in researching it. Okay. Um. Yeah, but uh, no. And then there's also, I just um since I'm here, just get this last take out mm -hmm. um about um is that I really find like that. We're conflating in the arguments of trans the um, gender and sex differences. Mm -hmm. um, so, like a lot of the solutions and um, 
arguments for are related to like sex changes and sex um like uh, sex dysphoria mm -hmm. right because i mean if we're just performing then we wouldn't have to worry necessarily about a lot of like the um the the biologicalness of it i mean there are i i sort of get it a little bit but you could just perform um but with like so it definitely is and i'm not saying that that isn't that is wrong but i feel like there's way more of a um sex dysphoria going on than there is a gender, a gender. dysphoria yeah 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 well i mean i think is um because uh, if it was a yeah. The other if day was, with, with right. Brianna talking about how like it was literally they just changed the term from transsexual transgender to kind of because people don't like to use the word transsexual anymore. So, yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, what do you call it? Like you would think that this would be a big sticking point for mm -hmm. for trans people is their genitals for them specifically, not for other people, but for them sure. specifically. But right. it doesn't seem to be. I mean, bottom surgery is like the least done thing. And yet there are people who are very happy being trans without doing that. And so it yes. makes me wonder why is mm -hmm. that? I, I don't have any answers. These are just questions that right. go through my mind. Well, I, I would say the bottom surgery one, I would be cautious on because I, I would probably wager that most of that is just because bottom surgery outcomes are so sketchy. Like if they had a perfect bottom surgery, sure, no, that had a high totally... efficacy result. I think you would see like ninety five percent of people do the bottom surgery or something. Possibly, but what I'm talking about is you'd think that they would say that um, because they're so scared of it that the bottom surgery is like or their bottomness, you know, um, what their genitals are a big ongoing concern that is the source of their gender dysphoria, but it doesn't ever seem to be a source of gender dysphoria for so many, many trans people that I hear um, from. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like, um, do you remember, I used to, I, I forget who I asked. I said, you know, if there was a pill that would cure your gender uh, dysphoria, would you take it? J, J X E. Yeah, I and I and I yeah. realize this is a very unfair question to ask someone. It is. Uh, who has uh, That specifically. Yeah. But I, I feel like mean... this kind of relates to what you're talking about because it's like if the surgeries are very sketchy and people don't necessarily want to do them for that reason, then they might convince themselves or tell you or report in a poll that, oh, yeah, I'm totally happy, you know, having a penis or a vagina when they're not actually. So. So, yeah. That's, uh, that's all. Well, I mean... Uh, there are there are um of there are videos I would like to run past you eventually, but mm -hmm. um but okay. wait for a different episode that's not like one hour before you gotta go. Sure. Sure. Um, or just link them to me and I'll check them out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, just I think that like well, I mean maybe it's selfish of me, but I think like the uh -oh. um your um you guys and your um audience would get a lot out of it just by going over the videos in the way that you usually do. Sure. Um, I could even possibly out. hook yeah. you up with uh -huh. a kink researcher, maybe. Oh man. Um, maybe that could be interesting. Because um the one girl that I was talking about, Evie Lupine, um, right. she actually lives in Portland. Mm -hmm. So and I might be able to contact her. Hmm. Okay. Cool. Maybe. Well, we'll see. Thanks for coming on, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, take care, take man. Care. Bye. <laughs> Look at this. We had a dog and a cat on stream. What, what are the that? odds? What are the odds? There you go, guys. You, you had your two dogs cartoon and... characters talking about degeneracy for the evening. <laughs> dogs and cats are both. I'm both what? I mean, pretty popular pets. That's true. That's true. When you say, what are the chances? I think very likely. That, well, I mean, how many streams have we had both a dog and a cat on stream?
Adam. And we have a cat on every okay, single I, stream. Okay. So. A cat that talks to us. And I'm not talking about you holding, <laughs> ragamuffin? holding a ragamuffin up to the mic, going, <laughs> like shaking him like he's a little like. People oh. really enjoy that. They do. They do. So that's see, that makes I enjoy that. But see, now that you now that I know about your cat feeding habit, it kind of makes me wonder. About yeah, that. that's he's why like, oh. she's so vocal. She's like, "No, not the food no. again. No. Not, not the force feeding." Oh, and we found out, we figured out what breed Wormy is. Yeah. A ragdoll cat. Wormy is a ragdoll cat, yeah. Sitch somehow magically found the breed of cat that Wormy is. And there's a Wikipedia page that describes Wormy in every detail. Which, wow. Now I actually know what kind of cat to look for to replace Wormy. So. <laughs> Yeah, they said that the the ragdoll cats have a um, a lot of people will describe them as having dog like behavior. Yes, falling around like a dog. All, All right. the things Wormy does that I love. There you the go. The thing is, I always thought, look, I don't but the, having a long haired cat is a pain in the bee. Oh yeah, they talked about like the grooming and shedding is like yeah, awful. yeah. But right. the personality is so worth it. I yeah. wish I could have that personality in a short hair cap. Right. Yeah. Maybe you could look it up. Just try to find it. Maybe. Or maybe you got to get someone who breeds um, a rag doll with some kind of short hair cat. That's the thing. Is the behavior is somehow in the shape of the brain, right? Yeah. So you might lose it by something. You have to find very docile short haired cats and kind of try to breed them together until you get the right thing. Behavior is a kind of shape. No, part of the problem. It is because those the that f the f the long haired fuzziness of the ragdoll cats does make them extra adorable. Oh yeah, totally. And I mean, he's so soft. Yeah, he's so soft. Yeah. Yes. Can you just shave your cat? <laughs> I do. I shave him during the summertime, but I don't want to shave him in the wintertime. Okay. He'll freeze. Okay. Um. Super chats. What are we gonna do? Twenty dollars and up, and do the rest on Tuesday. Or, we can do I mean, that, yeah, because I feel like you're fading. It's no, I'm I'm fine. I mean, we got an. We'll hour. do twenty dollars up in the members, and we'll say the rest for Tuesday. Okay. Moondoggy for twenty dollars says it's funny because as time went on, Blair White became more individually minded while still being center right. She knew the picture was gonna. Oh, I read that one. She's gonna piss everyone else off, especially the right that don't like trans people in general. True. Did Andrew convince you? Are you gonna try the cuck thing? No. <laughs> With your next girlfriend, or are you going to be like, look, <laughs> look, I'm feeling adventurous now. No, no. And also, I mean, that story was someone trying it and it going up horribly. So no. On our first date, look, I want you to have sex with my friend. Listen, that, I, I don't know what, I don't know what moral foundation mm -hmm. uh, is being triggered by the cuck thing, but I will never in my entire life ever participate Too in risky. anything like I mean, that. Yeah. No, I'm not, I wouldn't. If, if I listen. I could be with like the perfect woman. And mm -hmm. she'd be like, I want to try this thing. I'm like, well, I guess it was fun while it lasted. You're not perfect. <laughs> right. You're no longer perfect. Well, actually, I don't know. I, if 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 she was like, listen, I want to watch you fuck another woman. I'd be like, what? And she's like, yeah, I want you to like pretend like you're cheating on me. And you're cracking me. I'm like, I, I don't want to do that. And she's like, no, you should do it. It'll get me off. I'm like, uh, are you sure? <laughs> like, no, look, the whole time you're <laughs> thinking, this is a test, right? Yeah, I'm like, yeah, you're fucking me, right? I'm like, I don't want to do that. But it, like, it, like if if they really like were like, no, seriously, I'd be like, all right, I'll right, if they're dead, like, I don't no, think don't I would do be... it. Don't fall for it. It's listen, a test. You're failing. Listen, listen. No, no, my only point was, I don't, I wouldn't be psychologically bothered by that. I'd only bother me if I was the one being cocked. So if some girl was like the perfect woman and she's like, I get off on people cocking me, I'd be like, all right, I guess. Uh, okay. Not my thing, but that's, you know, that helps you. What if she sobs uncontrollably in the corner while you're doing it? Oh, that'd be rough. <laughs> but then afterwards, she's like, no, that was amazing. I'd be like, what the fuck's <laughs> happening here? My brain can't Look, handle it. Exactly. Yeah, no, like, it's like yeah, that's psychological true. torture. You're right. Now that, I don't think I could, <laughs> if I like love this person, I don't think I could deal with that. Because I'd be like, what just the fuck? Just sobbing, just bawling, like you just killed her mom or something. Like, how am I, listen, I can't perform when the girl's sobbing in the corner <laughs> like that. I don't know why you guys. 
<laughs> I don't think I could perform in that in those circumstances. Oh my god, mm -hmm. that's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, I assume you would, you would be like, I'm not that. Oh, hell no. Look, yeah, right. this is just. Yeah, this mm -hmm. is too weird for me. Yeah, I'd be like. <laughs> Look, and I'm a particularly weird person, too. So. Sure, sure. Yeah, if they're like, listen, I'm going to hide in the closet and touch myself. I'm like, all right, I guess. Sobbing in the uncontrollably <laughs> in the corner is like, what is happening here? I'm like, listen, we need to take you to a psychologist. This is not healthy. Obviously, you're like having a mental breakdown. No, it's great. I love yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay. I don't yeah, know about that. Might be, might be time to move on. Might be time right. to try to find yourself a normal, happy, healthy relationship. Well, the, the hypothetical was someone who's like perfect, right? And then they had this one hang up. So. That makes them, that means they're not perfect. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Andrew Clark Petrero says, that's why you need a safe word. Yeah, but I, the, the, I'm assuming the hypothetical is like, they're actually, that's what they want. They want to be sobbing in the corner. Right. That's not the safe, that, you know, they're not going to be upset by that, but. So. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it would be a weird situation. It'd be a very weird situation to deal with. Huh. Um. Let's see. Loki's wager for six months says these Twitter leftoids will say queerness is an inherent contradiction. A woo woo go confuse the straights, then melt down over gay right wingers. LOL. <laughs> That's a great point. That's true. That's true. And funny. Uh, Simon O'Leary for seven months says, speaking of gay conservatives, Douglas Murray was on the boys cast was a fun show. These gay lefties can't hold a candle to him. Rags is right. And S class is the best class. Yeah, Douglas Murray's awesome. He is, yeah. Um, let's see. Are we going down or up? I'm going up. Okay. I'm going backwards. Gotcha. Uh, I'm following along so I can keep keep up. Twitter months. sucks for twenty dollars. Thanks so much. Oh, okay. It says re the male point of view is sexually pressing me as a woman, but also I'm a sex positive slut. Who uses sex to get what she wants from men, but don't ask my body count. That's slut shaming. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely um a lot of the quote sex positivity now definitely manifests itself in terms of like I want I basically want to do whatever I want. I basically want to do whatever I want, and no one can ever criticize it, criticize me for it, or make me feel bad about anything ever. And it's like that's not how reality works. Yeah. Look, there's going to be a lot of shaming involved. Yeah, right. If you're doing things I don't just, things that I just don't like, things that just annoy me, I'm going to shame <laughs> you for. <laughs> sure, sure. And, and I mean, I think part of the problem, I think, for women is basically like feminist has basic feminism. I think, okay, I think women Fem are, feminists women, have been are lying too. women are horny. I'm not going to pretend like women aren't horny. Women are definitely right. horny. But right. feminists kind of added, like, created this idea that's kind of, it's funny, they're basically perpetuating, like, the male fantasy, which is, like, women should be as horny as men. And it's, like, I just don't think that's actually true. No, I factually incorrect. True. Yeah. Yeah. I think women are, I think just evolutionary, women are choosier, and they'd have to be. So. Now, maybe they're hornier once they have a partner, but I guess maybe that's the difference. Women are just, can be just as horny as men, but like they have like a partner as opposed to like, I'm just going to be like, fuck a bunch of different dudes. I don't think that's the average behavior that a woman wants or desires. Yeah. I think some women do have that. But some it's just, do, it's not, but the... I don't think that's the average. Yeah. Right? I've known, I've definitely known women like that, but I think they're yeah, it's great. unusual. <laughs> well, whether it's great or not depends on, on where you are. So. You're like, oh, that was great for my one night stand with this lady, you know. Goodbye. <laughs> like, never see you again. Oh my. You know. And then you feel horrible. You're like, uh, wow, right. I just totally use that person. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> right. Or you could be like, oh, I like you. And then they're like, oh, I'm not looking for a relationship. You're like, oh, okay, bye. <laughs> like, so. Look, it's Armageddon. <laughs> Jesus, Adam. What? What? Oh, you're. Oh. Where are you? Where are you? I'm I, at J Mac for twenty dollars. 
Right above that. Oh my god, for two dollars says little Tay dropped the new music video. That's it, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> That's like the best screen name. It's a good one. It's so much fun to say. Yep. Oh my god. <laughs> Stuck for two dollars says the penis mightier than the sword. There you go. Mm -hmm. True. Uh, J Mac for, for twenty dollars. Our surrogate father says, "How is Blair's post not making things difficult? You have a ton of men having a break, mental breakdown over whether or not they find her hot." Yeah, I mean, I agree. I agree. Shouldn't they be in favor of that? Yeah, that's what I think. Right. Sounds like they're questioning their own conservative bona fides. Right. Uh, Kachango for twenty dollars says, "Watching your UBI video and you mentioned audience makeup." Interesting that when leftists realize they have right-wing views, other leftists don't ask why they watch their content, but ask them why they aren't left enough. <laughs> That's true. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Spencer Harmon for 17 months says, we're going to make it to 24 months soon. Well, thank you, Spencer. True. Sweet. Uh, Neil well Johnson for two months says, part of why they labeled it don't say gay is because gay and say rhyme. That is true. And rhyming is always catchy in the mind. Uh, right. Spencer Harmon, thanks so much for the 10 gifted memberships. Thank you. How do, is there a word that's like say, but rhymes with trans? The trans bans? Bans the Don't trans? bans trans? The DeSantis <laughs> bans the trans? The classroom bans the trans? Yeah, there's something there. You would work out something. Uh, Mark Twain's Revenge. Thank you so much, Mark Twain's Revenge, for the eight months of being Order of the Enlightened. Says Adam, Ernst Rome was a gay fascist. He was leader of the SA until he was purged by Hitler on the Night of the Long Knives. I remember that guy. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Jonathan Rosler for 13 months says, I think the drag show story hour only started to be defended by the left because the right rightfully started attacking it. Total tribal brain. Yeah, I, I think. I think so. I think so as well. Uh, Blue five six six for ten months for discipline equals freedom. Thanks so much. Says hi rags. Yeah, thanks for being a member. Hello. Uh, do do do. Solo says hi for two dollars. Says hi rags. Might as well just look. That's Solo for two dollars. Says hi rags. Thank you, Solo. Um. Twitter Cameraman sucks. 502 oh. for twenty dollars says the problem with having government building housing is they can't build efficiently. California has a number of these programs that have all end up spending insane amounts per person, like the forty four thousand per person tent city. Hmm. Nolan Games yeah. for twenty dollars. Thank you, Nolan. This is your first ever super chat. Thank you. Says A team with a bunch of exclamation marks. Great. Says, okay, so you copy your brain patterns, but what does that even mean? Is that you? How much of you is your gut biome? In my mind, it's closer to a portrait painting. It's a copy of an aspect of you, but not you. Yeah, see, that'd be interesting because, like, you know, we do it's it, this is kind of the fascinating part of intuition. So like for years, for decades, for thousands of years, however long this idea of like, like why do they say it's your gut intuition, right? They say, oh, you're thinking with your gut. It's your gut intuition. And yet science now maybe finds out that there's actually truth that your gut kind of in a weird way can operate as a second brain in terms of interacting with making you think and feel different things in a way that we didn't really think about before. Like they've actually found that there's neurotransmitters and things in your guts that affect your neurotransmitters. And so it's like, well, when people would say you're using your gut intuition, they intuited that your gut had something to do with it. <laughs> and they turned out to be right, maybe. Isn't that weird? Yeah. I mean, I should reread Curse while I haven't read him in so long. But he has a scenario where he sets up that I think you go back and forth. So they they basically reconstruct your mind in mm -hmm. some sort of robot or something. Mm -hmm. And you can move your consciousness from your body to the robot back well, and forth. Well, that's completely different, yeah. Now that, I think people would be on board with. Because then they would feel like they're still them. 
Right, but there's this process where you're going back and forth to kind of make you decide if you want to stay in the robot or not. Right, right, right. You right. Have a choice. He right. sets up a, f a few different thought experiments, and some of them you're like, okay. Like, I, 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 I would do that one. That one is a bit of a stretch. <laughs> like, no one wants to be in the prestige, okay? That's, that's what we all yeah. want to avoid. We all want to avoid the prestige situation. Exactly. Yes. Right. But I think there is a prestige situation in oh, there, there and you're going like, yeah, yeah, there 100% is. Yeah. The the yeah. the situation you laid out with youth with this lethal Jackson is the prestige. Well, that's situation. why I said that. Well, also there's yeah. one that's a destruct uh destructive brain scan which you're like, "Okay." Yeah, that is also a prestige situation. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. And yeah. I I would never take a chance on that. Well, so. if a bunch of other people did it beforehand, why not? Yeah, but there's no way to know if it's like if it's a copy or if it's really them. There'd be literally no way to make that determination. You get in there and it's like terrible graphics, and you're just no, like, no, no. Oh I mean, God. like they're just dying, and something is copying and replicating their behavior into the robot, and you'd have no way of making that determination. Yeah, I don't. I just for me, it's just maybe it's because I have read so much of the transhumanist stuff. It's just impossible for me to imagine that we're not going to have, that we're not going to create a thinking, feeling being that's equivalent to a human being but just artificial well here what would be it'd be weird talking about the gut biome thing like if they could say copy you your brain in a non-destructive uh capacity and so there's like an atom like robot walking around but it actually behaves very different than you even though it has a complete copy of your brain and then you find out how much of you isn't just in your brain and that'd be kind of interesting yeah i mean if that's a thing if yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree that a lot of times we feel we're localized in the brain and it's really just a small part of the equation. Like the body is. Right. Well, it's part a big part, it. but it yeah. could just, again, always just be a part. So, yeah. How much of it, though? Right. And it's like weird things. Like the brain is actually two brains that work independently of one another. They've sure. done those experiments where they sever and all of a sudden, like, you get all kind of weird, weird effects. Shit. Yeah. yeah. Right. I don't, yeah, I just, I can't imagine that that's not in our future. It seems like every single thing that we've done in science fiction ends up coming true. I mean, maybe um, time travel is the one that I think may never actually happen but it seems like everything else i feel like it's, definitely i, I feel like well, it was weird because if you act talk to some theoretical physicist they'd be like well time travel should be theoretically possible <laughs> so i know yeah i think it's like, mathematically possible it's just a question of how to actually physically do it yeah right and how would it even work um because it could be one of those things where it works but not the way anyone expects so it doesn't cause any of these like a million paradigms or paradoxes i should say but anyway um yeah i mean i it's i again i think it's definitely i think we'll definitely do it at some point i just think it's much i think that's much further down the road than us just having like robots and shit walking around yeah robots like, working for us robot yeah. slaves robot slaves yeah we should call them slaves sure look i think we'll call them raves i think um Elon is ballsy enough to do it. I think Elon is ballsy enough to market and sell the first Tesla slave. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Well, the, the, I saw a Tesla robot's white, so that's fine. No, he, Elon's going to paint him black, obviously. Oh, that, that, okay. <laughs> if you paint it black, you got a big problem. Okay. If, you're, if your Tesla slave is black, you know, oh, if it's white, then you're okay. Then you're, you're good. What if you get to choose? There's like different colors. Yeah. Oh, that'd actually be funny. The Tesla slave, it's literally every color but black and brown. It's like white, <laughs> Cause it, red, cause that's blue, too, purple, pink. Because that's too hot button. It's like literally every fucking color. What if it was, no, what if it was like black? Like like the color black. Like no one's skin is this color black. But it, they didn't have brown. That was like the one color that they didn't have. They didn't have brown or they didn't have like like skin peach pink color. Really? That'd be interesting. They had every other color though. Get mine chrome.
There you go. Ew, I don't want a chrome robot. Oh, so badass. Oh, Jesus. Like, fucking, like, look at him, like, ah! It's too bright in this room. You're, like, reflecting in my eye. Did you see the robot sorting the blocks? I did. That was pretty cool, yeah. 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 They had this robot that supposedly using machine learning learned visually, I believe, entirely visually, without, like, programming to sort blocks by color. This is Elon's dream. Elon is going to have a fully automated factory that literally has one guy working there mm -hmm. that just turns the switch on and off. Right. Because that that robot, the sorting robot, I think keep thinking that's a factory worker right there. Look at that. Sure. And he it's impressive. He looks at the line and... It's, it's impressive how quickly, once machine learning took off, it's impressive how quickly we're kind of moving the pace. Yeah. Forward. So, because it, yeah. it felt like we were like robots were like a dream that would never come, and now all of a sudden it's like boom! Like all of a sudden it's just here. And you're like, holy shit! The learning process for human beings is so slow because we're learning kind of everything at once. But as soon as you have a robot, you can teach it super quick. You like here, do this for the next two weeks <laughs> until you're perfect at it. Well, the, that's the key. The key is if you can literally train a machine learning algorithm visually, that's the key to, make, to getting the robot to be able to do whatever you want, essentially. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very interesting. Uh, Akilian Narya Sawami for $20. Thanks so much. Says the most interesting thing from the live panel was Destiny saying, quote, don't call Jesse single transphobic and address the arguments, and then Emma immediately calling Jesse Single transphobic. <laughs> really? Wow. As class is the best class. That's funny. Ouch. Yeah. Bob Van Gogh for $5 says, all the right-wing stereotypes Destiny denied came out during his Vosh Emma panel. He was cringing so hard, it was so gratifying. There you go. Hopefully there'll be a non-ass audio version I can listen to. So That's funny if that's the case. Cool. Zero Fox says you can train them visually like convolutional neural networks. They've been doing it for years now. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, it's just Abby for two months says what's weird about the quote, how often do you think about Rome thing? Is the inability to, uh, to then understand why someone would find Rome interesting? Um. Yeah, I know, you know it's interesting. You know it's funny. I didn't. I should actually. I want to test this out on my parents. I just had. I have a very interesting idea. I feel like if I went to my mom and I told her, I don't. I think I've literally done this. So I, I'm saying I'm feeling like this. If I told my mom some interesting factoid about Rome, you know, like the aqueducts or something, she'd be like, "Oh, that's really interesting," and like genuinely be interested in it. If I told my dad, he wouldn't give a fuck. <laughs> That's he'd just crazy. be like, I don't, he's like, he's like, oh yeah, that's great. <laughs> like, I feel like he wouldn't care at all. My dad is not interested in anything I'm interested in. It's so mm -hmm. like, I don't know. Well, it's funny. My, so my dad is very interested in politics and movies and sports, but I don't care about sports at all. Um, my mom is very interested in psychology animal behavior and animals in general and store like she like likes movies and stories too so i think those would be like the three interest ranges i would classify each of my parents and i feel like i've kind of absorbed all of their interests with the exception of sports right cool um and also, I guess my mom just likes because she, she, she would find Rome stuff interesting. So she'd probably like anthropology. I feel like my dad would not give a fuck at all about Rome or anything about Rome at all. I look. I don't know where the memes are coming from. I saw one clip where some woman asked this guy if he thinks about Rome, and he's like all the time. And then he starts talking about Rome. Yeah. And his explanation of Rome completely seems like it was written by some right winger on a facebook post like it, it doesn't probably seem, was none yeah. of these videos are real like whatever <laughs> <laughs> it does it yeah. didn't seem like he had written he had read like the rise and fall of the roman empire or anything like that right right 
So I just, it's the one thing that I saw and I was thinking, okay, well, this is just a meme. This is not really, people are interested in Rome and digging in. Like R Rudyard, I could actually believe has read like the rise and fall yeah. of the Roman but he Empire. He has a, a massive interest in just history in general. Right, um, exactly, exactly. But this idea that just every common guy is like obsessed with the Roman Empire. No, no I, yeah. I think what's going on is, um, number one, I think, as you said, is a meme. Number one. Uh, number two, I think it's that in America, if you were to like ask the average American, like, I want you to picture in your mind an ancient society. I think they're all, I think we'd all inst instinctively go to Rome because that's kind of right. like the big ancient society that exists in the American mind. You know, if you said medieval society, we're thinking like medieval, you know, Brits. But if you say ancient society, people are going to think of the Romans. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Roman culture. What about 300? Kind of, Leonidas. Right. Roman that's great. philosophy, polit politics, and culture is kind of the most relevant thing, or at least we believe is the most relevant thing still to our culture and philosophy. You know, people like, I've always loved uh, Greek and Roman mythology and all that stuff. I've always found it intensely fascinating. I don't know why. I just really like the stories and all that stuff. All those stories are popular. And so when you have like people who are kind of like, who have a, a moral intuition that to wonder if things were better in an ancient time. Cause I think that is a moral intuition. Just be like, Oh, I'm sure things were like more interesting or better in like an ancient time. I wish I was, I wish I was in an ancient time somewhere. Right. So they, they have that intuition. And then you have the most popular ancient time for Americans to think about is Rome. And so therefore you have a bunch of people thinking about Rome a lot. Yeah. And I think that's the explanation. Uh, contrast for 18 months. Thank you, Contrast. Says, everyone crying about AI sex robots will be the end of us. Porn addiction is a serious issue now. It will be worse because of this. Not even joking. What do you... Of course it will. Everyone crying about AI when sex... Oh, when sex bots will be the end of us. Yeah, that's going to be real weird. The sex bots is definitely going to be a massive, massive thing that people are not going to be ready for. And it's going to create some weird fucking societal shifts that we're just going to have to figure out how to deal with. Which I don't know the answer to. Guess when the prestige takes place. What time? Uh, well, Tesla's in it, right? So it's like, what, the 20s? 1890s or is it later London. Oh, 18. Oh, wow. This is even earlier. When, not too well, much earlier. I mean, yeah. So it was like 30 years earlier. Yeah. Good show. I forgot Tesla was in it. Yeah. Um, let's see. What's up? I'm just looking where we are. Christian Baller for 18 months. Thank you. Christian Baller has been, has been outside the simulation for 18 months. Thank you so wow. much. Wow. Thank you. That's great. Says big thanks to our dads for providing me with so much content over the course of the past several years. Pretty sure I've heard more of your voice in terms of straight hours more than pretty much anyone at this point. <laughs> that is kind of crazy to think about. It is. Yeah. It is, yeah. Um, Adam, how close is the comic? Pretty close. I'm on my last pass now. So I'm doing, I'm like finishing pages and moving on. So nice. Yeah. I mean, I would like to have it done this month, to be honest with you, and get it to the printer next month. So Wow. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Making all the other content is taking time. Me down sure. a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Uh Brick Nose for three months. Thanks so much. Brick Brick Nose has been discipline equals freedom for three months. Says now that Team Truth is entertaining woo woo BS. <laughs> How long until you guys bring Duncan Trussell on as a guest? He has some interesting views about secret gnomes all around us. I'm sure the CIA knows. I don't, I don't Duncan Trussell. I don't know anything about this. Duncan Trussell believes in gnomes. What what's up with the gnomes? I don't know. I don't know. Which what thumbnail should I use on the video? Because we have like two thumbnails, one video situation here. Um, probably the contra points. Okay. Thumbnail, right? Sure. 
I guess we need our some body once told me oh did uh ct send some r.i.p some what? timestamps uh i guess i should at least on a group chat no there should be one at least one timestamp past the what if all hissed interview right Funny. Look, I like the fact that we do everything constantly different. It keeps people guessing. <laughs> sure, sure. I kept thinking maybe we should do two streams, but like you no. get a, a big audience, you don't want to just like you don't want to split cut it, it off. Yeah, yeah. No, it's one stream's fine. Whatever. People know where to find it. People do like the timestamps, though, so they can go yeah, to whatever well, they want. It, it will, we'll lose, we'll put in the timestamp when. Um, to separate the two different things so we can do that that's not a big deal um oop paul sansui for nine months says this guy calling himself a historian is laughable the left is made to benefit the managerial class lol what i i mean i what's the problem with that concept the, i don't know i agree with that well, I'd say, actually, I'd say it's backwards. The managerial class was made to benefit the left, not the left was made to benefit the managerial class. That seems to make sense to me. Oh, here, CT sent you the timestamps. Did you see? Oh, yeah. There Perfect. You Thank you, CT. Um, no, I mean, I, I think that is true. I'm not sure what what is the issue there. Uh, at Liberty by Jinkaza for eight months says arguing with Georges on Twitter X or does any of Adam's UBIs and tax views come from Henry George's land value tax theory? No, okay. but I know Henry George's tax land theory. You know about it. I do. Yeah. In intimate detail. And Miss Sparkles for five dollars says, "Adam, how old are you? I'm tired of this argument over your age, gentlemen. End this for us, please." XO XO. Never, never. You must continue to guess. <laughs> there you go. Although there I did go. see some pretty accurate guesses going on in the chat. So yeah. Well, you gave away a little hint in the stream. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Is that why everyone was? Every I'm time sure. I give away a hint, everyone's like, "Oh my God, he's so old!" Holy. They're shit. doing the calculations. They're like pulling yeah. out the. The calculator but they don't believe it that's right. the hardest thing the hardest thing is all is believing it look i'm going to be honest with you it's just like the prestige <laughs> it's right in front of your eyes it's there right you there, there you go. all you have to do is believe mm -hmm. okay uh jill and Mick, thanks so much for the one get to membership thank you Boop. Orion, oh, I heard that one. Metalworks four eleven ninety for eighteen months says the mouse utopia experiments were a shit terrible example. Well, there you go. I don't remember what the context was, but there you go. Yeah, I think there were some problems with that experiment. I think people do tend to take away way too much from. Right. But you know, it's still interesting to talk about. Zero Fox says, Adam, hint for Adam's age. Adam voted for FDR all four turns. <laughs> That's the best part. Look, I love these jokes. That's I good. do. That's good. I like that. Okay, it'd yeah. be amazing. Right. Voted for FDR. Yep. I shook Sitch's favorite president's hand. <laughs> there you go. Before True. we departed for World War II. You guys don't know this. Adam was in World War II and in Korea and yes. in Vietnam. He's been in three wars. Yeah. Okay. And Iraq. No, he dodged that one. And I and Afghanistan. He's like he's like Wolverine. I'm on my way to uh Ukraine next week. Right. Look, we're gonna fight to the very last Ukrainian. 
Uh, Wind Traveler for four months says woke originations can't compete with meritocratic organizations. Um, they will inevitably fail without externalities to prop them up. Yeah, I agree. I think that's, you know, I think that's true of socialism in general, part of why Venezuela failed, but definitely true of um, woke stuff. Ooh. Dr. Dealer for 18 months says this is the most doomer pilled dribble I've ever heard. You would think the clock is a minute till midnight. Any meteors soon? Nostradamus. There you go. I mean, I'm not as doomer pilled either, but I hope you can take something else of value away from the conversation. Speaking of Dr. Dealer, Dr. Dealer for five dollars says any team enjoys toothpaste and peanut butter together and deliberately doesn't wipe his muddy feet when coming inside. S class is the best class. Wow. Wow. Is this true, Adam? Tooth Those are both toothpaste complete. and peanut butter. Look, this is time. all lies. Normally, Disgusting. Dr. Diddler you usually get me on something, but yeah. this is all fake news. Wow. That's disgusting, Adam. Toothpaste and peanut butter. Oh. Yeah, of course that's disgusting. I would never oh. dream of doing that. Yeah, okay. And look, I wipe my feet as before I come in the house. Yeah, all right. No, okay. Uh, Luke W. for four months says, if any of this stuff is real, how come nobody... Oh, I read that one. That's the James Randy thing. I gotta look at that CAA thing. That is super interesting. CAA, if the CAA actually like, was successful with fucking projection and then just everyone stopped caring about it, that's bizarre. That's so weird. Um, Let's see. Read that one, read that one. Or that one. Generic seven Eric for 14 months says late and not gay. A class is S team. Well, there you go. Thank you. Sweet. Uh and then we were a reasonable amount of late today. We were only like 10 minutes late, weren't we? Yeah. Took me a second to set up and it was right. cool. Look, we We've been wanting to talk to Red Eared for a long time, so. Yeah, very cool guy. Uh, Pim Tool for 125, I think it's Filipino dollars. Says, Adam, please be Gordon Freeman on Halloween, or S Class will be Best Class and A Team will be Ass Team. Gordon Freeman. Uh, you don't know who uh, Gordon Freeman is? Jesus oh, who's Christ. That? Also, Sitch can rock a Nihilant costume. Oh, that'd be awful. How do you not know who Gordon Freeman is? Uh, you fucking Oh, cool. I, yeah, I know who Gordon Freeman is. Come the on. main character of Half-Life. Of course. Yes, of course. Yeah. A game you claim to have played a bunch. I have, but I usually don't play as Gordon. I usually play as like Ronald McDonald or like a you naked you woman. Play, you've never played the single player, have you? You've only played the multiplayer deathmatch. I, no, I play the single player. Well, you can't play as Ronald McDonald in single player. Yeah, no, look. I, we, I mean, you before... don't see yourself, but everyone calls you Gordon. Gordon! Man, I think, like, we got Half-Life, I think, in, like, 1996. <laughs> like, right. I know, it's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the first games I, one of the first, I think Half-Life was the first first-person shooter I ever played, and I was like, this is fucking amazing. <laughs> Wow, I mean that's a good one to start with, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, running around, killing the what were the? I mean, there was like worms the and shit on. The, yeah, head crabs. They're little crab guys that run on the floor. Try oh, to you're right. You. Yeah, yeah, trying to jump up at you. Yeah, running around trying to do the mission, and then we discovered, oh look, we can rig our computers up together, and we can play against right. each other in these different maps. Look, Gordon, ropes. We can use these to escape. And then it was over. We were like, oh, man. Did you ever we're play Doom? Play this. Like original Doom? Like shitty Doom 1 Doom? There, were, there was a bar in New York's when I lived in New York that had Doom that I played at a few times, but not really, right. not really enough to... Like, I didn't have it myself. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't... What was the first FPS I ever played? 
I mean, one of the first video games I ever played was Duck Hunt, but I think I don't count that as like an FPS. Um, what was there Duke any Nukem? Does that I count? never played the original Duke Nukem. What FPSs were on Super Nintendo? Um, FPSs on Super Nintendo. Yeah, I mean, Duke Nukem is kind of a first person shooter. No, Duke Nukem is a first person shooter. I'm saying. <laughs> I don't but think But it's just it's like ridiculous graphics compared to like Unreal or Right, obviously. Um I don't think I ever so I had Super Nintendo and I don't think I ever played a first person shooter. I'm, the first the first first person shooter I might have ever played was Goldeneye. That could be true. Played the fuck out of Goldeneye. That could have been the first one. That was like my generation's Half Life was Golden mm. Eye. Golden Eye. Never played Golden Eye. Nope. Golden Eye was crazy. It was, it was. I think one of the first FPSs that was like split screen. So you go to your friend's house that had an N sixty four, and all four of you be playing Golden Eye, and you all had your little boxes. You'd be like, "Stop screen hacking! Stop looking at my screen! You're screen hacking! Don't look at my screen!" Oh yeah, I would always do that. Yeah, I'd always look over. Not, yeah, I'd exactly. be like, like staring at the screen. Where the hell are you? Yeah, exactly. I'm trying you're to like, find oh. you in this map. Right, right. I'm gonna get your ass. Oh, look, yep. you're right there. I see you're right by the bathroom. You're mm -hmm. dead now, motherfucker. Right. Yep, everyone that was the level everyone played. The level with the bathroom. The faculty. That was the level. Yeah. As I remember my friend, he he was really good at it he actually owned it and he like he would do this thing where he would we would be on proximity mines and he put a proximity mind at each spawn oh, point because he memorized those. them each but it's so funny because he did that and as soon as he finished like i came up behind him and shot him in the head and so he just kept spawning and dying <laughs> and like if you remember from golden eye it was like the little james bond music so it'd be like da -na, da -na, da -na, da -na, da -na, da -na, and just kept doing it like again and again because he just kept spawning and blowing up Trip mining the spawn points. Yeah, I was that's dirty. what it's all about. I was so fucked up. That or just getting the fucking golden gun if that was on the map and just camping the spawn for the golden gun. Oh it's yeah, stupidest. That was the dumbest. We'd be like, no, just don't. The golden gun is the dumbest weapon ever. Oh my god, so terrible. Just single shot kills you no matter where it hits you. God, fucking Goldeneye was like such a garbage game. You couldn't even aim. You had to literally stop moving to aim. Who de who designed this awful, awful thing? Who designed the N64 controller? That person should be like beaten and sent to the realm of like bad controller design hell. It's literally one of the most awful design controllers of all time is the N64 controller. Just looking at these maps, these old like Half-Life-ish maps. Mm-hmm. Just, I mean, it's like we would play for hours. Is the nostalgia like, coming back to you? No, I, I'm fe feeling a little PTSD because we would play like 24 <laughs> hours at a time, and I would just oh be like, god. "Oh my god, I can't!" Like I would go to sleep, and I'd see the map in my in your head. dream. Did you play Half Life One or Half Life Two maps? I mean, I'm pretty sure Half Life One. I mean, what's okay. the difference? I didn't even know there was a Half Life Two. Well, then I guess it was one. Yeah. Well, I mean, the second we, one. I had played Half Life. Graphics, I played so. Counter Strike, and then I, right. I moved on to Unreal, Unreal Tournament. Right. You had your French lady in Unreal Tournament. Yeah. But none of those were. Not, all those maps were kind of. Samey. Samey, yeah, totally. Yeah. Half Life Two, the graphics. A lot were of concrete. Better, so. A lot yeah. of a lot of underground concrete. Industrial bases. Of, yeah. Yeah. A lot of graded walkways, metal graded walkways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I play. I I never played Half Life One until college, I think. And I played. Someone redid it with like good graphics, and I played it. Oh, I never okay. played the original with like the the dog shit paper graphics. So. There was no gravity gun in Half Life One. Was there a gravity gun when you guys played? Hmm. 
gravity gun? No, I don't know what that is. So it was like you could throw a grenade and then pick it up with a gravity gun and you'd hold it and it'd go dick, 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 dick. And then right before it went off, you'd fire, you'd, ch- you'd chuck oh, it at yeah. someone. I, we didn't have that gun. Okay, no. so it was, it was Half Life 1. We had tri- a bunch of, tri- I always loved the trip mine. So with the little laser ring that went yes. across the floor, you'd yeah, set yeah, it like yeah. a low, real low down by the door. So, so you when someone walks it. in, they'd be yeah. like, ah. <laughs> Oh, I was good with those trip mines. Right. I'd, I would, because you get three at a time, I would like find where the trip mines spawned up and I'd start, you know, creating a little art project in a room somewhere and be like, mm-hmm. well, no, I think they only let you do three, right? And then the, if you did a fourth one and the other ones vanished. Um, I don't remember because I never I think played Half-Life could. 1 Deathmatch. I don't play Half-Life 2 Deathmatch. I think you could only do three at a time. Right. Yeah. I had the vision in my mind that I was going to do like 20 of them in a room. And then. No, yeah, obviously. Well, the, if the game probably couldn't even handle it. <laughs> it can only handle so many objects existing in the world. So weak. Right. Yeah, I play Black Mesa. And I've seen Black Mesa um, virtual reality with AI, which is hilarious. I, it's hard for me to recommend because it's literally hours, like. It's like, I don't know, 24 hours maybe of content. So it's hard for me to recommend it, but it's very funny. God, I wish I could play Warhawk again. I played so much Warhawk. That game is so fun. Warhawk. But it doesn't exist anymore. Never played it. I'm sure you can find it somewhere. Warhawk was a game that you could get. There was airplanes, tanks, jeeps. Is this for PlayStation 3? Yes. Okay. Because say if it was for PlayStation One or Two, you could get uh, on your computer very easily. I don't. I mean, assuming there's like oh my PlayStation god. Three ROMs, but I don't know where they are. Oh my god! I want to play so bad. <laughs> you probably really like the like Starfront, Star Wars Battlefront Two, because it was just like it was really cool. You could, um, you can get in all sorts of all the Star Wars vehicles and shit, run around, blow people up. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm assuming Warhawk would only be fun if you were playing it like with other people. Warhawk, you only did play with other people, right? Even yeah. if you found the game now, there's no, there presumably be no server. That's so. yeah, the servers went offline, and that's why you can't play it anymore. Right. So. Yeah, but it was fun. Always capture the flag. Capture the flag is based. Capture the flag is my favorite is mode in best. Yeah. TF2 as well. <laughs> play yeah. way too much TF2. So. You, there will always be a bunch of idiots that you 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 know you'd roll up to the base and you'd be like, oh great, there's like four other guys here. We're, we totally have a team that we can get this flag out. They can provide cover. Yep. And they're like, what the fuck are you doing? Like you're just running in circles. <laughs> cover me, you idiot. <laughs> Try to imagine Adam as an adult playing Warhawk PS3 screaming at some child to like cover me you fucking piece of shit. <laughs> cover well, I mean, me. Oh my god. Look, there yeah. are all, there are obviously other adults in there, but mm-hmm. there are other kids in there. I'm sure. Oh my I know when I'm playing TF2, I I just assume everyone playing TF2 with is a child. I saw a video game. Yeah. Or I I saw a uh YouTube video, and they were talking about how they have all these AI like attachments on video games now that just make it impossible to be like if you're not playing with some modification. Like what? There's no way that you can play in these multiplayer games online and stand any chance of winning. I don't. I don't understand. They have cheats, basically. Some kind of cheat that makes you like shoot perfect or oh 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 you mean people are using uh bots or aim yeah. aim hacks or something yeah yes so, right, yeah right. that's not AI that's just aim hack yeah well they one the one that we're talking about in the video had some AI component to it oh that's awful look the a I think the AI component was part of how they make it how they hide that you're using a cheat oh okay yeah which yeah, and- I was thinking look. There was a, I was actually relatively good, but I don't know that anyone was cheating. Yeah, I know 
Oh, only it was very it was rare. It was pretty rare when I played Left 4 Dead 2 a lot. Mm-hmm. But when I played TF2, there was was reasonably common for someone to be using an aimbot. Though usually usually you could get uh them kicked out of the kicked out of the match and banned from the match. So Yeah, what fun is that when someone is just like a thousand times better than you. Well, I don't even know what fun they have because it's like you just see them spinning around in circles, just shooting everyone, and they just you know they'd be a sniper, so they just one shot headshot everyone, and you're like, what is even like, what is the pleasure that they're deriving from this? Because I wouldn't, I would feel like this is so boring. Like, you know, I feel boring. like there was people in Warhawk occasionally when I thought, okay, this guy's just there's no, this guy's so good, it's impossible. Like, how is anyone this good? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. I mean, I guess the only enjoyment is that you know you're pissing people off. And you're just <laughs> a, a child who is looking for control in your life, I would imagine. No, I would just leave the server. Right. Like, the servers would just get abandoned. They'd be like, gone, right. gone, gone. Yeah. So then you'd start playing on certain servers regular servers where everyone knew everyone and they would just kick whoever it was they'd be like fuck that guy Mm -hmm. right right i wonder that'd actually be a funny gaming stream uh adam playing left for dead too look i want to play warhawk so bad right now just looking at these screenshots i just look i'm anxious to get in there we can't (laughs) I mean, I'm sure there's a million, not a million, I'm sure there's some equivalent game with a modern game you could play that's like exactly the really? same as Warhawk, I would imagine. Some Battlefield 7, whatever. I don't know what Battlefield they're up to now, but. Right. That's something like that. So. Hmm. Adam plays Getting Over It. That'd be fun. Yeah, I mean, we'll do it. Look, I got to finish the comic. Christian yep. Baller's going to be mad at me if I don't get this comic out soon. True. I can't be playing video games all day. Look, True. this is this is interesting, too, because I think Christian Baller sent me a movie and was like, have you watched that movie yet? Have you watched that movie yet? I'm like, dude, I don't have time to watch a movie. I'm trying to finish the fucking comic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look what I would give to, like, the... Like the only luxury I allow myself is like one day a week hanging out with my wife because like I don't want my marriage to fall apart. Well, you hang out with me. Well, yeah, obviously. But you this hang out is, with me more you know, than you hang out with your wife, Adam. Not really. I mean, I hang out with my wife all the time. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> and good. I stream with you just a couple times a week. So well, we yeah, have to do an Christian extra Baller stream. Sent me, Christian Baller very generously sent me whiplash which i haven't got a chance to watch yet. look i want to watch a movie yeah. but i just look is he, did he every... send you whiplash too or is it a different movie? no he sent me the kingsman oh right, right which i haven't seen and i want to watch it's got that one cool scene in it but yeah no i'm just this is the thing i don't know if you saw that yeah i guess you did because he tagged both of us the guy giving ethan klein a hard time for not making content but I'm always working on original content. The whole comic is original content. I don't care about making original content. Cause... Yeah, you should though, man. Okay. Look, you're an artist, Sitch. I know Am you're I? trying to. I know you're trying to deny it. Okay. You should work on. Uh, look, we got a rough of the second. I'm not doing that. We're gonna, we have to. We have to nail down our content before we start any anything on the second comic because of how long this has taken the first comic oh really yeah that's my position okay <laughs> jeez <laughs> okay i don't i don't want a repeat of of uh, of this situation so what's look this situation's amazing what are you talking about okay what is the situation well i don't want you to spend another 3 years on <laughs> something mm-hmm. And a second comic. Well, look, uh, a lot of the three years part of it is just me figuring out how to literally make a comic with no experience. Right. So next time it's take, what, a year and a half? You don't go into a job. Mm, Right. Yeah, I feel like I could do it 10 times faster now, obviously. Right. Yeah. Yes, of course. 
not going to make the same mistakes that I made last time because I didn't good. know what the fuck I was doing. That's good. not going to have to re-letter the book like three times because oh I did God. it wrong a bunch you of re times. Uh, I thought that's the last thing people do is the lettering. I mean, look. <laughs> okay, I think... I think He's just trying to make sense now. I yeah. think my process is much better, though. Okay. okay. Lettering, lettering should be done first. Why? Lettering is very... Because you kind of... You develop it... You know, you rough it out, and you letter it, and then you go from there. You kind of get a better feel for... Look, the way... The way the professionals make comics is just... I mean, it's not really realistic. They okay. literally just, I mean, a lot of them don't even write the story until the co comic is done. That's insane. It is insane. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's the most insane thing I've ever heard in my life. Well, this is why I think a lot You're of the comics... You're saying they draw the panels first? Fr frankly, this is the reason why I think a lot of comics suck, is because they don't really think out the story. They're just like, look... and. Sitch and I, this is a big contention because I'm like, look, this has to look amazing. We want, I want cool, big set pieces. Well, you want those things, but you need a coherent story to bring those together. You can't just put a bunch of set pieces and like, oh, the story doesn't matter here. Just, it's got to look cool. Got to yeah, be there's, both. There's art brain and then there's right brain. Right. Writer's brain. And you need to kind of combine them to both you get do. a good story. Yeah. It's a, a good comic. The Matrix is like the perfect example because the Matrix functions on all those levels. It's just that movie's hitting on every level. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's what happened to... That's the downfall of One Punch Man because the guy who does the art is probably the best comic book artist I've ever seen in my life. Um, but he's obviously art-brained because he completely fucked up <laughs> when he had creative story? control. Right. Yeah, when he had creative control of the story, he completely fucked it up because he doesn't... He's an amazing artist, but he doesn't understand story. Yeah. Which, you know, I mean, that's fine. I don't understand art. I'm a writer by right. trade or by like brain. I don't I understand, understand both. art. So I understand both. I do. Right. Yeah. Anyways. What are we wrapping up? We're wrapping up. Oh, sweet. Look, what took us so long? No, just shooting the shit. Is it almost, look, oh my God, we're down to the wire. I didn't yeah. even look. Anyways, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for your incredibly generous donations. Uh, thank you, What If Alt Hiss, for coming on talking to us. It was great talk. Everyone, make sure you subscribe to What If Alt Hiss. Very cool guy. And thank you, Rags, for coming on. It's great talking to Rags. As always, friend of the show, Rags, whenever you want to come on. Door is always open for you. And thank you, Andrew Clark, for coming at the end and telling us all about the kinks. <laughs> and thank you, you who have made it in this stream. You are the true heroes. You are the true saviors. You are the true enlightened centrist. You are the true protagonist of reality. And we'll see you all on Tuesday. Boo-boo!